بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد we thank Allah Azza wa Jal for the opportunity to gather once again after our break, after our hiatus for around uh, two and a half months. Uh, we're now coming back and resuming uh, the lectures of the seerah. And alhamdulillah, we have covered, I think, around 35 lectures we have done uh, in which the Makki period uh, has been completely covered. And we began talking about the Madani period and we began talking about the major changes that occurred in the first few months of the uh, Madani phase. And the most important of these uh, was a new emphasis of the political freedom of the Muslims. For the first time the Muslims have political freedom. For the first time there is an independent state. Uh, for the first time the Muslims can act as a political body. Whereas in Mecca they were a persecuted minority. In Medina now they have a uh, the beginnings, if you like, of a republic. I mean, these terms are of course not representative. What you call it republic, whether you call it a, 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 a political entity is really the best uh, type of description. And uh, as I had already mentioned uh, in the last few lessons that we did, there were two threats facing them. One of them internal and the other external. And each one of these threats we will discuss in the next few weeks. As for the internal threats, Medina was not yet unified under the Prophet and in fact there would always be a group of people who were not happy with the changes. And these are of course, who are they? The Munafiqun, the hypocrites, right? The hypocrites did not want status quo to change. They wanted the old ways. And the Prophet ﷺ had to deal with them until the very end of his life ﷺ. Uh, and of course internally as well we said that there was the uh, other tribes that were not Arab nor were they Muslim. Uh, primarily these were the Yahud tribes and of course in the next four or five years the Prophet will have to deal with them as well. This will be another tangent or another important uh, portion of the seerah. These are the internal difficulties. The external difficulties of course primarily right now it is only Mecca. Right now it is only Mecca but slowly in the next few years the entire Arabian Peninsula will become involved. So, we need to understand that the animosity at this stage is unique. Mecca and Medina, the Quraysh and the Muslims. Slowly but surely, for the first time in human history, never before has this ever happened, the entire Arabian Peninsula will become polarized between two camps. And this polarization is the precursor to the unification. Okay, all of this is going to be discussed inshallah in the next few, uh, actually towards the very end when we get there. The unification of Arabia, which never happened in the history of humanity, it happened for the first time under our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So how did all that happen? Of course, primarily through these military expeditions. And that is why the history of the Madani Seerah is almost 80 to 90% a history of military battles. And this is the reality that we have to deal with, that we would like to know so much more information. But again, the chroniclers only recorded that which was the most important from their perspective. And from their perspective, the Madani phases, probably 80% of it is simply one battle after another. And uh, we will try our best to try to extrapolate the rest of the incidents as they occur. To summarize what we had discussed in the last lesson, because we need to understand that before we begin the Battle of Badr. Uh, there were some minor skirmishes. Two or three are extremely important to understand before we get to Badr. Uh, the first of them is the Sariyatul Nakhla. Who can remind me what was the Sariyatul Nakhla? Who can remind me? Sariyatul Nakhla. This was the very last episode that we did, the very last halaqa about the seerah. One of the was killed Something happened. I like this. <laughs> Something happened sometime. <laughs> Some Sahaba were sent to find out information outside of Mecca. What happened? You're getting confused. They were not lost. Two of them became lost, but the rest of them got to Mecca. Yes. And then what happened outside of Mecca? So they found an unexpected caravan. 
right? And they raided the caravan and they killed one person in the caravan. They killed one person and they raided the caravan, small mini caravan, probably eight, nine camels. And so complete surprise expedition. The caravan was not armed. They, 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 they gathered the, 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 the expedition, the, the war booty, and they brought it back to the Prophet And the Prophet said, I didn't tell you to fight. I didn't tell you to kill the people. And why was this problematic? Well, it was problematic because it occurred in the sacred months, right? It occurred on the very last day of the sacred months. The very last day, yes, and, and, and then Allah revealed, yes, al-Hrami qitalin fi. So this is the Sariyatun uh, Nakhla. Uh, the other incident that we need to remind ourselves of is the Ghazwatul uh, Ushayra. The Ghazwatul Ushayra. And again, this we already discussed this before. The Ghazwatul Ushayra is the part one of the Battle of Badr. How so? The Prophet ﷺ knew that the caravan of Abu Sufyan is going northwards, towards Syria. So the Ghazwatul Ushayra was the intended caravan on the way up. And the Battle of Badr was the same caravan on the way down. Okay? So the Ghazwatul Ushayra set up Ghazwatul Badr. Ghazwatul Ushayra is phase one. But it didn't happen because by the time the Prophet got there, Abu Sufyan had heard the news and he fled quickly, took another route. And so Ghazwatul Ushayra, the Prophet never actually met the caravan. Other minor things happened and he formed some alliances and tribal agreements. And so there was a success, but there was no military conflict in Ghazwatul Ushayra. Uh, and so what happened because of Ghazwatul Ushayra, Abu Sufyan was on high alert. These days you can say code red now. Right, high alert. Why is he on high alert? Because he already knows that the Prophet is interested in his caravan. And the concept of targeting caravans, uh, this is something that goes back even before this. And one of the interesting incidents that I didn't mention before because we don't have a particular time when it occurred. We have a rough idea it occurred the first year of the, after the Hijrah. When exactly, we don't know shows us that the targeting of the caravan was something that even the Ansar were thinking about, not just the Muhajirun. Even the Ansar were ready to start targeting the caravan. What is this incident? It is narrated in Sahih Bukhari that uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, and who is Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh? He is the leader of the Ansar. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh is the most uh, vibrant, dynamic leader, the up-and-coming leader of the Ansar. That Sa'ad Sa ibn Mu'adh was a close friend with Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Umayyah ibn Khalaf was the owner of Bilal, the, this famous Umayyah ibn Khalaf. He was a close friend of Umayyah ibn Khalaf in the days of Jahiliyyah. And the two were business partners. So whenever Umayyah would go north, he would stop over in Medina and stay at the house of Sa'ad. And whenever Sa'ad would go to Mecca, he would stay at the house of Umayyah ibn Khalaf. So they had a good friendship from the days of Jahiliyyah. One time in the first year after the Hijrah, we don't know exactly when, Sa'ad went down to Mecca, perhaps for business trips, perhaps for some other uh, reason. And it was the custom of the time that they would always do tawaf. They would always do tawaf. So Sa'ad asks Umayyah, come, F uh, tell me when should I go do tawaf? That is going to be a good time. So Umayyah says, go when uh, nobody is going to be witnessing. So clearly there might be some tension. Why? Because Sa'ad is now helping the Muslims. Sa'ad is now, uh, he is now a Muslim. But from the incident, it appears that his Islam was not known either to Umayyah and to the people of Mecca. But even if his Islam is not known, what is known for sure? He is helping the Prophet ﷺ. He's a supporter. He is uh, embracing, he has embraced the Muslims and he's now defending the Muslims. So he asks Umayyah, when can I go to Tawaf so that there won't be any, any tension, any hostilities? So Umayyah says, let's go right in the heat of the sun when everybody will be asleep. So they go at noontime, at Zahira they call it, which is when everybody takes a nap. And lo and behold, Allah Azza wa Jal wills that they meet the very worst enemy and that is Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl is coming back home and he sees these two figures and he asks Umayyah, who is your friend? Who is your friend? He figures something is fishy because nobody does tawaf when everybody is going to sleep in this hot sun. And so uh, Sa'ad says, this is Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, basically from Yathrib. And so uh, Abu Jahl gets angry and he says, how is it possible that you are performing tawaf around the house in safety after you have given protection to these renegades, he uses the Arabic word subat, and subat 
يعني صبا was what they called the Muslims that they had become Sabians they had left their religion right and it's a, it's a term of heretic or renegade these zindiq these people that have left the religion of their forefathers how can you give protection to these suba and claim that you will help them and now you have the audacity to come to Mecca show your face and do tawaf in such safety wallahi were it not for the fact that you are a guest of Umayyah, Abu Safwan, he called him Umayyah, you would not return to your house in one piece. This is an open threat, and this is a threat that contradicts everything of their religion and of Islam. As you know, Mecca was haram by the time, from the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Man dakhalahu kana amina. No one has the right to stop anybody from coming to Mecca. And Ibn Abbas narrates that in the days of Jahiliyyah, one of us would see a person who had killed his own father doing tawaf and we would not touch a hair on his head. They understood that Mecca is sacred land, but when it came to Islam, the double standards began for the first time. And we're getting this hint now. How dare you come to Mecca after what you have done? What has he done? He has, it doesn't say he has embraced Islam. And therefore it appears Abu Jahl did not even know that Sa'ad is a Muslim. Rather he is saying, you're helping the Muslims. And that is enough of a crime that you shouldn't even come to Mecca. When Sa'ad heard this, he became very angry. He raised his voice so that the people of Mecca could hear. And he said, Wallahi, if you are going to threaten me, and you're going to deprive me of Mecca, of Tawaf, I will deprive you of something that is more painful to you than this. And that is your trade route to Syria. He said this in front of the Kaaba so that everybody in Mecca could hear. You're going to threaten me, now you're going to see what's going to happen. And so the concept of targeting the, uh, the caravans of the Quraysh wasn't just something that the Muhajirun, uh, the Prophet told them to do. Of course, up until this time, no Ansari has participated. But Sa'ad is feeling the pressure. And Sa'ad says, khalas, tit for tat. You're going to threaten me, now you will see as well what we are going to do. And that is exactly what he did. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, that's exactly what he did. That he then began to target in the Battle of Badr, as we're going to study, the caravans of the Quraysh. Uh, the Battle of Badr, the Battle of Badr, by the way, firstly, what is Badr and why is it called Badr? Let's get to the, the, the introductory stuff before we jump in. Uh, Badr is an area or a location that is named after a well, so it's the well of Badr that is named after the person who dug the well. So Badr is the name of a human. And many centuries ago, he dug up a well. And so it was called the Well of Badr. And after he dug up the Well of Badr, the whole plain became known called the Plains of Badr. The whole area became known as the Plains of Badr. And this person, his name was Badr ibn Yakhlud, and he was from the tribe of the Banu Dhamra. And the land of Badr, or the area of Badr, it is around 160 miles southwest of Medina, uh, and 250 miles north of Mecca. So it is in between Mecca and Medina. Inshallah, next class, we'll be using some of the charts and diagrams that our very own Dr. Bashar has very meticulously done. Inshallah, next class, we'll be showing some of those. Uh, for now, all you need to know is that Badr is in between Mecca Mecca and Medina, and it is closer to Medina than it is to Mecca. In our times, uh, if you go by car, you can easily get to Badr in an hour and 10, 15 minutes. An hour and 15, an hour and 10, uh, you will get to Badr by car. In those days, of course, it, take, it took uh, around three days uh, on, on regular uh, journey. Um, by the way, it's also interesting to know this is a symbolic uh, uh, coincidence, and of course, there is no such thing as a coincidence. Allah's Qadr is all there. That Literally a few weeks before, but less than a month before Badr, a very interesting thing happened that we talked about in our last lesson, and that is the change of the Qibla. It's a very significant correlation, Badr and the change of the Qibla. The change of the Qibla literally occurs, literally, probably three weeks before Badr. And this is just too close to ignore. The, the time frame is too close to ignore. And there is no doubt that there is a huge symbolic change taking place. That the Qibla of the Muslims will now be facing Mecca. And then the greatest victory that early Islam ever saw shall be also given to them. In other words, it's as if it's being said, how can you face Mecca and yet not have Mecca in your possession? How can you face the Kaaba and yet the Kaaba be polluted by idolatry? And so Allah Azza wa Jal blessed them with that great victory right after the changing of the uh, Qibla. It's as if there is 
an, a sign or an indication that now that the Qibla has changed and you've won over Badr, slowly but surely, eventually Mecca as well will be yours. You're not only facing it spiritually, you will physically also obtain uh, the city of Mecca and that is of course exactly what happened. Now, now we get to the uh, incident of uh, basically building up the, 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 the incidents leading up to the Ghazwat al-Badr, the Battle of Badr. Uh, this is called the Battle of Badr, the Great Battle of Badr. Ghazwatu Badr in al-Kubra. Why? Because in our last lesson we mentioned another incident called Ghazwatu Badr in al-Sughra. And this Ghazwatu Badr in al-Sughra, the reason it's called Badr is because it took place very close to Badr, the Sughra one, not the Kubra. But it had nothing to do with the Quraysh. The people who were attacked were local tribesmen. So this is called Badr, uh, Badr as sughra It has nothing to do with the tribe of Quraysh. It has nothing to do with the caravan of Abu Sufyan. What was the Ghazwa that was on the caravan of Abu Sufyan? Who can remind me? What was the Ghazwa? Ushayra. Ghazwa to Ushayra. And when did it take place? Who can remind me? This is, should be in your notes for those who are taking notes. Ghazwa to Ushayra. When did it take place? You don't have your notes with you. You have to close and open another file. <laughs> I like that honesty. Yes, it's somewhere else. It's somewhere in my iPad. It's Jumadul Jumadul Awwal of the second year of the Hijrah. Jumadul Awwal of the second year of the Hijrah. The Prophet went to uh, the, the land or the area of Ushira. He didn't go to Badr, by the way. The, on the way up, he didn't go. When the sorry, when the caravan was going up, he did not go to Badr, he went to another location. And he camped there for a few days, this is Jamadul uh, Ula, uh, and he stayed there until the very first few days of Jamadul Thani, Jamadul Akhira, and then he returned back to uh, Medina. Now, when the time came, rough time came, that they expected the caravan back, and this is in, in now the month of Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ began sending multiple spies to see where has the caravan reached and we have at least two or three a hadith that mention different spies so this means basically that over the course of every few days he's spent sending out another few uh, people uh, for example in sahih muslim anas ibn malik says that uh, when uh, the time came for the caravan's return the prophet sent a spy to inform him about the advent of the caravan and when the spy returned, when the Sahabi returned, the Prophet ﷺ made sure that nobody was sitting in the room except for Anas. And Anas was excused because at this time he's probably seven years old. Except for Anas he was excused because he is a, uh, a child and because he's the personal servant and the uh, Sahabi informed him about the whereabouts of the caravan. In another hadith in Ibn Ishaq it is mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ said, sent Talha ibn Ubaidillah and Sa'id ibn Zayd. So he sent two of the famous Sahaba uh, to monitor their activities and they waited for the caravan and followed it for a while until the caravan passed them by and then they galloped back quickly to uh, Medina. And they reported that the, that to the Prophet ﷺ that it was under the command of Abu Sufyan that it had uh, almost a thousand camels in its uh, entourage. A thousand camels is unbelievable wealth. A thousand camels is something that uh, it is said, uh, early history books say that the Quraysh had never had such a large caravan in recent history. This was the largest caravan in recent history. Why this is the case we don't know, but perhaps this is due to economic factors prior to this, that they were basically, uh, they acquired the Muslims wealth, as you know they confiscated Muslim property and land. Perhaps other things happened that the books of, of Tariq and history don't mention, but this was the largest caravan in recent history, in recorded history for the Quraysh. And some modern historians uh, and economists have calculated that the net worth of the caravan would be around 50,000 dinars, 50,000 gold coins. 50,000 gold coins is basically a few million in our times. I calculated myself, but then the problem comes, how much is a dinar? A dinar goes from anywhere from $150 to $600, $700. Depends on the historic value of the dinar as well. Early Umayyad dinars, they go for around $800, $900. Some of them, uh, if you get a really rare, rare one from Al-Walid ibn, ibn Abdul Malik, uh, you actually go for $900,000. So if you do $1,000 per dinar, multiply that by 50,000, 50, you're talking about uh, 30, 40 million, 50 million here. But other dinars in our times go for like two, three hundred dollars So even if you do $100, even if you do $100, that's basically, uh, how much is that? 50,000 times 100 is 5 million. 
right? Five million, for roughly, from our uh, from our uh, currency, right? Five million dollars for the early nascent Muslim community that had nothing. You're talking about changing the entire treasury, really, of the early Muslims, right? So we can understand why the Prophet ﷺ was so eager. Now, in our last lesson, we had already talked about how non-Muslim Orientalists have skewed and have uh, attacked the Prophet ﷺ for saying he's a highway robber. And this is ridiculous because after what the Quraysh have done, this is the least that is to be expected. He's only targeting the Quraysh. He's not targeting anybody else. And frankly, most of that wealth was directly confiscated from the Muslims anyway. That's probably one of the main reasons why the caravan has so much money. Also, Ibn Ishaq mentions that there was hardly any household in Mecca except that they had an investment in that caravan. And this makes it very personal. There's hardly any household in that uh, in the Qabila of Quraysh except that they had a camel or at least something on a camel that they had sent. And again, I don't need to remind you, this was their main source of income. Back in those days, they didn't have salaries and paychecks. You literally got money in bulk, once a year, twice a year. This was their main money. Everybody who had any money would purchase goods and then invest in this ca caravan. Send it over to Syria, purchase other goods, send it back to Yemen. This is how the people of Mecca obtained their wealth. They are not farmers, they are not cultivationists, they are people who are trading rihlat al shita'i wa sayf. This is their backbone and livelihood. And the Prophet knows full well that if he were to acquire this caravan, what's going to happen? Number one, he will bring the Meccan economy to a screeching halt, completely gone. Every single household and qabila has invested. And number two, he will bring all of that fortune to the Muslim economy. And of course, that is exactly why he was so uh, eager to obtain this wealth to help the Islamic cause. So, Talha bin Ubaidullah Sa'id bin Zaid, Zaid, they rushed back to the Prophet ﷺ and they informed him that uh, Abu Sufyan is now coming with a thousand camels and that he will be at such and such a place. And so the Prophet ﷺ immediately gathered together the Sahaba and said, now here's a little bit of contradiction, what exactly happened? According to one report in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ did not announce where he's going. And he said, we have a mission to undertake, so whoever has his animal ready should come with me. And some of the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, my animal isn't ready. It's in another place of Medina. Let me go get it ready. And the Prophet said, no. Only those whose animals are right here and now, we're leaving right now. So that's the version of Sahih Muslim. In a version of Ibn Ishaq, the Prophet ﷺ said to the Sahaba that, هذا عير قريش. This is the caravan of the Quraysh. قد أدبرت عليكم. It's coming back to you. And it has in it the money of the Quraysh. So let us go out to meet it. Perhaps Allah will give it to you. How do we reconcile? Uh, Allah Alam is very simple to do that. It seems that Allah knows best that when he stood in the masjid, he did not announce who or where or what. Because in the masjid there could be munafiqun. There could be hypocrites. There could be uh, spies. There could be uh, still... Mecca, uh, sorry, Medina still has idol worshippers. Medina at this stage still has idol worshippers, as we'll understand, as we'll talk about. One of the main, uh, one of the main turning points of Badr is that after Badr, all of the idol worshippers basically converted to Islam, i.e., munafiqun. That's exactly what happened, right? After Badr, when, uh, um, shirk could not exist in. Medina. So up until Badr, there are still idol worshippers. There are hypocrites. There are other groups there. So the Prophet ﷺ did not make any public announcement. Rather, he said, we have a mission. Whoever wants to go, let's go. But there's one condition. You need to be ready right here and now. Literally, let's leave right now. And that is the ultimate surprise tactic. Not even the Sahaba knew where they're going. Then when the army leaves Mecca, and the process of can see that it's now contained who he's with, then he announces to them, this is the caravan of the Quraysh, it's coming back, let us go and attack it. Perhaps Allah Azza wa Jal will bless you. And so, Allahu uh, Alam, and by the way, this is not what most of the books of Sirah mention. Most of the books of Sirah ignore the report of, of uh, Sahih Muslim, but the report of Sahih Muslim is very explicit, and that is the Prophet did not mention where he's going. Whereas the one in Ibn Ishaq says he's mentioning where he's going. So, Allahu Alam, the way you put this together, which actually makes a lot of sense, he didn't mention in the beginning until finally they left the city and then he uh, mentioned. And this shows us again and again and again. 
it shows us the meticulous planning of the Prophet We have seen this in every major incident. We've seen this in the Hijrah. We're going to continue to see this. We've seen this in the Bay'atul Aqaba. When he, when he did the Bay'atul Aqaba, he stationed Ali in one place. He stationed Hamza in another. He has all of this meticulous care taking place. Even though he's Rasulullah and he, he could put his trust in Allah without doing anything. But that's against the Sunnah. You do everything you can and then you put your trust in Allah. You tie your camel and then you tawakkal ala Allah. So the Prophet didn't even tell the Sahaba until they are outside of the city. He uses the utmost surprise and caution. As Anas said, he caused everybody to exit the room when the first spy came back so that only he could hear the news. Nobody knew where they're going until finally when it, the caravan is right upon them, instantaneously he says, whoever's ready, let's go. He didn't even give them preparation. Why? Well, because this was easy prey. There were only 40 armed guards to this thousand caravan envoy. That's nothing. Why would the Quraysh do this? this is a good question I don't have an answer to. Why would they do this? Because the time is tense. You would have thought that they would have been more uh, thoughtful in this regard. Allahu alam, what is the reason? But the fact of the matter is, there were only 40 uh, armed guards, if you like. There were 40 warriors, right? Guarding this caravan, 40 for a thousand camels. Like, do the math yourself. That's basically one person for how many? F uh, the f uh, f 20, 20 something camels, right? Do the math yourself. Like, that's nothing. That's nothing. And so the process and realized if we only have, you know, two, three hundred people, which is what happened at Badr, that's all we need. And they don't even have to be armed to the hilt. And so whoever's ready, just go home, get your stuff and let's go. That's exactly what happened. And that is why we understand Badr was not meant to be a war. Badr was not meant to be a battle. Badr was meant to be confiscation of a thousand camels. Badr was meant to be a quick, easy one. They would have seen three, four hundred men. They would have gone helter-skelter. Those who wanted to make a stand would have died there. And then the entire thousand camels are taken by the Muslims. What is needed is speed and urgency. What is needed is that the Quraysh not find out. Right? And Allah Azza wa Jal willed other than this for a wisdom that was known to him. And we see it clearly uh, after the, uh, in the aftermath of the battle of Badr. So, this sudden instantaneous message explains why none of the Sahaba really was armed to the hilt. None of the Sahaba had their armor on. That the, the animals that were taken were animals that just happened to be there. That the entire army only had two riding horses. They only had two. And that camels were less than a hundred camels. For a caravan of 300 something people, there were less than a hundred camels. Why? Because it wasn't assumed that there would be, they would be needing fast horses. It, wouldn't, it wasn't assumed that they'd be needing a lot of camels. This was easy prey. This was you're targeting a sitting duck. They just have to go, show them 300 people, and then take the, the, uh, the, the prize, right? And Allah Azza wa Jal, as, uh, as we will find out, will something else. So, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he reaches his first encampment and they set up tents, uh, they, uh, they set up tents, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi first thing he does, he takes a detailed survey of everyone who is now participating. Notice, he couldn't do this in Medina because he just wants to leave, he just wants to get out. Right? Once they stop and they encamp, now he goes over every single person. He makes an assessment now. What do I have? What do I, what do I need to do? And he notices that there are two people who are too young to participate. And these are Al-Bara ibn Azib and Abdullah ibn Umar. The both of them are younger than 14. Generally, the Prophet would allow uh, these young men who had passed the age of 14. He would allow the 14 was the cutoff point. And uh, of course, I mean, for those times and ages, yani 14 was basically what we would consider to be 18. Of course, 14 year olds in our times, we don't even want to leave them alone in the house. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, they'd be too scared to stay alone in the house. In those days, we had 13 years old, Al Bara and Abdullah ibn Umar, they wanted to participate and they were eager to participate. And subhanAllah, every single major battle, we see the same tension. That 13 years old, 11 years old, sometimes they want to participate. And the Prophet ﷺ tells them, no, you cannot do that. We'll see the same thing in Uhud, we'll see the same thing later on as well. That in their eagerness, they wanted to be men. Right? And I always say that, wallahi, we have dumbed down our own youth. 
that if we were to treat them like adults, that young men would become adults faster. But because we have this false age of adolescence, where biologically they are men or women, but intellectually we treat them like kids, then we're going to get these problems, right? And I firmly believe this, that Allah Azza wa Jal has created, uh, has made the age of puberty to be the age of intelligence. That's the sign of the Sharia. And therefore, if society were to treat these youngsters the way they deserve with intellectual integrity, honesty, with respect, then these youngsters would grow up faster. And we find this again, uh, this isn't just Islamic by the way. Yani 100 years ago, 500 years ago in every society, when you were 14, 15, you were an adult. It's not just in Islamic societies, right? And this is the reality, the sad reality we have to live with that there is this teenage years that we ask Allah to protect us against the problems of teenage years. Um, tayyib, let's get back to the uh, issue of Badr. So Al-Bara ibn Azib and Abdullah ibn Umar were sent back. Because the distance was short, they were sent back alone. Just the two of them, they can basically uh, go home alone because there is just one one journey, one, one uh, day's journey, the two of them can go back alone. And the final count, was basically around 315, some books mention 313, some books mention 315, some mention 317, basically 310 and an odd number. These were all the volunteers. Around 83 of the Muhajirun, 62 of the Aus, and 170 of the Khazraj. 83 of the Muhajirun, 62 of the Aus, and 170 of the Khazraj. The Khazraj were double the Aus, and that is because for two reasons. Firstly, the Khazraj were more than the Aus. Secondly, the percentage of Muslims in the Khazraj was more than the percentage of Muslims in the Aus. Who can remind me why? The Khazraj were generally the poorer tribe. And the Aus was generally the richer tribe. And therefore, generally speaking, the poor convert before the rich. And the uh, Khazraj embraced Islam quicker than the Aus embraced Islam. And also, they were larger in number. Um, the two horses, I said I already said there were only two horses, they belonged to Zubayr ibn al-Awwam and al-Miqdad ibn al-Aswad, and they were less than a hundred camels. Some books mention 70, some books mention more than this, but less than a hundred camels. So basically, uh, every person uh, had to share a camel with three people, right? So every camel, there were three people taking turns riding the camel. You cannot have three people riding the camel at the same time. And so what they decided to do was two would walk and one would ride and then uh, it would just take shifts and turns in this manner. Now we have to point out here there's, there seems to be some significance to this number, 310 and something. There seems to be some significance because it occurs in multiple places in our religion. Of them is, for example, the famous hadith of how many prophets and how many messengers. We talked about this way back last year or maybe two years ago, right? What is the difference between a prophet and a messenger? And the famous hadith of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, Ya Rasulullah, kam rasulin ursilan, kam nabiyin. How many rasul? The Prophet said, 310 and something, jammun ghafir, a large quantity. How many anbiya? 124,000. So, 310 and something, that's here Badr. It is also said that the number of people who were in the army of uh, Jalut, uh, uh, um, uh, Talut and Jalut, the number of people that were fighting on the side of Dawood, on the side of David, against Goliath were also around 310 and something. Right. And so Allah knows best, but there seems to be some type of significance with this uh, number. So we said that the uh, Sahaba had to share a camel, three people per, per camel. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was assigned the camel of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And along with them was the famous Sahabi Abu Lubaba. Abu Lubaba, you will come across his name from the very famous incident that we'll talk about in the incident of Banu Quraidah. Abu Lubaba was that Sahabi who made a mistake. He repented and he tied himself to the masjid. Right? As an act of repentance. He did something that he regretted. We'll talk about that when we get there. And he felt so guilty that he went to the masjid and he tied himself up. And he deprived himself of food and water. And he said, until Allah forgives me, I will not leave this place. 
and he was almost about to die when Allah Azza wa basically revealed his repentance in the Quran and they said khalas you are forgiven so he said no until the Prophet himself comes and allows me to be free I'm not going to be free so the Prophet himself came and he untied Abu Lubaba from that pillar uh, this is Abu Lubaba we'll talk about Abu Lubaba that story uh, later on so Ali and Abu Lubaba and the Prophet they were assigned one camel Imam Ahmad in his Musnad mentions a very beautiful incident now. Can you imagine if you had been assigned the camel with the Prophet What would you do? Not take, not take what? Your turn on the camel, right? Can you imagine, can you imagine that if you had to share a camel with the Prophet what would you do? He will say, Ya Rasulullah, Tfaddal, you guys, you, know, you, you, you take the camel, we will walk. And so, both Ali and Abu Lubaba insisted that Ya Rasulullah, we will walk and you take the camel full time basically, right? And subhanAllah, the response of the Prophet is so sweet and gentle and profound. It's so full of wisdom that you just you just like mind boggle. How could this is of course coming from Mishkat to Nimur, from the well of prophecy? Yani he could have said yes, he could have. And wallahi, if he had said yes, who would have objected? He is Rasulullah. Forget even, forget even the religious. He is the leader. When does the leader do exactly what the private does, right? Even forget the religious side. A general in the army, right? The five-star general never ever travels the same way as the private. He, this is understood. Like you work your way up to the top and then after that you're given the red carpet treatment and everybody accepts it. Added to this is the religious side. That he is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khatamun Nabiin, Sayyidu Waladi Adam, on and on and on. Right, and so if anybody had like uh, uh, done this, nobody would have objected that the process is riding in the other two are walking. Alternatively, he could have said, "No, let's be fair, let's share." He could have done that way as well. Just be blunt and say, "No, no, I disagree with this. Let's be fair and let's share." And he could have been strict with that, but he allowed them to share in a manner that was very sweet and very beautiful. He smiled back at them and he said that the two of you are not any younger than I am. You're not any stronger than me. And I am not, now this is a double negative, in any less in need of the ajr than the two of you. I'll repeat what he said. The two of you are not any younger or stronger than I am. We're all equal men here. Pause here. By the way, technically that's not true because how old is Ali? Yeah. 20, 21. 20, late, late, late 20s, or yeah, mid 20s, mid 20s by now, right? And the process is now, how old is the process? 55, 54, 55. So even technically, Ali, we don't know the age of Abu Lubaba. Abu Lubaba, we don't know his age uh, at this time. But yeah, anyway, we can say he's a middle aged man. So technically, the process is the uh, senior of them in age as well. But he says, the two of you are not any stronger than I am. Now that might is, is possibly true in terms of physical strength. Yes. And neither am I in any less need of the rewards from Allah that I will get if I walk. And so when he said this to them, they had no response to this. So how are you going to respond? When he says, I'm doing this for the ajr just like you. We're all three men here. We're all three of roughly equal physical strength, right? And so I need the ajr as well. And so he insisted that they take turns on this one camel. And that was uh, his way of enforcing the fairness, the, the equitable uh, treatment. And of course, I mean, it goes without saying, yani, subhanAllah, can you imagine here the psychological uh, repercussions of the Prophet ﷺ walking? Imagine if you were in that army now, in that caravan now, the heat, the desert sand, the thirst, the, the trouble. Now you see the Prophet walking. What are you going to do? But you cannot complain. You cannot complain. By the Prophet walking with the army, khalas, that's it. Now you are, there is nothing you can do now, right? And again, this is the wisdom. And this is exactly, I mean, no doubt he is Rasulullah But why was he respected? Well, because he acted like Rasulullah as well. Right? He could have, as they say, like, you know, pulled his rank. Right? He could have. And who would have complained? I mean, honestly, who would have complained? But no. 
And that's the, exactly what Allah says. You are the role model. You are the, uh, the, the one who is gentle, merciful. So he walked along with all of the rest of the army. And there was nothing different from him than from the rest of the, uh, of the Muslims. And subhanAllah, when you have a leader like this, what is going to happen? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, they live the same lifestyles. When Umar goes and conquers Jerusalem, look who is he learning this from, right? Who is Umar learning this from? That when he gets to Jerusalem and his slave is on the camel, what does he tell the slave? Hey, it's not fair, it's your turn. Correct? And he walks into Jerusalem and the people of Jerusalem think that the slave is Umar and Umar is the slave because wh what leader in the world would walk leading in his slave while he is walking? Where did Umar learn this from? He has the best teacher, the best master, the best uh, muallim and that is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Another uh, interesting point here as well, by the way, before we move on again, this is one of the problems of seerah is that the seerah is composed of many small incidents, right? So we need to draw a larger picture by mentioning disconnected incidents, right? And then we just try to put them together. Another disconnected incident that is a precursor to uh, the Battle of Badr, and we have a lot of benefit uh, from this, very deep benefit, especially for the times and the place and the political climate that we are living in. And that is the lack of participation of two people in the Battle of Badr. And that is Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman and his father, uh, uh, al-Yaman ibn al-Hakam. Uh, these two people, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman and his father, the two of them could have participated in Badr and they wanted to participate. But they were held back because of a promise they had made to the Quraysh. Hudayfa and his father, were once captured by the Quraysh. And the Quraysh were almost going to kill them. When finally one of them decided, you know what, let's just make them promise that they're not going to ever fight alongside Muhammad As long as they're not going to fight with us, then khalas, send them back, no big deal. So they didn't really have, Hudayfa is not a, a muhajir by the way, Hudayfa is neither, yani this is a longer story, but Hudayfa and his, fa well, his father, not Hudayfa, his father, is not from Mecca, nor is he from Medina. He, he came to Medina in the days of Jahiliyyah because of a crime he had committed, so he abandoned his tribe and he basically came to Medina. He was adopted by the people of Medina and then he became a, a Sahabi. He accepted Islam and then his son Hudayfa accepted Islam. So the two of them are neither Makki nor, nor Madani, quite in this sense. They're neither Qurayshi or not are they Aus and Khazraj. So when the Quraysh capture them, they don't have any direct animosity. Like these are people who are caught up, basically. So one of them has sympathy and says, okay, you know what? We're not going to kill you, even though you're Muslim. We're not going to kill you. This is, of course, before the Battle of the Badr, a few months before the Battle of the Badr. We're not going to kill you, but you have one condition. And that is, you will never fight us alongside the Prophet ﷺ. Right? You're not going to join the Prophet ﷺ fighting us. And so when the Prophet ﷺ heard, when they returned back to, uh, from the Quraysh and the Prophet ﷺ heard this, the Prophet ﷺ basically did not allow them to participate in any of these ghazawat. And this shows us that a Muslim is upon his word and promises. A Muslim is never a traitor. A Muslim is never a traitor. They gave their word. And once they gave their word, even in times of great trial and difficulty, they did not take up arms and fight against the uh, Quraysh. In the Battle of Uhud, we'll talk about exactly what happened and we'll uh, clarify some points there. But any type of uh, uh, offensive battle that was taking place, uh, Hudayf and his father did not participate and therefore they remained back in uh, Medina. And of course this shows us in our times especially, treaties have to be respected and honored, obligations and duties, including duties that are understood, such as duties of citizenship, let's say. Right? These are obligations, these are legally binding contracts. And if you are a visa carrier or a citizen or whatnot, there are certain obligations upon you, regardless of what's happening in the world. If you don't like it, then you don't have to be a citizen holder or a visa holder. But you cannot be a citizen and a visa holder and then go against what? That entails, right? You understand the, the Islamic rulings here. That it is not allowed from the Sharia perspective to break a promise or your word. It is not allowed to be a traitor. You cannot be two-faced. Swear that you're a citizen and then do something that will uh, go against the oath that you have given. Nobody is forcing you to make that oath. And if you're not going to uphold it, then do not say it. And that's what we learn from Hudayfa and his father. That even though one can say, hold on a sec, they were almost going to be killed. But they gave their word in solemn promise. 
right? They could have been killed. They could have. But they didn't. They said, okay, you know what? We agree to your condition. We're going to go back to Medina and we're not going to fight against you. And when the Prophet heard this, then he did not accept them to fight and they could not volunteer to fight. And this shows us that a Muslim is upon his conditions and promise. Al Muslimuna ala shurutim. This is a hadith. Al Muslimuna ala shurutim. And the ayah in the Quran, O you who believe, fulfill your covenants. Ya amanu, awfu bil uqud. And you understand the implications in modernity, and I don't need to go into this tangent, and I've spoken about this very explicitly in talks that are related to uh, those issues. Uh, another incident that occurred that the Prophet is, is leaving Medina, and they still think that they're going to uh, get to the caravan of Abu Sufyan, that one of the uh, pagans of Medina, his name is not mentioned in uh, the early books of Sirah, one of the pagans of Medina who was known for his bravery and fighting skills, he marched up to the Prophet ﷺ. He is not a Muslim. And he says that I wish to join you in order to get this ghanima. I wish to join you. The Sahaba were happy to see him because they're getting a strong man. The Sahaba were happy to see him. The Prophet ﷺ said, Do you testify that Allah is your Lord and I am the Messenger? He said, No. I'm still a mushrik, I'm still a pagan. No. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna la nasta'inu bi mushrik. We do not ask for help from the pagans. So the man stayed where he was, and a few hours later he again caught up with the camp. I guess the thought of all of this money, 1,000 camels and whatnot, come, came to him, and once again he said, that allow me to come with you, because he wants to share. Allow me to come with you. Again the Prophet ﷺ asked him, do you testify, la ilaha illa He said, no. So he said, inna la nasta'idu mushrik. And then a few hours later again he writes in, and he's gotten the point now, basically, right? So now the Prophet ﷺ asks him, and he says, Yes, Ashhadu Allah illallah, Ashhadu Allah Rasulullah. Now he accepts Islam. And so he was allowed to join the caravan at that point in time, or join the expedition at that point in time. And uh, this hadith has been again used politically in our times, and it was used in Gulf War One, Gulf War Two. It was used during all of these times that uh, is it allowed to ask for military help from a non Muslim? Uh, or not, because the Prophet said, We do not ask help from pagans. And this is a classical controversy amongst the four madhahib. Uh, some scholars say that you can never ask for any such help. Other scholars say that it is allowed with conditions. And frankly, this is not the time or place to get into this tangent. Uh, but you understand this also has political ramifications in the modern world. It has caused a lot of controversies in many lands. Can you get the help of a non Muslim? Right, this happened as you know very, very recently many times. Can you get the help of a non-Muslim army to help you against an aggressing army? So these types of ahadith were then brought up and this is not the time or place to discuss both opinions but there is a spectrum of opinion, there is a gray area. For example, Imam al nawawi in his uh, commentaries, Imam al nawawi says that this, this hadith shows that the general rule is that you do not ask help from the uh, pagan army, but there are exceptions. And Imam al-Nawi says, the Prophet himself sought the help of Abdullah ibn Urayqit, who is Abdullah ibn Urayqit, who is Abdullah ibn Urayqit, the guide of the Prophet in the, in the Hijrah, right? Imam al-Nawi says, the Prophet himself sought the help of Abdullah ibn Urayqit at a time of great sensitivity. I mean, subhanAllah, think about it. There's a hundred camels on his head, as you know, dead or alive. And hundred camels is a mini fortune. This man, whoever gave him in, he would have lived comfortably for the rest of his life. Yet he trusted after Allah Azza wa Jal, he trusted his life with Abdullah ibn Uraqit. And so Imam al-Nawi says, if a person has good opinions of Islam, i.e. either are sympathetic to Islam, and they can be trusted, and the situation calls for it, then one can ask the help uh, of uh, mushriks against uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an enemy. Uh, point being, again, this is one of those issues we see over here in this incident. The Prophet said, We don't ask the help of a mushrik. And yet, he himself, at a time, and there are more than this time as well, where the Prophet got the alliances of the pagans, uh, he got the help of, uh, of others. Uh, for example, when Abu Talib died and Abu Lahab was going to expel him, the Prophet got the help of uh, Mutam ibn Adi. Remember this, right? He got the help of Mutim bin Adi and he took the, it is called a jiwar, and in our times it's basically the visa of Mutim bin Adi that Mutim bin Adi has allowed me to stay in Mecca. If I was
Bulahab has kicked me out, then Mutab ibn Adi has allowed me. So the point being, you should know that there is a spectrum of opinion, and uh, frankly, each opinion has some some uh, strength and evidence to it. And in my humble opinion, it is a case by case situation and basis that when such a situation arises, then the scholars of that region and land let them talk amongst themselves and come to a, a conclusion. And this is an ishtihadi issue anyway. Another interesting point here that Subhanallah, our religion does not ask us to look into the chests of people. Here is a man, Wallahi, the average person would doubt his Islam. Correct? The time, the place, the circumstances. The whole story. Once he says no, twice he says no, finally he says, you know what, okay, khalas, I'm a Muslim. But what does our religion tell us? Judge people by outward and leave the inner to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And wallahi, we would be so much better if we simply followed this, right? Leave the inner affair. Don't doubt people's intention. The Prophet asked him three times, Are you a Muslim? No. Are you Muslim? No. And there's a lot of money to be gained if he's a Muslim. So on the third time he goes, You know what? Khalas, I'm a Muslim. And nobody questions his Islam. Let it be. And in fact, and I have said this previously before, there is no denying that our religion, the Sharia, gave incentives for people to convert. Monetary sometimes, political at other times. Why? Who remembers what I said? Why is there, like somebody says that, you know, uh, your religion encourages people to convert, even financially there are privileges, right? Why? Why is this the case? I said this very clearly. I didn't say that, but that's a valid point. If the, uh, what I said, if they convert for any reason, because Islam is true, we are confident that they will eventually convert for the right reason. That we're so confident of our faith that you know what, khalas, convert for the money, no big deal. But what's going to happen? Slowly, Islam and Iman will enter the heart. And this is the reality that we see from people to this day and age who convert for secondary reasons, primarily in our times for marriage and love, right? A person will convert because their spouse wants them to, and, and that person is not a Muslim. So the boy is not a Muslim, and then this girl says, you know what, if you're not a Muslim, I can't marry you. So he goes, khalas, khalas, okay, I'll be a Muslim, yes. You know? I mean, wallah, I have had people come up to me. You know, boy meets girl, boy falls in love with girl, girl falls in love with boy, the boy is not a Muslim, they come to the masjid, she's not practicing Islam, but she knows one thing, she's not wearing hair, she knows one thing, you know, I can't marry him if he's a non-Muslim. So right then and there, and, I, and he asks me, I, there was an in case, he literally asked me, I mean, there's nothing I can do, I have to convert to marry her, right? Like he does not want to convert, you know? And I said, no. Unless you convert, you, you cannot marry this person, right? And so he decided to convert. It's not my job to look into his heart, is it? It's not my job. And eventually, these people, as for this couple, I didn't keep in touch with them, but I have met many uh, couples that eventually the one who converts becomes even more practicing than, than the Muslim, right? Well, like how many times, and this happens to me so many times that, you know, the, let's say the sister converts and then she starts getting more and more religious until finally the husband comes and says, Sheikh, can you tell my wife to calm that religiosity down? She's kind of, you know, going a little bit too much now, you know what I'm saying? And this is so common now that the woman will convert or the man will convert and then one of them, mashallah, tabarakallah, they will go beyond the other. So, so what if he converted for another reason? We're so sure Islam is true. Yalla, bismillah. Whatever your reason is, eventually you'll be a true Muslim. So we don't question people's uh, motives. Now, this is of course the general rule. There might be some exceptions here and there, but here is one of those questions, uh, one of those times when it was not a uh, question. Uh, so, uh, getting back again to the issue of Badr, the Prophet Sallallahu looking at the various reports, it seems that we can guesstimate that he left Medina on the 12th of Ramadan. He left Medina on the 12th of Ramadan in the second year of the uh, Hijrah, and he uh, put in charge of Medina Ibn Ummi Maktum, who as you know was the blind Sahabi. And this shows us that in our religion, and Wallahi it is a very big deal for the time, that when somebody was physically impaired, they were literally treated as outcasts, right? When somebody was blind or lame or something, they were literally treated as subhuman. And the very fact that the Prophet chose a blind person and put him in charge of Medina, Wallahi, we can clearly say that our religion was uh, very forward thinking for the time, right? That it did not take these personal uh, um, uh, faults, if you're, well not false is not a good word, but uh, these, um, what's the technical term I'm forgetting? 
handicaps is the term that it did not take these handicaps as being any problem in the job that you're doing so what if he's blind he can take charge of leading the player he can take charge of the civil affairs of medina what has his blindness got to do with with this whereas wallahi for other people at the time to be blind to be deaf to be you would you would be treated as a crazy person or you would be treated as subhuman as a child and the very fact that Ibn Umi Maktoum is being put in charge of the city shows us our religion did not discriminate against uh, people who have physical uh, handicaps. And so, and this is not the only time, by the way. Ibn Umi Maktoum was put in charge of Medina at least a dozen times. Why? Because he was a sensible man. He was a wise man. And his blindness did not come into the way of him being basically in effect the temporary mayor of Medina, right? Being in charge of Medina. That's a very prestigious position. And the wisest person they could find was Ibn Ummi Maktoum. Um, in the meantime, uh, so the Prophet ﷺ left uh, Mecca on the 12th of Ramadan. Abu Sufyan is coming back and Abu Sufyan is taking extra precautions to find out what is happening. Is the Prophet ﷺ going to attack or not? Why? Because he's already uh, he already found out that the Ghazwatul Ushera just barely missed him by a day. The Ghazwatul Ushera, he literally uh, saved it by the skin of his teeth, as they say. One day, otherwise he would have been caught, right? And so, Qadr Allah, Ghazwatul Ushera was the warning for Abu Sufyan. That was what sent him off his warning bells. That on the way back, Abu Sufyan took extra precautions. So much so, he would send spy parties out to spy on the spies. There's a spy game going on here. Right? He would send delegations out to find out is anybody spying on us? And it is said that uh, Ibn Ishaq mentions that uh, some Bedouins mentioned that they saw two men spying on the camp. Of course, these are Talha and Sa'id ibn Zayd. Right? The Bedouins mentioned that there were two men who were spying on you. And so Abu Sufyan said, show me where they camped. So the Bedouins took Abu Sufyan to the camp of these two men. We are assuming they're Talha and Sa'id. Who else could they be? And Abu Sufyan examined their camp and examined their markings until finally he came across camel dung. And in his intelligence and desperation, he opened up the camel dung. And what do you think he found? Dates of Medina. <laughs> exactly right. But not the dates, but the date seeds. Big difference. <laughs> right? He found the date seeds of Medina. Right now, I mean, obviously, it's a little bit uh, disgusting. Even though technically, camel dung is not najis, I have to say that. Even though I wouldn't touch it, but still, it's not najis. But still, well, it shows you these are scouts. These are people who know how to analyze. Right to open up, to crack open a camel dung, and to examine what is in this camel dung, and then to pick out the seed and say. And he said, these are the dates of of Yathrib. Right. He recognizes the seed from where it is coming. Khalas, everything fits into place now. And so Abu Sufyan panics. Abu Sufyan panics because he realizes we are being monitored. And therefore this panic causes him to go into overdrive mode. And he does two things, both of which Qadr Allah saved him, but Allah's Qadr was also there. It brought about the biggest disaster to the Quraysh, right? In saving himself, he brought about the biggest disaster to the Quraysh that Allah blessed the Muslims with. So he did two things. The first thing that he did is that he took an unknown route. Immediately, as soon as he found out this is happening, he hired a local guide and he says, get us out of here. Take us from the shore. And he went from a much farther route. He basically bypassed. And inshallah, next week we'll show the maps that Dr. Bashar meticulously has drawn or PowerPointed or whatever. Uh, that he basically bypassed the entire city so that he wasn't even close to where the Prophet would have been. And the second thing he did is that he sent for reinforcements. He sent for reinforcements. And how did he send for reinforcements? He sent his fastest rider who had the fastest uh, camel and that is Dhamdham uh, Dham ibn Amr al-Ghifari. Uh, he sent Dhamdham to go to Mecca and to announce to the Quraysh that unless they do something, their caravan will be confiscated. Unless they send reinforcements, your money has now been destroyed. And so Bamdam immediately uh, proceeded on the fastest camel possible. And uh, really it was very fast because think about it, that this is probably taking place, probably taking place around the 10th, I mean two, three days before the process leaves. Because again, these are the two spies. As soon as the two spies come back, literally as soon as they come back, what does he do? He goes to the masjid, he says, right now, let's go. Somebody said, I want to pack my bags. No, right now, let us go. 
right? Look at the, the quickness. He doesn't want the news to get to Abu Sufyan. So within two, three days, Dhamdham must have reached Mecca. Mecca, the same day they make the decision, within three days they come back and they're at Badr. This is super fast speed. And this we'll discuss inshallah in the next lesson. We have one more thing for today inshallah. And that is events happening in Mecca before Dhamdham arrives. One thing happens in Mecca before Dhamdham arrives. That sets the stage. And that is the dream of Atika binti Abdul Muttalib. Atika, the aunt of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, the full sister of Abdullah and Abu Talib. She is the full sister of Abdullah and Abu Talib. And, uh, and therefore, she is the full aunt of the Prophet ﷺ. By the way, did Atika accept Islam or not? Uh, Wallahi, it seems to be a difference of opinion. Uh, Ibn Ishaq mentions that the only aunt of the Prophet ﷺ who ever accepted Islam is, everybody should know, Safiya. That is by unanimous consensus. Ibn Ishaq says the only aunt, Am, Amma of the Prophet ﷺ to accept Islam is Safiya. Uh, however, Ibn Sa'ad says that Atika also accepted Islam. This one, Atika, that we're going to talk about. And that Atika migrated to Medina after this, and she died in Medina. Truth be told, even Ibn Hajar finds this skeptical because we don't have a single report about anything from Atika after this dream. And had she converted to Islam, we would have heard of stories like we have heard from Safiya. So Allah knows best. Maybe she did. Ibn Sa'ad says that she did. That Safiya and Atika were the two. Whereas Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Ishaq is the earlier and the greater authority. Ibn Ishaq says none of the aunts of the Prophet accepted Islam other than uh, Safiya. So keep this in mind and Allah knows best uh, whether she accepted Islam or not. One thing for sure, we never hear of her after this dream. This is the only incident that we hear of her and after this she is basically what happened and when she died and what not. We don't have any indication and yeah, anyone who can say had she been a Muslim then this would have been uh, preserved with more care but in the end indeed Allah knows best so what dream did Atika see Atika had a dream three days before Dhamdam's Dham's arrival three days before Dhamdam Dham arrived in Medina so they have no clue what's going on she woke up flustered and agitated and she called her brother Abbas the uncle of the Prophet she was close to Abbas she was the closest to Abbas in age and in uh, bond. So she called it Abbas. And she said that I saw a nightmare. I saw a dream that I'm very concerned. It's giving, it's making me very uh, scared. Abbas said, what happened? Tell me. So she said that in my dream, I saw that a crier had come to Mecca. That a crier is going to come to Mecca, excuse me, in three days. So she predicted in three days, a crier will come to Mecca racing on his camel so she's seeing the crier she's seeing the camel and she see, and she knows it's going to be in three days and he first goes to the masjid and he cries out in the masjid ya ghudar o oh you traitors and betrayers people who have betrayed o oh, p o oh, oh, traitors meet your death in three days from now so six days from the when she's saying this three days and then three days go out and meet your death in three days from when I'm announcing this, right? Go out and meet your death. And then she said, the crier was on top of the Kaaba. So first he's next to the Kaaba. Then he's on top of the Kaaba and he says the same thing. Then he's on top of the mountain of Abu Qubais. The mountain of Abu Qubais, you still see it in Mecca. When you go to Mecca, you will find that small mountain that you can see from the Haram. This is the mountain of Abu Qubais. He is on the mountain of Abu Qubais. And the mountain of Abu Qubais was the highest peak in the immediate vicinity. And many times when they wanted to make a very major announcement, uh, they would go to the sometimes Abu Qubais mountain and sometimes to Safa and Marwa, which is closer. Abu Qubais is a little bit farther outward. And so he was standing on the mountain of Abu Qubais and he said the same thing. So he is saying it three times again. What is he saying? Ya Ghudar. Ghudar is the plural of those who are betrayed. Ghadara is to the worst type of, of, of betrayal, the worst type of uh, uh, traitors. Right? Why are they traitors? Because they have betrayed the foundation of what they considered jahiliyyah, of what was most important to them, and that is blood. Blood. Qabila. Tribes. Right? The one thing they value is tribes, tribalism. And what have they done? For the first time in Arab history, they have broken tribes. The Quraysh. And they have not allowed their tribesmen to basically live with them. 
This is one reason they're called traitors. Some can also say, and there's nothing wrong with this, they are traitors to the religion of Ibrahim. And this is also plausible. They are traitors. Ya Ghudar, O traitors, meet your death in three days. Go out and meet your death. Then Atika is saying, this crier picks up a large rock from the mountain of Abu Qubais and he topples it from the mountain. And Atika is saying, she sees the rock go down all the way from the mountain until when it gets to the base, it splinters and cracks up. And then it continues rolling until every house in Mecca gets hit by one of the rocks. Right. So the boulder cracks and then every house is hit by one of these stones. Now what is the interpretation? It's pretty obvious. The interpretation is that whatever announcement this man will make will cause the deaths of these traders in three days. They don't realize it, but that's what the announcement will cause. That they're going to die in three days. And the rock hitting every house is the sign that every house will be struck with the calamity. What calamity? The death of multiple people in the household. Not a single household of the Quraysh was spared in the battle of Badr. Every household had debts. Every household was affected. And so the crier is predicting, and, and, and that is the rock coming down, the boulder coming down, that every one of your houses will be uh, affected by this incident that's going to happen. And so uh, Abbas became very uh, worried as well. And he said to uh, Atika, he said to Atika that Wallahi this dream is a very dangerous dream and I am worried if you tell it to people you will get into trouble so keep it to yourself don't tell anybody about this dream it seems like a very dangerous dream and it is said that Atika used to see these regular dreams and we know that seeing dreams is something that Allah blesses people with uh, seeing dreams uh, that can be interpreted the king at the time of Yusuf saw these dreams right the king at the time of Yusuf was not a Muslim and yet he saw these dreams being a Muslim non-Muslim doesn't mean uh, these dreams can come to non-Muslims as well and so Atika sees this dream so Abbas says don't tell anybody because I'm worried what will happen if people hear about it yet being the man that he was he could not follow his own advice he tells Atika to be quiet but he goes and tells his best friend and that is Al-Walid ibn Utbah and he says, Oh Al-Walid, please don't tell anybody else. You see where this is heading, right? And so Al-Walid says, yeah, I'm not going to, I promise, promise I'm not going to tell anybody. And Walid goes and tells his father Utbah. And he tells his father, look, Abbas made me promise. So basically you get the point here. Within a short period of time, the whole city of Mecca is now gossiping about this strange dream. You want to keep a secret? Keep it a secret from yourself and to yourself. That's the only way to keep it, right? You tell two people and that's it. The secret is out. So Abbas was the one who opened up the doors to telling the secret, even though he's the one telling Atika, don't tell anybody. So Abbas still thinks that nobody knows because he has only told Al-Walid. Yet within a few hours, it spreads and gossip and the whole people of, of Mecca are now talking about the strange dream of Atika. However you want to interpret it, there is clearly doom and dread. Oh traitors, meet your death in three days. That's not a positive dream, right? And a rock comes and smashes into every house. That's not a good dream. So you don't need to be an expert in dream interpretation to know that this dream is against the Quraysh, right? right? So the Quraysh are not too happy at this dream. Abbas doesn't know that they're not too happy. In any case, he goes to sleep. By the time he wakes up, everybody in the city is gossiping. But he still doesn't know. He goes around his business buying and selling then he decides to as he usually does as was the uh, custom of most of the Arabs and Quraysh at the time to do tawaf after Asr just go and do tawaf this was their custom so he goes and he does and he's going to do tawaf when he sees Abu Jahl surrounded by his entourage his minions and Abu Jahl says Ya Abbas when you're done come here Abbas figures what's going on he doesn't still doesn't get the point that the dream might have reached Abu Jahl he does tawaf and then he comes to where Abu Jahl uh, had called him. And Abu Jahl says to him that, O oh children of Abdul Muttalib, again the Banu Hashim, since when did you get a female prophetess as well? You understand the sarcasm here? Okay, we get the point you think you have a male prophet. Since when did you get a Nabiya as well? A female prophetess. Abbas says, what do you mean? He's like, it's caught now. What do you mean? And, uh, 
of course uh, Abu Jahl is going on and on he's like are you uh, he, he said ya bani abdul muttalib oh children of abdul muttalib are you not satisfied isn't it enough that you have men who claim to be prophets but you not, you're not satisfied with that you now want women to be predicting the future as well if it is true that a crier will come after three days then it will happen it is true but if it does not happen then by allah we will write a basically we'll say a sign in those days and we will place it on the kaaba the door of the kaaba that the banu abdul muttalib are the most lying of the arabs known to man he is angry abu jahl and he says if this does not happen then we are going to publicly shame you enough is enough you already claim to have one prophet now you're going to bring forth another prophetess a female uh, prophet al-abbas narrating the hadith himself later on he says i was caught off guard and so i denied everything this is what happens when you're caught in a lie you just deny no no you're mistaken whoever told you we didn't see she didn't see any dream right he denies everything but the news of what Abu Jahl has done to Abbas and humiliated Abbas and humiliated the Banu Abdul Muttalib because again Abu Jahl belongs to which tribe everybody should know now Banu Makhzum Banu Makhzum Abu Jahl belongs to the Banu Makhzum so the Abu uh, Banu Mayyaz Abu Sufyan all of them uh, Abu Jahl belongs to the Banu Makhzum so the Banu Makhzum and the Banu Hashim have their rivalries and the Banu Umayyah, these three had their internal rivalries, right? So the Banu Makhzum has a rivalry. So now this Makhzumite has publicly dissed the Muttalibites, right? And so the Banu Abdul Muttalib are now fuming. Abbas denied everything. Before he even gets back to his house, the women have heard what just took place. MashaAllah, how news spreads. And when Al Abbas comes back, the women began lashing out at him and they literally say are you not a man where is your manhood could you not defend your own women now it's not a matter of dreams or not. it's a matter of tribalism now right forget what Atika saw where is your man have you no shame they literally said don't you have murua have you no shame you were dissed and your sister was dissed and the whole banu abdul muttalib were dissed and you just stand there and take it until finally Abbas says, I decided that khalas, the next day I have to go back and publicly rebuke Abu Jahl and defend the Abdul Muttalib, the Banu Abdul Muttalib. Okay? So now it's becoming into a tit for tat. And Al Abbas says, For the rest of the day, all the women of the Banu Abdul Muttalib came and had it out with me. The whole clan came and basically said, You have to do something. Have you no shame? This and that. So now he is now thinking, What can I say tomorrow? And so the next day he wakes up and the first thing he does he walks straight to the Kaaba to find Abu Jahl and he's narrating this is in the first person it's narrated in the Mustadak of Al-Hakim it's in the first person and uh, Al-Abbas says that uh, when I came to the masjid I saw Abu Jahl in the distance as soon as he saw me he turned pale turned his back to me and walked away Abbas is saying what is the matter with him? Doesn't he have the courage to face me now? Now he thinks his bravery has got the better of him, right? And I went to go face him when I finally saw what had caused Abu Jahl to go pale. What was that? It's now the third day. It's now the third day. The second day, Abu Jahl rebukes him. Then he wakes up. It is the third day. And the crier has already arrived. Abbas has not heard him yet because he's walking out. Abu Jahl has already heard him. And so Abu Jahl is so embarrassed, he cannot even face Al-Abbas. Right? And the crier is none other than, of course, uh, Bamdam. And uh, to make the effect even more uh, melodramatic, even more melodramatic, uh, Bamdam had actually mutilated his own camel. In one, uh, in one uh, narration, it is said, he chopped its nose off, a'udhu billah, like some a mutilation. And he smeared the blood over the, the camel. Uh, this would also make the camel panic, by the way, to make it faster even, right? And he tore his clothes up. He put all of this soot and this dust on himself. And he rode the camel backwards. All of this to have a melodramatic effect and to give the impression that he himself had also been attacked, right? And he begins to cry out when he gets to Mecca that, O oh, Quraysh, your caravan, O oh, Quraysh, your caravan, your property and money with Abu Sufyan, 
it is being attacked by Muhammad and his companions right now and you will not be able to defend it unless you act immediately now everything is a lie by the way as of yet because he is saying it's being attacked whereas there was a threat of attack right and he is coming as if he has been attacked even though nobody has touched him so there is a uh, a, a desperation there is a uh, uh, an exaggeration going on here that he's trying to make this melodramatic effect that your caravan your money will be lost unless you do it now an-naja an-naja help help basically SOS SOS and so he came to the masjid he came to the Kaaba and he made the announcement of course his announcement was come and fight and Atik is already telling them no come and meet your deaths you're going to meet your debts, right? And this was, of course, the prediction of uh, Atika. And uh, we have come to the end, inshallah, of today's. Uh, next Wednesday, inshallah, ta'ala, we'll start off from the preparations of the Quraysh and uh, also show you some of the maps and diagrams uh, also of the Battle of Badr. If there are any uh, questions, we have, we have uh, five minutes of questions, inshallah, ta'ala. Abu Jahl Amr ibn Hisham. Yes. Abu Jahl was his kunya from the very beginning. Yes, Abu Sufyan sent Bamdam. Abu Sufyan sent Bamdam because he, it is said he, that he had the fastest horse and he was the fastest rider. And it's clear he was because he got there so quickly. Sisters, any questions? Brothers, yes. So this is a question of usul al-fiqh and the question is do, does the ruling upon the Prophet differ from the rulings upon the other Muslims? The response is there, is there are some elements of the Sharia, some aspects of the Sharia where what is unique to him is different uh, than what he legislated upon us. So there are certain hadith that have been interpreted in this light. That that was unique for the Prophet ﷺ, and it was not something that we need to follow. But these are exceptions and not the rules. And generally speaking, when these exceptions exist, he himself points it out. And the most famous famous example is that of wisal, which is fasting two three days nonstop, right? Or it is explicit in the Quran where Allah says خَالِصَةً لَكَ مِنْ دُونِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ. It's in the Quran, special for you. Only for you and not for the other believers. So it is true that this is something that exists in Usul al Fiqh, but we don't invoke this principle unless there is an explicit evidence to show this. Otherwise, the general rule is that everything the Prophet did and said and approved, we are also told to follow it. Because he is the, generally, he is our Uswa. He is the Uswa. Now, this does play into Fiqh, for example, drinking while standing. The Prophet apparently there's a hadith some ikhtilaf whether it's authentic or not said don't drink while standing but he himself drank while standing this is in Bukhari as well how do we do this some people say khas for him the majority say well this shows it is allowed you can do it but it's makruh to drink while standing uh, urinating while standing as well there seem to be uh, things that one hadith says he did it and another is like he never so how do you reconcile some said it's khas others said no uh, when there's a need you do it otherwise you don't so there, this tension does exist in fiqh but it should only be evoked when there is no other means of reconciliation. Also, the fact that he's doing this publicly for the communal benefit, right? Allahu Adam, uh, this cannot be used in this case. Allah knows best. Yes. Yes, we did mention this in the last lesson, which was before Ramadan, which I, probably you weren't here when we did that. Um, the justification, one needs to realize a number of things. First and foremost, that that world is very different than our modern world. And the rules and the laws that we are accustomed to were not rules and laws they are accustomed to. And it is unfair to read in our ethical values into their time and place. It is unfair to assume we have a higher standard uh, than they did, which is what many of our people of our contemporary times think. No, they had a different standard and different uh, uh, style of living. And <clears throat> attacking caravans was something that every group did with another group they didn't have a treaty with. There was no government in Arabia. 
There was no unified government in Arabia. And this was the law of the jungle. That's exactly what Ja'far said to the king, right? When he went to Abyssinia, that the strong devours the weak. And Islam came and brought about a system of government. And Islam came and said, it is haram to do this once the system of Islam is established, okay? But in that establishment, Islam did have to go on the offensive and defensive. And the attacking of the Quraysh is both a defense and an offense at the same time. The Quraysh are not a neutral tribe. The Quraysh have caused all of the sufferings and damage to the Muslims. The Quraysh have persecuted the Muslims for 13 years. The Quraysh have not allowed the Muslims to live. The Quraysh have expelled the Muslims. The Quraysh have confiscated the property of the Muslims without paying them a penny in return. And that is probably why this was the largest caravan, right? So this is a state of war going on. And the Quraysh knew it. That's why Abu Sufyan himself is taking precautions. Okay, so there is no treaty that is being broken. There is no understanding that is being contradicted. Rather, the understanding is if you can get it, you're going to get it. Both the Quraysh and the Muslims knew this, right? So really there's nothing problematic at all. And that is the least that we can expect after all that the Quraysh has done. There is no, even according to modern standards, even according to modern standards, if you look at what the Quraysh has done to the Muslims, yani this is a state of war. And in a state of war, this isn't collateral damage, no. Yani we don't even need to get into what is happening in modern times and sanctions against countries where hundreds and thousands of children are being killed. Why? Because of the one dictator in person. And this is what is happening now is much worse, much worse under the guise of democracy and, 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 and whatnot. So frankly, there's nothing at all surprising at, 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 at what is happening and it is justified even in terms of modern laws. And Allah knows best. Okay, yes, go ahead. Yes, I had mentioned this before and there's a number of theories. The one theory is that Abbas uh, was uh, sympathetic to Islam but not a Muslim. Uh, the other theory is that Abbas was a Muslim and the Prophet ﷺ had instructed him to stay there to inform and th that's exactly what he did in the Battle of Uhud. In the Battle of Uhud, he was the one who informed the Prophet ﷺ about what was happening. Okay? The, the question is, what is the wisdom in saying the Qur'an is Arabic? No, no, the wisdom of Allah is saying in the Qur'an that if you reduce it, it says this is an Arabic Qur'an, so that you may think. What is the wisdom of Allah is saying that this Qur'an is an Arabic Qur'an, given your studies of Arabic culture, pre-Islamic? Allahu Alam, I don't know it's anything to do with Arabic culture. It's rather Allah is speaking to those upon whom the Qur'an came down, and they are the Arabs. And Allah is saying that I have sent this Qur'an in Arabic so that you can understand it. So it's not being given to you in a foreign language, like we say it's not in Greek. So Allah is saying, Inna anzalnahu Qur'an al-Arabiyya la'allakum ta'qilun. Right? That Allah is saying that, and again the mukhatabun or the people that are being addressed are the Arabs at this point in time. That the Qur'an is coming down to the Arabs. At this point in time, everybody who's li listening to the Qur'an and hearing it is an Arab and who understands Arabic. So Allah, and now the question is problematic for the non-Arabs. And I've been asked this when we did Surah Yusuf, like what do the non-Arabs do? Right, and that's a whole different tangent which you're not asking. You're asking, what is this question? Uh, 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 what is the wisdom here? The wisdom here is Allah is saying, this is in your language, go study and understand it. And Allah challenges them that if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed, then bring something similar to it, right? So Allah is using their own eloquence and their own language and outbeating them, outwitting them in their own game. And Allah is saying, if you're in any doubt, you think you know the language, bring something similar to it. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Final question from the sisters before we... Yes, go ahead. We don't have any details about what exactly is on the caravan, on the camels. We don't have any details. We can only assume from secondary sources. And the assumptions are that the buying and selling that takes place is the middleman type of buying and selling. For example, when a businessman goes to another country, he buys the goods of that country, he comes back to the country he's living in, then he'll sell them to his people. Then he'll purchase the goods that are not available elsewhere and go back there. So we've, we already mentioned the genius of the great, great, great grandfather of the Prophet the fourth generation, the fifth generation grandfather of the Prophet was the Rihlat al-Shita'i was Saif. 
that he made Mecca an economic center. He made Mecca an economic lifeline that he goes all the way down to Yemen. And from Yemen, you will get the imports of Africa, Ethiopia, of Habasha, of uh, the Yemeni uh, coast, which is a lot of things in Yemen. And then he brings it up to Mecca. In Mecca, all of the tribes come for Hajj across Arabia. So you buy and sell from every single tribe, different furs, different spices, different goods, everything. And then you go up to Rome and then you're connected to the entire Roman peninsula. I mean, not peninsula, the whole Roman Empire from east to west, from uh, North Africa, all the way up to uh, what is now basically the borders of Iraq. You're getting all of these goods in Rome. So Mecca becomes an economic capital. It is highly doubtful, this is my guesstimation, that the caravan would have physical goods of the Muhajirun. No. They're coming back from Syria, so they have the goods of the Byzantines. They have their utensils, they have their pots, they have their spices, they have the furs, they have the silks, they have the cloth that is famous in uh, in uh, the, the Byzantine lands. They're going to come back to Mecca, and then in Mecca, the Arabs are going to come from across Arabia and purchase these goods, because they're not going to go all the way up to Syria. They're going to come in Hajj, they're going to purchase all of these goods, get a lot of money and a lot of other goods, and then go back to Syria. So Allahu A'lam, and also what Ibn Ishaq says, everybody had invested in the caravan, right? So the investment is done basically with a monetary quantity that you have 5,000, 10,000 uh, in the caravan. I don't think there's going to be a physical good that the Muhajir is saying, I want to get my particular, you know, something back. Uh, this does not seem to be the case, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Uh, Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so we're now uh, still on the Battle of Badr. Uh, last week we had talked about the preparations for the Battle of Badr uh, and why it is called the Battle of Badr. Who can remind me why is it called the Battle of Badr? The, it's a person's name, the person who dug a well at a particular place and that place was then called after the well. Uh, and this is which Battle of Badr? The first, the second, the third? No, this is not Sughra, this is Kubra, this is the big one, this is the second battle of Badr, this is the big, this is the real battle of Badr, the other battle of Badr is not even quite a battle, it was just a minor skirmish as we had mentioned. Now, uh, we had mentioned that Abu Sufyan detected uh, the presence of the Prophet ﷺ and he took an alternate route, uh, going closer to the shore, closer to the, uh, the, 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 the Red Sea, and he sent uh, uh, a, an envoy, a crier to Mecca, to hype up the people of the Quraysh to send an army. So what happened after the dream of Atiqah, we had mentioned the dream of Atiqah, we had mentioned uh, the commotion that had been caused by Abu Jahl and by uh, uh, Al-Abbas and what happened over there. What happened after that? The Quraysh immediately convened a council and they're debating what exactly needs to be done. And almost unanimously, they agreed they need to send an army to protect the caravan. Because the exaggerated report of Dhamdham, the exaggerated report of the envoy of Abu Sufyan had made them very worried about their investments. This is their livelihood, this is their saving. There's simply no question that this in their eyes is a legitimate army. That they need to gather together an army immediately and send it out to, co to confront the, uh, the Muslims. And therefore the largest and the quickest gathering ever in the history of Mecca took place in that they gathered together uh, the largest quantity of people in the smallest amount of time. That literally within a day preparations were completed and they left uh, Mecca. And a number of incidents occurred, and again we're trying to piece this together to make a, a fluid narrative. A number of, of incidents occurred. It is said by Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Ishaq mentions that not a single family in Mecca remained behind except that somebody was sent on behalf of that family. Every single household sent somebody. And this is uh, a prediction of the dream of Atika. Because what was dream, the dream of Atika? That every household, a rock would hit it. Right? And in prediction of that dream, what happened? Every household was uh, sending a person, an emissary, and if they could not send an emissary, uh, if they couldn't send somebody from within the household, they hired another person to send. 
They hired another person to, to, to go in his place, and a number of specific incidents are mentioned by a number of people about what happened here. So we know a number of things that occurred. Firstly, Abu Lahab himself, who is Abu Lahab? Of course, he's the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. He's also the chieftain of the Banu Hashim. Abu Lahab decided not to go. And instead, he found somebody to go in his place. And this person... Uh, his name is known, uh, 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 his name is known, Al uh, Asa bin Wa'il, that he hired, he didn't hire, sorry, he didn't hire somebody. Uh, he didn't hire somebody. He actually had a loan, an outstanding loan of 4,000 dirhams that was owed to him. And so he told this debtor that if you go in my place, I'll forgive the loan for you. 4,000 dirhams is a large amount of money. If you go in my place, I will uh, forgive this large amount for you. And so this person went in his stead and Abu Lahab did not go. Now it is not mentioned why Abu Lahab did not uh, go. It, this, this is not mentioned in the classical books as far as I could find. Uh, but Allah knows best, perhaps along with the natural fear and cowardice of, in, of meeting an enemy and of being killed, Allah knows best there was also probably a sense of conflict. There was a sense of personal conflict that in the end of the day, this is his sub-tribe that he will be fighting. And this goes against everything that the Arabs stood for. The Jahili paganism, the Jahili uh, system of tribalism, that in the end, he could not meet his own tribe in battle. Because after all, most of the, the Prophet himself is Banu Hashim, that's his nephew. Uh, the majority of the Muslims uh, of the Quraysh are from uh, the tribe and related to him. And therefore, perhaps he did feel some conflict. And in fact, throughout the seerah, even though, of course, Abu Lahab is not worthy of any praise, and Allah curses him in the Quran. Nonetheless, we find that Abu Lahab, on a few occasions, did do certain things of nobility according to his custom, not according to Islam, according to his custom. And of them, as you remember, who can remind me one or two things that Abu Lahab did that uh, were of nobility? He the animals. When the Prophet was born, that he was so happy that he uh, s sacrifice freed the slave and he sacrificed an udhiya and because of this the Prophet ﷺ said he's given just a little bit of water every week he's given a little bit of water uh, because of this right and what else did he do who, who can remind me he initially protected the Prophet, he protected the Prophet ﷺ after the death of Abu Talib after the death of Abu Talib Abu Lahab became the de facto leader of the Quraysh or of the Banu Hashim to be more precise. And despite all that happened, he said, you know what, since in the end of the day he is my tribe, he is my nephew, I guess I'll have to protect him. But then Abu Jahl got in the way and he had to uh, withdraw. So there seems to be that deep down inside, it's not any good, rather we call it Jahiliyyah. That he had the sense of Jahiliyyah that this is my tribe. And how can I fight my own tribe? Allah knows best. This is my theory. The classical books don't mention anything. Why would Abu Lahab not go out and fight? Of those who uh, initially, and, and by the way, there's no question that even though Abu Lahab was one of the worst, there are people much worse than him. Right? Abu Jahl is much worse than him. Umayyah is much worse than him. Right? So there are people that are much worse than uh, Abu Lahab. Even though Abu Lahab is definitely of the lower category of the, uh, of the uh, disbelievers. Of those who also hesitated and refused to go uh, was Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah. Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah. Who is Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah? Who can remind me? No, no, no. no. Utbah is not the guide. Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah. What did he do that made him... You all know, but you just don't know the name. Utba ibn Rabi'ah was the one who uh, gifted the grapes to the Prophet ﷺ after the incident of Ta'if. This is Utba ibn Rabi'ah. That he saw the Prophet ﷺ being tortured, and he saw him sitting down in the shade and shelter, bleeding, and he felt some sympathy uh, for him, so he gifted him some grapes with the Christian slave, if you remember. right? This is Utba ibn Rabi'ah. And again, Utba has some, uh, some noble qualities throughout. We notice a number of noble qualities throughout the seerah. Utba ibn Rabi'ah, and he was a distant uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, Utba ibn Rabi'ah himself initially decided not to go and fight because again these are his own relatives. However, his brother Shayba, Utba and Shayba were blood brothers. His brother Shayba said, if we abandon our people at a time such as this crucial time, then for the rest of our lives we will have to suffer mockery and humiliation. 
That if we don't stand up to our principles and our cause now, it will forever be a cause of aib, a cause of embarrassment for as long as we live. And so the both of them uh, prepared uh, to go out and they did not know and realize that the both of them were preparing for their own debts. In fact, their debts were the first deaths of, or of the first deaths of the Battle of Badr, as we'll study, they died in the Mubaraza. The Mubaraza is the pre-battle, the battle before the battle. The, it's, a, it's a duel to the death, right? This is the duel to the death that precedes the wars. This is how the Arabs would fight. And Utbah and uh, his brother Shayba, they were of those who died in this uh, pre-battle. And uh, Utbah, by the way, he, he clearly demonstrates some common sense and some values that he believed in. And Utbah is the one, again I'm jumping the gun, but so, so that you understand uh, who is Utbah. Utbah is the one who tried to prevent the battle till the very last second. Till the very last second. I'm going to repeat this story, inshallah, next week. Uh, but uh, Utbah was the one who, when the two armies had lined up, Utbah was just so disgusted that cousins and uncles and brothers and sons are all going to fight each other, that he devised a scheme and a tactic, and he, uh, the, the story is long, I'll talk about it next week, but it, what happened was he then jumped on his red camel, he had a red camel, and he was galloping throughout the ranks, and he was telling uh, the Quraysh, do not fight, even if you win, you will be the losers, because you will have killed your own brothers and sons, right? What type of victory is this when you go home, having been proud of killing your own cousin and brother? How is this a victory? And uh, he said, blame it on me and my cowardice, go ahead and tell the Arabs. Now that's what you call a noble man, right? That he's saying, go ahead and tell them that I became scared and I was the one who stopped you. I don't mind. Let the blame come to me. Even though you all know I'm not a coward, but go and tell them that I became a coward today. Now that is really a sense of nobility. This is Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, right? Nonetheless, uh, uh, his brother told him that uh, if you stop now, then for the rest of your, our lives, we're going to have to hear the waswas. We're going to have to hear the, the, the innuendos of the uh, Quraysh that we didn't participate when we should have participated and therefore his what we now call blind nationalism really this is what caused him to basically support his cause and this is Islam is always against blindly supporting any cause only the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the human being that we support unconditionally right as for other human beings we look at their cause, we look at their methodology, we look at who they are. The only person who is unconditional supported is the Prophet Sallallahu Everything else, every other person, we need to see what is right and what is wrong. This is uh, this type of jahiliyyah, this type of asabiyyah, this type of uh, supporting your party. Right or wrong, I don't care, I'm going to support it. Right? This is typical in humanity. You find it in nationalism, you find it even along the, let's say, political lines, Democrat and Republican, sometimes people are so blinded, they really don't care. It's their party, they were born in it, khalas. They're, they're going to support it right and wrong. And we as Muslims are told, no, follow the truth even if it is against yourself, against your mother and father, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Even if it's against your parents, speak the truth. Follow the truth, it is above any uh, person or any blind cause. And this is what we find here, that Utbah was a wise man in the end of the day. In fact, Again, I'm jumping the gun. This is all next week's halaqa. The Prophet ﷺ said, if anybody in that gathering has wisdom, it is the man on the red camel. And another version, if anybody has any khair, any good in him, it is the man on the red camel. So the Prophet ﷺ said, the man on the red camel who was Utbah, he is the one who embodies all that is good in the Jahiliya Arabs, in the Quraysh. These are the, if they have any good, it is this man, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. But still, what happened? When he tried to, uh, Abu Jahl won over and Utbah then in his anger, again I'm jumping the gun, but Abu Jahl accused him of something and in his anger, he became the first person to go out and fight in the Mubaraza. Look at blind rage, what happens? Look at the sense of, I don't care what, right or wrong, I will support my cause. Once he threw in the towel, as they say, once he agreed, khalas, he became the first victim to his own fanaticism. Because what was he fanatic about? The cause of jahiliyyah, the cause of tribalism. Why did he not want to fight the process? Not for any truth or falsehood. He believed the truth was on his side. But it was a sense of jahili tribalism. That's all it was, right? 
And so that was what was cause motivating him. That's not a noble cause. And therefore, it's not going to take him uh, all the way uh, uh, as much as it needed to be. Uh, so Utbah ibn Rabi'ah eventually was also convinced. And therefore, he also agreed to go and participate. Yet another uh, person who was uh, hesitating to go, but for totally different reasons. So Utbah and Abu Lahab, perhaps their reasons were somewhat noble from Jahili standards. As for one who was uh, not wanting to go out of pure cowardice, this is Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt was perhaps the lowest of the low of the entire enemies of the Prophet wasallam. And I've mentioned many times before that those who opposed Islam in Mecca, we can say that there was a spectrum. That some of them, let's say the higher side of the spectrum, even though they're pagans and mushriks and kafirs, they nonetheless had some nobility. That they didn't stoop to uh, cheap shots. They didn't, they didn't do that which was undignified. And the best example of this is Abu Sufyan. That Abu Sufyan, despite his, ja his jahiliya, his paganism and whatnot, he had a sense of nobility in him. And that is why we don't have any narrations where he did something crude or vulgar or, or demeaning to his own dignity. He didn't do that. He was a noble enemy and therefore eventually Allah guided him. As I said many times, generally speaking, of course there are always exceptions, generally speaking, those who are noble enemies, we find that Allah guides them. Means they had some good in them, right? And those who were the lowly, the vulgar, the crude, the disgusting enemies, those who had no manners and akhlaq, generally speaking, we find that these were not guided. Again, there are exceptions, but this is the general rule. And Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayl, perhaps we can say he was the filthiest of the filthy. The worst of the worst. And perhaps this is a wisdom why Allah did not even mention him in the Quran. That he's indirectly mentioned Abu Jahl, he's directly mentioned Abu Lahab, but Uqba is so filthy he's not even worthy of being mentioned. And where do we begin about Uqba and what um, uh, Uqba has done? Uh, Uqba is, is the one who, uh, in the incident we mentioned in the persecution of the Muslims, Uqba was that one who snuck up behind the Prophet ﷺ, took off his, his garment, his shawl, and he tried to ch uh, choke the Prophet ﷺ while he was praying in front of the Kaaba. And Abu Bakr came running up and he said, Allah. This is now a verse from the Quran, that will you kill a man just because he says Allah is his Lord, you're gonna murder him? And he's trying to choke the Prophet ﷺ, and Abu Bakr had to go and defend uh, Uqba, uh, uh, defend the Prophet ﷺ against Uqba, and that was when Abu Bakr was beaten and bloodied and bruised until he was in his house for a week or two. We mentioned the story in detail. Uh, Uqba is the one who was amongst those who uh, suggested and approved assassinating the Prophet in that secret meeting. Right, this is the, the Darun Najwa, the secret meeting that they had that to assassinate the Prophet Uqba was in that crowd to suggest it and to approve it. And Uqba was that filthy person who, uh, when Abu Jahl mocked uh, the, the Prophet in Sajda, that they were with a group of people, that Abu Jahl said, who amongst you will go and pick up the carcass of an animal that had just been slaughtered? An animal had just been slaughtered, and in those days, an animal was not slaughtered every day. This is a rare event. An animal is slaughtered once every few weeks and then the carcass and the the entrails and the intestine is thrown in the in the outside in the junkyard and so Abu Jahl said who amongst you will throw this when the Prophet is doing sajda on him because they would mock the Prophet in sajda you know the sajda is not something the Quraysh did the sajda is an Islamic uh, routine the Muslims bow down their heads to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so this posture was being mocked by Abu Jahl and they're laughing and they're uh, hitting each other on the backs and they're saying who's gonna now uh, to make fun of the Prophet ﷺ, throw this carcass on him and so uh, as Ibn Ishaq said فَقَامَ فِي الْقَوْمِ أَشْقَاهُمْ the most worst of the people stood up and rushed to get it and that was Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt was the one who rushed outside of the uh, the city and this is a nobleman he's not he's not a poor person he's a he's a slave owner He's a nobleman, he is a, a rich person, and yet he picks up this filthy, can you imagine like the flies and the filth and the blood and the gore, can you imagine he's going to pick this up, right? He would never do this for any cause, but the filthiness inside of him was worse than the filthiness of this carcass. For him to pick up this filth, 
and to rush back happy, rejoicing that yes, I'm gonna throw this on the Prophet ﷺ. Can you imagine what type of mentality is that, right? This is Uqba ibn Abi Mu'il, and this is the one who, when he threw it on, they're all laughing, and the Prophet ﷺ was stuck, as you know, he was stuck there, it was so heavy on him, and Ibn Mas'ud is saying that I saw him and I could not do anything, because Ibn Mas'ud is a, a slave, Ibn Mas'ud is a mawla, they would have cut his head off, but he or somebody runs to Fatima, because she's a Qurashi, and Fatima then goes, and she is the one as a young girl crying. Uh, she is the one who helps uh, the Prophet uh, uh, out from under this. And uh, it is narrated that Uqba once, uh, he sarcastically invited the Prophet to a meal. Sarcastically, like, come, have, I'm having a dinner, come, have a feast with me as well. And the Prophet said that I will never eat with you until you testify, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. I will never eat. You think I'm going to sit and eat with you? And so, in his anger, astaghfirullah, he spit upon the face of the Prophet. This is Uqba ibn Mu'it. He spit upon the face of the Prophet. And the Prophet calmly wiped that spit away and he predicted the prediction that would happen. And he said, O oh, Uqba, when I meet you outside of the valleys of Mecca, I shall execute you, or I shall kill you, or I shall chop your head off, is the Arabic word, which means I shall kill you, and it was literally chopping over the head off, while you are tied up. This was a prediction. The pro Uqba was the nobleman, and the Prophet is now being persecuted. Uqba said, uh, the Prophet said, just wait. When I will meet you the next time outside of Mecca, right now you are in Mecca, the next time we meet outside of Mecca, or we can say, the first time I meet you outside of Mecca, the situation will be turned around now. That your execution will be at my hand. And your execution will be uh, as a prisoner of war, basically. And so, Uqba was frightened when he heard of the Battle of Badr. He said, this man has promised to kill me. This man has promised to kill me and I cannot go out of Mecca now. Now look at the irony here, that deep down inside he knows this prediction is true. Right? Deep down inside he actually knows this is going to happen. And so he does not want to leave uh, Mecca. But one of his entourage, one of his family, we don't know who the name is not mentioned, he said, don't worry, I have the fastest camel, I will give it to you. Even if the army flees, don't worry, your camel will take you far away from the camp, you will come back to Mecca safe, right? And so, with this promise, uh, and uh, the others were also uh, castigating him and making fun of him, he decided he had to uh, prove his manhood, and so he decided to go ahead and accompany, and uh, this person gave him the fastest camel, but you cannot outwit the Makkah or the Kaid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah, when the army fled in the Badr, we're gonna come to this, when the army fled, Uqba's camel was the first to flee. And so Uqba was left in the middle of an empty plain with no person and no camel and nothing. Absolutely nothing. And the Muslims captured him as a prisoner of war. And as we'll come to probably in two, three weeks, Allah knows when we'll get to that. But uh, Uqba was one of only two people who were executed. The Battle of Badr, there were no executions. All of the prisoners were released except for two. And number one on the list is Uqba. Right? For all of these reasons. So, Uqba was scared and he knew something was going to happen. And indeed, it did happen because the Prophet ﷺ, uh, predicted that it would happen. And of those who try desperately also to get out of the Battle of Badr is Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Umayyah ibn Khalaf is the slave master of Bilal. Right? He was the one who did what he did to Bilal. And his death is a gruesome death as well. Umayyah ibn Khalaf was the uh, typical... Uh, coward. He's the typical overly fed huge man wearing fancy garments. The typical, the stereotypical, you know, uh, <laughs> richer, you know, nobleman of Mecca. He doesn't have any skills at war. He's got a lot of money. He's got a lot of slaves. He wears the fanciest garment. And Ibn Ishaq says he was a big man. Yani he was, mashallah, tabarakallah, right? That, that type of man. And so, uh, when Umayyah ibn Khalaf heard about the Battle of Badr, he found somebody to go with him. And he said, I'll pay you as much as you want. You are my representative. You will fight and you will basically, yani not pretend to be me, but you will say, this is the representative Umayyah ibn Khalaf, right? And so, uh, Umayyah ibn Khalaf was very happy. He managed to get out of it. But Umayyah is, no doubt, one of the seniors of the Quraysh. He is one of the top five leaders of the Quraysh. And his presence will bring great morale to the troops. So, 
Abu Jahl heard of this. Abu Jahl is, there is no doubt, number one on the list of enemies. The worst person is Abu Jahl, right? As the Prophet said, he is the Fir'aun of my Ummah. Abu Jahl, he gets involved in every matter he can. Abu Jahl turns the tide many times for the worst. And this is one of them. That uh, when he heard of Umayyah not going, he went to Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And he said, if you do not go, this will demoralize uh, many people. You are the Sayyid of this whole valley. He's boosting him up, his ego, right? He's not the Sayyid, but he's one of the Sayyid. He's one of the leader. You are the Sayyid of this whole valley, and your presence is necessary. Still, he was hesitant. Abu Jahl, despite his force, could, he still could not convince him. So what did he do? Abu Jahl then went to the same Uqbah. The same Uqbah, right? And they devised a, a tactic to humiliate him in public, to make sure that he goes out. What did they do? So when Umayyah is sitting uh, in the Nadi, the Nadi is the public space, right? The Nadi is the, uh, the, the, the Senate, if you like, outside of the Kaaba. There's this open area. This is called the Nadi. So in the daytime, all of the Quraysh would sit there. Uh, so when Umayyah was sitting on his fancy carpet and he has his entourage and he has his clothes on him, so Uqba came to him with a, a perfume burner and the uh, coal underneath it of the type that women use. So they had feminine perfume, right? Of the type that women use. And he brought him and said, this is your gift, O Umayyah. Perfume yourself as you are worthy of being perfumed. You get the hint here. That you are no man. You are a woman. You're, you're deciding to not fight when you need to be. And of course, Umayyah understands exactly what's going on. This is how the Arabs did their smearing to each other. Right? This is how the Quraysh did it. He, he understands what is going on. And so he stood up and he cursed Uqbah. Literally, he cursed Uqbah and whoever sent Uqbah. Because he knew Uqbah is not smart enough to do this himself, right? So, and by the way, Uqbah himself, you can tell, he is overcompensating for his own uh, cowardice before. Right? Uqbah himself is just barely convinced. Now he needs to show he is dedicated to the cause. So Uqbah is the one that is sent by Abu Jahl to push Umayyah to go uh, fight. And so even then, by the way, Umayyah's cowardice shows. When he goes back home, Ibn Ishaq tells us, he tells his wife that, go purchase for me the best camel that money can buy. Why? <laughs> Run back if I need to, right? His wife begs him, don't go, you never know, you might die, this and that. And he tells her, don't worry, I don't really intend to fight. I'm just going to make a show of it and then just quietly sneak back. Don't worry. You know, even so to the last, that Umayyah did not intend to fight. He was not a fighter in any sense of the term. And he just wanted to spend a few days and hopefully uh, he would just sneak away or he would make an excuse and come back. He never intended to fight. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لِيَقْضِيَ اللَّهُ أَمْرًا كَانَ مَفْعُولًا لِيَهْلِكَ مَنْ هَلَكَ عَنْ بَيِّنَا That Allah will cause to pass what He has willed will pass. And so everybody who will die will be, uh, will be caused to die. And Umayyah's name was amongst those. And by the way, the incident of the, uh, the, the camel or the... Uh, the, the goat being thrown onto the Prophet ﷺ, right? You all know that after this happened, we mentioned this many months ago and we talked about this, when the Prophet ﷺ stood up with the blood on him, he said, Oh Allah, I leave you to deal with, and he mentioned all of these seven or eight people by name, Umayyah ibn Khalaf and Uqba ibn Mu'ayt and Abu Jahl, and everyone whom he mentioned, every one of them, this list, were the first people who died at Badr. Right, and so he is one of them over here as well. And he knows that this is very risky for him. Nonetheless, uh, so uh, uh, Umayyah as well, Ibn Khalaf, Umayyah ibn Khalaf then, uh, even though he purchases as uh, we are led to, um, of course the detail is not mentioned, but he tells his wife, go and purchase, and notice he even tells his wife, like he, he's too embarrassed to go himself, like he, to, to people wouldn't know, go and purchase the fanciest camel you can. Uh, and so he prepares himself and he doesn't realize he himself is also preparing his own uh, death. Um, uh, in the tafsir of a suddi it is mentioned that before they left Mecca, all of the Quraysh gathered around the Kaaba and they made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they held on to the rings of the Kaaba and the cloth of the Kaaba. And they said, O oh Allah, whichever of these two armies is more noble in your eyes, help them. And O oh Allah, whichever of these two groups is more honorable, then give them victory. And O oh Allah, send your aid upon the better of the two tribes. And little did they realize they are making dua against themselves. 
They're making dua against themselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references this in the Quran. Surah Al-Anfal. And by the way, Surah Al-Anfal, uh, all of it deals with the uh, incident of Badr. And inshallah, I'm seriously thinking about when we finish the Battle of Badr, we actually pause for one halaqa and just do Surah Al-Anfal as Battle of Badr. Because honestly, I think one of the biggest uh, drawbacks of most Sira books is that they actually don't discuss the entire Quranic relevance verses, you know. And I think it's very important personally that we actually discuss the Quranic verses and Surah Al-Anfal, all of it, and it's only 10 pages. Uh, it's not a very long Surah, it's a middle-sized Surah. The whole Surah is about the Battle of Badr beginning to end. I'm seriously figuring out if we can manage to do that in, in one halaqa, inshaAllah uh, ta'ala. So, um, we said that uh, uh, they, they gathered outside of the Kaaba and they made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah references this in Surah Al-Anfal verse 19. Surah Al-Anfal verse 19. al fatah. If you are asking for victory, then the victory has already come. Meaning on the other side, not on your side. إِن تَسْتَفْتِحُوا فَقَدْ جَاءَكُمُ الْفَتْحِ وَإِن تَنْتَهُوا فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ Now, the verse is a reference to the Quraysh, not to the Muslims. The reference to the Muslims has already come. We're going to mention this when we get to Surah Al-Anfal. That Allah says, when you asked Allah for help, Allah said, I'm sending down all of these angels. This is in the beginning of the Surah, right? Now Allah mentions the other side. إِن تَسْتَفْتِحُوا If you are asking Allah for Fatah, Fatah means? Victory, right? Then don't worry. That the victory has already come, not to you. It has already been sent down. The victory has come, but not to you. But if you stop what you're doing, it is better for you. And if you return to war, we shall return to war. And all of your numbers will not help you, even if you are a lot. Because Allah is with the muttaqeen and not with you. So Allah references that you are asking for victory. Don't worry, the victory has already come. Too late. You're asking for it is not going to change where the victory will be coming uh, down. Now the, uh, the Quraysh uh, left Mecca. They began marching outside of Mecca and the whole army came. And at that time, we'll mention why it came down. At that time, their numbers were around 1,300. Around 1,300 people uh, gathered together. And this was the largest army that the Quraysh had ever gathered in its history. And Islam brought many changes with it. Of it, it is literally uh, exponential. The sizes of the army is increasing. The Quraysh, as we have said many times, is a tribal society. You don't get 5, 10, 15 tribes joining together to fight another 5, 10, 15. No, small tribes fighting other tribes. An average skirmish would be 200 people, 100 people versus another 100, 200 people. This is how you would do it. For the first time, numbers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And in Badr, it's 1,300. In Uhud, it is 3,000. In Ahzab, it is 5,000. It's getting bigger and bigger. And every army is breaking records before it. Because clearly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is intending in a very expedited way. It's an exponential. Literally, Allah Azza wa Jalla is attending the entire conquest of Mecca, of the, uh, of the Arabian Peninsula. So, they had 1,300 people as they're exiting. And from the beginning, we noticed that the Quraysh are not united. There's always bickering. Allah says in the Quran, تَحْسَبُهُمْ جَمِيعًا وَقُلُوبُهُمْ شتى. You think they're one group, but in reality, their hearts are disunited. You think they're one, but in reality, their hearts are disunited. And this disunity began from the very exiting of Mecca. That one group uh, began debating amongst themselves that, hold on a sec, we're leaving Mecca unprotected. All of the men of fighting age are marching outside of Mecca. And then they brought up an old rivalry that existed before the coming of Islam. This is paranoia. It's been now 10 years since this rivalry. It's still fresh, meaning the people who are involved are still alive. But nothing has happened because when Islam came, both tribes had to deal with this new message of Islam. Right? What had happened, the, the, Quraysh, or the, 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 the Quraysh and the Banu Bakr, another tribe, the Quraysh and the Banu Bakr had started a small uh, tension or war. To make a long story short, uh, one of the Quraysh youth uh, wandered into the land of the Banu Bakr and he was a future leader of, of the Quraysh 
and uh, Ibn Ishaq mentions that he was a tall and handsome man. And so when the leader of the Banu Bakr saw him, he felt jealousy that this boy is going to become the leader. This boy was a very handsome and, and strong man. He felt a sense of jealousy. And so he told one of the Banu Bakr to go and uh, assassinate him, just kill him, for, just for no reason, in the middle of the desert. And before this, by many years or decades, uh, they had a blood feud that the uh, one member of the Quraysh had killed somebody from the Banu Bakr. So, they say, so he said, I'm going to make up for that one for one. I'm going to make it up by killing this young man. So when the Quraysh sent a representative that, what is this? Why did you do this? So the, the, the chieftain of Banu Bakr said, a man for a man. A man for a man. That, remember that guy you killed? And he mentioned some name, we don't know when, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Remember that guy? I killed this boy for that boy, for that young man that was killed. So let's just call it quits. A man for a man. So the Quraysh said, okay, fine, you know what, a man for a man, he's right actually, that they did, we did owe them blood money, we never paid up, so instead of paying a hundred camels, we'll just not go to war. And so uh, the brother of this killed man, the brother of this Qurayshi who was killed, he decided to go and assassinate the chieftain of the Banu Bakr, not just any average guy, the very man who was jealous, the very man who ordered the assassination. And so he succeeded in this mission. And the chieftain of the Banu Bakr was assassinated and this brother, this is in the days of Jahili, this is before Islam came, this is before the coming of the Prophet This brother brought back the clothes and the sword of the chieftain of the Banu Bakr, bloodied, and he had a gruesome death as well. He uh, cut him into pieces, he cut his stomach up, and then he brought this back and he put it on the door of the Kaaba. That look, look at what I have done. He put it on the door of the Kaaba, and so the news spread that uh, the Quraysh has basically killed the chieftain of Banu Bakr. Now this is war. This is civil war between the Banu Bakr and the Quraysh. And before any war could take place, the message of Islam became stronger and stronger and the both tribes basically just paused for a while. So the situation was now in limbo. It's unresolved. And so for some reason they get paranoid that now the Banu Bakr are going to come and they're going to attack Mecca when it's empty, they'll take our women, they'll kill our children, they'll take our possessions, they'll get their vengeance now. Okay, so there was a huge commotion in the army, rumors spread, and as it is, generally people don't want to go to war, they want an excuse to get back, right? So this is an excuse now, the army was about to return, or at least a large segment of it. Then what happened? Shaytan became desperate. Shaytan, Iblis himself became desperate. That what am I going to do now? And so Iblis appeared to them. Physically Iblis came. And Allah mentions this in the Quran as we'll mention. Iblis came to them in the form of Suraqa ibn Malik. The same Suraqa ibn Malik who was attempting to catch the Prophet in the Hijrah. This is the same Suraqa. Why Suraqa? Because Suraqa was uh, from the uh, Banu Kinana. And the Banu Kinana is the larger tribe of the Banu Bakr, i.e. the Quraysh and the Banu Hashim, the same relationship. Right, the Banu Hashim is one of the tribes of the Quraysh, right? So the Banu Kinana r rivals the Quraysh. And the Banu Bakr is one of the tribes of the Banu Kinana. Clear? Tribalism has to be studied when you study the seerah. Clear? Right? And uh, uh, Suraqa was from another of the tribes of the Banu Kinana, but nonetheless, yani he's from the Banu Kinana, he's from the equivalent of the Quraysh. So, and he's a chieftain of their tribe. So, Suraqa comes and says, don't worry. I have heard of your fear. I will make sure that the Banu Bakr do not attack you. Clear? Right? Shaitan basically comes in the form of a nobleman whom they all knew and trusted and respected, Suraqa. And of course at the time Suraqa was not a Muslim. Suraqa became a Muslim later on, as you know. We mentioned the story of Suraqa in detail. Uh, that the, uh, that, um, uh, that uh, Shaitan came to them in the form of Suraqa and said to them that don't worry, I promise you that as long as you are gone, I shall protect Mecca, that I am wa inni jaru lakum, that I will be your protector. I will be your, uh, you can count on my word that the Banu Bakr are not going to attack uh, Mecca. And Suraqa even said, you know what, I'll accompany you as well so that you know that I am serious. Even though he's not from the Quraysh, even though it's not his fight, even though the, the Banu Kinana are not involved in the caravan. It's nothing. But Suraqa, allegedly, Suraqa said to show you how 
clearly we will not attack, I will fight along with you. And so they were so happy that one of the chieftains of the Banu Kinana is coming. This is a big morale boost. And then when Suraqa, quote unquote Suraqa, it's not Suraqa, this is Shaitan. When Shaitan, we should say, uh, uh, sees the angels coming down on the morning of Badr, and we'll come back to the story when we get to the morning of Badr. When Shaitan sees the angels coming down, Nakasa ala aqibayhi, Allah mentions all of this in the Quran, right? He turned around and he started running away. And the Quraysh were like, Suraqa, why are you running away? Because they cannot see the angels. They cannot see the angels, right? So the Quraysh are like, why are you running away? Didn't you say you're going to fight with us? And one of them tried to stop him because he's come all the way. Can you imagine? From Mecca, he's come all the way to Badr. The morning of the battle of Badr, this is when Suraqa sees all of those angels come. That's when he turns around and he runs away. And when one of them tries to stop him, Shaitan basically shows his true identity, pushes him so hard, the man just flies up in the air. Uh, and uh, quote-unquote Suraqa, i.e. Shaitan says that Inni ara ma la tarun. This is in the Quran. Inni ara ma la tarun. This is uh, Surah uh, Surah Al Anfal, verse forty-seven, forty-eight. Surah Al Anfal, forty-seven, forty-eight. That um, uh, Allah says in the Quran uh, that wa id zayyana lahum shaytanu a'malahum. This is the verse. Wa id zayyana lahum shaytanu a'malahum. When Shaytan made their actions beautiful for them. This is the story of Suraqa now. When Shaytan beautified their actions, go ahead, fight. You're doing a good cause. Wa uh, qala. لا وقال ذا سبحان الله رزق وإزين الله الشيطان أعمالهم وقال لا عاصم لكم اليوم الناس نو لا عاصم وقال لا لا غالب لكم اليوم الناس وإني جار لكم and he said none amongst mankind can defeat you لا غالب لكم اليوم من الناس none amongst mankind can defeat you why because you are so many you have so much so many weapons you have thirteen hundred people وإني جار لكم and I am your guarantor, your protector. It doesn't mean I'm your neighbor. It means I'm your protector here. I'll make sure nothing happens back there. When the two armies faced one another, he turned his back around, right? And he said, I can see what you guys cannot see. I am scared of Allah. Shaitan is scared. I am scared of Allah, the uh, Lord of the world. Wallahu shadid uqab, Allah is severe in punishment. So this is uh, the first, if you like, notice of the differences in the army of the uh, Quraysh. Uh, we, we know from a number of riwayat, Imam Ahmad's Mustad and Ibn Ishaq and others, we know that when the army left, there were 1300 people. Abu Jahl is the undisputedly, the main leader is Abu Jahl. They had over a hundred horses, over 600 uh, suits of armor. We don't even know the number of camels, uh, uh, probably around four or five hundred camels. We don't know the exact, not only to ride on, but also to use as food. Uh, it is said, we're going to come to this, that every day they had to slaughter 10 camels. And so they must have uh, hundreds of camels because they're slaughtering 10 camels every day and they, they have to ride on the camels as well. And they even brought along their uh, singing girls, their qayyinat. And the, the singing girls, you understand there's a connotation here as well. And there's also uh, the issue of uh, having uh, some morale as well. That the girls are going to be beating their drums, they're going to be dancing, they're going to be, uh, they're going to be showing, displaying uh, the pride of the Quraysh. And so they brought their uh, cheap sloganeering, you can say, as well. This is cheap sloganeering. They brought their uh, cheerleaders, you can say, right? They really, they are a type of cheerleaders, you can, you can say. That uh, they brought them along as well. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Quran. Uh, Surah Al-Anfal, verse 19. وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ خَرَجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ بَطَرًا وَرِيَاءَ النَّاسِ وَيَصُدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Don't be like those who exited their houses. بَطَرًا وَرِيَاءَ That they are arrogant, they're boastful. And they want to show off to the people. And they want to block the path of Allah. وَيَصُدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ مُحِيطٍ And Allah is surrounding all that they do. So Allah describes their psychological frame of mind. When they're walking out, they're feeling puffed up. بَطَرًا And رِيَاءً They want people to hear they're 1300 strong. We're the largest army uh, the Arabs have ever seen. And so this is another point here. That up until this time, 1300 people have never gathered in this backward area. Because again, there's no government. 
have retribed to himself. For the first time they have 1300. So they want the Arabs to hear. The Quraysh have gathered the largest army ever. So Allah mentions what is their niyyah. And Allah says, what was their main niyyah? They're blocking the path of Allah. And wallahu bima ya'aluna muhit. Rather Allah has surrounded all of them. They think they're blocking Allah's path. They do not realize Allah has blocked them. Wallahu bima ya'aluna muhit. And uh, another incident occurred uh, soon after this that, well, let's get back. So, so the army of Quraysh has left Mecca. Abu Sufyan, once he realizes that he's in the safety, we go back to now the caravan, right? So, so there's three things going on, the Prophet the Quraysh army, and Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan, once he realizes that he's beyond the reach of the Muslim army, once he's realized that he's in the, he's in the green, he sends another emissary, another envoy, and he mentions uh, to him that go tell the Quraysh that they can now return, that the caravan is safe. Notice even Abu Sufyan did not want war. He did not want the Battle of Badr. He didn't see. What he wanted was protection for the caravan. There's no need now for protection. The caravan is now in the green. It's in the safety zone. And so Abu Sufyan sent an emissary, go tell the army to return. We don't need their help now. I'll be back in Mecca in a few days. So once the envoy reached the Meccan army, they had to now, they're already outside the city, they've been camping for two, three days outside the city, uh, traveling for two, three days, not camping, and now they have to reconvene. What are we supposed to do now? Some of them, primary amongst them was Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah, the same Utbah who didn't want to go, the same Utbah who to the very end does not want war. Utbah says, okay, now we clearly don't need to fight, let's go back to Mecca. The job has been done, the caravan is safe. Once again, Abu Jahl was adamant. And Abu Jahl said, no, we will go to Badr. We will go to Badr. Badr was known for being a nice plain area uh, and there was lots of water because there was these wells there. So we will go to Badr. It also had some grave, uh, not grave, some, some date palm uh, le uh, uh, plantations there. So it was a, a type of oasis. We will go to Badr and we will stay there for three days and we will drink our wine and have our women sing for us and let the Arabs hear that we are a strong and mighty nation. So again, he has the Jahili mentality. Now notice here, there's still not a talk of war. Perhaps Abu Jahl had it in his heart, but there's still not a talk of war. The whole purpose of the army was to protect the caravan. There's still not a talk of fighting for, for no reason now. Khalas, the caravan's protected, why do you need to fight? Utbah saying, let's go back. Abu Jahl insists. And even now he says, let the Arabs hear of our, 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 our uh, strength and let us... Uh, slaughter our camels, eat or cook our meat, drink our wine, and let the news spread in all of Arabia that we are a nation to be feared. We are a Quraysh, that people should be scared of us. Despite this, some tribes decided to come back because they had no interest in fighting the Muslims. They only wanted their money to be protected, their investments to be protected. The largest of these was the Banu Zuhra and perhaps other smaller tribes also joined. So much so that around 300 or 350 people returned back to Mecca. And so the army went down from 1300 to around 1000 or in another report 950 men. So around one third of the army now goes back and this is also obviously a big uh, demoralizing uh, factor. And Allah Azza wa Jal again mentions this in the Quran that the ikhtilaf or the differences, there's tensions going on amongst the Muslims as well because the Muslims did not want to meet the, the Quraysh army as we'll come to and there's tensions in the Quraysh army for a whole different reason that they just don't want to uh, engage and Allah says in the Quran again Surah Al-Anfal وَلَوْ تَوَاعَدْتُمْ لَاخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِي الْمِعَادِ If the two of you had agreed to a fight you still would not have been able to set a time and a place, right? Even if you two wanted it, you wouldn't have done it. But I wanted it. وَلَوْ تَوَاعَدْتُمْ لَاخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِي الْمِعَادِ وَلَكِنْ لِيَقْضِيَ اللَّهُ أَمْرًا كَانَ مَفْعُولًا But rather Allah wanted His commandment that had already been decreed, Allah wanted to fulfill it. It's a beautiful verse here that Allah is saying, even if the both of you intended for a war, it wouldn't have taken place. You would have disagreed, you would have not been uh, uh, fully on the same page, but neither of you wanted it, Allah wanted it. 
Why? In order that his qadr be done. وَلَكَ لِيَخْضِ اللَّهُ أَمْرًا كَانَ مَفْعُولًا And لِيَحْلِكَ مَنْ هَلَكَ عَنْ بَيْنَةٍ وَيْحَ مَنْ هَيَّ عَنْ بَيْنَةٍ So that whoever dies, dies after the proof has been established. And whoever lives, lives after the proof has been uh, established. And so uh, Allah Azza wa Jal is saying that no one can ever escape from the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. Another incident that is mentioned is that when the army reached uh, Juhfa, and Juhfa is where Masjid Aisha Tan'im is, that's the area of Juhfa. When the army reached uh, this area, so most likely this took place before Abu Sufyan's envoy reached them. But again, we're just trying to piece it together. Uh, most likely this took place basically as soon as they left Mecca. One of the youngest men in the army from the tribe of Banu Hashim, i.e. a cousin of the Prophet uh, or to be technical, uh, his cousin's son, so uh, uh, he's one generation below the process. And he's a young man, the youngest of the Banu Hashim. He woke up startled because he had seen a dream. And he said, in, and he announced to the Quraysh what the, the dream that he had seen. He said, in my dream, I saw a man riding towards us, an announcer, a crier, to give us a, a news and message. And he had a camel with him. And the man announced, Hudba ibn Rabi'ah has been killed. And Shayba ibn Rabi'ah has been killed. And Abu al-Hakam ibn Hisham, ay Abu Jahl, has been killed. And Umayyah ibn Khalaf has been killed. And he kept on mentioning so and so and so and so, every single famous name of Quraysh that eventually was killed. He mentioned all of these names and then he cuts the hump of the camel and sent the camel forward. And the camel went into our uh, tent area our uh, encampment. So he's seeing his own encampment in the dream. And the blood splattered on every single tent of our encampment. And he woke up scared and flustered. Obviously the interpretation is very obvious that not only are these people going to be killed, but every tent will have casualties. Every single house of the Quraysh will have casualties, but they ignored his dream and they just uh, considered it to be uh, uh, just a, a dream that he had seen, not realizing that it was a true dream. So let us pause on the, the Quraysh side. Let's now go to the Muslim side. Now what's happening on the Muslim side? We'll get back to the Quraysh side in a while, maybe most likely next uh, Wednesday, inshallah. Now the, 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 the Muslims, when they left Medina, they had no clue that they're going to meet an army. It's not even an inclination. Right, so the totally different perspective now. The Muslims are leaving Medina and they literally think this is going to be an easy raid. A raid where we are, mashallah, 315 and there's only 40 of their armed guards. Like we have a ratio of almost 1 to 10 basically, right? We're almost 1 to 10 of their guard and we'll have a clear victory. However, rumors began to come. And this is the way of the, uh, the, the the Bedouins, that Bedouins are traveling back and forth and they'll carry the news that something's happening. And every time you meet a traveler in the desert, you would ask, where are you from? What are you doing? What is the news? And the rumors began to spread that rather there is an army that has left Mecca intending to fight with the uh, Muslims. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now he was shown a dream, we don't know when, and I get, I get back to this next week inshallah. Uh, we, we don't know when, but he was shown a dream that he will be fighting an army. And he was hoping that this dream would be later on, maybe not in this particular expedition, maybe not in this expedition. Then when the rumors began to reach, so the Prophet himself began to then question the Muslims. What do you think? Because what had he told them? We, we said that initially he kept it a secret, right? He said, we're going on an expedition. Then as soon as they exited the city, when he knows who's in the, 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 the Muslim camp, then he said that we are going out to meet the caravan of Abu Sufyan and perhaps Allah will give us a huge ghanima, a huge uh, booty with this. Right? So the people became very happy. Then, after a day or two, when these rumors are now coming, now the tone begins to change because news is reaching to the contrary. And the Prophet ﷺ said, what do you think that instead if we met a group from Mecca that has been already informed of your departure, i.e. a group that is prepared to fight you. And some of the Sahaba began to question this. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we do not have any preparations to fight an army. We came to attack Al-Ayr, the caravan. We came to attack the caravan. We're not ready to engage in a fight. The next day he repeated the question again and the response was even more firm. We cannot do this. We're not ready to engage in an army. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Quran. 
that وَإِذْ أَخْرَجَكَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَيْتِكَ بِالْحَقِّ وَإِنَّ فَرِيقًا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لَكَارِهُونَ that when your Lord caused you to go out of your houses so notice Allah is causing the both armies to leave right we already mentioned that one group has left Mecca now Allah is talking about the Muslims that Allah is saying وَإِذْ أَخْرَجَكَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَيْتِكَ بِالْحَقِّ that remember when your Lord caused you to exit your own houses but the truth was with you وَإِنَّ فَرِيقًا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لَكَارِهُونَ a group of the believers did not like it وَإِنَّ فَرِيقًا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لَكَارِهُونَ يُجَادِلُونَكَ فِي الْحَقِّ بَعْدَ مَا تَبَيَّن they began arguing with you about this truth even after it was made clear to them يُجَادِلُونَكَ فِي الْحَقِّ بَعْدَ مَا تَبَيَّن كَأَنَّمَا يُسَاقُونَ إِلَى الْمَوْتِ وَهُمْ يَنْظُرُونَ it was as if you were dragging them to their deaths as they're looking at their deaths i.e. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mildly rebuking some of the companions. That they were so scared, they thought they're gonna die and none of them died. They thought they're, you're dragging them to their death, you're dragging them to the greatest victory. Right? So they began arguing with you. يُجَادِلُونَكَ فِي الْحَقِّ They began arguing, we can't do this, no way. There's no way we can fight the Quraysh. And Allah says, it's as if they're, they're seeing themselves die. They don't trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they'll take care of them, that Allah will take care of them, right? And Allah, uh, and uh, when Allah says, بَعْدَمَا تَبَيَّنْ Even after it was made clear, what is this after it was made clear? The next verse explains, وَإِذْ يَعِدُكُمُ اللَّهُ إِحْدَى الطَّائِفَتَيْنِ أَنَّهَا لَكُمْ Allah had promised that yes, you're going to meet one of these two, إِحْدَى الطَّائِفَتَيْنِ Whichever one you meet, you will be the victors. So the Prophet told them, at this stage he himself is unsure. But he told them, even if we meet the other group, Allah has promised me victory. This is what he told them. Even if we meet the other group, Allah has promised us victory. And so he is telling them, look, don't worry, Allah has promised us victory. But still the human soul is weak. And they said, we're not ready, we cannot fight an army. We don't have armor, we don't have food, we don't have supplies, we don't have anything. We literally were expecting expedition and come back you know, within two days. But it is two, three days away from Medina. We're going to come and come back, we don't even have anything. And Allah says, they continued arguing even after you had explained to them. But Allah wanted uh, His decree to go forth. And uh, uh, Allah says, You wanted the one with no weapons, to be yours. You wanted the ghanima, you wanted the booty. But, Allah had a far bigger thing in mind than some money. Allah wanted to show who was upon the truth. Allah wanted to show who was upon the truth. Yawm al-Badr is called Yawm al-Furqan. Remember this, right? The day where truth is clear from falsehood. The, the victory of Badr was unparalleled until the conquest of Mecca. That Badr and the conquest of Mecca are the two biggest victories without a doubt. That this is the first and this is the last victory that Allah Azza wa gave them. And the both of them are miracles beyond miracles. And Allah is saying, today I wanted to show who was true and who was false. That Allah said, To destroy the batil. Even if the kafirun uh, do not like it. So, uh, this shows us, by the way, subhanAllah, so many benefits here from this ayah. It shows us that the Sahaba, yes, they are perfect human beings, but they're humans and humans cannot be perfect. They are as perfect a generation as possible. That Allah is saying, يُجَادِلُونَكَ فِي الْحَقِّ They were arguing, we can't do this, no way, we can't fight the Quraysh. Yet this arguing does not make them any less of a believer. Because Allah says in the Quran that فَرِيقًا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah calls them mu'min. These are not munafiqs. The Badr, there are no munafiqs in Badr. Nifaq started after Badr as we'll mention. Right? Before Badr, anybody who converted, there is no nifaq up until Badr. Every convert is a sincere convert. So only after Badr, the phenomenon of nifaq begins. So Allah Azza wa Jal called the group that is yujadilun, that is attempting to persuade the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not to go, Allah calls them mu'min. And what does this show? It's a big sigh of relief for us that look, even the believer, yani he has some hesitation, he has some fear, he has some 
it's not as if they're all superhuman or superman. No, there is some genuine fear that look, they didn't want to fight. And Allah Azza wa Jal mildly reproaches them, but He says they are fariqa min al mu'minin. They're a group of mu'mins. These are not munafiqun that didn't want to go and fight. So, to find, to find uh, uh, a deed difficult, to be a bit hesitant to do a, po a positive deed, this in and of itself is not nifaq. As long as your iman eventually wins over. Allah says in the Quran that كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْقِتَالُ وَهُوَ كُرْهٌ لَكُمْ Qital has been written for you but you hate it. Allah says you hate it. Their hatred of qital, did that make them munafiq? No, it did not. It is human nature to not want these types of things. So there is a difference between finding, so waking up for fajr, right? This is our jihad of our times. We thank Allah, this is the type of jihad we need to do, subhanAllah, you know? Waking up for fajr. Every one of us, we might feel on occasion, when the alarm bell goes off, you know, the alarm clock goes off. It's like, subhanAllah, another day, can't we just sleep? Do I have to do this? That in and of itself is not nifaq. As long as what? We get out of bed. <laughs> if we don't get out of bed, that's a big problem. <laughs> yeah. But to feel the hesitation, right? Or to feel the, like let's say, let's say those who are going for hajj for the first time, they're really scared, they're really worried because of all of the problems. Yes, that's iman, not a problem. It's okay to have a little bit of fear and trepidation and nervousness as long as you overcome it. So Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in the Quran, the Sahaba uh, felt this type of fear. The Muslims, they also made their way uh, to Badr and they're still not sure the Badr is, of course, on the, on the route to the caravan. Uh, they had expected to, to meet the caravan the first time in the same place of Badr. And they're still proceeding there. And that is why the Quraysh as well, they know this is the most logical place for them to go to. So the both of them are intending uh, to go to Badr. As Allah says, even if you had agreed, you wouldn't do this. But Allah had already planned. Even if you had agreed to set a time and a place, you would not have been managed to meet each other. But Allah had set a plan that you will meet each other. You will, that Allah Azza wa Jalla already decreed this to occur. So the Muslims got to Badr and they're still not sure which of the two uh, groups they're going to meet. And the Prophet ﷺ took Abu Bakr himself as an emissary. Why? Because this is a very tense situation. He didn't even send any other emissary. He and Abu Bakr, they went out scouting for information. And as far as, as I know from my own readings of the seerah, this is the only time that the Prophet himself acted as a scout, as an emissary. That he leaves the army, he himself is the fact collector. And this shows us the sensitivity. This shows us that even the Prophet was worried, what if it is the army, what are we going to do now? And he doesn't want to tell the Muslims until he himself is sure. So he takes the only person that he trusts like beyond anything, his most trustworthy, and that is Abu Bakr. And the two of them go collecting information. They become scouts. They become the, uh, the people, you know, fact-finding. And he takes Abu Bakr and, he, and he's finding uh, information until finally they come across the old, an old Bedouin. And this is the source of information, right? The Bedouins are just wandering in the desert and these are yani, people who are not going to be involved in the fight. They're neutral, they're not, they're Bedouins. They're not in the Quraysh, they're not in the Yathrib, they're not in Medina. They're simply uh, carriers of information. So uh, the Bedouin obviously does not recognize who these two people are. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ asks him, do you have any information about the Quraysh and about Muhammad and his army? Not even realizing the Bedouin is that he is Muhammad. He's asking this so that suspicion doesn't fall on him. If he said, do you have any information about the Quraysh? Obviously, which side is he on? He's on the side of the Muslims. In fact, he is Rasulullah right? But in order to like make the Bedouin feel that he himself is also neutral, that he's coming from a neutral tribe. So he asked the Bedouin, do you have any information? What's going on with the Quraysh? I heard some stuff. And what's going on with uh, Muhammad and his army? What's, what is going on? So the Bedouin said, who are you? I can't tell you until I know which side you're on. Right? He, he's also a wise man. Which side are you on? I will not inform you anything until you tell me who are you. And so, of course, the Prophet cannot say because... He's going to then give away the game plan, right? And so uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, I promise to tell you who, well, that where we are from. Notice very specific now. The Prophet ﷺ knows what he is saying, right? I promise to tell you where we are from. As long as you tell us, 
any information that you have. You have to tell us what you know, and then we will tell you where we are from. So with this confirmation, this Bedouin felt, okay, you know, if they're going to tell me, clearly they're not on one of the two sides, or else they wouldn't want to tell me, right? And so the Bedouin feels like, okay, I can confide in them, and they can confide in me. So he said, okay, if you want to know, this is my information. What has reached us is that Muhammad وسلم, has left Yathrib on such and such a date, and he was right. And if this is true, then they are camped right outside of Badr, and he was also right. But of course, the Prophet and the Bedouin right now are not at Badr, they're at another location, right? So the man is thinking, if that information is true, they must almost be at Badr, and he was dead on. Because he's a Bedouin, he knows exactly how, how much armies are taken. So this much the Prophet knew because he is the Prophet And it has reached me that the army of the Quraysh has left Mecca on such and such a date, which was also true. And if that is accurate, then they must be at such and such a location, which was also true. And that was on the other side of Badr. They're going to be there the next day as well. right? So this is very... Well, bad news at the time, but of course Allah Azza wa had a good news plan. That the Bedouin is confirming that there's an army. That he's telling them, and they can verify it because he knows about them. So clearly he knows about the other side as well. That the Bedouins have the, uh, this is their CNN, right? This is their uh, news network here. The Bedouins have their information. And by the way, the Bedouins needed this to live themselves, right? They needed this to survive themselves. They need to have all of the information to avoid any conflicts or maybe to bribe one side against the other. So this is their information. This is their livelihood. This is their safety. So the Bedouin says, okay, I've told you my information. Now you need to tell me, where are you from? You promised. And obviously the Prophet promised. And so the Prophet said, نَحْنُ مِنْ مَا We are from water. <laughs> We are from water. And he turned around and rode on of the camel with Abu Bakr at his side. And the old Bedouin was left scratching his head. Min ma? From ma? Which ma is this? Is this the ma of Iraq? Like the city of Iraq is ma? Is this the ma of Iraq or which ma? I don't know which ma you're talking about. But the Prophet gave the answer. Nahnu min ma? We are from water. And this isn't the first time that I've demonstrated this phenomenon called, you should all know it by now, Tawriya. Tawriya. This isn't the first time. Tawriya. Tawriya, again I'll say it. Tawriya, we saw it in Tafsir Surah Yusuf many times. We saw it in the Seerah many times. In the Hijrah, where uh, Abu Bakr said, this is my guide. He's guiding me to the path. Right? This is my had. Yahdini al This is my guide. Right? Tawriya means double meaning. You're hiding the truth with another truth. You're not with a lie. Islam does not allow lying. But at times, Tawriya is permitted. Right? And our Sharia tells us that whoever uses Tawriya excessively, it's only going to be a matter of time before he gets accused of lying, and there's an element of truth in that. But Tawriya in and of itself has a legitimacy because you're not lying. You're not lying. Where are you from? We are from water. Are you not from water? Yes, we are from water. Right? Allah says in the Quran that وَخَلَقْنَا وَجَعْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْءٍ Everything living comes from water. So this type of tawriya, we have seen it many times in the seerah uh, of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, notice as well, I mean, subhanAllah, the bravery of the Prophet to act as a scout. Scouts are the most dangerous because there is no army to protect. Anybody can see, and he is the Prophet ﷺ, like literally the most important person. But it's also the sensitivity. The sensitivity of the situation. So, the Prophet ﷺ comes back uh, and he does not tell the army anything yet. And the first thing he does, he goes and he stands in salah, asking Allah for help. Because now he himself is getting tense. What is to be done? And this is again a natural tension. Nothing wrong with that. He himself is tense. Now what is to be done? And as he is praying, as he is praying, there is a commotion that begins. What is this commotion? The Sahaba have captured two of the slaves from the Quraysh. And they are asking them, where are you from? And they said, we are from the army of the Quraysh. We are from the, the army that we just left a few days ago. We came to defend the caravan. And they began beating up the slaves, the Sahaba, saying, no, you're lying. You're not from the army. You're from the caravan of Abu Sufyan. Notice, they themselves are so eager that... What they're going to meet up is not the army, but the caravan. They're throwing their own projections onto these slaves. 
And they began beating the slaves, saying, No, tell us the truth. Tell us the truth. You're from the caravan, aren't you? And they continued beating until finally they said, Yes, we're from the caravan, we're from the caravan. Then after a while they asked again, and they said, No, we're from the army. So they beat them again. Until finally they said, no, no, we're from the caravan, from the caravan. When the Prophet ﷺ finished his salah, notice how long is his salah as well, subhanAllah, he's praying a long salah. When the Prophet ﷺ finishes his salah, notice the simplicity and yet the profundity. That he says to the Sahaba, when they tell you the truth, you beat them. And when, when they lie, you let them go. I mean, how, how foolish is that? That they've t they're telling you the truth, you cannot swallow that information and so you're beating them even though they're telling you the truth which is we're from the army of the the Quraysh right and when they're lying to you and they finally say we're from the caravan from the caravan that is when uh, you know you let them go and this shows us that uh, subhanallah it's as if the Prophet is saying it's ridiculous to torture them they'll tell you anything under torture right what, what's the point of beating them what's the point of torturing them whatever you want them to say they're gonna say it when you're gonna beat them so this is the beauty the profundity the process that he's telling them look they're telling you the truth they have nothing to gain they're not they're they're, they're from the army of the Quraysh I mean they're slaves but they're not a part of the army they're they're just workers in the army they're just you know cooks and, and, and cleaners and whatnot they're telling you the truth and accept them at face value and of course this was the final if you like verdict now that khalas we are not meeting the caravan. We are meeting the army. Okay, this was a very uh, difficult and emotional time now for the Sahaba now. That this was the test. That the caravan is now officially, now the Prophet has told them that no, this is now, they are true in what they say. They are saying they are with the army and they are not with the uh, caravan. And then the Prophet came up to them to ask them questions. And he says, tell me, how many people are in the army? So he wants to find out. How many people in the army? And they said, we are slaves, we are just water carriers, we don't know these things. And they are illiterate, they're uneducated, we don't know anything. We, we don't know how many you know, uh, people are in the army. And uh, again, the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ, okay, so you are workers, you are slaves, tell me, how many camels do they kill every day? So now this is their job. Notice, subhanAllah, you know, the the, 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 the deepness, the profundity, like the, 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 the slaves are right, like how do you expect us to, we don't count to a, a thousand, we don't know. So the process and asked them a question they would know. Okay, you're the cooks and cleaners, how many camels do you kill a day? So they said nine or ten. So the process and immediately said they are between nine hundred to a thousand. Look at, again, the Sahaba are not able to get this information. Two questions, and immediately the Prophet has the information that uh, he needs from these, uh, these slaves there. So they're around between uh, 900 to 1,000 uh, people, because one camel would on average be able to feed 100 uh, people. And he said, who is present amongst them from their noblemen? And thus began a who's who of the Quraysh. Right? This is the whole point of Badr that we don't really, many of us don't understand. Wallahi, every single major henchman of the Quraysh is eliminated at Badr. This is really the beauty of Badr. Everyone whose names we've mentioned and, and were, are worthy of being criticized and smeared, everyone to a last man. It was a, a victory upon a victory. Every one of these men. And so they began mentioning Umayyah ibn Khalaf, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, uh, Suhail ibn Amr, Abu Jahl, all of these people are mentioned and they're all the noblemen. They're all the noblemen. And this news caused the Muslims to be very disheartened. Why? Because the whole gathering has come. All of the noblemen, and if, they, and if they are here, this means their wealth is here too. This means they must have paid a lot of people. This means they have the best armor. This may, and they did have the best camels and the best armor. A lot of these cowards purchased the best camels, right? So this demoralized many of the Muslims. And again, this shows us the humanity of the Sahaba. I mean, wallahi, they were demoralized. We would have turned around and read, fled, fled, you know. This demoralized the Sahaba, but the Prophet ﷺ smiled in happiness. Why? Because he knew Allah's promise is true. And Allah had said, whichever of the two you meet will be yours. That's what the Quran says, right? Allah had said, you're going to meet one of the two, whichever one you meet, it will be yours. You wanted the one that had no weapons. You wanted the caravan. 
but Allah wanted something bigger than this. So when it was now confirmed that the, they are facing the army, and the Prophet ﷺ hears that the army has all of these elite people, he is happy. Why? Because he trusts Allah's promise that Allah has said, this will be yours. And so he told the uh, Muslims that, Unzuru, uh, look, Makkah has presented to you, uh, the uh, Arabic expression is Falakul Akbal, which basically means the creme de la creme. Right? It has given you its, what are you, what are you going to say, the liver of its what? I mean, yani the expression is, huh? You can't translate this, Eddie, doesn't it? But yeah, the, the cream of the crop. In, in English, we have our own way, right? So, huh? It, it, it's given to you the, the, the bounty. It's given to you the cream of the crop, right? Uh, it's given to you the apple of its eyes. It's given to you the best that it has. Mecca has given to you, offered on a plate, basically. It has given to you the best that it has. And when he saw the look of like uh, dejection in their faces, he said, that wallahi, by Allah, Umayyah will be killed over here, and Shayba will be killed over here, and Utbah will be killed over here, and Abu Jahl will be killed over here. And he pointed to them every single location that literally the next day when it happened, or two days from now as we'll get to when it happened, every single person was found on the very spot that the Prophet had pointed out. That he's trying to make them feel uh, a sense of ease and at peace. And now that the Muslims realize that they're facing an army and not a caravan, now the Prophet needed to rile up the troops. He needed to rile up the troops. And this shows us, yes, there's a lot of fear, but when push came to shove, they passed the test. Right? There was a lot, and Allah Himself mentions it, that you are arguing with the Prophet ﷺ. And this is the difference between Iman and Kufr, Iman and Nifaq. That yes, Iman might feel hesitant, but in the end, it will win in the day. And so the Prophet ﷺ called the gathering of all of the Sahaba, and uh, he uh, told them that, you know the situation as it is, uh, what do you think we should do now. What do you think we should do now? Now obviously there is really no choice. I mean, you know, th there is no choice. The army has come. If they were to go back to Medina, this is like the worst humiliation. This is like not even meeting them in battle. And if they meet them in battle, then it's a very difficult victory. It's a very difficult uh, situation. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, what do you think needs to be done? This is not the first time, nor, nor will it be the last that we will see shura in action. Shura in action. Yadullahi ala al jama'ah. That Allah's hand is upon the majority or the, or the group. And there is no question that uh, consultation, shura, is a praiseworthy element of Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ had no need of shura, but he demonstrated shura for all of us. He doesn't need shura. He is Rasulullah. ﷺ. But he's demonstrating what any leader should do. He's demonstrating that the leader needs to have the people behind him. Also, even if he is Rasulullah the best way to moralize the, 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 the troops is to have them involved in the decision making as well. right? And so he says, what do you think we should do? Immediately Abu Bakr, of course, Abu Bakr stands up, he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sends salat upon the Prophet and then says, Ya Rasulullah, do as you please, we are behind you. It's your decision. right? Sat sits down. The Prophet thanked him and praised him. Then he asked again, what do you think we should do? Silence. Umar stands up. And Umar says, Ya Rasulullah, do as you please, for verily, we will do anything you want us to do. He sits down. The Prophet then praises him. Then he says, for the third time, what do you think we should do? Silence again, because what does he want? So Al-Miqdad ibn Amr, another Muhajirun, stand up, st st stood up. And Al-Miqdad probably thought that maybe Abu Bakr and Umar weren't forceful enough. Let me go and add some, some rhetoric. Let me add some fiery language here. So Al-Miqdad ibn Amr said and said, Ya Rasulullah, do as Allah has commanded you to do, and we are right behind you. Ya Rasulullah, we will not say to you as the Bani Israel said to their Prophet Musa, اذهب أنت وربك فقاتل إن ها هنا قاعدون. You all know the story in the Quran that when they're going to meet the big giants, right? The Bani Israel said to the to Musa, look, man, you and your your God go and fight. We're not going to go fight those people, right? We're not going to say that the uh, Al Miqdad said. Rather, we will say, you and your Lord, you go fight, and we are right behind you fighting, 
right? And then he said, Ya Rasulullah, go and take us to Barak al Ghimad. Barak al Ghimad is again an expression. Take us to the corner of the world. This is an English word say. Barak al Ghimad is just an expression. Take us to the corner of the world and we will follow you uh, until we meet what Allah's decree has destined for us. Now, it's basically the same thing is being said, except that al Mikhdad is a bit more eloquent. You can't get more eloquent than this. Now he sits down, thinks, khalas. This is what the Prophet wanted to hear. The Prophet thanked him. Then for the fourth time said, what do you think we should do? Why? Because the Ansar, this is now the crucial factor. Abu Bakr is Qurashi. Umar is Qurashi. Miqdad is Qurashi. And the Ansar, remember from the covenant of Bay'at al-Aqaba. Go back there now. The Ansar had promised the Prophet that they would, the phrase is, protect him as they would protect their own families. Badr is not protection, Badr is offensive. Badr is not protection. They can go back to Medina now, khalas. The Ansar had not signed up for this. The condition for the Ansar was if we are attacked in Medina, then you will protect me as you will to the max. As you will protect your own family and children, you will protect us. That's all we want from you, right? That was the condition. And so now for the first time, the Ansar are being asked in a very gentle manner. And notice the Prophet didn't even put them on the spot. Three times, and three times Quraysh stand up. And the Quraysh are indeed, As-Sabiqun al awwalun No, we expect the Quraysh to stand up. Three times the Quraysh stand up. And the Ansar are quiet. Now, for the fourth time, they realize there's something deeper than this, right? And so, that great leader of the Ansar, the greatest leader of the Ansar, that leader whom when he eventually died a shaheed, the Prophet ﷺ said, the throne of Allah shook at the death of Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. This is Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. Now we know why the throne of Allah shook. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, that young man, that, that eloquent, that powerful man, who was going to be their leader had he lived. lived. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ, when Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad came after the battle of Khandaq, and he was wounded, and he was dying, but they didn't know he was dying. That was his death wound. Uh, they thought he would live. He was wounded he came on his donkey and the Prophet ﷺ said to the Ansar stand up to meet your leader stand up show some respect this is Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad that the Prophet ﷺ is telling the Ansar stand up have show some, show some respect to your leader and by the way standing up for leaders is a whole fiqh issue about should you should you not and this hadith clearly shows us that it is allowed on occasion it is allowed and as for the fiqh Imam al and others talk about it. anyway this is Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad so then he stood up and he said, perhaps you're waiting for us, Ya Rasulullah. I.e., is that why you're asking four times? Perhaps you intend us, لَعَلَّكَ تَقْصِدُنَا Perhaps you're waiting for our response. And so the Prophet ﷺ finally admitted, he said, Naam, yes, I need to hear from you. What is your response as the Ansar? And so Sa'ad gave that eloquent speech, which when you translate it destroys all of the eloquence, but it is a powerful, a rousing speech. And he says in it that, Ya Rasulullah, Amanna bika wa saddaqnaak. After all, we believed in you, and we trusted you, and we testified that what you have come with is the truth. And we have given you our uhud and mithaq, our promises and our oaths, that we will listen and obey you. Notice the beauty of Sa'ad here. He doesn't go back to the bare minimum. We gave you a promise to protect you. Rather, he mentions the other phrase. We will obey you, Ya Rasulullah. Right? Look at this Iman now. He is going now to the spirit of the law, not to the letter. If he wanted to go down to the letter of the law, he could say, look, you know, there's an exemption. We didn't sign up for this. You know, if he wanted to. But he's looking at the spirit of Islam. He's saying, Ya Rasulullah, after all, are we not Muslims? Didn't we believe in you? Didn't we trust you? Didn't we do everything you want us to do? So now, Ya Rasulullah, go forth and do as you see fit, and we are with you. For I swear by the one who has sent you with the truth, were you to, were you to take us into the ocean and charge us galloping into the ocean. These are people who cannot swim, by the way, right? These are, these are Bedouins, these are desert dwellers, they don't know how to swim. Were you to charge us into the ocean, then we would go right behind you. We are not scared of meeting the enemy tomorrow and we will show you our patience during battle and insha'Allah or la'allallah, which is basically insha'Allah, Allah will show you through us that which will comfort you. I.e. 
you will see our bravery, our sincerity, our truthfulness. So go forth ala barakatillah. Famdi ala barakatillah. Go forth upon the blessings of Allah. We are right behind you. And when Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad said this, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu his face became like the shining moon. Like he was so happy to hear the Ansar were behind him and this reinvigorated him. And uh, he reiterated what he had said before that wallahi Allah has promised me one of the two and it is this one and every one of them will that I have mentioned because he had mentioned them every one of them will die tomorrow every one of these that I have mentioned will die uh, tomorrow and having said this he then began the actual preparations for war and we have come right to the end of our uh, halaqa for today shall the next Wednesday we'll continue about the preparation in the side of the Prophet system and also what happened in the side of the uh, Quraysh. We have a few minutes for Q&A and then we have two, three announcements to make before uh, Salat al-Isha. So questions about today's? Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, was a good talk, so uh, whichever camera he made will have a success. If that be, was that revealed when he was praying after he came back? So the question is, when was the verse revealed that Allah has promised you one of the two caravans? The response is, we don't know exactly when, but we can assume from the context of the verse that it was revealed when the first rumors had come that there is an army coming. So when the Prophet left Medina, he had no clue, he had no idea that he's actually going to meet the army and that's why he tells the Muslims that we're out to meet the caravan and inshallah Allah will bless you with a great victory which was true Allah did bless them with a great victory right but he thought it was the caravan then in between this caravan news and this incident now when the rumors began to come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised him you will meet a group one of the two either the caravan or the army and you will be victorious in whichever one that you meet so can during the no, Surah Al-Anfar was revealed after Badr. But it explains Badr. Who became the leaders of Makkah after Badr? Abu Sufyan. Who became the leader of Makkah after Badr? Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan became uh, the, uh, the... Abu Sufyan was relatively younger. He was... Uh, he could not have been leader had it not been for the death of all of the seniors. So he sucked up into the vacuum. And so Abu Sufyan became the leader and that is why in the Fatih Makkah the Prophet ﷺ said Man dakhala bayta Abu Sufyan fahuwa amin. He mentioned one person by name. That Abu Sufyan is the only one of the old guard of that level, of that tabaqa. Right? Nah, they had Suhaid ibn Amr and they had others, but not to the level of Abu Sufyan. Right? Again, these are levels of, uh, uh, of people. And Abu Sufyan was, uh, like you can see here right now, for example, Abu Sufyan is the leader of the caravan, Abu Jahl is the leader of the army. So already you find yani, that they are at somewhat of a similar level. So the main person of Mecca became Abu Sufyan, and that is why in the Battle of Uhud, Abu Sufyan was at the head of the army. Surah Al Anfal was revealed after Badr. But it explains Badr. Immediately after Badr. Immediately after Badr. And it explains Badr. And that is why, inshallah, I hope, inshallah, when we finish Badr, we'll actually pause to do a quick tafsir of Surah Anfal, just one halaqa, inshallah. Maybe even just the verses related to Badr. So that next time we read Surah Al Anfal, it will be very fresh in our memories. Because, subhanAllah, every one of these incidents is linked to an ayah of Anfal. So it's very beneficial to know Surah Al Anfal. Yes? You commented on the, uh, the two that they caught by the it's a very difficult question I, I understand so the, the brother is asking about so the 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 two slaves were beaten and in our terminology would call now when we say torture they were not like sliced they weren't like you know I mean they were just like slapped with shoes or whatever you know I mean that type of that type of stuff you know just a little bit of we would say roughing up you know, they weren't like cooked over a fire like the Chinese torture or something. You know, it's like, this is not so. Firstly, I mean, I'm not and he's saying that even this is just an art. I'm just saying, let us be careful. This term torture has a connotation that perhaps that's why I didn't choose the term torture. I use the term beat, right? Barabuhum, yani rough them up, slap them up, right? Um, this is a very difficult question. And there is a, uh, a very simple response to this. And that is that, in my humble opinion, 
the Sharia has revealed a basic framework that allows for adaptations, right? And there is no doubt that at another time and place and world environment, certain things would have been allowed that our political, uh, uh, you know, uh, treaties and whatnot do not allow in our times. So. The Sharia came and raised the bar immensely. For example, you had to feed prisoners of war, you couldn't starve them to death. You had to give them a minimal amount of housing and whatnot. This was not known before the coming of Islam, right? In the Battle of Badr, the Prophet said, uh, and we'll come to this, he said, feed them with what you feed uh, yourself. And so the prisoners were treated better than the people who were hosting them, right? Because when the Prophet said, feed them with your feed yourself, so then the meat was given to the prisoner just in case somebody would be accused that you took the meat, you didn't give it. So the Sahabi literally picked his meat up and put it in front of the, the prisoner. The prisoner felt embarrassed that you're giving me the meat. He quietly put it back in front of the Sahabi. The Sahabi said, no, this is yours. Right? So the Islam came and no doubt it changed a lot of things. And yet, it didn't uh, you know, do maybe what uh, some other later treaties did to show that there is a spectrum. Right? So in our times, if certain elements of certain treaties go more than what Islam did, once the country signs agreement to these treaties, there's no problem in saying, okay, you know what, we will also raise it to this level, right? So what I'm saying is, uh, it is there's nothing wrong at all in any Muslim nation or country signing on to these international treaties and then upholding their level and condition. And as for the incidents in the seerah that seem to go against modern uh, conventions and whatnot, I think honestly it is very intellectually shallow for any serious academic to challenge uh, them because they, what, you need to compare what the Prophet and Sahaba did with what others did at his time and place. Right? You need to be relative that when Europe was doing this, when China was doing this, this is what the Muslims were doing. Right now, if let's say uh, the treaties have you know uh, done certain things in modern times, then okay, not a problem for us to hold up to them. And also, we do need to be very clear here and point out that look, even you guys have not upheld your own treaties in a million and one exceptions, all related to Islam and Muslims. So don't come preaching to us about uh, you know hum uh, you know uh, uh, human rights and whatnot when you know we still have Guantanamo and we still have this. We still have, where does we where do we even begin the list? Okay, don't come preaching to us when you yourselves clearly don't have uh, a stellar record. So, uh, it's a t difficult question, but again, I don't see any major problem in responding in this matter. Uh, sisters, any questions before we... Uh Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. Uh, last Wednesday we had talked about the beginnings of the Battle of Badr and the fact that the Prophet wasallam had to verify from the Ansar whether they were willing to fight with the Prophet wasallam or not. And uh, as we said that the Ansar, uh, the leader of them, Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, he stood up, he gave a beautiful speech and he committed to whatever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted them to do. Now, when the Prophet sallallahu saw these enthusiasms coming from the Sahaba, he began the preparations for the war. And now that the Ansar had committed, so he could use their uh, their manpower if you like. And so he divided up the group or the army into three uh, flanks if you like. And he gave the primary flag, the flag bearer, and that flag was white in color. And by the way, the Prophet had different flags in every battle. So he didn't have one standard uh, flag. Rather, it just so happened whatever was convenient at the time. It appears that he didn't have uh, the standard flag. Sometimes he had white, sometimes he had black, uh, and sometimes he had uh, other colors as well. Uh, and so in this uh, battle, the Battle of Badr, he gave the primary flag uh, to Mus'ab ibn Umair. And Mus'ab ibn Umair, as we all know, he became a shaheed in this uh, uh, battle. Uh, so, uh, sorry, not in the battle of Uhud, he will become shaheed in the battle of Uhud. And uh, he gave the white flag to Mus'ab ibn Umair. And he then divided the rest of the Sahaba into two groups. On the right-hand side, he placed Ali ibn Abi Talib, and he gave him all of the Muhajirun. And on the left side, he placed Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, and he gave him all of the Ansar. According to one report, he actually had a backup group as well. 
Uh, and that was so therefore it's as if he's dividing his army into four groups again we're all trying to piece together what happened according to one report he had a backup group uh, maybe for reinforcements uh, maybe for another position in the battlefield and he placed them under the charge of Qais ibn uh, Sa'sa but the two primary groups one on the right and one on the left and there was of course the the, the battalion that was going to charge the one on the right was Ali ibn Abi Talib and the one on the left was Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh and the one on the right was the Saha was the the, um, uh, Muhajirun and the one on the left was the Ansar. Now here in this division between the Muhajirun and the Ansar, we actually uh, learn that Islam takes into account cultural and ethnic divisions. In that the, Ans the, the Ansar were given one group and the Muhajirun were given another group. Why is this? Because every person is more familiar with his own ethnicity, his own people. The Muhajirun knew each other better. And the Ansar knew each other better. And the Muhajirun felt more comfortable together because after all, they had lived together, they, have, they had uh, grown up together. And similarly, the Ansar, they also felt more comfortable together. And therefore, we learn from this that the attitude of some Muslims to ignore culture completely or to ignore any type of ethnic division, this is an extreme. Allah Azza wa Jal clearly says, we have made you uh, shu'ub and qaba'il. And shu'ub means large uh, large qabilas, if you like, the, the mother qabilas. It's translated as nations, but the concept of nation is a modern concept, as you know. Shu'ub means uh, basically maybe races or ethnicities. So one sha'ab is the Arab sha'ab, another sha'ab is the Indian sha'ab. So this is like shu'ub. And then qaba'il is the sub tribes. Qaba'il is the actual tribe. This is Quraysh, this is Hudal, this is the uh, Banu Murrah. And so Allah is saying, I have made you all of these different ethnicities and different uh, tribes so that you may lita'araf, we'll get to know one another. In other words, uh, this is a tangent of the tafsir. If all of humanity had been the same, how would you stand out? If everybody was exactly the same, how would you stand out? So the fact that we have different faces, different looks, different tastes, different cultures, each one of us has a personal identity. Each one of us has a specific background, if you like. So the point being here that the Prophet ﷺ took advantage of this ethnic division basically by putting each group to itself. And there is no doubt that you just look around you that birds of a feather flock together. That people of a particular area will congregate, will socialize more than people from another area and there's nothing inherently un-Islamic about this as long as it's not taken to an extreme, right? And here we have this division of the Ansar and the uh, Muhajirun. Also notice that the Prophet ﷺ put in charge of them, both of the uh, leaders were young dynamic visionaries. Ali ibn Abi Talib on the one side and Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh on the other. And both of them were of their noblemen, i.e. Ali is considered to be of the noble and Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh as we know he was also considered to be of the future leader of the Ansar and once again there is this uh, pragmatism, there is this reality that you cannot deny that there are certain people in every community they are more respected than others, right? We have, some people have this utopic notion everybody is exactly the same, no they are not. Some people have qualities that set them apart from others. Some people have leadership. Some people have charisma. Some people have those qualities that make them respected amongst their peers. And the Prophet ﷺ did not choose a nobody. He did not choose a person unknown. He chose those people who would have had the respect of their respective ethnicities, right? Ali is the uh, great grandson of, of Abdul Muttalib. Ali is the cream of the, uh, the, the crop of the Quraysh. Uh, he is the young man coming up. So the Quraysh all admire and love him. His lineage, his father, everything is perfect. After all, his father is Abu Talib and he was the chieftain of the Banu Hashim. And of course, on the side of the Ansar, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, uh, he was going to become, as you know, the leader, if you like, uh, of the Ansar. Uh, had he not died, uh, his shaheed death, as will come to, inshallah, and his time in the seerah. So once again, an element of pragmatism, that we look to our community. Not everybody is respected the same. And when you give positions of leadership, you need to give it to those people who are respected in the community. Why? This is a time of war. You need, you cannot have a person who, who, whom others will say, why are you put in charge of me? What makes you better than me? And again, there is an element of uh, taking into account the differences of people. Also notice that the person who was chosen to be the flag bearer, and the flag bearer is in some of the flag bearer, of course, he is not the leader. The flag bearer is not the leader. The flag bearer 
is the one who positions the army. He is the central point. He is the focus, right? So he has an honorary position. And he chose somebody whom uh, both the Ansar and the Muhajirun could basically look up to. And that is Mus'ab ibn Umair. He is a Muhajir, so he is Qurashi. And yet he is the earliest of the people to immigrate to Medina. And therefore, the respect that he has amongst the Ansar is unparalleled. After all, most of the Ansar converted at his hands. And so, Mus'ab ibn Umayr is chosen. He was a Muhajir, he's a Qurashi, he's of the noblest and the richest families, and yet he's also converted most of the Ansar at his own hands. And therefore, he was the most Madani of the Muhajirun. He was the most Madani of the Muhajirun, and hence the Prophet cho chose him to basically symbolize the entire army, and nobody could have symbolized it better than this Muhajir, who is also a Madani, who is the one who, at whom hands the Ansar have converted. And again, this shows us the wisdom of the Prophet And of course, it's a very honorable position, but it's also a dangerous position, because the flag bearer is always the target of the enemy. The enemy wants the flag to fall. It's a symbol. If the flag ever falls, even if it's picked up again, it's a symbol that when the uh, uh, when the other uh, army sees the flag fall, it encourages them. It gives them uh, hope. It gives them more power to f attack. So the flag should never fall. Never. And Therefore, the flag bearer is always the center of attack. And another problem is the flag bearer is always uh, impaired because he has one hand holding the flag. And so he cannot fight to the same level as those who are not holding the flag. And so the flag bearer has a very important role. Of course, one of the main purposes of the flag bearer during any particular battle. And remember, this is the good old days. You're fighting one man to one man. Not like uh, the modern armies where you never see your enemy. Right? The good old days, you literally are in the thick of things. Right? So you will get disoriented. You will turn around. You will do this and that. And the purpose of the two flag is to always have a marker that where are you, which side is the enemy, which side is your, uh, is your own army. So the purpose of the flag has all of these matters. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ arrived, he was the first of the two to arrive. He preceded the uh, Quraysh by a day. So he came to the plains of Badr on the 16th of Ramadan. And this is of course in the second year of the Hijrah. On the 16th of Ramadan, in the second year of the Hijrah. And the Prophet ﷺ immediately set up his uh, camp and his tents basically on the outskirts of the entire plains of Badr. And inshallah, I keep on saying next week we'll have the maps, but I'm waiting to finish all of the, the, the documentary basically, the, the talk basically, and then inshallah we'll show you the maps uh, on the PowerPoint slide. Uh, Dr. Bashar has done a great job of compiling maps and, and uh, drawing the whole uh, diagram. So once we summarize it all, then inshallah one day uh, when we finish all of that, we'll just summarize it again through those uh, diagrams. Uh, so the Prophet ﷺ camped on the 16th of Ramadan on the outskirts of the uh, plains of Badr. And before he had set up camp, Al-Hubab ibn al-Munzir, who was a scout, he was well known for being a person who went into the desert long periods of time. He was somebody known for traveling. Al-Hubab ibn al-Munzir came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, this place that you have decided uh, for us to camp, is this something Allah has told you to do, such that we are not allowed to move one inch forward or backward? Or is it your own opinion and it is based on tactics and strategies of war. Why are you camping here? And so the Prophet ﷺ said, no, this is my own opinion, it's basically my strategy. And so the Prophet he said, in that case, Ya Rasulullah, I suggest we don't camp at the corner of the plain, rather we should proceed until we're beyond midpoint. And therefore the wells of Badr are behind us. And in this case, he said, we shall have plenty of water and they will have to rely on their jugs and their canisters that they've come from Mecca. And of course, that's a big demoralizing factor, right? We have the water for them, it's a big demoralizing factor. They have no access to water. And they will have to, they know that their, their water will run out, they're going to have to go back after uh, a period of time. And so, uh, in one version, Jibreel came to him and said, follow the advice of Hubab. And so the Prophet ﷺ then followed the advice of Hubab and he said, you have directed us to the better uh, opinion. And therefore he then uh, did not camp there. He proceeded onwards until they had 
uh, it, it appears to be there are multiple wells. There was one major well, and there, there were small multiple wells. And to this day, if you go to Badr, you will still find there's one major well, and then there's smaller wells away. So he put all of the wells behind him, and just to be on the safe side, he blocked the smaller wells after taking the water out and pouring it into the big one, right? So just in case they go to a farther well on another side of the plain, all of those were blocked off. All of those were filled. And the big well that was the main one, the other waters were taken out, pulled out by canister and thrown into the large one so that it was in the center of the Muslim camp and the Quraysh had no access to any, uh, uh, any water. Now this incident uh, is just one of dozens of examples in which the Prophet ﷺ would regularly take advice from the companions and sometimes even change his mind and act upon it. And the concept of shura is sh shown over and over and over again. The Prophet ﷺ was never like the modern dictators. It was never like my opinion must go. Rather, he would always take the opinions of the Sahaba. And in this incident, uh, Al-Hubab also demonstrates that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, sometimes, now this is a very deep Usul al-Fiqh issue, and uh, is worthy of a lot of discussion in Usul al-Fiqh, but not in the Seerah. The question is, did the Prophet Sallallahu sometimes do things from his own opinion, not from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? And this incident, of course, suggests that he did that sometimes his opinions were from himself. And uh, perhaps those opinions uh, might have had other interpretations that some would say are better in, in some circumstances, such as in this case of Al-Hubab. Now this is true, there's not a problem to say that, uh, but the problem comes that some people take this exception and try to make a rule out of it. Some people say that, look, this was the personal opinion of the Prophet ﷺ, therefore, we can go through the whole sunnah and pick and choose basically what was a personal opinion that he used to do and what was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Now this is wrong for many reasons. Firstly, we need to understand you cannot extrapolate the incident of Badr into Sharia. Ah. The incident of Badr is a particular strategy of war. You cannot say when the Prophet told you pray that oh this is his opinion. Give zakah, oh this is his opinion. The sharia ah is what he's commanding you to do. And where he's camping at Badr, there is not necessarily anything to be derived from sharia. Ah. But Badr is only going to take place once. We don't do Badr every year, we go and do Badr and camp at the same place. He is not, basically what I'm trying to say is, when he camps at Badr, he is not intending to legislate a position of where to camp at Badr. You see the point here, right? Whereas when he prays, when he fasts, when he orders commandments for the Muslims of Medina, do this, don't do that, inheritance, laws, hijab, divorce, marriage, all of these laws, this is sharia. Ah, right? And he intends for the Muslims to follow him. And therefore we cannot equate one time incident of Badr with the rest of the sharia. Ah, right? Another point is that Hubab had to ask him point blank. Hubab didn't assume that he can understand which one is which. He asked him point blank, Ya Rasulullah, is this from Allah's wahi or is it from your ijtihad? Right? Who amongst us now can do this to the sunnah? Nobody can do this anymore. Right? And the basic rule is that whatever the Prophet said and did, it is his uh, sharia. Ah. Uh, by the way, so there are a number of occasions, very few, where sometimes once again the Sahaba asked the Prophet specifically, is this something you're commanding or is this just a suggestion? By the way, this is very rare. Usually, and there are literally, literally, no exaggeration, dozens of examples, dozens of examples. Usually, when the Sahaba heard something, they would apply it so literally, they would apply it so literally, it sometimes borders on the unimaginable, like how is this possible even, right? Uh, so there's two incidents, uh, both of which literally have the same almost story, and that once that the Prophet ﷺ was uh, in his tent, and uh, one of the Sahaba was outside, and it had there had been a command, this was in one of the expeditions, that nobody should enter the tent. And this Sahabi had a pressing need. And so he asked the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, may I enter uh, the tent, I need to speak to you. So the Prophet ﷺ said, yes. So then he remembered the commandment, you're not supposed to enter. Then he said, Ya Rasulullah, can I enter with my whole body or just part of my body? And he's so confused now, like, what is, are you telling me to just put my head in the tent, right? Or are you telling me to physically step in? So he has to verify, right? Another instance of this nature is once the Prophet ﷺ was uh, uh, 
giving the khutbah, uh, and during the khutbah he mentioned to somebody to uh, stop. And there was a sahabi coming into the door, and he didn't see the context of that word stop, right? So he literally stopped mid-door with a foot up, stop. And he just stopped right there. Like he heard stop, khalas, no questions asked. Stop, right? And, and we can go on and on. Ali ibn Abi Talib in the battle of Khaybar, right? That the Prophet ﷺ told him that he gave him the, 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 the standard. And he said, go forth and do not come back, right? Imdi, and he go forth and do not come back and go and, 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 and fight them in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he gave them all of the command what to do. Ali walked 10 spaces. Then he had a question. He was about to turn around. But then he realized the Prophet said basically don't come back until you're victor victorious, right? So he shouted out loud, Ya Rasulallah, because he didn't want to turn around. Ya Rasulallah, what should I tell them when I am surrounding? Like what are the conditions you want me to get? The point being, he was being so literal here that he doesn't even turn around because the Prophet said don't come back till you're victorious. So he didn't want to turn his back until he was victorious, right? So the point being, we have hundreds of examples like this, but we have one or two where there's an overriding reason why one of the Sahaba asks, is this wahi from Allah or is this just a suggestion, right? So this is one of them. And then of course there's a famous uh, uh, incident which is somewhat uh, uh, humorous as well. And that is the incident of uh, uh, Barira. The incident of Barira. Uh, that uh, Barira is a long story, but uh, the, the, the short of it is that she was a slave and she was married to uh, a slave. And uh, she was freed and in Islamic fiqh when the, the slave is freed and he, he or she has a marriage it is up to them whether they want to continue the marriage or not it's up to them they can then annul the marriage so now that Barira becomes free she has the right does she want to remain married to a slave or not she can uh, without his permission because now she has the right to do this she can annul the marriage Fasq is called right she can annul the marriage so she decides to annul annul the uh, marriage. Uh, and so her husband uh, begs and pleads her and her husband literally is crying with her that, Oh Barira, please take me back. You know, we can make it work out. Come on, please. You know, let's, uh, let's do something. And let's uh, uh, think of all the good old times. He's basically begging her to take him back. And Barira would not even look back at him. لا يلتفت إليه. She's li literally not even giving him the pleasure of her look, right? And they're going around the city. And he is crying. Ibn Abbas says, I saw, uh, Mughith was his name, Mughith was the husband's name. I saw Mughith's beard was wet with his tears. And he's crying out, O Barira, O Barira. And Barira would not even give him her look, right? She's not even looking at him. And so the Prophet saw the two of them walking around Medina like this. And so he felt mercy for Mughith, even though he's a slave. But the Prophet is Rahma lil Alameen. He felt mercy for Mughith. And he said to Barira, Ya Barira, why don't you take him back? I mean, come on, you know this poor guy and he's crying, he's begging, why don't you take him back? And obviously Barira has no desire to take him back because all of this has taken place. So she said, Ya Rasulullah, ata'muruni? Are you commanding me? In which case, okay. Or are you just like, you know, suggesting, right? So the Prophet said, La innama ana shafi'. I'm just, you know, reconciling. Ana shafi', right? So then she said, with only the scorn that a woman can possibly muster, La haja li fi, that I have no need of him. I have no need of him. Uh, and so uh, the point being that Barira asked, Ya Rasulullah, are you commanding me or not? And he said, no, I'm not commanding you. And this shows us that once again. Now, you know, the Prophet is being merciful that there's no way that uh, a marriage will last if uh, one of them, you know, is so much antagonistic towards the other. So he said, no, I'm not commanding you. So once again, Barira is verifying, is this Amr or is this just a suggestion? My point being, you can literally count these types of incidents on the fingers of one hand. In fact, some people say these are the only two incidents uh, in the whole seerah in, of this major where somebody actually says, is this Amr or not? Right? And there might be one or two more, but they are literally within the fingers of one hand. So for those, and of course the people who do this are those who wish to basically change the Sharia ah and say uh, that the Prophet did not command any laws that are of a legal nature. That's his opinion. We don't have to follow them. What we follow is uh, theology. What we follow is ritual, salah and zakah. Don't tell us hudud, don't tell us marriage and divorce, don't tell us interest and financial transaction. That's his personal opinion. 
and they based this from this one incident of uh, uh, one incident of al-hubab, and this is wallahi extremism. You're going to take this one incident and ignore the whole seerah. In any case, I needed to say that because this incident is misused. Uh, so. As we said, they went forward and they put the water in one well and they set up uh, a, a small type of camp. And this was when Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad suggested, Ya Rasulullah, why don't we make for you a, uh, a special khayma, a special headquarters where you can monitor the battle from. Uh, and so the Prophet agreed to this. So they chose an area where he could see the battle, probably a little bit of a hill or something, where he could uh, see the battle. And it was somewhat of a, uh, a mu'askar, or if you like, the, the headquarters. They built a headquarters for him on the plains of uh, Badr. And uh, the Sahaba then uh, set up, uh, um, not tents, they were not going to have tents, they were living there for one night, but they, you know, they, they, they made their camels sit down and they set up their sleeping bags and everything. And uh, night fell and the Quraysh were on the horizon so they could see that the Quraysh are coming in. There is not going to be a battle tonight, the battle is going to be the next morning. So night fell and it is known that the battle is going to take place tomorrow morning. And it is narrated in the Musnad Imam Ahmad that the Prophet wasallam spent the whole night awake making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making prolonged sajda. And he said in his dua that, O oh Allah, if you destroy this group, in tahlika hadhihi al-usaba, if you destroy this group, falan tu'bada fil ard. You are not going to be worshipped on earth. In other words, if we fail, then I am the final prophet. And if I fail now, there's not going to be any more prophet after me. O oh Allah, if you don't help us now, then you will not be worshipped on earth earth and in the middle of the night the rain began to fall not a, a downpour but just a dripple just a drizzle light rain began to fall and the people had to take their belongings and run helter skelter to shelter themselves from the rain under the trees under the shrubs in uh, maybe even in the in the shade of their camels they just had to make some type of covering to shelter them from the uh, rain and uh, the Prophet ﷺ continued to pray and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until finally the dawn broke and he was the one who said that, uh, O oh people, as salah, O oh people, as salah. So he woke them up for uh, Salat al Fajr and thus began the 17th. Uh, of Ramadan, the 17th of Ramadan in the second year of the Hijrah. According to some modern historians, this is uh, March 17th, 624 CE. March 17th, 624 CE. And it appears that this occurred on a Friday. It appears this occurred on a Friday. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran both the rain and the sleep. Allah mentions the rain and the sleep as being miracles from Him. And this is in Surah, uh, which Surah is about Badr? I said this many times. Anfal. Surah Al-Anfal, right? It's basically all of Anfal is about Badr. From the beginning to the end is basically a reference to Badr. And Allah says in Surah Al-Anfal, إِذْ يُغَشِّيكُمُ nuas When sleep overcame you, when you became drowsy, إِذْ يُغَشِّيكُمُ nuas أَمَنَةً مِّنْهُ This was a, uh, a blessing and a peace and a security from Him. Right? And he sent down for you from the skies rain to purify you. So there was a physical uh, benefit as well. That you are dirty, you are disheveled, you're tired, the rain will cleanse you. It's like a fresh bath. And there was a spiritual bath, a physical bath and a spiritual bath, that the ridge or the filth of shaitan will be wiped away. And then there's another benefit, three benefits. And to make your uh, footsteps firm. So when it rains just a little bit, so when there's no rain, the desert sand is very difficult to walk in. It's literally, as you, many of you know this, like you put your sand in it, you feed it and it goes down. You put your feet in it and it goes down. You, so, no rain is difficult to walk. A lot of rain is impossible to walk. It will become muddy. Just the right amount of rain will make it firm like the uh, cement, if you like. Just the right amount of rain, it will make it firm. And Allah caused their side of the field to become firm. And Allah Azza wa made their side of the field firm to the footsteps. لِيُثَبِّتَ بِهِ aqdam To make the qadam, to make the footsteps very firm. And uh, uh, it is reported, Ali ibn Abi Talib said, this is Muslim Imam Ahmad, Ali ibn Abi Talib said, if you could only have seen us on the night of Badr, if only you were there to see us on the night of Badr, every one of us was dead asleep. 
except for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was praying uh, behind a tree and he was making dua until morning. And of course, this is a miracle because the night before anything, we're so nervous we cannot sleep. The night before any major exam, any major test, how about a major battle? How are you going to go to sleep? But Allah said, I was the one who caused you to become drowsy. Why? Because sleep makes you fresh, sleep makes you firm, sleep makes you powerful. And so Allah blessed them with sleep. Can you imagine in the Quraysh side, they didn't get the rain, they didn't get the sleep, so automatically Allah is blessing the Muslims in so many different ways. And again, we know, إِنْ يَنْصُرْكُمُ اللَّهُ فَلَا غَالِبَ لَكُمْ If Allah helps you, then there is none who can uh, overcome you. And um, uh, it is also said, even though I have not found an authentic isnad, but it is found in some books that uh, the Quraysh side, they received a downpour of rain. And of course, this is the worst because it makes the ground muddy. And when the ground is muddy, then you cannot do anything. So the Quraysh side, they got the bulk of the rain, and the Muslim side, they got the perfect amount of uh, rain. Uh, it, this also shows us the concern of the Prophet wasallam that even though he is the Prophet of Allah, and even though he puts his trust in Allah, still, what can he do as a leader? He is concerned for his people. So the whole night he spends making dua to Allah, making sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, begging and pleading Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in fact, uh, Ibn Mas'ud says, Ibn Mas'ud says, uh, reported in uh, Tabarani, that I have never seen anyone pleading in my whole life, he said, I've never seen anyone pleading more than the Prophet was pleading on the night of Badr. So Ibn Mas'ud is saying the amount of pleading and begging throughout the whole night. He said, I've never seen anybody pleading that type of, of, of pleading uh, other than the Prophet on the uh, night of Badr. And the question arises, did he go to sleep at all? And there's a little bit of a discussion amongst Ibn Kathir and others. Did he go to sleep at all? Ibn Kathir says he did doze off. He did doze off. And it was in this dozing off that Allah showed him the dream. What dream is this? It is referenced in the Quran. It is referenced in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذْ يُرِيكَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنَامِكَ قَلِيلًا Again, Surah Al-Anfa' That Allah showed them to you, them meaning the Quraysh, to you, as being very small in number. You saw their army as being very small. وَلَوْ أَرَاكَهُمْ كَثِيرًا If he had showed them to you كثير, as much as they were, لَفَشِلْتُمْ وَلَتَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ You would have despaired. And you would have began differing with, e with each other. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ سَلَّمْ But Allah protected you. Allah protected you by not showing you the real quantity, by giving you a boost of confidence. Now, not showing the real quantity, uh, this is not misinformation. Because if there are a hundred people and you see ten of them, these are ten. They're not, there's ten out of the hundred. If Allah were to have shown a hundred and fifty, this is incorrect information. Right? Allah showing some of the people and not all, there is nothing incorrect over here because Allah never does anything incorrectly. Allah says, Woman astaqwin Allah haditha, who speaks the truer than Allah? So Allah Azawajal did not tell the Prophet, you're seeing the whole army. Rather, he showed him a dream. And the dreams of the Prophets are true. And so the Prophet saw a section of the army. And this section is a correct and valid and true section. So when the Prophet woke up, he felt a surge of confidence. Right? And that was the goal of the, to give him that comfort. To give him that search. Allah knows he's going to be victorious. So before the victory, he's made feeling optimist. Uh, the, the optimism is there. And this is of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah azza wa jalla showed him uh, their quantity to be fewer than they actually were. And as the uh, sun rose up and they have prayed uh, Salat al-Fajr, the Prophet is now starting to align the Muslim army, and he did a tactic that was never done before amongst the Arabs. This tactic that we all know of, but amongst the Arabs, they did not have this tactic. The Arabs of old, they had the tactic of Al-Farru wal kar Al-Farru wal kar And Al-Farru wal kar the best way to describe this is, you can just imagine, uh, they, they, they do a, a, a attack, basically in circles if you like, right? They go out and they attack the army, and then they come back and they recuperate. And then they go out and they attack and they come back and they recuperate. Al-Farru wal kar means they go in batches and they come back. And they go in batches and they come back. This is Al-Farru wal kar 
The tactic of the Prophet is the modern tactic that we are all used to, and that is military battalions marching in rows. All of them in rows. And Allah Azza wa Jal references this uh, in the Quran. Inna Allah yuhibbu al-ladhin yuqatunna fi sabilihi saffan ka'annahum bunyanu marsus. Of course, uh, modern military maneuvers, we all know that that is the most effective way. That you have rows upon rows, literally, and all modern uh, you know, armies, what do they do? They learn to march in rows. This tactic was not known to the Arabs. This was not practiced by the Arabs. But Allah Azza wa Jal taught our Prophet some this tactic, and this is now the standard tactic of all armies in the world, and that is to have ranks and rows and files. The entire army should be in rows. And of course, now in, in, in the Battle of Badr, they didn't have all of these weapons, uh, they only had some of them, but of course e eventually what, what, what should be done is that the front row is going to have the javelins and the spears. And the back row is going to have the bow and arrow. And then the middles are going to have the swords, right? Now, in the Battle of Badr, they had some of these weapons, but not enough to really form a proper battalion. Nonetheless, they did what they could. And that is to have the, the, those who had spears were right in the front, and the people with the, the swords were the bulk, and everybody had a sword. Swords were what you all had. Uh, and then, uh, bow, they had a few bows and arrows, and so the bows and arrows were put at the back, and that is, of course, all of this, the Prophet did not go through any military school. But it's something that Allah Azza wa Jal just blessed him with, this intuition of, of how to arrange the army. Uh, and... This, of course, worked out for the betterment of the Muslims. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ was walking between the rows, straightening them like he straightens the rows for salah. Like literally having them in absolute straight lines. Again, I pause here. This is exactly what modern armies do, where they teach their soldiers, their infantry, to march such that psychologically they're marching Yani literally, bunyanu marsus. Literally, like Allah says, bunyanu marsus. And this is something, amazingly, the Prophet had never seen this. He had never experienced this. But it is something that, because he is Rasulullah SAW, it is simply coming to him. So he's marching between the, the rows and the ranks. And he had a stick that he was tapping people to make them completely straight. And there was a uh, Sahabi there who's, uh, who was standing in front of the line. He wasn't standing in the line. He was incorrect in his position. And so, and his name was Suwad. And so the Prophet ﷺ poked him in the stomach and he said, O oh Suwad, go get your place in line. Go straighten your line. Straighten up, O oh Suwad. So was Sufuf. Have the line straight. And he pokes him with the, with the uh, uh, stick. Uh, Suwad says, Ya Rasulullah, you have poked me and caused pain without any cause. In other words, I didn't deserve this pain. And Allah has sent you with truth and justice. So I demand justice. <laughs> Allah has sent you with truth and justice. So I demand justice. And I need to do this basically to you as well. Can you imagine they're about to have a battle? Can you imagine? And the Prophet did not, like he's literally just poking him. I mean, come on. You know, it's just a poke. It's not like he's putting a sword or something. It's just, get your place in line. And Suwad says, I demand justice. Can you imagine any other general, right? Who would have spoken to him in this manner? Can you imagine any other person? What would they have done if a private, if an infantryman speaks in this fashion? Immediately, the Prophet ﷺ drops the stick, raises his shirt, drops it so you can pick it up, raises his shirt and says, here's Qisas. Your turn. Here's Qisas. Instantaneously he does this. Can you imagine like, Wallahi, it's the battle of Badr, you're going to be fighting the Quraysh, you're going to... But the Prophet ﷺ basically said, you have a point basically, you know, that okay, I caused you some pain, cause me the pain back. Here's the, uh, you may do Qisas. And uh, Suwad immediately uh, bowed down and hugged and kissed the skin of the Prophet that was exposed. He kissed his stomach and he hugged it. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, what is this, O Suwad? You're supposed to have poked me. What is this, O Suwad? So he said, Ya Rasulullah, you see the situation we're in. You see the situation we're in. And so if we die, if I die, I wish that my last breath or my last time be that my skin touch your skin before my death, right? Of course, he didn't die in that battle, but the point being, now this is also a genius here, right? Look at how he's thinking that when the Prophet ﷺ pokes him instantaneously, he thinks of a plot, basically, to kiss the Prophet ﷺ, to hug the Prophet ﷺ. How else is he going to do this? So, uh, the Prophet ﷺ made dua for him and uh, asked Allah to bless him. And again, yani again, this is obvious here. I mean, the ideal 
uh, role model that was set by the Prophet ﷺ in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to rights and privileges and wrongs and dhulm, everybody is the same. Kings and the peasant, they are all under the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is why the Prophet ﷺ was so literal, he said, you know, yes, you're right. I shouldn't have poked you without any reason. That you caused pain. And what is this pain? What is the poke? I mean, Wallah, you do this, we do much more to our kids and our loved ones every day, right? But the Prophet said, you're right. And instantaneously he raised his shirt and this shows us his humility, his humbleness. Uh, it shows us that this is why our religion led the world for as long as it did. That the leader and the led, the ruler and those who were ruled, they were all equivalent in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we all know of the famous stories where sometimes even the Khalifa, and when he went to the court, he was judged as being wrong. And the famous story of the Jew and Ali ibn Abi Talib, where uh, when Ali was taken to court, the judge ruled against him. Right? And Ali accepted that judgment and the Jew immediately accepted Islam and he said the, this religion that causes a judge to judge against the Khalifa has to be the religion of truth. And this is why Islam was what it was once upon uh, a time. Uh, nonetheless, so the Prophet made dua for Suad and uh, continue, uh, continued to go down and making the rows uh, straight. As the sun is rising and finally the two armies can see one another, so we can say this is probably around 7, 7.30 in the morning, the sun is just about rising here. The Prophet ﷺ saw a man hastily running back and forth, uh, not running, uh, galloping on his camel in the lines of the Quraysh. Galloping back and forth in the lines of the Quraysh. And the Prophet ﷺ said, if there is any good in the Quraysh, it is in that person. And if they have any good in them, they shall listen to him. In another version he said, if they listen to him, they shall be successful. They shall be good if they listen to him. And he said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, that, O oh Ali, call out to Hamza. Hamza was standing right in the front. Call out to Hamza and tell me who is that man and what is he saying. So Allah gave him wahi that that man is saying something good. But he didn't tell him what. So he told Ali to ask Hamza. So Ali went and marched forward and, and asked Hamza uh, to find out who is that man and what is he saying. So we infer from this that Allah told him that the man has some wise uh, words. Uh, and so the Prophet said, if they listen to him, they shall be good. Uh, and who was this man and what was he say? We'll talk about inshallah uh, in a while. Um, also when the Prophet saw the Quraysh, once again he began to raise his hands to Allah and making dua to Allah against the Quraysh. And he said, Oh Allah, this is the Quraysh. They have come against you with their pride and their arrogance, challenging you and rejecting your messenger. Oh Allah, your help that has been promised. Oh Allah, your help that has been promised. Oh Allah, your help that has been promised. I.e., I want your help that has been promised. Oh Allah, cause them to be destroyed today. So he continues to make dua even until the very last uh, minute. Let's pause here, go to the side of the Quraysh now. So there's two things happening at the same time. So let's pause here, go to the side of the Quraysh, then come back to the side of the Muslims. On the morning of the 17th, as the two armies are facing one another, the Quraysh has come late last night, so they don't really know who they're facing, meaning the size, the quantity. Right? They're still uncertain. And so they send right after Fajr most likely, when the sun is, or maybe even at dawn, we don't know an exact time, but before the armies began to meet, they send their most experienced scout. His name is Umayr ibn Wahab al-Jumahi. Umayr ibn Wahab al-Jumahi. They send their most experienced scout to go find out how large is the army of the Muslims. And so Umayr goes far and wide, maybe even circles around. But he goes around the plains of Badr alone to get an estimation of how large the Muslims are. And when he came back, he told the Quraysh, they are around 300. That's pretty precise. They're around 300 plus or minus some. But I feel that this is a huge catastrophe about to happen. They didn't ask his opinion, but he's offering his opinion. I feel there's a huge catastrophe about to happen. Young men of Yathrib, charged, eager, enthusiastic, young men of Yathrib, waiting to inflict death. A group of people who have no help other than their swords. They don't have armor. 
They don't have battalions. They don't have too many spears. They don't have too many javelins. They don't have too many bows and arrows. They literally came as an expedition with their swords. They're not armed to the hilt. And so when you're not armed and you're facing an enemy, what does that cause you? Desperation. It causes you to fight much more than you would fight otherwise. So he's saying, I'm seeing these young men and they only have their swords. They're going to be very desperate. By Allah, I don't think that you will be able to kill anyone amongst them until they kill at least one of you. You're not going to kill anyone unless they kill one first amongst you. And if 300 of you die, then what pleasure will you gain for, for, for winning? If one third of you die, what's the point of this battle? Now do as you please. So uh, Umair gave him his advice and it was an honest assessment that the, that the Muslims did not have weaponry, they didn't have horses, they didn't have armor, they only had their fighting swords, but they had a determination that you guys don't have. I sense in them fear, uh, not fear, sorry. I sense in them, uh, what's, a, what's a good word here? Bravery, not fear. I sense in them determination, is a good word here. I sense in them determination that even if you kill them, they will kill an equivalent number of you. 300 of you will die before you're able to get them. So what's the point of returning back to Mecca when your brother, your cousin, your father, when one of you is going to be dead, one out of every three of you will be uh, dead. And uh, Abu Jahl said, we didn't ask for your advice. We just wanted the quantity. We didn't ask for your advice. Who are you to tell us what to do? Uh, another person who's strongly opposed to the war. So now that they're actually facing the army, still there are people who don't want to fight. We've already mentioned in our last lesson that more than one third of the Quraysh has already returned. Right? When they found out that the caravan of Abu Sufyan was safe, more than 300 uh, people returned of different tribes. So there's already a, a, a dispute. We already mentioned that Umayyah, Utbah, they didn't want to go. That Abu Jahl had enticed them and said, look, let's just camp at Badr and sing for three days and get drunk for three days and let the people hear that we're not scared of anybody. So there's talk of war, but there's still hope there's not going to be a battle. That's the uh, position right now. Another person, therefore, who's stopping the battle is Hakim ibn Hizam. Hakim ibn Hizam. Hakim ibn Hizam, his son was a Sahabi, and his son was on the other side, Hizam ibn Hakim. So don't get confused. Hakim ibn Hizam. So the Sahabi is Hizam ibn Hakim ibn Hizam. So the father, grandfather, sorry, the son and the grandson are, men, are the same name. So don't get confused. The father is on this side, the son is on that side. Hakim ibn Hizam. Hakim ibn Hizam did not want war as well. And he went to Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah. Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah who has been not wanting war from day one. Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah who has basically tried his best that the Quraysh never fight. And Utbah who has been grudgingly coming to the army. He did not want to be here. And so he goes to Utbah. Why does he go to Utbah? Because he knows Utbah is not eager for war. And so he goes to Utbah and he encourages him to mediate a truce. How can you uh, make sure there's no battle today? And so Hakim asks Utbah that why don't you take on the blood money of the uh, Hadrami, Amr al-Hadrami, pause here, Amr al-Hadrami, he was killed in the Sariyat al-Nakhla, if you remember. He was killed in the Shahr al-Haram, right? Ashur al-Haram, yasalunuk Shahr al-Ami, qitalin fi. Remember that Sariyah where six of the Sahaba, they didn't know what to do, and then they decided to launch an offensive. One person was killed. This is al-Hadrami. And they were, uh, his name is uh, Amr al-Hadrami. And they were hyping this up a lot. And they were saying, these are the people who killed al-Hadrami. And we have to revenge the blood of Hadrami. And they attacked al-Hadrami in the Haram, during the Haram, in the area of the Haram. Right? So they're making a big deal. Wallahi, we find the same types of sloganeering to this day. That these are the people who did this and who did that. And they don't see what they themselves have done. The same type of one-sidedness. Right? Always we see this. So the Quraysh are doing the same thing. These are the people who have killed al-Hadrami. And they're making a very big deal of al-Hadrami. So there's blood now in the air. People want revenge for Hadrami. Like we have to defend our wounded and our fallen. We hear the same cry to this day. No matter what it means, we have to defend Al-Hadrami's honor. Uh, even though maybe before this Hadrami might be unknown, right? But still, now he becomes a, a, a hero. So, um, Rutba said that, okay, Rutba is a rich man, he's a noble man. Rutba said, okay, fine. If this is what's going to prevent bloodshed, I shall pay the blood money of the Hadrami. I will give it from my own pocket. That's a lot of money. 
right? I will give the blood money. You all know blood money. We don't have to go over blood money. Huh? When somebody is killed or dies, you, play, you pay blood money. And blood money is supposed to be given by those who killed. But then if somebody else gives it for peace, this was accepted by Islam and by the Quraysh before. This was accepted. For peace, if you give the blood money, then you're not supposed to fight. So uh, Utbah says, I will give the blood money. And he made a speech to the relatives of Al-Hadrami, the extended relatives of Al-Hadrami, saying that, look, I will give the blood money, stop chanting his name, basically. Stop making him to be the cause. Uh, however, when uh, the news of this reached uh, Abu Jahl, he flipped out, basically. He flipped out. Before we reached Abu Jahl, I forgot. So, uh, Hizam, uh, Hizam, sorry, Hakim ibn Hizam, I'm getting confused. Hakim himself said, take the advice of this man. Take the advice of this man. And it was at this time when Utbah said, if somebody accuses you of cowardice, this is when he said this now, if somebody accuses you of cowardice, then mention my name. And tell them that Utbah became a coward. Utbah became a coward. That you wanted to fight, and I was the one, now Utbah's leader, he's the elder, he's a senior, and he said, I was the one who became scared, go ahead and say that. As long as it's going to avoid uh, bloodshed, uh, even though you know he has to defend his honor, even though you know I'm not a coward. He's not a coward. Everybody knows he's not a coward. But he says, if somebody then blames you, you were cowards for not fighting, mention my name and say, you weren't cowards, I became cowardly and you didn't fight because of me. For by Allah, what will you gain by fighting this man? If you're able to defeat him, you will be killing your own father, your own cousin, your own nephew, your own blood. And again, this was unprecedented in Arabia. Never did one tribe kill a member of their own tribe. This is the gang mentality. How would you like it, he said? How would you like it that you are amongst the murderers of your own nephews and uncles and sons? Meaning, even if you don't kill him, somebody in your side of the army will kill your father, will kill your son, will kill your, your brother. How will you like it to see somebody who killed your own brother? Now he's evoking Jahiliyyah here. He's evoking Jahiliyyah here. That nobody could stand his tribe being murdered. Now you're saying that you're going to be murdering yourselves. And even if you physically don't kill your own relative, somebody will end up killing. And that somebody is on your side. How can you live in peace in Mecca with this man who killed your own uh, brother? So let us return and let us leave Muhammad and his companions to the rest of the Arabs. And then he gave a very profound point. If they take care of him, if they overcome him, this is what you want. It won't be at our hands. And if it is the other case, meaning he overcomes them, then surely in his izzah is our izzah as well. Meaning, isn't he a Quraysh in the end of the day? And if he wins over, then this is for our good as well. Right? And you will have an excuse that he will forgive you if he were to ever conquer Mecca. Now imagine, subhanAllah, he's thinking all of these steps ahead. That if Muhammad is successful, then alhamdulillah, that's what you want for your own tribe, to be successful. And when he comes back to Mecca, you can remind him, look, we didn't fight you that day, so forgive us. Even though he was going to forgive them anyway, as we know. Uh, and if he's not successful, let the Arabs, uh, other Arabs uh, deal with him. So this was when he was on his camel and he was going back and forth. And that is what the Prophet is seeing on the other side. And so he's saying, if they have any good, they will listen to the man on the red camel. This is the parable of the man on the red camel. This is the man who has some uh, sense in him. So, when he's going back and forth, Hakim is so happy that finally this blood money will be paid, that Hakim himself rushes to Abu Jahl. And he says, O oh Abu Jahl, uh, Utbah has agreed to pay the blood money of the Hadrami, and so let us avoid this bloodshed. And so Abu Jahl mocked Hakim, and he said, O oh, Hakim, didn't Utbah find any messenger other than you? Meaning messenger means you're a slave now? That you're, you're a servant of, of Utbah now? Didn't he find any slave, any messenger other than you? And so Hakim said, I am not a messenger to him. But this is basically my message as well. Meaning I want this as well. Uh, he, so Abu Jahl is trying to put him down by saying, Are you now a carrier boy? Are you now a telegraph boy? Didn't he find anybody other than you? And so Hakim responds back, well, if you want to know, I agree with this message. That's why I am here. 
I want I want no bloodshed as well. And of course, Hakim is also a noble uh, Qurashi as well. And so, uh, when Abu Jahl sees that two or three people are changing their minds, Abu Jahl goes to the blood brother of the Hadrami who was killed. The blood brother, not the extended family. So this is the immediate one. And he says, will you be happy to take some gold for your blood, for your, for your brother? Have you like no shame that you want to just uh, incite them now or before they change their mind? And so this young man, the Hadrami's brother, the young man stood up and he gave a passionate uh, talk about his brother and the death of his brother and, and how could they uh, basically listen to this. And uh, Abu Jahl at this point then said that, O oh, oh, Utbah, you have become a coward when you have seen the ranks of the Muslims. This is what has caused your mind to uh, to change. Now this is strange here. Utbah himself said, call me a coward. Right? When Abu Jahl called him a coward, he flipped. Even though he's saying, you call me a coward. I'll, I'll take it. But I guess he didn't want Abu Jahl to call him a coward. Right? Anybody but Abu Jahl. When Abu Jahl called him a coward, he said, uh, and... Uh, uh, this, he sent a bit of a derogatory, uh, derogatory phrase, which I'm not going to translate fully. Uh, but he said to him that, and he didn't speak to him directly, he spoke to him in the third person. He said, this person, meaning Abu Jahl, who perfumes his behind with perfume of women. So he's basically making very derogatory terms uh, about him. He accuses me of being a coward? He shall see who the real coward is. And thus saying, he called his own brother and his own son to march out with him right then and there for the Mubaraza. In other words, he acted emotionally and this led to his death. What is the Mubaraza? We're going to come to the one-on-one -on -one fighting. What is the Mubaraza? That is the one-on-one -on -one fighting. So when Abu Jahl taunted him and said that looking at the army of the Muslims has made you a coward, this made him so enraged, he immediately told uh, his brother and his son, uh, Al-Walid, to come march with him and fight the, the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims, the Mubaraza 3 to 3, as we're going to uh, come to. Now, uh, notice here as well that the Prophet ﷺ praised the wisdom of Utbah, even though that wisdom was not coming from Islamic ideals. Where was it coming from? Jahiliyyah. Why didn't he want to fight the Muslims? Tribalism. Tribalism. Right? It's not as if he's saying they are upon the truth and we are upon batil, right? He doesn't want to fight because of tribalism. But this ideal of his, of not fighting, is a good ideal. And what he is saying makes a lot of sense. How could you fight your own brother and your own cousin? And then you go home and the murderers of your own brother will be your neighbor. How could you do this? I mean, isn't this common sense, right? And so what we learn here, and it's very relevant for us here in the world that we live in. In the world that we live in, there are people that are defending ideals that might not be coming from Islam. But those ideals are good and virtuous in and of themselves, even if they're not coming from Islam. Whether it is freedom of other people, whether it is uh, the right for the government not to kill its own citizens, you know, whether it is, you get the point here, you know, there's a lot going on in, the, in, in, in America today. And there are many who are supporting causes that are not coming from the Sharia. They're not coming from qala Allahu qala Rasuluhu. But those causes are causes that are just causes, independent of it coming from the Sharia. It's, they're just causes. No government should kill its own people, ex execute them uh, without any trial. No government should send you know, drones and just f fire upon civilians. And uh, there are many people in these lands that are opposed to these policies. There's nothing wrong with us not just praising them, but getting involved with them, helping them out. Here is the process I'm saying, if there's any wisdom in this whole qawm, it's in that person there. He said it's wisdom. Here's, here, he is saying, if they have any good in them, they'll listen to this man. So, they're idol worshippers, but they still have wisdom. They still have good. And listening to this good will bring about good in them. Right? And therefore, alhamdulillah, I don't need to preach uh, to you over here, but sometimes uh, there are still people who uh, think that we should not get involved at all in the system. There are still people who say we should have nothing to do with this system because it's all uh, corrupted and faulty. And the fact of the matter is this is really not a very intelligent uh, attitude and is going to cause more long-term damage than uh, good. And so even though 
uh, his ideals were coming from Jahiliyyah, still because those ideals were good, the Prophet ﷺ called it wise ideals. And this shows us, and the whole seerah shows this to us, that a person can be good and bad at the same time. A person can be an idol worshipper and still have principles that are worthy of admiration and respect and yes, even support. Now, uh, as the Quraysh themselves are lining up, Abu Jahl stands up and makes a dua to Allah loudly so that everybody hears him. And subhanAllah notice on the one side the process of making dua, on the other side Abu Jahl is making dua. Abu Jahl stands up and makes dua to Allah and he says, and his dua was completely against him even though he did not realize it. He says, O oh Allah, whichever of the two of these armies has brought more evil and whichever of these two has cut the ties of kinship and whichever has brought the more unknown doctrines, the more strange ideas, let them meet their death today. And in all three of these counts, Abu Jahl is more guilty than uh, the Prophet ﷺ. So, the one who's bringing more evil, the one who's cutting the ties of kinship, subhanAllah, why are they fighting the Prophet ﷺ? Cutting the ties of kinship, right? The one who's bringing the new doctrine, the Prophet ﷺ is bringing the doctrines of Ibrahim. He is the original doctrines. The original doctrines of the Arabs was Tawheed. And Abu Jahl is following the newer doctrine, not the oldest doctrine. And so Abu Jahl makes dua against himself. And that is exactly what Allah says in the Quran. In تَسْتَفْتِحُوا فَقَدَ جَاءَكُمُ الْفَتْحِ That if you are asking for victory, too late. The victory has already been given basically against you. Right? In تَسْتَفْتِحُوا Here's Abu Jahl. You're asking for fatah. Too late now. The fatah has already been decided and it's not going to go to your uh, favor. And the two armies are now facing one another and the Prophet ﷺ issues a command here that certain people should not be killed. He says, certain people should not be killed if you see them. And he mentions in particular Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, his own uncle, Al-Abbas. And he also mentions Abu al-Bukhtari. Abu al-Bukhtari... Uh, Many things are narrated about him, but uh, one of the major things about Abu al-Bukhturi, he was one of the most important people to break the boycott. The boycott way, way long ago. And, uh, and he mentioned some others and he said, all of these people, they are fighting even though they don't want to. They're karihun. They have been forced to fight with the Quraysh and they are not wanting to fight and this shows us that not all enemies are the same even those in an army some of them are better than others even those who are facing the muslims uh, intending to kill them you never know somebody might not have that intention somebody might not have that full so the prophet says and because he knows because he's rasulullah he knows there's al abbas there's abul bukhturi and there's others who don't need to be uh, killed now we had mentioned that uh, uh, we had mentioned that Utbah started the Mubaraza. What is a Mubaraza? Mubaraza means uh, battle or championship, if you like. Mubaraza is an open bout between uh, specific people. And the way that the Arabs would have a war, the way that they would have a battle, is that before the two armies actually engaged one another, a few people would fight one-on-one -on -one with others. Typically, some of the... Uh, senior figures, not the actual leader, because that would be too demoralizing for any group, but the second tier, if you like, right? The second rank. They would go out and they would fight one another in order to give some moral victory to one of the two sides, to give them a boost. So this was their st style. It was called a Mubaraza. And of course, you rouse up, this is also you rouse up the, the army. You also have a whiff of blood here now that now you see somebody killed and uh, you're supposed to either want to avenge or then if, you, if your side won, then you want to go and uh, attack. And... Uh, it was uh, Utbah who was the one who started the Mubaraza. However, there was an incident that occurred before this. We don't know exactly when. Was Whether it was the night before or whether it was early morning of the 17th, the books of Sirah don't mention. But one person died the first in the whole uh, two armies. And this was uh, Al-Aswad ibn Abd al-Asad al-Makhzumi from the Banu Abd al-Asad uh, from the Makhzum from the Abu Jahl tribe. Al-Aswad ibn Abd al-Asad al-Makhzumi. And when they came to the, 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 the battlefield, and that's why uh, it seems that this happened on the night of the 16th, Allah knows best. Maybe it happened on the Maghrib time or something of the 16th. When they came and they saw that all the water had been uh, cut off, right? So they were expecting water. 
They were expecting to get some water when they saw all the water cut off. Al Aswad said that I will be the one to get some water for you, or I will die trying. I'm going to make sure I cross the enemy lines, get some water from one of the wells, and bring it back for you. And so uh, he attempted to sneak into the uh, uh, the side where there were the wells, and Hamza uh, saw him and uh, cut uh, cut off his leg, and then killed him before he reached the water. And therefore, he was true in what he said, that I will either get water or I shall die trying. Well, he died trying. And so he became the first person to be killed on the Battle of Badr, and that is Al-Aswad ibn Abdul Asad al-Makhzumi. Allahu alam whether this took place on the 16th night or on the 17th morning, we don't seem to uh, be able to verify. However, the first actual uh, precursor to the Battle of Badr was the actual Mubaraza, and this was Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah, his younger brother Shayba ibn al-Rabi'ah, and Utbah's son Al-Walid ibn Utbah. So we have two elderly people, maybe in their early 60s, late 50s type, and this is Utbah and his brother Shayba. So Utbah and Shayba are the brothers. And then Utbah's son, Walid. So Walid ibn Utbah, his father and his uncle. So this is all coming from the core of the Quraysh clan. This is the cream of the Quraysh clan, but this is second tier. Abu Jahl is first tier. Abu Sufyan is first tier. Abu Sufyan, of course, not here at Bal. This is the first tier. Utbah and Shayba, this is basically one level below them. And this was Mubarak is done between these types of people. So they marched forward with their swords to the middle of the ground. And they shouted out, who will come forth and battle us? Who will come forth and battle us? Immediately, three of the Ansar stood up. And they, they were uh, Auf ibn Afra, Mu'awwid ibn Afra, and Abdullah ibn Rawaha. Abdullah ibn Rawaha is the one whom the angels did ghusl of. Uh, on that day, we're going to talk about it in Uhud. Uh, Auf and Mu'awwid ibn Nay Afra, they were the ones who eventually killed Abu Jahl. We'll talk about their story. And they were both very young, probably 17 or 16 years old. And in their eagerness, automatically, they're the ones jumping up. So as soon as... Utbah says, who will battle with us? These three young men of the Ansar. And perhaps the Ansar felt the need to prove themselves over the Quraysh, right? So because they're all from the Ansar, the three of them. They stood up and they said, we will battle you. So Utbah said, who are you? So they said, well, we are so, so and so, so and so and so and so. So Utbah said, we have no battle with you. We have no problem with you. We didn't come to fight you. We don't know you people. Why should we fight you? We are fighting our own blood. Again, they're thinking pure jahiliyyah. They really don't even see the point to fighting the Ansar. Think about that, right? We don't even need to fight you guys. Why are you even here? Go back home, basically. Right? They don't understand the bonds of Iman. They don't understand that Iman is stronger than blood. So they're saying, we don't need to fight you. Go back, send us our own. And then they called out, Utbah called out, O Muhammad Wasallam, send us equals worthy of us. Our blood. Don't send us these Ansar or these uh, uh, Yathribites. Send us some Qurashi. Send us people worthy of us. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the one who himself assigned the three of them. So he said, Stand up, O Ubaidullah ibn al-Harith. And you, O Hamza. And you, O Ali. So he sent three of the core of the uh, Quraysh. And uh, when the three of them stood up, Utbah said, who are you? Uh, so Ubaidah said, this is Ubaidah ibn al-Harith. This is far away, they cannot recognize by, by features, right? This is Ubaidah ibn al-Harith, and Hamza said, Hamza ibn Abdul Talib. Ali said, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And so Utbah said, noble, noble adversaries, come and let us fight. This is what we want to fight about. Noble adversaries, come and let us fight. And Ubaidah was the oldest of them. By the way, who, who is this Ubaidah? This was Ubaidah ibn al-Harith ibn al-Muttalib ibn Abdi Manaf. I.e. Ubaidah ibn al-Harith ibn al-Muttalib, not Abd al-Muttalib. Muttalib is the brother of... Muttalib is the brother of... No. No. Abd al-Muttalib is called Abd al-Muttalib because of this guy. Have you forgotten the story? What is Abd al-Muttalib's name? Shayba, Shayba, white hair, Shayba, right? And Abdul Muttalib, who, who rescued him from his akhwal in Medina, in Yathrib. Muttalib rescued him. Muttalib brought him back. And when Muttalib entered the city, you're forgetting the story. When Muttalib entered the city, he had a young boy. And he didn't want to tell the people that this is the son of, this is the son of, 
the son of his brother, he didn't want to tell the people this. Why? Because he was still scared of the akhwal, the Banu Najjar. He was scared of them. So they said, is, who is this? Is this your new slave? And he said, yes, this is my new slave. So Abdul Muttalib became Abdul Muttalib. Otherwise his name is Shayba. So Abdul Muttalib is called Abdul Muttalib because of this Muttalib. So Ubaidah, his grandfather, is that Muttalib. What does that make him of the Prophet? Well, the son of his, his, his father's second cousin. His father's second cousin. Right? And he is the, uh, he is coming from the core. He is, he is uh, coming from the core. Uh, he's not Banu Hashim, by the way. Because Muttalib's brother was Hashim. Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim. He's not Banu Hashim. He is Banu Abdi Manaf. Clear? So he's one of the seniors of the Banu Abdi Manaf, not of the Banu Hashim. But still, they're all Quraysh. They're all Quraysh. So he sends Ubaidah ibn al-Halith, and he was the eldest. He was the oldest amongst them. And uh, uh, Ubaidah, is the oldest, so he automatically goes towards Utbah, and Utbah is the oldest amongst them, right? And uh, Hamza, who is the middle, he goes to Utbah's younger brother, and that is Shayba. So Hamza is the middle age one, and he goes to Shayba, the middle age one, and then of course the two youngsters are Ali on the one hand, and Al-Walid ibn Utbah on the other, right? So automatically, each one goes to somebody who's worthy of the opponent and of course common sense there's no need to by the way some of the books of hadith mention changes around here but this is ibn ishaq's uh, pairing and honestly is the only logical pairing right it's the only logical pairing that each one is by age and this is what we expect is common sense that everyone will find sign find somebody for uh, his own uh, age group and it is said that both Hamza and Ali, the younger of the two, both Hamza and Ali instantaneously pounced on their opponents and they were able to kill them without a single injury to themselves. Details are not mentioned. All we know is that both Hamza and Ali, uh, they exchanged some blows, but no blow was able to come on them and they managed to kill their uh, opponents. And as for, uh, uh, as for Ubaidah, Ubaidah, Utbah managed to slice his leg off. In the battle, he managed to slice his leg off. Ubaidah fell down, and Utbah was about to kill him. But by that time, both Hamza and Ali had finished off the other two. And so they came to the rescue of, uh, of uh, Ubaidah. And so they managed to kill uh, Utbah. And so the father, the son, and the uncle, or the, uh, the brother, if you like, all three of them died. Uh, all because of what? All because of what? Because he was insulted that Abu Jahl called him a coward. Think about how foolish that is. He was insulted that Abu Jahl called him a coward. And subhanAllah, look at Allah's qadr. These were not the worst of the Quraysh. Neither were they the best. They were not the worst of the Quraysh. But their hamiyyah, their tribalism, their, their what, do you, what do you want to call it? Like it's basically the, the arrogance of just look, my tribe, right? My tribe, whatever is my tribe, that is what is going to be done. Just because of this. Even though... Utbah was not one who wanted to fight. But when your morals are not based upon Quran and Sunnah, when your morals are stemming from anything else, even if they have some wisdom, they're also going to have some faults in them. And so in the end, all three lost their lives because of Hamiya, because of uh, overheated, if you like, uh, paganism. And Allah references this in the Quran, according to many tafsir, uh, scholars of tafsir, uh, in Surah Al-Hajj, verse 19. In Surah Al-Hajj, verse 19, Allah says, "Hadani khasmani ikhtasamu fi rabbihim." Hadani khasmani ikhtasamu fi rabbihim. These are the two uh, people who are arguing. They're arguing about their Lord, according to the majority of the scholars of Tafsir. Hadani khasmani ikhtasamu fi rabbihim is a revelation regarding these two. Mubarazas, basically. That one group has one position about their Lord, another group has another position about their Lord. And Ali ibn Abi Talib used to say that uh, I will be the first person who will, ikhtasamu means they're going to argue in front of their Lord, I will be the first person who will argue on Yawm Al-Qiyamah because I was the one who was the first to kill on Badr and this ayah came down about me. And so this is one interpretation of Surah Al-Hajj verse 19. Surah Al-Hajj verse 19. So the Mubarazah proved to be a big, oh, by the way, Ubaidah uh, was carried on the shoulders of 
uh, Ali and Hamza, and he died a few days later uh, from the effects of the wounds because his whole leg was cut off and they were not able to stop and cure that or stop the bleeding. And he was old, an elderly man uh, as it is. And so he uh, became an after effect shaheed, not in the battle, not in the battle, but because of the wounds of the battle, he eventually died uh, a few days after this. So this was a big moral boost to the Muslims that it appeared that all three of their people came back safe and all three of the Quraysh had died and of course this was just the, the, the initial victory. This was the appetizer that Allah gave to the Muslims uh, that eventually the whole victory would be theirs. And it is narrated in uh, uh, Sahih Muslim that when the Prophet wasallam was lining up the army, he once again turned to face the Qibla and he raised his hands up to the skies. And he started making dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. Oh Allah, fulfill your promise to me. Oh Allah, give me what you had promised. Oh Allah, if this group is destroyed, you shall not be worshipped on earth. The same dua he is making, uh, he was making the last night. And he raised his hands completely to the skies, i.e. not just over here. He raised his hands completely to the skies. And this is one of the three postures that we learn from the Sunnah about how to make dua. The most common posture is to put your hands out like this, straight out like this. This is the most common posture, right? And I have said many, many times, the palms have to be outwards and not inwards. This is the biggest mistake people make is they make it inwards. And you, the Prophet explicitly said, do not ask Allah from the backs of your palms. Ask Allah from the inside of your palms. We don't ask Allah like this. We ask Allah like this. The palms have to be open. This is the most common way. Sometimes the Prophet would make dua by simply raising a finger. By simply raising a finger, uh, and this is especially for dhikr or istighfar, astaghfirullah, 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 he would just raise a finger. So this too is uh, allowed for dua and dhikr. And very rarely, very rarely, he would raise his hands all the way up to the heavens. All the way up. And when you raise your hands up, you don't have your palms facing down. You literally have them facing up like this. So the palms are now facing outwards and up. Not, you cannot do this and go up, right? So he would have his uh, hands upwards and the palms are again out because you always ask Allah with the outward of your palms. So your hands are facing up and you're making uh, dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on this occasion, it is also allowed to raise your head up to the heavens as well. Otherwise, in salah, you never raise your eyes up. In salah, you never raise your eyes. But at times of extreme problem, extreme distress, then the Prophet would literally raise his head to the heavens and his hands up to the heavens like this, uh, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he kept on making dua and he kept on making uh, dua until so much so that, and he's oblivious to everything around him, that his uh, rida, his upper garment, it falls out. And he is standing there, bare uh, chested, nothing on his chest. He just has his izar, his lower garment on, and his whole chest is open. And he's making dua, and he's oblivious that his rida has fallen down. And so at this, Abu Bakr, radiallahu an, he picked up, he stood down, he stooped down, picked up the izar, and he wrapped it around the process, and he hugged him from behind. And he said, enough, ya Rasulallah, enough. Your Lord will give you as you have promised. Your Lord will give you as you have uh, promised. And uh, it was at this time, now subhanAllah over here, we notice a very profound or very beautiful uh, uh, point here. And that is that the Prophet and Abu Bakr are perfecting two different emotions, both of which should be present in the believers. The Prophet is perfecting the emotion of fear. And Abu Bakr is perfecting the emotion of hope. And we have said so many times, hope and fear are both essential. Hope and fear are both essential in the heart of the believer. And you have to have both. And each one has a time where it deserves to be more than the other. At this point in time, the Prophet ﷺ had more fear in his heart that I will, my, my dua will not be accepted. And Abu Bakr had more hope. And at this point in time, even though both are necessary, of course, fear is more appropriate because you're facing the army. Because this is the time where uh, everything will, 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 will be manifested. And so even in this, the Prophet ﷺ, of course, and he is Rasulullah, Abu Bakr is second always. Abu Bakr is manifesting 
uh, hope and the Prophet is perfecting the emotion of uh, fear. And so he hugged the Prophet from the back, he put the izar on, he lowered the hands and he said, Enough Ya Rasulullah, your Lord will give you as you have promised. And he had barely said this when the Prophet went into his uh, trance, which means that wahi is coming, right? So literally as soon as he lowers his hands, Allah's response comes, right? And this goes back to the hadith in Abu Dawood that the Prophet ﷺ said that when uh, Allah's servant raises his hands up, Allah is embarrassed that those hands come back without putting something in them, right? Allah is embarrassed. The word used is hayi, shy. Allah is shy. You know, just like when uh, a beggar comes to one of us, he keeps on begging, you just feel shy, come on, you know, let me just give him something, right? And Allah, walillahi al a'la, to Allah belongs the more perfect example. If any one of us with nobility feels shy when somebody comes and asks and asks and asks, how about Allah Azza wa Jal, how perfect is His nature? And how about His Messenger is doing the asking, right? How about Rasulullah is doing the asking? How can those hands come back without giving him something. So barely has those hands come down, except that Jibreel comes with his wahi. And the wahi, basically he closes his eyes, he appears tense, you can see that wahi is coming. And then when the wahi is lifted, uh, Ibn Mas'ud said, he turned around and it was as if his face was the moon. And when, he, when the wahi is now lifted, whatever news is happening, it has made him so happy that is, his face is now like the moon. And he tells Abu Bakr, Abshir ya Abu Bakr. You're telling me to calm down? I'm telling you, be happy. Abshir ya Abu Bakr. For indeed, the help of Allah Azza wa Jal has come. The help of Allah Azza wa Jal has come. This is Jibreel. He's pointing now. This is Jibreel. He has worn his turban and he's holding on to the straps of his horse, guiding it through the uh, valley. And Allah revealed in the Quran that. Uh, 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 that when you ask Allah Azza wa Jal, I shall help you uh, I shall send a thousand uh, angels for your help and one for every one of them. They have a thousand, I'll send a thousand. And one angel could have taken care of all of them. But Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, don't worry. When you are asking for help, I will send down one thousand angels to help you out. And the Prophet ﷺ began reciting سَيُهْزَمُ الْجَمْعُ وَيُوَلُّونَ dubur. سَيُهْزَمُ الْجَمْعُ وَيُوَلُّونَ dubur. This is of course which surah? Surah Al-Qamar. Surah Al-Qamar. Uh, that سَيُهْزَمُ الْجَمْعُ وَيُوَلُّونَ dubur. And uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab said, when he heard this verse, he said, I never understood this verse until the Prophet ﷺ recited it on the morning of Badr. What does it mean? سَيُهْزَمُ الْجَمْعُ وَيُوَلُّونَ dubur. The Groups shall be defeated and they will turn their backs and flee. Sayuhzamul Jamr, the Jamr will be defeated. dubur. They're gonna turn around and run away. Umar said, I used to ask myself, which group is this? Where will they turn their backs? And when the Prophet recited it on the morning of Badr, I knew this group will be defeated and they will turn their backs and they shall uh, flee. And uh Inshallah, the time is, I think we cannot start the next, uh, we'll just mention one thing, that one incident, and then we have to start uh, the details of the particular battles, that the Prophet ﷺ then stooped down, uh, picked up some rocks and pebbles, and he threw it towards the direction of the Quraysh, and he said, Shahatil Wuju, Shahatil Wuju, Shahatil Wuju. May these faces be cursed. May these faces be cursed, and every single person in the army of the Quraysh felt blinded. They got something in their eye. They got something in their nostrils. Even though it was one, uh, one uh, throw that the Prophet ﷺ did, and it was literally maybe half a mile or something away. You could, you know, physically it's not going to go there. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused it to go to every one of the Quraysh. They were blinded by this. And Allah references this in the Quran. وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى That when you threw, you did not throw, but Allah threw. It's a beautiful verse, right? When you threw, you did not throw, but Allah threw. In other words, you did throw, but it wasn't you that was throwing. It was Allah who was throwing. وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى And every single member of the uh, uh, Quraysh army, they, they felt themselves blinded. They had to cover up themselves. They had to uh, basically clean their nose and their eyes again. And of course, after this, the actual battle began. And inshallah, we will do that, بإذن الله تعالى, uh, next Wednesday.
And before I open the floor for a uh, question, reminder to myself and all of you, as you all know, uh, that tomorrow is the day of Arafah. And inshallah ta'ala, we should all be fasting on the day of Arafah. The Prophet ﷺ gave those blessings of the day of Arafah that he gave to no other day of the year. Uh, and uh, subhanallah, if Laylatul Qadr has been hidden in the wisdom of Allah, the day of Arafah is very crystal clear which one it is. And if uh, we have to search for 10 nights for Laylatul Qadr, Alhamdulillah, we know that the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, where they are, and what is the king of these 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, and that will be tomorrow. And it is authentically narrated that many of the Sahaba and Tabi'un and Taba Tabi'un, many, many stories, that if they were not, of course, if we were at Hajj, then we have a whole different talk to give. And may Allah protect those who are at Hajj and accept their du'as and accept their uh, troubles and tribulations and cause them to come back safe and sound and have their sins forgiven. And may the people of Hajj remember those who didn't go for Hajj as well, inshaAllah ta'ala. That's a sincere du'a we make as well. Uh, so, because we are of those who uh, are not at Hajj, some of those who would not go to Hajj, it is authentically narrated that they would spend the day of the ninth as much as possible in dua and in dhikr. And one of them said that, if I am not there in body, inshallah I hope to be there in spirit and soul. That uh, today is the day that Allah is giving all of these barakah. And so, if I, and he sp would spend the day in the masjid, this tabi would spend the day in the masjid. And he would say, if I'm not there in my body, inshallah, may my du'as be accepted like their du'as. And we know that, as Imam Malik mentions in Muatta, that never is shaitan more humiliated than he is on the day of Arafah because of what he sees of the mercy of Allah coming down. And so, if this is the case, of course, at Arafah, we are not there still Tomorrow should be a day that we should try our best to have extra dhikr, extra ibadah, uh, extra dua, uh, do what we can to come close to Allah. And of course, most importantly as well is to do the, uh, the, the, the fasting on the day of Arafah. Also, by the way, on the day of Arafah, tomorrow, we begin the takbirat for those who are not in hajj. So we begin the takbirat from the fajr of Arafah. And so after these every salah, we should be saying the takbirat out loud, the takbirat of Eid, the same takbirat of Eid. For the Eid al-Adha, they go on the 9th and the 10th and the 11th and then the 12th Asr time, that is when they stop, right? You should all know this now. 12th Asr is when they stop and then at Maghrib we don't do the takbirat. So uh, we will start the takbirat uh, after every salah. After, even if you're alone when you're in the house, you just say the takbirat after every salah. Uh, from tomorrow, we start on the day of Arafah. Uh, and then, of course, uh, announcement for the Eid, as you all know, is in the Cook Convention Center uh, at 9 a.m. And it's Friday. It's going to be jam-packed. It's a re regular work day. So please... Uh, try to get there by 8.45 or 8.40 or something. It's going to be a long line for parking. You all know that. So we're also going to try to expedite the process, but you know how it goes. We're going to play it by ear. But we understand a lot of people have to go back to work. So we cannot delay Eid too late. That's what I'm trying to say. right? No doubt we're not going to start exactly at 9. But I mean, we're not going to go too late because uh, we have to um, make sure that people get to work. Also, you need volunteers, Baranka, still? or Yes. So, uh, f after Maghrib tomorrow, we're going to have iftar over here, uh, inshallah. Potluck dinner, so don't show up except... <laughs> <laughs> if, if you cannot if you cannot bring food bring your du'as just bring your du'as inshallah uh, but it's potluck dinner so uh, try to think of varieties of dishes inshallah and bismillah let's uh, have iftar here tomorrow and then uh, from after maghrib uh, if you can spare an hour or two uh, brother Iqbal needs your help to set up uh, and uh, make the convention center uh, prepared for the Eid Salah inshallah ta'ala uh, we have a few questions inshallah bismillah so the Prophet once had only one time in his life he had Eid and Jum'ah on the same day he had Eid on Jum'ah and so he said in Khutbatul Eid that uh, whoever has prayed Eid with us does not need to come for Jum'ah but we are having Jum'ah here meaning in the masjid so if a person prays Eid the fard of Jum'ah is lifted if he comes, it's good. And the community must have Jum'ah, so every masjid will have Jum'ah. The fard of Jum'ah is lifted, but if he doesn't pray Jum'ah, he must pray Dhuhr in its place. Okay, so it is not fard to come for Jum'ah 
on the day of Eid if you have prayed Eid, uh, the Eid prayer. Clear? Okay. And if you pray Jumu'ah, then Alhamdulillah. Okay, yes. In the preparations for the battle, you know, the decision of the Mubariza and the lining of Imam up in rows and strategy, how much of a role did uh, Hamza play? I mean, he was experienced in warfare. Did he not have a prominent role or was it all Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam deciding it? So the question is, how much of a role did Hamza play in the uh, assigning of uh, tasks and roles? Again, our big problem is the bulk of these incidents are not mentioned. And believe me, I have scoured the books and tried my best to get as many incidents. And there's also entire dissertations written about Badr and about Uhud and about... So I literally have PhDs and master's dissertations just about every battle. right? So people have spent five years... Uh, you know, literally just scouring everything. Uh, and I have, alhamdulillah, most of these dissertations at home. So I go through these and I go th And unfortunately, we don't have that many riwayat. I mean, as it is, uh, can you imagine any incident? How much can you record of it? As I have said many times, you know, how much can you actually record of it? So also, when the Prophet system is there, you want to record what he's doing. So we don't really have, I mean, it's amazing we actually have the amount of details we do about what's happening in the side of the Quraysh. It's amazing we actually have this because some of those converted to Islam later on, so they're telling us what happened. It's actually a blessing from Allah that we have what happened. Otherwise, who would know uh, what's happening in the side of the Quraysh? So sadly, no, we don't know uh, what role Hamza played in, in the preparation. Allah knows best. Yes. The Fasting was part of that time? The, the fardiyya had not yet been revealed. The fardiyya had not yet been revealed. It was just about to be revealed. And this was the, uh, the, the uh, second year of the hijrah. And remember, the first year of the hijrah is when they actually uh, did the hijrah. Remember, there's no zero. Remember, when in calendars, there's no zero, right? And so, uh, this is like the, f the first full year that is coming upon them. The actual timing of the revelation of of uh, of Siam seems to have been right after the battle of Badr it seems to have been and also remember that uh, the first year of Ramadan Allah Azza wa Jal allowed those who were able to to give a fidya every day remember this Surah Al-Baqarah right fidya to ta'amu miskin that if you had the money it wasn't that fard there was much more lax Whereas the year after that, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ That's when it became. So again, all of the laws came down gradually. So Allah knows best. We don't have an exact date when the Siyam was revealed. We don't have. But because of the fact that there's no mention whatsoever of the fasting at this time, what people have inferred is that the revelation to fast came down. Aqiba means right after the battle of Badr. And this fits in perfectly to Surah Al-Baqarah overall. That most of Baqarah came down. In fact, all of Baqarah came down except for the last ayah, the ayah to Dain and that whatnot. Pretty much all of Baqarah came down the first year and a half after the Hijrah. Right? So Baqarah is the earliest Madani revelation. So some of the revelations are right before Badr, such as the change of Qibla. And some of the revelations are, are during a Badr. There's one or two ayat that reference Badr. And then uh, some of them are right after Badr. So we can say that the fasting, Allahu Alam, is right after the incident of Badr. But there's no exact date. So Allah knows best. Any question from the sisters before we break? Okay, final question from the brothers. Okay, Bismillah. We will then. Uh, we want to. <laughs> no problem. You were hesitant to ask. Well, uh, it's 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 actually a complicated issue about the uh, the ability of the Prophet, والسلام, to be a mushtahid or you know in Umur al dunya that he's uh, he can make calls in Umur dunya and he could be wrong, like the hadith of the uh, of the uh, the uh, Balah when he suggested to do something to the Balahan and failed and he said and to ma'lamu bi umur dunyakum so that's that's in an umur dunya now in umur sharia can he be a mushtahid is it possible for him or is that against the uh, so this is a deep question and it's not easy to answer and every madhab has positions about this and this is a topic of usul al-fiqh the question the brother is asking is can the prophet have a personal opinion in matters of the sharia 
he clearly can have a personal opinion in matters not related to Sharia. For example, where to put the army. This is a personal opinion in matters not related to the Sharia. Can he have personal opinions in matters related to the Sharia? Uh, the strongest opinion seems to be that Allah Azza wa Jal gave him the authority to have such opinions and if Allah Azza wa Jal did not want to agree with that position he then revealed wahi to change it. So Allah gave him the authority to legislate Sharia upon us. And that authority is binding by Allah's command. وَإِن تُطِيعُوهُ تَهْتَدُوا If you obey Him, you will be guided. Right? Examples of this, He changed His mind. Apparently, sometimes not because Allah told Him to, but He felt it was okay. And the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal allowed Him to do this clearly says and tells us that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the Prophet ﷺ is somebody whom Allah has allowed to propagate Sharia. Ah. A classic example of this is, uh, is the issue of men visiting graves. Issue of men visiting graves. The Prophet ﷺ prohibited men from visiting graves. And then he wanted to visit his mother's grave. And so he asked Allah permission. So he initially thought that we should not go to graveyards. This is his own position. And he knows it's his position. And he makes it binding on the ummah. And the ummah follows him. So the only time you enter a graveyard is to bury somebody. You go bury somebody, you get out. That's it. So graveyards are abandoned then. Then he wanted to visit Amina. And so he asked Allah permission to visit Amina. And Allah gave him permission to visit Amina. And that's the famous hadith. He went and he cried. And then he said that Kuntu Nuhitukum an Ziyaratil Kubur. Kuntu Nahitukum an Ziyaratil I used to forbid you from visiting graves. But I wanted to visit my mother Amina's grave, and Allah had allowed me to visit graves. And then he himself was crying so much. So then he said, So go and visit graves because it reminds you of death. So it's as if he himself saw a wisdom in visiting graves. It reminds you of death. And he said, Go ahead and visit graves. Right. The key point here is that nobody should say that, well then this means we don't know what is from Allah, what is from the Prophet because in the end of the day we don't care. Allah has commanded us to follow the Prophet So if Allah Azza wa Jal did not agree with the decision, He would reveal wahi for it. As we know in the case of the prisoners of Badr for example. Right? If Allah Azza wa Jal did not agree with something, He would then reveal something for it. So the fact that Allah does not reveal anything means that whatever the Prophet said that's, that's a is binding. No, but this, the, the point is still there that if Allah Azza wa Jal did not agree with any decision, He would reveal Wahi. I agree with you, there's no two situations that are exactly the same. But the point being, if the Prophet made ijtihad about anything and Allah Azza wa Jal did not agree with it for whatever reason, he would intervene and send wahi down. That's what I'm saying. And so, when it comes to the Sharia, everything the Prophet says and tells us to do is Sharia. And we don't care whether Allah specifically told him this ruling or not, because Allah chose him to be our Rasul. And Allah chose him to be our role model. And so, everything he does and says becomes binding upon us. That's what the purpose of Rasulullah is. That's what that's what Allah that is what a messenger is. Every messenger has been sent so that he is obeyed by his people. Undisputed obedience, right? Yeah, that's the point. Only by giving ita'a to him will you be rightly guided. Okay? That fala wa rabbika la yu'minun. No by your Lord, Allah may qasam by the Rabb of Muhammad. Notice he didn't have to say wa rabbika. He could have said, Fala wallahi. Fala wa rabbik. Gave qasam by the Rabb of Muhammad وسلم, to show that relationship, right? La yu'minun. They don't have iman. Hatta yuhakkimuka fima shajara baynahum. Until they take you as their hakam. What does hakam mean? Ultimate judge. 
right? About any dispute that they have. حتى يحكموك فيما تجر بينهم ثم لا يجد في أنفسهم حرج مما قضيت and then they don't have something in their hearts against what you have said. ويسلم تسليما and they submit wholeheartedly. You can't even in your heart feel why did the Prophet do that? Think about that. That goes right? against the ishtihad idea because the ishtihad idea has a possibility that he might have he might be wrong. Like I, you, I, I, you didn't hear me clearly. If his ijtihad was not agreed by Allah, what did Allah do? He reveals something. And so, and so, yeah, but in his own lifetime, it's going to come down. That's why the Sharia did go through some fine tuning. In his own lifetime, it's going to come down. And uh, there are many instances of commands being back and forth. Again, I don't want to go into dis dispute here, but according to one opinion, uh, muta was forbidden twice and allowed twice. Back and forth and back and forth, right? Another opinion says that lahm al donkeys al bighal that was also forbidden twice and allowed twice. That there is some fine tuning going on, and there are other opinions as well. Sometimes uh, somebody suggested something to the Prophet and Allah Azza wa Jalla reveals something because of that suggestion. Now it's coming from Allah Azza wa Jalla, but the suggestion came from another uh, companion. I mean, classic example is hijab. Umar was the one who said, Ya Rasulullah, shouldn't you know your wives and, and women be wearing the hijab? And Allah Azza wa then revealed, and so Umar used to be proud and say, Wafaqani Rabbi, or sorry, Wafaqtu Rabbi fi thirath, right? That I agree with my Lord in three things. So you're opening up a door which could be very complicated, but there's no need to. I understand it, it's very easy. <laughs> the bottom line is, whatever the Prophet says is Sharia. Ah. As long as there's nothing that he himself does that goes against that. That's the bottom line. And this is, all of the fuqaha basically say this. All of the fuqaha. So the issue is more theoretical. Can the Prophet have independent ijtihad? It's theoretical. Even if he did, you have to follow it. And he, do, he did. The strongest position is he did. He has ijtihad. He has ijtihad. Sure. Yes, but you, have, you are obliged to follow it. This is the strongest position. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Inshallah, we will continue next Wednesday with the Ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. So we're today, inshallah, going to uh, discuss the actual gist of the Battle of Badr uh, or the incidents that we have narrated about the Battle of Badr. And in our last few uh, lessons, we had mentioned the precursors to the Battle of Badr, the, arm, the, uh, the armies lining up, the prophets are making dua, the issue of khawf and raja between Abu Bakr and the Prophet Sallallahu all of this has been mentioned. Now, the problem comes with the actual battle is that you cannot describe a battle between hundreds of people except with specific stories between individuals. Right? It's not possible to describe an entire battle. These are the old style battle where you're one on one. So what we have is a series of small incidents, that's all that we know, maybe 10-15 incidents of specific battles between two people, right? And this is our narration or this is our version of the Battle of Badr. And this is of course, uh, we want to have much more details, but unfortunately we don't have uh, most of these details recorded. What we have is literally probably around 15 stories and that is about it. So. Let us begin with, and again, another problem comes chronologically. How do you put these stories together? Again, it's almost impossible. So with all of these caveats and disclaimers, let us begin with the stories that we do have narrated about the Battle of Badr. So of the stories that definitely must have occurred at the very beginning is the story of Umayd ibn al, uh, Umayd ibn al Humam. Uh, Umayd ibn al Humam. Uh, and Umayr ibn al-Humam, he became uh, a shaheed in this battle, one of the few, literally around 13 or 14 Muslims who died. He was one of them and one of the earliest. So when the mushrikun started running towards the Muslims and the Muslims are also charging forward, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, قُومُوا إِلَى جَنَّةً عَرْضُهَا كَعَرْضِ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ Stand up and go and fight. قُومُوا Stand up and embrace a heaven that its width, its ard is like the heavens and the earth, right? Baina samai wal ard. As much as the heavens and the earth distance, this is the width of one Jannah that you will get. And so, uh, Umayr at that time was preparing for battle and he was just eating some dates to strengthen himself. And so when he heard this, he said, Bakhin Bakhin. And Bakhin Bakhin means to trivialize something. Bakhin Bakhin, it's not used anymore in common Arab vernacular, it's one of those classical phrases. But it basically means, 
like this, like something to trivialize, you know, you'd, in our vernacular. So the Prophet said, Ma, what, what do you mean? And how are you trivializing this? And so uh, Umair said that what I mean, Ya Rasulullah, is a Jannah whose ard, whose width is between heavens and earth. If this is the, the truth, then what use is it to remain living here? I want to be of those people of Jannah. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, Anta min ahliha, you are of those people. You are of those who will get that Jannah. And so when he heard this, he threw away the dates and he said, if I live long enough to finish these dates, then it is too long of a life. If that's what I'm gonna get, then I really don't need to finish these dates, right? And so he threw the dates away and he stood up and he charged into the army and he met his uh, shahada and he's one of the handful of Muslims who died in the Battle of Badr and so he has a very great honor because the Badriyun as it is are the elite of the Sahaba, right? The people of Badr. And then to die a Shaheed in Badr, this is a handful of people and he is uh, the first and the most uh, uh, foremost amongst them. Uh, it is also narrated that when the army began to charge, the Prophet wasallam said, do not Throw your arrows on them until they come within distance. Keep your arrows, don't be impatient. Then when they come, shower them with arrows. Shower them with arrows, but save some for later on. So he's commanding the archers what to do. That when they come close, send, spend most of your arrows, but not all of them. Leave some for later on. And in one version at Abu Dawood, he said, do not unsheathe your swords until they are right upon you. In the meantime, Concentrate on arrows and on looking at the enemy. So be prepared until the very end, then unsheath your sword. And at some point in time, again, we don't know exactly when, perhaps now or perhaps before this, he picked up that handful of dust, as we had said, and he threw it in the in the uh, faces of the mushrikun, and he said, shahat al wuju and shahat means uh, uh, that it, not just to, to to die, but really to be cursed, right? Shahat al wuju may these uh, faces be cursed. Uh, and it is narrated that every single one of the mushrikun, without exception, he was blinded for a while, he had to rub the dust out of his eyes because of this one handful of dust that had come. And we can, again, it is not explicit, but it would make sense that this occurred right when they're charging upon the Muslims. Right when they're very before the, 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 the meeting of the Muslims, this would make the most logical sense, but the riwayah don't mention when this took uh, place. And Allah mentions this in the Quran as we said, that you did not throw when you threw, but it was Allah Azza wa Jal who uh, threw. And of the uh, specific incidents that we know of, the Prophet himself, did he fight or not? This is a bit of a controversy. Did he fight himself or not? This is a bit of a controversy amongst the earlier scholars. And the majority opinion is that the Prophet generally speaking, did not fight in most of the battles, but in Badr he did fight. That in most of the battles, he was a military commander, and military commanders by and large do not fight. They, uh, they maintain the order and they uh, make sure you know, which troop goes where. As for the Battle of Badr, it appears to be by based on one or two narrations that he was physically uh, fighting along with making dua in the tent. So what Ibn Hajar and others uh, uh, opine is that he would fight and then he would make dua, and then he would fight and then he would make dua. So he was alternating between his tent, which was the tent that was set up to be the base, if you remember, we talked about that last week, and then he was also in the front of the fields. And they base this on a narration of Ali ibn Abi Talib, uh, which is narrated in Muslim Imam, Imam Ahmed, where Ali said that on the day of Badr, uh, we, uh, we saw that the Prophet wasallam was the closest of us to the enemy. And when the fighting got tough, we would seek protection through him, i.e. by coming close to him. And this shows us that he was fighting bravely and they wanted to be in that vicinity where the Prophet ﷺ was. And Ali ibn Abi Talib said that he was the most aggressive of all of us on that day. He was the most brave, he was the most courageous. Now, Ali himself narrates, Ali himself narrates that uh, he came to see what the Prophet was doing in his tent. And he found him in sajda. 
saying, Ya Hayu, Ya Qayyum, Ya Hayu, Ya Qayyum. And he's making dua. And so Ali left him and went back to the front. He came back again and he still found the Prophet in Sajda. And so Ali left him and he, and he fought again. Then he came back for the third time and he found him for the third time. And then when he went out, Allah wrote victory for them. Uh, so uh, he didn't come back for the fourth time. So Ali narrates both of these narrations that he was in the tent and he was in the front of the uh, army. And therefore the only way to reconcile is that the battle of Badr would have lasted a few hours, at least four or five hours in the entire thing. And therefore the Prophet ﷺ was alternating. The battle of Badr began as we said, everybody should know the date. What is the date of the battle of Badr? 17th of Ramadan, which was a Friday, which was a Friday. 17th of Ramadan, which is a Friday. And so the battle began basically uh, early or early morning. We can say roughly 7 a.m. after Fajr. It would have lasted up until midday, a few hours. So the Prophet is alternating between the front of the army and between uh, beseeching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Abu Bakr would stay with him wherever he went. And that, is, and that is what Ibn Kathir and that is what Ibn Hajar, they both mentioned. That the Prophet and Abu Bakr, they kept on going to the front and then making dua. And Abu Bakr was guarding him when he was making dua. Then they go to the front and back and forth. We also know from the Quran and from the Sunnah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down exactly 1,000 angels. Exactly 1,000 angels. Allah says in the Quran, إِذْ تَسْتَغِيثُونَ رَبَّكُمْ فَاسْتَجَابَ لَكُمْ أَنِّي مُمِدُّكُمْ بِأَلْفٍ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ مُرْدِفِينَ That when you were asking Allah for help, remember, when you were asking Allah for help, فَاسْتَجَابَ لَكُمْ And Allah responded, أَنِّي مُمِدُّكُمْ That I will help you. Mumid, I will help you. And this, we're going to get back to this verb. It's a very deep verb that Allah uses. I will help you. Not you sit back and do nothing. I'll take care of it. No. You do the job and I'll complete it for you. This is what amadda means, right? Amadda literally means you've done your job and you've just been pushed to get to the end. That is a very deep point here that we're going to come back to. So Allah says, Anni mumiddukum. I shall help you with 1,000 angels. Uh, murdafin, it means that coming one after the other in hosts. They're going to be coming uh, cavalry after cavalry. That They're all going to come to help you. And Allah says in the Quran, إِذْ يُوحِي رَبُّكَ إِلَى الْمَلَائِكَةِ That when Allah inspired the angels, أَنِّي مَعَكُمْ I am with you. So Allah is telling the angels, Go forth, I am with you. أَنِّي مَعَكُمْ فَثَبِّتُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Make the people who believe firm. And so they were made firm, their hearts were made firm, the soil was made firm, their weapons were made firm. So the angels, notice here, they helped the believers. The believers are raising the sword, the angels the one who lowers the sword. We'll see this now, right? The believers do something with their hands, the angels complete the action. Not that the believers did nothing and the angels took the charge of them. No. Allah says in the Quran, فَثَبِّتُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا سَأُلْقِي فِي قُلُوبِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا الرُّعْبِ I will throw fear, uh, terror, into the hearts of those who have done kufr. سَأُلْقِي فِي قُلُوبِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا الرُّعْبِ فَاضْرِبُوا فَوْقَ الْأَعْنَاقِ وَاضْرِبُوا مِنْهُمْ كُلَّ بَنَانِ Then go and strike. This is a command to the angels. Go and strike. At the unuq, at the neck, right? And also at every single, uh, anan means joint or fingertip or basically really every, every joint is really what is meant here. That every joint go and strike. Now imagine Allah is telling the angels, Allah is telling the angels that go and strike them at their necks and at their every joint. And I am with you. How much more help do you need? This is the angels Allah Azza wa Jal is, inspi is inspiring. And a number of stories have been narrated that the Sahaba saw physically uh, the angels, that the Sahaba saw the angels. Of course, we already mentioned last lesson, last Wednesday, that when the Prophet lowered his hands after Abu Bakr put them down and hugged him and said, uh, enough Ya Rasulullah, your Lord has answered you, right? As soon as he lowers his hand, he smiled as bright as the moon as the Sahaba said. He was uh, uh, literally it's like the moon. And then he said, Allah has answered our prayer. Here is Jibreel turbaned and armed. Here is Jibreel turbaned and armed. He has come down with the angels to help us. So Jibreel alayhi salam, the Prophet salam, informed them that he had seen them. Notice as well, subhanAllah, uh, turbaned and arms and, and, and riding a horse. All of this is mentioned. Notice even the angels have weapons. Even though they don't need weapons. They're angels. Even the angels have horses, which re leads to the interesting theological question. There are animals within the ilm al-ghayb that... 
have nothing to do with us, right? We know for a fact that even the jinns have animals, right? Bahimatul jinn, we have. Dabbatul jinn, we have. That even the jinns in their world, they have creatures as well. So Allah has created creatures way beyond our imagination. So even the angels have a type of horses. And the angels are armed and they have their swords, even though they don't need them. But all of this, we're going to come to the wisdom. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to show us that we need to put in the effort even even the angels need to put in the effort. They don't just say, Kun fayakun. Only Allah says, Kun fayakun. Even the angels, they need to put in the effort and then they see the results of that uh, effort. Of the stories that is mentioned, uh, Ibn Abbas narrates that, uh, and this hadith is in Sahih Muslim, that uh, one of the Sahaba was in hot pursuit of one of the, the, the mushrikun and he heard the sound of a whip coming from uh, in front of him. You can, you know the sound of the whip, that flash that comes. He heard the sound of a whip and he heard a rider cry out, but he couldn't see. He heard a rider cry out, Aqbil Hayzum, go forth Hayzum. Hayzum is the name of an animal. It's not, you know the animals have names, as you know, people give names to their animals. Hayzum is the name of a horse. And so he heard a rider calling out to his horse, which shows us even the angels name their animals, right? He calls out to their horse, go forth and attack Hayzum. And he saw in front of him that the mushrik that he was about to attack, when the sound of the whip came, his nose was simply chopped off. Without the, the, the Muslim lowering the sword. So the sword is up. Before he can lower it, the angel has done his job for him. And this is again the key point here, that the, the angels helped the believers. Every action they began, the angels completed it. Again, this is a very deep point here that Allah Azza wa Jal showed that you need to get to that point. You need to raise your sword, then I'm going to help you, right? You're not going to sit in the tent and let it happen by itself. And uh, uh, and when he came and he told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, that this, is, this happened to me and the, the, the man was killed by circumstances beyond my understanding, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you have told the truth, qad sadaqta. I'm not accusing you, Allah. you have told the truth. That was a help that Allah had sent down from the Sama al Thalith, the third Sama. You know, there are seven heavens, Saba Samawat and Tibaqa, right? So the third of those heavens, that angel is from that heaven. And he came to help you uh, at this occasion. Uh, and once uh, when Al Abbas was brought as a prisoner of war, we'll talk about the story of Abbas, a very interesting story. That's next Sunday, uh, next Wednesday, inshallah. When Abbas was brought as a prisoner of war, and Abbas was a strong man. And Abbas was a, a warrior. And the Ansari who bought him was a stout, short, and he not a very strong person, right? And so uh, Abbas was like very angry. And when he got to the Prophet, this is of course his, his, uh, the uncle of the Prophet when he got to the Prophet before even the Ansari can say anything, he said, Ya Rasulullah, this man did not capture me. Because he's embarrassed. Like he's such a big man. And then here's this little Ansari and half his size or something. And he's, you know, bringing him as a ring. This man did not capture me, right? And the man was saying, no, I captured him. Look, I have him in my hand, right? I'm the one who captured him. And so Abbas is looking around, trying to see, where is this man? He said, no, Ya Rasulullah, the man who captured me, he had parted his hair. And he was a, the most handsome man I have ever seen on a beautiful horse. Black and white mixture, so Adlaj, it's a, the most beautiful horse of theirs, black and white mixture, and he's trying to look around, he goes, but I don't see where he is. You know, I'm trying to see, this is the man, the big man, not this teeny guy, the big guy captured me. I want to, you know, make sure you guys understand, this guy did not capture me, right? So, uh, the Ansari said, no, Ya Rasulullah, I was the one, I was the one who got him. And so the Prophet said, uh, be quiet, for Allah helped you with a Malakun Kareem, a noble angel. Right? That you are not able to capture Al-Abbas by yourself. You were aided. You are right in your own perspective that you're running behind him and then you think you got him. But in reality, Allah Azza wa aided you by a, uh, by a Malakun Kareem. Uh, now, uh, remember we had said before the battle that the Prophet ﷺ had specified uh, two people and some versions say that he also specified uh, the children of Hashim, Banu Hashim, which is basically his uncles and his immediate cousins, right? That he said the Banu Hashim have been forced to come and fight. They did not want to fight. And by the way, this probably also explains Abu Lahab is still in Mecca, right? Abu Lahab is his uncle. 
and he did not come. Uh, and they excused him be, being the senior of the Banu Hashim. But the youngers of the Banu Hashim, the Prophet said, Ukrihu al qital That they were forced to fight and they did not want to fight. So he knows this. And it's not just his family. He also mentioned, who can remember the, the other Sahabi? There's one more Sahabi he mentioned. Or at this point, not a Sahabi, excuse me. A Qurashi. Not a Sahabi. He mentioned one more Qurashi. No names. You guys are all taking notes. Ha, Abu al-Bukhtari. Abu al-Bukhtari, what was special about him? What did he do? Why, would he, why did he get this honor? Why did he get this honor? He was, he, he helped them in the, in the Sha'b of Abi Talib. He helped them in there by sending food and water. And most importantly, he was one of the main people who caused this treaty to be finished. Right. So notice here, the Prophet ﷺ, the evil treaty, you know, the, the boycott, the boycott, he broke the boycott. Notice here, the Prophet ﷺ is repaying a favor. Think about it. That not all the Quraysh are the same. And those who have done good for the Muslims, they will be remembered. They will be remembered. And this is something multiple times that throughout the seerah. And this clearly shows us that we as Muslims living in a non-Muslim land, we look at the sympathetic non-Muslims, we see who's supporting the cause of freedom, the cause of, of, of you know, letting every religion practice its faith, and we do not treat them the same way that we treat Islamophobes. This is a clear cut from the seerah, that those who treat us with justice and dignity and kindness, we have to return the favor, and there's nothing wrong with this. There are some isolationist, narrow minds amongst us who say, all kuffar this and all kuffar then wallahi this is so backward I can't believe people are still saying this especially after all that has happened no not all kuffar some kuffar yes they have kufr, but they also stand for truth and justice right their kufr does not prevent them kufr means they they are not Muslims they believe in something else but their kufr does not prevent them from standing up for truth and Abu al-Bukhturi was one such person Right? And Mutlib ibn Adi was another person. And we're going to come to Mutlib ibn Adi as well. In the Battle of Badr, he's mentioned, even though he's dead. Mutlib ibn Adi has been dead for a while, a few months, but he will be mentioned in the Battle of Badr. And we'll come to this again. Uh, and so uh, Abu al-Bukhturi and Abbas and the Banu Hashim have been so, said that they will not be uh, killed. Uh, yet another, uh, there's many of these reports, yet another unnamed Ansari, we don't have his name, he mentions to his son, and so his son then says, my father said, and his father was a Sahabi, and uh, a Sahabi who is unknown does not affect the validity of the Hadith chain. It's a bit of an advanced point here. But if you don't know the name of the Sahabi, the chain is still authentic. Whereas if you don't know the name of the second or third or fourth person, then the, for sure the hadith is weak. As for the Sahaba, if somebody says one of the Sahaba said, or if somebody says my father the, was a Sahabi, and we don't know his name, we don't care because jihadat uh, al-Sahabi la tadur. That the, 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 un, the, the, the fact that a companion is unknown does not affect the chain. So he says that his father told him that uh, when he was pursuing the enemy or fighting with the enemy, before he could lift his sword, he saw the man fall dead in front of him with a sword wound. So before he could actually do this, the final blow, the man actually dies uh, in front of him. So he said, my father knew that he was being helped, that there is some divine help uh, coming. There's also a beautiful uh, hadith in, in Musadraq of Al-Hakim that uh, Zubayr ibn al-Awwam, and what did the Prophet call Zubayr ibn al-Awwam? He is my Hawari. He is my helper. Every prophet has a Hawari and Zubayr is my Hawari. And Zubayr is the father of? The father of? Abdullah ibn Zubayr. And his wife is? Asma bin Abi Bakr. These are now, these are things you should now begin to piece together. There's a lot of names, but you should learn to piece them together. Zubayr ibn Awam, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, he is my Hawari, my helper. So it is mentioned in the Musadraq of Al-Hakim that Zubayr ibn Awam was wearing a yellow turban on the Battle of Badr. And therefore, to imitate him, all of the angels came down in the same garment as a Zubayr, including the yellow turban. And this is a great honor for Zubayr ibn Awam. That all of the angels came in the, in the, in the mannerisms or in the, in the clothes of Zubayr ibn Awam. Whatever he was wearing, as an honor to him, all of the angels came wearing the exact same uh, garments as well. And these angels that came down, these thousand angels, Allah chose them himself. And Allah blessed them through the battle of Badr. Jibreel once asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as the Prophet told us later on, Jibreel came to me and asked me, what, and this hadith is in Bukhari, what do you think 
the Muslims. What do you think of those who participated in Badr? So the Prophet said, we think they are the best of all of us. We think they are the best of all of us. So Jibreel said, and similarly, those who participated in Badr from the Mala'ika, we too think the same. So Allah blessed, so Badr is so important that Allah blessed those thousand angels. And this shows us that even the angels have ranks, not all of them are the same. That the angels have their own internal ranks, and the elite of them are those who participated in, uh, in uh, Badr. Uh, now, uh, here we, I want to comment here, I've referenced this a number of times. Why did Allah Azza wa Jal send a thousand angels when frankly one angel could have done, ju done the job? Right? I mean the angels cannot be seen, they can quickly go instantaneously and do, uh, and do everything right then and there. And uh, when Allah Azza wa Jal wanted to destroy uh, the people of, of uh, Lut, it is said that Jibreel simply took his wing, he came in his real form, as big as the sky can see. And he took his wing, one tip of it, and he just hit the ground next to the, uh, the, the, the cities. And the cities, as a reaction to that, they flipped all the way up and then they came crashing down. Right? This is in our reports. This is exactly what the hadith say, that he just touched, he hit the ground, taraba, he hit the ground with his wing. With one portion, he has 700 wings. With one portion or one of those wings, and that was so powerful that the whole cities were basically destroyed. So then why does Allah Azza wa Jal send 1,000 uh, angels when one of them could have done the job? And again here we get to the simple fact that throughout the Quran and Sunnah the entire message that is given is you don't get anything for free. Not even Jannah. You're not, not going to get it for free. You have to put in an effort and even if that effort is not worth the result, Jannah is not worth our actions. Right? We don't earn Jannah. Right? Even if the result is much more priceless than your price that you pay, you need to pay some price. Allah Azza wa Jal will look at your effort and not at how much you've done, the quality. Allah will look at the quality and not the quantity. You need to do something. And therefore, when those Sahaba, the 300 of them, are literally going and walking into death. They're literally taking their swords out. Then Allah will send those angels, as we said, to complete each one of them what they're doing. The angels did not fight single-handedly. They didn't just go and get rid of the Quraysh while the Sahaba did nothing. No. They were mukammal. They were mumid. They were amadda. Which is, we gave so many examples, right? Every time we hear of an incident, the Sahabi is doing something. Then the angel finishes it off. Think about that. Never do we hear of an incident where the angel does the whole chore for the Sahaba. You see the point here, right? You have to, of course the Arabic is Akhla al-Asbab, you have to follow the means to get to the end. Right? You have to traverse the path to get to the destination. The destination is not going to be picked up and brought to you. You need to get there and even if you're not able to, Allah will bless you. But you need to put in the dedication to do so. I mean, subhanAllah, even uh, Maryam alayhi salam, when she's all alone, you know, and she's starving and she cannot do, she's in labor, right? And everyone who has children knows what labor means, right? Especially her sisters. She's in labor. She's hungry. And Allah says, don't worry, I'll bless you. But you need to shake the tree. You need to shake the tree. The dates did not just fall from the skies into her lap, right? She cannot stand up, so Allah says, okay, do what you can. What can you do? Right? Even Maryam, in that state, and she is the single best, you know, stafaki ala nisa al alameen, right? Still, she doesn't get it for free, right? She has to do something, and that is push the tree, shake the tree, and it will then fall onto you. Allah could have said, don't worry, I'm sending it to you. But again, here's the, 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 the point here. And subhanAllah, if this is the case for people like Maryam, when she's giving birth to that miraculous child, Jesus Christ, how about me and you when we want something? Should we be sitting at home and saying, oh, if it's decreed, Allah will give it to me? No, this is not the right attitude. Yes, if it's decreed, Allah will give it to you, if you strive to get it. Yes, Allah will give it to you if you strive to get, if you take the asbab, if you follow the means to, act, to actually uh, get there. And again, this is one of the most important lessons of Badr. One of the most important lessons that the victory was ultimate. It was a miraculous victory. Yet still it was not given until the Muslims went the whole nine yards.
They're in the thick of the battle. Then Allah's help comes down. And, and they see the help, right? That's tawakkul, isn't it? They have to get right to the battle. They're literally amongst the swords. They put their trust in Allah. When they put their trust in Allah, just like Ibrahim and, and Ismail, right to the very end, you raise that knife. Ismail is on the ground. Right at the very end, then Allah says, okay, you passed the test. So what Allah wants to see from us is giving it our utmost. Once we give it our utmost, then Insha'Allah Ta'ala, Allah Azza wa Jal will give us what we, uh, what, what He has willed and what we deserve uh, to get. And again, clearly their numbers were less, their quality was less, but when they showed that determination, all of this was uh, neglected and ignored and they got what they wanted. Now, Ibn Abbas also n says something very interesting. He said, Never did the angels actually fight with the believers except on the day of Badr. In every other occasion, they merely were backups. They merely were present, but they didn't physically fight. Now, this is Ibn Abbas's uh, uh, opinion, and his opinion about these matters is very big. Fi ilm al we take it. As we said many times, when a Sahabi says something about ilm al ghayb, we take it to be a hadith of the Prophet. So, these are some stories about the, uh, the angels. Many other stories are mentioned as well. Of those stories is uh, Ukasha ibn, uh, it's called Mihsan or Muhsan, both are allowed. Ukasha ibn Mihsan, Ukasha ibn Muhsan. Uh, Ukasha, the story of Ukasha. Uh, Ukasha radiallahu an. Ukasha was fighting with his sword and he hit the armor of somebody and it broke. And so he went back to the process of complaining and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I only have one sword. What am I going to do now? He had no other sword. And so the Prophet ﷺ picked up some some twigs and said, here, go fight with this. And so Ukasha took those twigs and he went into battle. And as soon as he lifted it, it became the best sword he had ever seen. And he kept this sword with him and he used it in every single future battle until he died a shaheed against Musaylam al kadhab He was fighting in the wars of the Ridda and so Ukasha died a shaheed. Once again, look at the tawakkul here. The Prophet gives him twigs. He says, go fight with this, right? He doesn't say, Ya Rasulullah, you told me to fight with this. What do you mean? No. This is what you call Iman bil ghaib. This is what you call Iman. The Prophet gives him some branches. Go fight with this. The Prophet said, Go fight. Khalas, sami'na wa ata'na. He takes it. He walks into the battle. He doesn't. I mean, can you imagine? Like twigs, what am I going to do? Right? But again, the Prophet said, Go fight with this. I'm going to go fight with this. And raises it, and lo and behold, it becomes. One of the best swords that has ever seen it. It retains its sharpness and its, its, and its glamour, everything, till the very day that he dies. And it is said that they buried him with that sword. It's one of those legends. Allah knows how true it is, but they didn't want to keep it. And it makes complete sense that that is a blessed sword for him. So they, they buried it with that sword. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows uh, best. But again, it, it, this shows his tawakkul and his iman uh, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, of the stories that is mentioned in a, uh, somewhat detail, uh, one of the highlights of Badr is the killing of Abu Jahl, uh, Amr ibn Hisham, Abu Jahl. Uh, and of course we know that the Prophet ﷺ said he is the Fir'aun of this Ummah. He is the Fir'aun of this Ummah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that he be killed by two young teenagers. Two young teenagers, most likely they were 16 and 17 years old, right? Most likely they were very young. And in this there is a lot of hikmah as well. That this great tyrant is going to be killed by people that are, frankly, you know, it's a bit demeaning for him to be killed by kids, right? Think about that. Somebody like Abu Jahl, for him to be killed by these teenagers, he wasn't killed by a mighty warrior. It's another humiliation for him. And of course, it's an honor for, uh, for them, and it's an honor for the Ansar, because they were both from the Ansar. And their story is mentioned in a lot of detail in Sahih al-Bukhari, and it is mentioned by eyewitnesses. Of those eyewitnesses is Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Abdurrahman ibn Auf says that when we were approaching the, the army in the Battle of Badr, I wanted to make sure that I was in good company. I was surrounded by strong men. Because you know what happens is when you're fighting one on one, if your companion finishes off the other, he can then come to help you. Right? And vice versa. So this is one on one battle is very different than the type of battle we have. It's a very different type of battle. We've all seen the types of movies where they show the chaos that takes place, right? So Abdurrahman says, I wanted to make sure I had strong men on my side. So I turned to my right and I was disappointed to find Yani a shab, a young boy. You know, he's not a man. And then I turned to my left and I found someone just like him. You know, small, thin, scrawny. These are not people that I want 
uh, around me. So I was disappointed. I was looking for better support. Suddenly, one of them, he poked me. And he leaned, whispered in my ear, so that the other one could not hear. Turns out those two were friends, right? And they had a competition going between them. Who would kill Abu Jahl? So they didn't want the other one to know. Now they're both Ansari. And they're both young. They've never been to Mecca. They've never seen Abu Jahl. Right? These are both uh, teenagers. So one of them poked Abdurrahman. And he said, Ya Am, Hal ra'ayta Abu Jahl? Have you seen Abu Jahl before? <laughs> Abu Dharman, of course he's seen Abu Jahl. He goes, Naam, what do you want with him? So he said that I have heard that he has disrespected the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I have given an oath to Allah, a qasam to Allah that if I see him, my shadow, it's an Arabic expression, beautiful, my shadow will overlap with his shadow until one of the two of us is dead. Beautiful expression here, right? That close, yeah. That w the both shadows are not going to remain standing. We will overlap with one another until one of the two of us is dead. And so, Abdul Rahman said, if I see him, I'll, I'll tell you, don't worry. He goes, barely had I got back to my position when the other one poked me and asked the exact same question. And I told him the exact same answer. So the both of them have a competition and they don't want their companion to know that uh, they're going to be the first to get there. And so when we were fighting, Abdul Rahman said, so when he heard this, he said, I felt comforted that the two of them had spirit now. Even if they're young, they have, mashallah, tabarakallah, spirit. Uh, and so uh, when we were fighting, I saw in the distance, uh, Ibn Hajj and others mentioned that Abu Jahl was standing uh, in a grove of trees. So it was a, a type of protection. So this is the equivalent. The Prophet was in his tent. Abu Jahl is surrounded by shrubs and trees and he's basically monitoring the army. He is, of course, the main uh, leader of the Quraysh, so he's monitoring the army from there. And he was surrounded by his men and most importantly by Ikrimah who was a strong young man, Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl. And so uh, when I saw him in the distance, I said out loud to the both of them that هَذَا صَاحِبُكُمَ This is your companion, the one that you asked me about, right? The one that you questioned me, that is them. Th that is the person there. So uh, uh, he said, as soon as I said this, the both of them darted into the army to get to him. See, they're young, they're a little bit impetuously brave. This is what we expect from impetuous, rash youth, that they don't care about anybody else. They will dart through the entire army and perhaps because they were young, they were also neglected and ignored by all the people in between. Had they been seniors, they would have been recognized. Right? This is another wisdom in their being young. That they're unknown, they're kids, they, nobody even knows who they are. How are they going to get to the leader of the Quraysh? So they made their way to this grove, to this uh, secluded uh, area and now we hear of their names. Uh, the first of them is Mu'adh ibn Amr al-Jumuh. Mu'adh ibn Amr al-Jumuh. And uh, his father was of the leaders of the Banu Salama. And Mu'adh himself, he was one of the younger people who took the shahada of the second uh, treaty of Aqaba. The second Bay'at al-Aqaba, right? So we can say that he must have easily been, because if he took the Shahada, then he must have been around 13 or 14. So he must be at this time around 15, 16 years old. Right? He's one of the young, youngsters who took uh, the Shahada or the 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 the, the Aqaba, the, the Ahd uh, of the, the second treaty of Aqaba. So this is uh, Mu'adh. And he raced forward through the trees and scared that he's not going to get to Abu Jahl, he jumped with his sword to try to get the remaining distance before somebody stops him. But he wasn't able to get to the upper portion of Abu Jahl because he's still too far away. So from this we can imagine there must have been some people, there must have been an entourage. We can imagine Abu Jahl is not going to be alone. So he comes dashing forth, he jumps as much as he can, but he's not able to get to the upper portion of Abu Jahl. He with, now you can imagine the whole body is now coming down. And his whole force is in his hand. So the sword comes smashing down onto the left leg of Abu Jahl. And it completely disconnects, swipes its way off. Completely. Uh, one of the narrators says that uh, the only thing I can compare to Wallahi is how a date seed flies away from the grinder when the dates are being grinded. So you know that grindstone, the big heavy grindstone. Imagine you're grinding, grinding. One of those dates just... Phew, Fly, you know, just sparks away like that, right? So he says, the only thing that Im imagery that comes to mind, that leg just flew away like a date 
flows out of the, uh, the uh, grinder. So he manages to deal a blow, but this blow is not going to be mortal. Abu Jah is not going to die. He's going to be one-legged, uh, but he's not going to die simply from one leg being uh, amputated. And when he, uh, by the time he's cutting his leg off, Ikrimah is trying to defend his father. And so Ikrimah is also lifting his sword to protect his father. And Ikrimah's sword chops off the entire hand of Mu'ad. The entire right arm. The entire, like literally from the, from the shoulder. That Ikrim is protecting his father. So one sword hits Abu Jahl, the other sword hits the hand of uh, Mu'adh, and it cuts it off completely. Mu'adh later uh, narrates, and he lived one, one, one uh, armed for the rest of his life. He didn't have that arm. That uh, Mu'adh narrates that my arm hung to my body by a thin, uh, you know, uh, tendon or something. We don't know what it was. It's just thin skin. It was clinging to my body, and it finally got in my way in Badr. So. I put it on my foot, bent down, and then ripped it off. Well, life, one of us gets a pinprick, <laughs> we can't, we can't concentrate, huh? If one of us cuts our hand with a knife or something, Subhanallah, that's it. Qamat dunya wa qaidat. You know, we're not able to think, right? Can you imagine? This is a 17-year-old kid, and he's saying the hand began to irritate me that it's getting in my way. Right now he's using his left hand for the rest of the battle. So in order to basically get rid of it, he puts his foot on it, then yanks it off, stands up to yank it off. This is Mu'adh, subhanAllah. This is not Mu'adh ibn Jabal, this is Mu'adh the, the young uh, Ansari. And uh, Mu'adh lived a long life and he died in the Khilaf of Uthman ibn Affan. He died a natural death in the Khilaf of Uthman ibn Affan. So this is Mu'adh. The second of the two... Uh, Mu'awwid his name is. So Mu'adh and Mu'awwid, don't get confused. Mu'awwid ibn al-Afra. And Mu'awwid ibn al-Afra, his mother, uh, his mother uh, is the famous, yani, al-Afra is his mother. She was so righteous and pious and famous that all of her children were named after her. That she was such a luminary figure that the children were called basically the son of or the daughter of al-Afra. Afra is the name of their mother. And uh, Mu'awwid uh, Mu uh, was one of those who had volunteered to fight in the Mubaraza. Remember we had said that three of the young Ansar stood up? This is one of them. He had that bravery. That right at the beginning, him and his brother, uh, not Mu'ad, his brother. What? Yeah, him and his brother. The two sons of Afra were of those three. So Mu'awwid was one of those who had volunteered to fight in the Mubaraz. And the Prophet said, he initially agreed, but then they disagreed. They said, we want somebody from our blood. So uh, he told them to sit down, and he then chose the other uh, three. And uh, Al-Afra, his mother, she was a close friend of Umm Salama. Umm Salama, in fact, when the Battle of Badr is taking place, Umm Salama had moved into Al-Afra's house, just for safety, for security, for, uh, for comfort, she didn't want to be alone. So Umm Salama was living with Afra in these days, what, that Badr is taking place. And uh, uh, Al-Afra, uh, she had three sons, two of them became shaheed in the Battle of Badr, Mu'awwid is one of them. And he had a brother as well, the one that also stood up to fight, the both of them became shaheed in the Battle of uh, Badr. And Mu'awwid, we don't know exactly where his blow struck, but it also struck somewhere in the body. We don't know exactly where. He also managed to strike a blow and make his way back, and he then died a shaheed sometime later in the battle. So he also uh, gets a blow to the, pro to the, uh, to the Abu Jahl, and the both of them come rushing back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that, Ya Rasulullah, we killed Abu Jahl. Ya Rasulullah, we killed Abu Jahl. And they both get to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam roughly at the same time, and they began fighting with one another. I killed him. The other one says, no, I killed him. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, show me your swords. So they both showed him the swords, and he said, the both of you have killed him, meaning both of these wounds together will cause his death. The both of you have killed him. So the honor of killing Abu Jahl, it goes to uh, the both of them. Uh, but Mu'adh was the one who got the armor of Abu Jahl because Mu'awwid died. Now, in Islamic law, uh, the one who uh, actually kills the, 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 the enemy will get his personal possessions. This is fiqh, Islamic fiqh. Right, the actual personal belongings of the person, you will get it at the end of the battle. And so uh, Mu'awwid and, Mu and Mu'adh would have shared, but Mu'awwid died a shaheed. So then, because he's not there anymore, so then Mu'adh gets the entire, uh, uh, the armor of Abu Jahl, which was a fortune. It was a very expensive armor and his horse and his sword, all of this. The personal belongings of the one that you kill, it is given to the one, uh, the, the, the warrior who does it. This is the Islamic uh, fiqh. Uh, so, 
the both of them get the honor of killing Abu Jahl. Now, after the battle of Badr had finished, to finish up the story of Abu Jahl before we get back to the, the incident, after the, the battle had finished, uh, the Prophet is, is telling the Sahaba, go and find the body of Abu Jahl. Where is Abu Jahl? Because remember, he had been in the middle of a tree or area, so they weren't able to find him for a while. So, go and find the body of Abu Jahl. So, a number of Sahaba split out to see who would find the body of Abu Jahl, and it was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, that Yemeni shepherd, that sixth convert to Islam, the one who was humiliated many times in Mecca by Abu Jahl and by others because he was a low caste. You know how it goes in Jahiliya. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud found him and he was breathing heavily at the very last breath of life. You know, like the very death, you can see that death is on him. He's just limpless and he's about to die. He's, he's uh, still alive, he's conscious, but you can tell that he is about to uh, die. And so, uh, of course, he recognizes him immediately, and uh, he places uh, his foot on the chest of Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl is lying on his back, he's about to die. He places his foot on the chest of Abu Jahl and says that, Do you finally admit that Allah has disgraced you? Oh, Adu Allah. Do you finally admit that... It's over, we have that basically we've won, that Allah has disgraced you. And to the very end, to the very end, he remained obstinate and stubborn. And he said, how, I've, how have I been disgraced? And how have I been disgraced? A person killed by his own people. Meaning, he's actually trying to put the blame on them. You killed me. Shame on you. After he's trying to kill them. Think about it, right? How am I the one who is disgraced, he's saying. I am a person who has been killed by his own people. So he's trying to, to the very end, throw the blame back on them. And this is the sign of, of a, uh, what, what can we say? I mean, just like, to the very end. He sees the gharaq, right? He sees it to the very end. At least Fir'aun tried to embrace Islam, we can say. Abu Jahl to the very end. Obstinate, threw it back at him. I'm not the one who did anything. You're the one who uh, killed me. And um, he asked, uh, he, he probably was, Allah knows, delirious or whatever, I mean, you know, the very last night. So he said, Tell me, what is the result of the battle? Who has won today? Probably still is not in his full senses. And so uh, Ibn Mas'ud says, Allah and his messenger have won. Allah and his messenger have won. And he then noticed the foot on his chest. So he said to Ibn Mas'ud, You have stepped on a high place, O son of a shepherd. And you're putting your foot on me. You have stepped on a high place. And that was the last thing that he said, because Ibn Mas'ud took his sword and attempted to kill him. But Ibn Mas'ud's sword had been made dull by the whole day of Badr. So his sword is too dull. And it's not managing to inflict that wound. And so he hit the hand of Abu Jahl, and Abu Jahl's brand new gleaming sword, which had not been used on the Battle of Badr, falls out and he uses his own sword. He takes Abu Jahl's own sword and he kicks off the helmet, the mirfar, and he then gives to him the final death blow. But this was, he would have died anyway. So Ibn, uh, Ibn Mas'ud got an honor, but not the full honor. That he would have died anyway, but the very end it was uh, Ibn Mas'ud who basically gave him the final blow. And then he came back to the Prophet uh, saying that, Ya Rasulullah, I found the corpse of Abu Jahl. And the Prophet said, Allah, you swear by Allah. He said, yes, I swear by Allah. Three times, like this is a very big news. And the Prophet said, show me his body to confirm. So they went and he saw the body. And this was when the Prophet ﷺ said, هَذَا فِرْعَوْنُ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ That this man, this is the only time he said this. And this, that's why we call him this. This was the Fir'aun of this Ummah. This was the Fir'aun of this Ummah. Of the people who met uh, a very evil end was Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And again, we notice, especially in the story of Umayyah, that Allah's justice is infinite. That as you do unto others, it shall be done unto you. That those whom you hurt, those whom you cause problems to, they will be able to get their own revenge. We see this especially in the story of Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And I already mentioned that Umayyah was a coward. And Umayyah had tried to bribe his way out. And Umayyah did not want to go. And Umayyah was shamed into going. Why? Because deep down inside he was scared. The Prophet had told him, if I ever meet you outside of Mecca, you are not going to live. 
And he was terrified because he knew deep down inside that this was true. So he was scared of leaving Mecca. But his arrogance got the better of him and they shamed him into coming and he remained a begging coward to the very end. When he saw that the Quraysh had fled, as we're going to come to this in a while, when he saw that his own people had fled, he began looking at somebody that he could get on his side. And one of his uh, best friends in the days of Jahiliyyah was Abdurrahman ibn Auf, that rich businessman, right? Abdurrahman ibn Auf was a rich businessman in the days of Mecca. Then he gave up everything, as you know the story in Medina. Then he started all over again and he became rich again. So Abdurrahman ibn Auf and Umayyah are both rich businessmen in Jahiliyyah. And they have a very strong bond from the days of Jahiliyyah. So much so that when Abdurrahman converted, he remained good friends with Umayyah. He didn't, like that, that friendship did not diminish. That they had a, uh, and he didn't uh, persecute, Umayyah did not persecute Abdurrahman. The only thing, by the way, uh, Abdurrahman, his name was Abd Amr, Abdu Amrin. And so when he changed, he converted, when he converted, he changed his name to Abdurrahman. And Umayyah said, I cannot call you this. Why? Because I don't know who is this Rahman. I don't know who is this Rahman. You know the Quraysh refused to believe in Ar-Rahman. وَهُمْ يَكْفُرُونَ Rahman, Right? And so, uh, 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 Abdul Rahman said that, I'm not going to respond to my old name of Abdu Amrin. I'm not going to respond to that. So they said, what can we do? So he said, okay, I will call you, call you Abdul Ilah. Are you fine with that? So, Abdul Rahman said, yeah, okay, I'm fine with that. So, Abdul Rahman would always be called Abdul Ilah by... Umayyah. So one of those strange things. So the only name that would call Abdulillah, Umayyah would call him always Abdulillah. So when he sees Abdurrahman, Abdulillah passing by, he holds on to him with two hands. And he, he notices that Abdurrahman ibn Auf has in his hands the armor of somebody who has been uh, killed. And so he's taking this armor back to his place, to his tent, Abdurrahman. So he says, Oh Abdurrahman, what if, or sorry, Abdulillah, you never call him Abdul Rahman. Oh, Abdul Ilah, what if I were to give you much more than this armor? What if I were to give you many milking camels? Camels that are giving milk are the most expensive, right? I'll give you as much as you want. Get rid of this and protect me. Take me as a prisoner and I'll give you as much as you want, right? Begging for his life to the very end, thinking he'll be able to buy it out. And so, I mean, Abdul Rahman is a businessman, even on the battlefield, even on the battlefield, and it is a halal transaction, completely halal. So he throws away the armor, and he holds on Abdul Rahman, and he had a son with him, a young man with him. So the two of them, he held on to their hands, and now instead of the armor, he's taking these two back to uh, the tent, or back to the muaskar, or back to the, uh, the camp of the Muslims, to basically say, these are my prisoners of war, then we'll ransom them off, and he's promised me a big uh, ransom. Now, of course, Allah wills, there's just no way that this is, you know, this is going to happen, right? Out of all the people in the world, of course, who do you think Allah chose to stop this entourage from getting to safety zone? Obviously, this clearly, any, wallahi, there's just no question for any, any of our minds, Allah is, this is not going to happen. Umayyah is not going to be saved, right? So, before they get to the camp, and this is the key point here, because they're still on the battlefield, the war is still going on, right? And a number of things can be said here. Firstly, the laws of war have not yet been revealed. The laws of Qital have not yet been revealed. As we're going to see what happens to the prisoners, they didn't know what to do. What happens to the ransom, they don't know what to do. What happens to what to do, all of this is, you know, the, um, the, the war booty, the ghanima, they don't know what to do. Right, so all of this is going to come down later on. So firstly, it was, it was the laws of Islam about Qital had not yet been revealed. Secondly, technically they're still on the battlefield. And this is a key point, they're not actually in the army yet, in the safety zone. There's still, war is happening. So it's a gray area. It's a gray area. Were the rules met or not? Completely gray. So Allah Azza wa Jal intended this that Bilal sees Abdul Rahman carrying or, or holding Umayyah's hand as prisoners now and just walking back. And Bilal says, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, Ra's al Kufr, the, the leader of Kufr, you are giving him security? Wallahi la najotu in naja, which basically means over my dead body. It's literally what it means, right? <laughs> Over my dead body, you're going to get this man back there, right? Now, Abdurrahman begins begging and pleading. 
Because, I mean, it's halal. It's halal. Nothing wrong with this. He wants plenty of riches. It's like, these are my prisoners, Bilal. Calm down, Bilal. It's all right, Bilal. These are my prisoners. He doesn't. But Bilal is getting more and more. And he's raising his voice, right? Umayya ibn Khalaf, Ra'sul Kufr. La najawtu in najan. He keeps on raising his voice until finally he calls a group of the Ansar for his help. And he said, this is that man that did what he did to me. This is that man. And the Ansar now, they know exactly who this man is now. Because Bilal's story is, if it's well known to us, what do you think to them? Imagine, right? Out of all of the Sahaba, our children, they know Bilal's story more than they know anybody else's. Isn't that true? Right? The Ahadun Ahad, that's the point. The, that Allah Azza wa Jal preserved his legacy, really like he preserved almost no other legacy. The one story that every child knows is the story of Bilal. Allah has preserved his izzah and honor. So the Ansar, they come, Bilal comes to them, a group, a group of Ansar, they're not really mentioned. And he brings them to uh, Abdurrahman. And Abdurrahman now has to negotiate with all of them, right? And he says, these are my prisoners. They, now, he doesn't want to say they promised me money because that would really be bad. But he's saying, these are my prisoners. They have entrusted themselves to me. And Bilal keeps on saying that you are not going to save this man. I will over my dead body. Until finally they surrounded Abdurrahman ibn Auf, the whole group of Ansar. And uh, over his negotiations, they began... Uh, prodding and and uh, and uh, you know basically sticking their swords in so much so it is said that Abdurrahman tried to stop them with his own body. Now he's not going to fight Muslims over this, but he's trying to stop them, and they would go underneath his hands like they they don't want to hit him either, right? So they're trying to like you know get him, and he was wounded. Abdurrahman was wounded in the foot by one of the uh, the swords uh, that when he's go they're going underneath it, it hit his foot as well, and he would show that wound as long as he lived that this is the wound that I got on the day of Badr uh, for. Because of uh, because of Umayya, and eventually uh, uh, they they managed to kill the both of them, Umayya and his son. They managed to kill uh, the both of them, and uh, Abdurrahman would say till he died, "May Allah have mercy on Bilal." Not only did he stop me from getting my two ransoms, I never got the armor back as well. Right? I lost everything, <laughs> and he, he still remembered. You know, I lost everything on Badr. That I got this, and I was gonna get this, and now may Allah have mercy on Bilal. I neither got this nor did I got nor did I get uh, that. And again, Subhanallah. Here we have the same voice that would cry out Ahadun Ahad. That was the voice that caused Umayyah's death. That same loud voice that would call out Ahadun Ahad. The same voice, right? Allah Azza wa Jalla will that it will come back now to haunt Umayyah. And it was that voice that brought the help of the Ansar and uh, managed to kill uh, Umayyah ibn Khalaf before he reached the safety of the camp. And uh, Umayyah ibn Khalaf as well, subhanAllah, I mean the only person who was not buried was Umayyah ibn Khalaf. All of the, the pagans, Quraysh, all of them were buried. Umayyah ibn Khalaf... Uh, when, when they found his body after the battle had finished, uh, they found his body and he died on, a, uh, on a, a bed of pebbles. SubhanAllah, look at this, right? He died on a bed of pebbles, which was what he would put Bilal on, right? And whenever they tried to lift him up, the, the flesh would just decompose. They couldn't pick him up. That wherever they tried to, they just couldn't. So they had to leave him on those pebbles and they put more pebbles on top of him to bury him. If that is not Qadr of Allah, think about that, right? Now, what is happening in Alim al-Barzakh, we can easily imagine. We can easily imagine, right? What is happening in the Barzakh with those pebbles, like Allah wants to demonstrate that as you punish Bilal, now you are going to be punished. That people will see. So Umayyah was the only person of the Quraysh that was not given a burial. Because they couldn't pick him up. And they just let him rot there. And because you have to cover a dead body. So they took those same hot burning pebbles of the desert. right, And they just threw it onto his body. So that his body was covered in the very sand and the very pebbles that he would torture Bilal with, they left his body over there. And again, if this is not Qadr of Allah, kama tadinu tudan, as you do unto others, so it shall be done unto you. We we'll see this throughout, not just even the seerah, throughout the previous nations, throughout, this is the sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah has sunan as well, routines as well. This is the sunnah of Allah, kama tadinu tudan, as you do unto others, it shall be done unto uh, you. Uh, another incident of uh, Badr that is mentioned, 
Another tragic incident of Badr is the incident of uh, Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah, Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah, that Abu Ubaidah, of course, is an early convert, he's a muhajir, he is, uh, he is fighting alongside the Muslims, and his father, Jarrah, was on the side of the Quraysh. And Jarrah was one of those bitter enemies who could not stand his son having converted. And that anger was so jealous, was so evil, that he had to, he wanted to kill his own son. Jarrah wanted to kill his own son. And so whenever Jarrah would see Abu Ubaidah, you, again the, there's long lines of people fighting, whenever he would see Abu Ubaidah, he would make his way to Abu Ubaidah, his own son. Amir al he wants his, to kill his own son, that he cannot stand his own son having converted. And every time he sees his father coming, Abu Ubaidah simply goes somewhere else. He doesn't want to uh, fight his own father out of respect and out of love and out of human courtesy, really, you know, that his father's coming, go fight somebody else, I don't want to fight you. So he would go somewhere else. Until finally, his father surprised him. His father surprised, attacked him. And out of the blue, he came uh, jumping on him to kill him, and he would have killed him. And Abu Ubaidah, now he's young, he's the son, he's the strong one, right? In self-defense, he took out his sword, and his father died at his own son's hand. His father died at his own son's hand. And the people began speaking that he has killed his own father. He has killed his own father. And Abu Ubaidah felt a great amount of sadness that, what have I done? And especially in the days of Jahiliyyah, now this is something, of course, even humanity-wise, but especially the Jahili tendency, right, of respecting one's tribe and one's ancestry, he really felt very uh, depressed and very sad. And Allah revealed in the Quran, the last verse of Surah Al-Mujadila that لا تجد قوما يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر يوادون من حاد الله ورسوله ولو كانوا آباءهم أو أبناءهم إخوانهم وعشيرتهم أولئك كتب في قلوبهم الإيمان This is Abu Ubaidah Amr al-Jarrah أولئك كتب في قلوبهم الإيمان That Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying you will never find a group of people who love, who will believe in Allah Azza wa Jalla who are believers and who have يوادون who have loyalty to those who have opposed Allah and His Messenger, even if they be their own fathers, their own sons, their own brother, and their own family. Those are the ones, the people of Iman, whom Allah has written Iman in their hearts. Ulaika kataba fi qulubihimul Iman. And so uh, Allah Azza wa Jal praised Abu Ubaidah as a person of Iman that there is no question one's ultimate loyalty always is to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every other loyalty is conditional to that loyalty and this is simply a given in Islam. There is no room for negotiation in that regard. Uh, now, uh, we already mentioned that the Prophet had, had forbidden the killing of Al-Abbas and the Banu Hashim and Abu al-Bukhturi. Uh, unfortunately, Abu al-Bukhturi was killed. Abu al-Bukhturi was killed. Uh, uh, how did this happen? Well, before we get there, Al-Abbas, uh, the story of uh, Al-Abbas, one other incident happened about the story of Al-Abbas as well. That when the Prophet gave the command that Al-Abbas should not be killed, and the Banu Hashim should not be killed, and Abu al should not be killed. Uh, Abu Hudayfa, Abu Hudayfa is the son of Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah. Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah is one of those three who has, well, the main one. Yani the Utbah and Shayba and Al-Walid ibn Utbah, right? The senior Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. He is the son of Abu Hudayfa. Uh, Abu Hudayfa, by the way, he is, you, you, you must have heard the name of the, of the Sahabi, Salim Mawla Abi Hudayfa. The Salim Mawla Abi Hudayfa, this is the Abu Hudayfa. Salim is one of the most famous Qurra of the Sahaba. Salim had a beautiful voice of the Quran, and there's a lot of a hadith about Salim. Uh, and Salim was the freed slave of Abu, uh, Abu uh, Hudayfa. And uh, Abu Hudayfa's sister was Hind. And Hind is the wife of Abu Sufyan, right? So this is Abu Hudayfa. His sister was Hind, the wife of Abu Sufyan. So Abu Hudayfa, Abu Hudayfa, when he heard the Prophet ﷺ say that the Banu Hashim is not going to be killed, he fell into an error. And the Sahaba were humans, and they sometimes fell into an error. And certain, you know, pre-Islamic tendencies came out. And he said, so our fathers and uncles and brothers, pause here, his own father has just died. His uncle has just died. His uh, brother has just died. Right? In the Mubaraza, correct? Right? In the three Mubaraza, his father, his uncle, his brother, they've all just been killed. So he said, so our fathers and brothers and uncles will be killed. Uh, 
but the uncle of the prophet or the uncle of the prophets and the family of the prophets will not be killed so that tendency came out in him and the news spread that Abu Hudayfa said this so the prophet ﷺ said he swore to kill al-Abbas he said I will kill al-Abbas he, he swore to kill al-Abbas that if I see him I will kill him right if I see him I will kill him so when this news came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was in the presence of Umar bin Khattab and he said Ya Aba Hafs and this was the first time that he called him with the kunya Abu Hafs and therefore Umar bin Khattab is Abu Hafs Abu Hafs he didn't have a Hafs he had a Hafsa but he changed it to Hafs Right, Ya Aba Hafs. Uh, that Ya Aba Hafs. Will the face of the uncle of the Prophet be struck with a sword? Will the face of the uncle of the Prophet be struck with a sword? How is this possible? And Umar ibn al-Khattab, you know, he got the point that you need to stop this. Umar ibn al-Khattab said, Ya Rasulullah, he has committed nifaq. Meaning, who is this? Who is he talking about? Abu Hudayf, he has committed nifaq. Let me... Umar style, right? This is Umar style, huh? Let me do what I would do, huh? Take care of it, right? And the Prophet forbade him from doing that. But uh, Umar basically went to Abu Hudayfa and made sure that Abu Hudayfa was put into place. And Abu Hudayfa then said that uh, he used to say that I shall never feel safe against the consequences of that one sentence. I shall never feel safe unless Allah accepts me as a shaheed. That I made a big mistake. And I'm always going to be worried about it unless Allah accepts me as a shaheed. And Abu Hudayfa, his dua was accepted and he died a shaheed in the battle of Yamama, which is again against the Murtads, against the battle of Ridda. Battle of Yamama, he died a shaheed over there. Now, a number of points here. Firstly, even the greatest of the Sahaba, they are human and they can fall into an error. Therefore, if one of us makes a mistake, have heart that people far better than you fell into far bigger mistakes than you. Imagine somebody saying this. Imagine somebody saying, I will kill the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, and he's on the side of the Prophet. ﷺ. Can you imagine how guilty he felt, right? Imagine he fell into an error and he realized his error and Allah forgave him. So those who make mistakes, we all make mistakes and people better than us have made far bigger mistakes than us. But they turned around, they repented, and Allah repented on them. Secondly, notice the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ that he handled it in a very wise manner. He expressed his frustration to Umar. He didn't directly go to him because that would have been too humiliating too. This is very now, imagine now Abu Hudayfa would have just wished that the earth swallows him up. Right? So he goes to Umar. He knows what Umar is going to do. And that is to put him in his place, right? And he expresses his frustration. Then behind the scenes, Umar goes and puts Abu Hudayfa in place, right? Again, look at the wisdom of the process. That he realizes this is an emotional thing. He shouldn't punish. He shouldn't do anything because this is an emotion. He excused him, basically, for what has happened to his own father and uncle and brother right now, right? Literally, he's just lost all three an hour ago, right? Literally. So, the process is irritated that this is happening, but he doesn't do any uh, uh, repercussions. There are no repercussions. There's no consequences because one's emotional state is overlooked here and therefore he tells Umar to deal with it and Umar indeed uh, deals with it. Uh, and also by the way, so uh, after the battle was finished, after the battle was finished and all of the bodies are going to be basically thrown into the well, we'll talk about that next Wednesday. So when the body of uh, Utbah, which is his father, uh, is now being dragged to be thrown into the well, uh, Abu Hudayfa, his face became very pale and you could see the effects of grief on him. Now notice here, subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ has just heard Abu Hudayfa say this about his uncle, but now the matter is over. So the Prophet ﷺ goes up to him and this is the way of reconciling now. Right? This is the true leader now. That he's now showing him that, look, I understand, let's not keep this, you know, uh, ignore this now, let's move on. And he goes to him and he consoles him and he says, yani perhaps you, you feel hurt at what you see. Now they're seeing his father being dragged, literally, because I mean, there are too many bodies. You're not going to show the honor you will to that enemy that you will to the Muslims, right? The Muslims got their own burial, they were dug graves. The, the Quraysh, the pagans, they just were thrown into a well and the well was covered up, right? We're going to talk about that next one day. So, they're, they're seeing the body being dragged. The Prophet ﷺ, and this man has just, Abu Hudayfa, I mean, I mean uh, has just threatened his uncle. But this is now 
forgotten. خلاص, Bismillah, let's move on. So he tells him, لَعَلَّكَ تَجِدْ يعني Perhaps you find this, you know, difficult to, to see this. And uh, Abu Hudayfa says, Ya Rasulullah, I have, I have no doubt that you know, my father died on kufr. I mean, I'm not feeling sympathy for his kufr. But I knew from my father wisdom and love and great care. I mean, after all, he's a father, right? And frankly, Utbah was one of the better of the Quraysh. He was of those who gifted the, 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 the grapes, right? Utbah was the one who gifted the grapes in Ta'if. So I knew from my father wisdom and siyada, yani leadership and nobility. He was a good person and because of this, I had hoped that Allah Azza wa Jal will guide him to Islam. But when I saw what has happened to him and realized that he died in kufr, then this has grieved me that he died in the state of kufr. And so the Prophet ﷺ made dua for Abu Hudayfa and uh, asked Allah Azza wa Jal to bless Abu Hudayfa. And this shows us again that the true leader that the Prophet ﷺ was that this incident happened a few hours ago. Now this is his way of showing Abu Hudayfa that look, I don't hold any grudge against you. Okay, you made a mistake. It was emotional. I realized that. And he comes and he consoles him basically. And in his own way. He consoles him about the death of his father, uh, Utbah. Uh, I guess we only have a few minutes left. Uh, so one of the stories we'll do uh, is uh, uh, Abu al-Bukhturi. It's also said Abu al-Bakhtari. Both of these names are mentioned. Abu al-Bukhturi ibn uh, Hashim, the one that was forbidden from being killed, he ended up being killed. And his story was that uh, one of the Ansar al-Mujdhir ibn Ziyad, when he saw Abu al-Bukhturi, he said to him, Ya Abu al-Bukhturi, we have been forbidden from, from harming you. We have been forbidden from harming you, so surrender yourself and I will take you back to the camp. Surrender yourself and I'll take you back. So Abu al-Bukhturi said, how about my friend? They were together fighting. How about my friend? So the man said, we don't have any laws about him and where he's going to be fought. And that's not, that's not, you know, my business is I'm not allowed to harm you. And so Abu al-Bukhturi said, no, let not the women of Quraysh say, that I saved myself at the expense of my friend. Let me not die a death that I will be, or let me not live a death that I will be mocked because of my cowardice. Right? And so he then charged, and when he charged, the Sahaba had to defend back, and uh, the same Sahabi who killed him, he came to the process and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I tried my best to take him prisoner, like you said, but he refused except to fight, and so I had to kill him. So he was excused uh, for this. He was excused for this. And inshallah, uh, we'll stop over here because the next bit is a bit long, and so we'll leave that for next uh, Wednesday, bi the ta'ala. Before I open the floor for questions, um, just point out that the ACO meeting is taking place uh, next Sunday at what time? 6 p.m., right? 6 or 7 p.m. Or is the representative here? Sister Sahrish, is she here? It's Not here? Uh, There's a poster out there. I was told to remind all of you, and it's a very necessary thing to know about uh, what is going on and especially locally here in Tennessee the people that are running for office and uh, what we have to do to help out and it's a bit of a fundraiser for this organization uh, that Alhamdulillah has proven to be very effective in the anti-Sharia campaign in Tennessee we have seen what they have done so I will be there we have a, a state senator coming as well. Uh, one of the senators, uh, state senators of Tennessee is coming as well. Uh, we have Sister Ramzia, who's the, the lawyer and the, the, the activist uh, from, from Nashville coming down. This is next Sunday. So inshallah ta'ala, uh, I encourage all of you to purchase a ticket and to go there and to support them uh, and, and see what they're doing. Uh, the other announcement is that inshallah ta'ala, uh, from next Tuesday, and you'll get an email about this, from next Tuesday, we will be starting our advanced class uh, from 7.30 to 8.30. From 7.30 to 8.30, we'll be starting our advanced class. Uh, and it, the topic uh, has been changed because of a number of issues. So we'll be talking about the creation of Adam alayhi salam and this, the benefits from the creation of Adam. And this is a multi-series, uh, a number of different uh, tangents about the benefits from the creation of Adam alayhi salam. This will be starting inshallah ta'ala next Tuesday and we'll send an email out for everybody. And unlike this class, that class will have some rules and there will also going to be some, uh, some payment that, uh, have you decided how much or are you going to decide it? Okay, so 20 per person, 30 for family, this is uh, a registration fee. And it will last uh, basically until the Christmas break, inshallah. It will last until the uh, Christmas break, around the 
20th or something, whenever, uh, or a little bit 15th of December, something like that. So it'll last around five, six weeks. Um, with one w one week break, I won't be here, but basically th that will be lasting there. Uh, so that's next Tuesday. Uh, the other announcement, what else? There was something else. We're also going to have the November is coming, and November means Thanksgiving. So we're just having a Thanksgiving dinner with the so November 15th at the Heart Song, at the Heart Song. Okay, November 15th, and the tickets will be sold on Friday. And and uh, one more very yes. Oh yes, of course. Uh, so. We are also raising funds that we're going to give to Islamic Relief for Hurricane Sandy and the victims of Hurricane Sandy. As you know, it's caused quite a lot of damage. 50 people have been uh, killed. Uh, and uh, we are trying to show our help and support as well. Uh, and there are boxes there uh, outside. And we've contacted Islamic Relief. They have set up uh, their, their boots and they're distributing food and clothes. And they're distributing uh, necessary items for the victims. And so this is a great cause for us to help out Islamic Relief. And that is outside. And uh, yes, that's the next announcement I was going to do. We have a lot of announcements today, mashallah. Very uh, tasty and spicy announcement. The uh, Mulan Bistro. Mulan Bistro, we have been so successful with them that they are now, alhamdulillah, fully halal. Alhamdulillah. Now what this means is that you guys are going to have to eat out quite a lot. Why? Because we need to support them. Right? You have to request, they have a halal menu. They have a halal menu, so when you go there now, you just say you want the halal food. And apparently, according to our trusted authority, Asif, if you, uh, if you request any item, they will make it for you uh, halal, even if it's not on the halal menu, if you request it beforehand. Oh, but apparently, for some reason, I don't know why, they can't do pork halal. So, I don't know, I mean, it's just one of those, you know, you're just going to have to, you're just going to have to accept it, you know. But every other item on the menu, they can make it halal for you, uh, if you request them. But anytime you walk in, they have a halal menu, right? There's a sign, there's a special halal menu, and if you want any of the other dishes, then you request it in advance. Insha'Allah, I'm not supposed to tell you this, so I'm just going to be generic here. Insha'Allah, make dua. The same good news will be said of another restaurant soon. Insha'Allah. Insha'Allah. We're working on this. But again, what this means is that we need to help and support, uh, you know, these services. Because again, if we don't, I mean, you, the, the success of one has basically led to this. And this was, wallahi, the actual goal of Zabiha Night. This was the goal of Zabiha Night, that our Islamic presence, now we need to start making people aware and businesses and others and then inshallah slowly but surely we'll have halal meat available in many supermarkets and groceries i mean that's the goal inshallah is that uh, make our presence known and facilitate our living uh, in this land inshallah uh, yes another announcement go ahead Yes, of course, it goes without saying that there are a handful of Muslim businesses. We wish there were much more. There's only a handful of halal businesses. We definitely need to support them as well uh, in their efforts. And they've been doing this much longer than, than these other companies. So, alhamdulillah, any, uh, one of the few halal entertainments we have over here is to take the family out for a meal. And so, inshallah, once every while, any, whoever can afford it should, you know, uh, patronize all of these, uh, you know, uh, establishments and help them out, inshallah ta'ala. Yes. Zubair bin Awad was a Who were the other Hawaris? No, we only have one name mentioned. Yes. So, you mentioned about the same subject a while back that you guys are going to form a committee to show and actually not only promote but also draw. So, the idea is still there. The idea is still there. The, the brothers asking about uh, forming a, a halal monitoring committee to make sure that the you know stores are selling halal. The idea is still there, but there are some logistical issues that are not easy to solve. And there's also the potential backlash when we discover somebody's not selling halal, then we advertise he's not selling halal, then what if he goes to court, what if he, you know, I mean, it's like slandering now. Yeah, I mean, this is a very, it's a very touchy thing. The idea is there, but we need to cross some hurdles before we get to it. Right, inshallah. This guy has the receipt from a local halal Yes, from Baraka. Yeah, the, the Mulan Bistro guy has is buying it from his neighbor, the Baraka store, and he has the receipt posted that he purchased it from them. Inshallah. Okay, any questions from the sisters? Yes.
very, very softly. Can you raise your voice? I can hear you now, yes. The Prophet ﷺ told us very explicitly that the reason that they should not be killed is because they were forced to come to battle and they didn't want to come to battle. And that is why all of them surrendered without killing anybody. They didn't kill anybody. Abbas did not kill anybody. They simply, you know, at their first opportunity they surrendered. They had especially close ties. This is their uh, cousin, this is their uh, nephew in the case of Abbas. Uh, that's the only uncle of the process and that participated so they did not want to fight and therefore they surrendered at the first opportunity Okay, defectors. Yes from the Quraysh. Yes We're gonna talk about this next Wednesday was he a Muslim or not we'll talk about this next Wednesday inshallah ta'ala next Wednesday uh, Yes You're trying to figure out the question Yes. <laughs> Good. Okay. Okay. Yes. Intervention of aid of angels in the presence of messengers is that possible after the messengers? Can it happen in other circumstances? Can angels aid others after the process? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. لَهُمْ مُعَقِّبَاتُ مَبَيْنِ يَدَيْهُمْ مِنْ أَمْرِ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِ يَحْفَظُونَهُمْ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ This is in the Quran. لَهُمْ مُعَقِّبَاتُ مَبَيْنِ يَدَيْهُمْ مِنْ خَلْفِهِ يَحْفَظُونَهُمْ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ That he has guardians in front of him and behind him that are protecting him at the command of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is for the believers, all of the believers. It, it not, not only can it happen, it happens all the time. Yes, it is very possible. Yes, exactly. Exactly. This is very possible. That when we see a miracle take place, it sometimes it is a miracle. Yes, exactly. In a situation. Yes, in a battle situation as well, and there are there are mutawatir reports from people that you know in the days of Afghanistan. Now you know you all are older than I am. I remember stories from those who had gone there. You also eyewitnesses, people that have gone there and then told us things that are simply mind-boggling. You know that this is the realities and. I believe many of these stories, and I, the people that told me them witnessed them, and I know these people. Uh, so yes, we. This is still to this day. It can happen. It can happen. I'm sure in Syria there is no question in my mind. I'm sure that there are things happening in Syria, and there are, uh, you know, again it's mutawatir, and it. Uh, uh, there's no denying that people are experiencing these types of divine aids and interventions, and Allah knows best. Final question. Yes, go ahead. You had said that uh, two, when two people wanted to kill Abu Jahal, and then um, later on, uh, he, uh, Prophet وسلم, he sent out some people to go look for him. And for the corpse, yeah. Yeah. But the person who found him actually killed him. So, so as we said, the person who found him was, who was he? Um, Ibn Mas'ud. Ibn Mas'ud dealt the blow that killed him, but he was going to die. So there's something called a mortal wound. A mortal wound means the wound is so severe that he's going to die. Abu Jahl was found in a state where he was on the verge of death. If Ibn Mas'ud had not found him, he probably would have lived another half hour. right? So he's breathing heavily. And he's at a stage where it's beyond uh, saving now. That there's no question he's going to die. Therefore, yes, you're right, Ibn Mas'ud killed him, but it wasn't a mortal wound. He, did, he finished him off. He just finished the deed. He expedited the end death. Right? La, Ikrimah is a Sahabi. Aslahak Allah. Ikrimah is one of the elite of the Sahaba. Ikrimah, Ikrimah, Ikrimah. He was one of those who when the Prophet ﷺ conquered Mecca, Ikrimah was on the list of those six who will not be forgiven. Six people were said. Only six. Find them dead or alive and kill them. One of them, they found him clinging to the Kaaba for mercy. The Prophet said, kill him even at the Kaaba. So his name was on that six. So Ikrimah fled before the Muslims came. He fled. 
Ikrim of Lari. Ikrimah, he did so much in the battle of Uhud. He did so much. And he's, he was the son of his father before he converted. So Ikrimah fled. And then when he fled, he went to Jeddah. And from Jeddah, he said, let me just go to Abyssinia. Khalas. Because he knew once Makkah is conquered, it's the final domino. The, the rest is just going to happen. So he goes, let me just live in, in, in Abyssinia, Habasha. So he uh, rode a ship uh, to go to Abyssinia. And on the ship, Allah Azza wa Jal basically sent a thunderstorm. Uh, not a thunderstorm, but a typhoon or what do you call it in the ocean. And the ship was uh, about to crash. And the captain of the ship said that I've done what I can. I, nothing I can do. So right now, the only hope that we have is a miracle from Allah. So make dua to Allah. For wallahi, you and I both know that Allah and Al-Uzza will be of no benefit to us now. <laughs> right? This is the captain of the ship. So he said that, uh, Ikrimah said that, when I heard this, I realized, why should I worship a lat when I get back to the shore, when he's not going to help me, when I need him now. SubhanAllah, what this shows us is that many of the pagans were sincere in their paganism. Of them was Ikrimah. Right? That he genuinely, genuinely believed in shirk. And finally, somewhere that light bulb clicked. That it makes sense. So he said, Oh Allah, I promise you that if you save me now, that I shall go to your messenger, and I shall put my hand in his hand, which is the oath of allegiance, and I shall find him forgiving and merciful. He even knew this, even though his name was on the six. And I shall find him forgiving and merciful. So Allah Azza wa Jalla saved him. He got back to the shore, and uh, he uh, went to the process. At this time, was in Tabuk. So after the conquest of Mecca, he moves on to Tabuk. We'll get to, we'll get to that. So he was now he went to the, the camp, and he knew there was a price on his head, dead or alive. That that was basically the point. So he took his turban and he covered himself. Muqanna, they say they covered himself completely. You know how they they, they covered themselves completely, so nobody recognized him. And it's a risk because if somebody recognizes him, his head is going to be off instantaneously, right? And there's nobody that can help him. So he goes into the tent or the, the muaskar or the army of the Muslims and he makes his way to the Prophet ﷺ when he is within distance of him because that's the one person basically that can forgive him, right? He then un unfurls the, the turban and he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka la rasulullah What happened ya Ikrimah? Like, whoa, you know? From here to there. Then he explains his story. Right? And when he explains the story, then Hasuna Islamu, his Islam became very good, and he died, uh, I want to say, fighting against the Romans. He died in one of those big battles, fighting against the Romans, Ikrimah. Uh, he, he lived a good life after that. This is Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl, the son of Abu Jahl. Our young brother has his hand raised for a long time. This is our last question that we need to. Why did Hamza die? He didn't die yet. Be patient, his death will come. Huh? <laughs> His death will come, but not in the battle of Badr. Okay, inshallah. So we. Uh بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. I apologize about my voice today, but uh, I'm suffering from a little bit of a flu and uh, my voice has still not recovered, so I'm going to have to speak in a, a, a low voice for most of today, which as you know for me is very difficult to do when I speak, so will have to be a more calmer lecture, inshallah. Ameen, ameen. Uh, so, uh, we were still talking about the actual incidents during the Battle of Badr, and uh, the next incident that we're going to come to is a tafsir of something in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Anfal, وَإِذْ زَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ وَقَالَ لَا غَالِبَ لَكُمُ الْيَوْمَ مِنَ النَّاسِ وَإِنِّي جَارٌ لَكُمْ That one shaytan made their deeds beautiful to them. وَإِذْ زَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ وَقَالَ لَا غَالِبَ لَكُمُ الْيَوْمَ مِنَ النَّاسِ And shaytan said to them, Nobody can beat you today. You are too powerful. وَإِنِّي جَارٌ لَكُمْ And I am your protector. فَلَمَّا تَرَاءَ الْجَمْعَانِ When the two groups saw one another, نَكَصَ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ He turned around and he fled. وَقَالَ إِنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِّنْكَ And he said, I have nothing to do with you. 
إِنِّي أَرَى مَا لَا تَرَوْنَ I can see what you cannot see. إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهَ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ I am scared of Allah, the Lord of the worlds. This is in Surah Al-Anfal, and it is in the context of the battle of Badr. What is this a reference to? Uh, we already mentioned for the first half of the story, and that is that when the Quraysh were leaving Mecca, they almost turned back because they became scared of a surprise attack from another internal dispute. We mentioned this before. And shaitan came to them in the form of Suraqa ibn Malik from the Bani Kinana. And he said to them, and they were worried about an attack from one of the sub-tribes of the Bani Kinana. And he said to them, I, as the chieftain, as the nobleman from, from the Banu Kinana, are, am guaranteeing you, you're not going to get attacked from the Banu Kinana. Inni jaru lakum. You have my protection. So much so, this is Suraqa in the guise, or Shaitan in the guise of Suraqa. So much so, he said, I will even accompany you as a, uh, as a live hostage, if you like. I'll go with you, and I'll accompany you, so you can be sure that if I'm in the battle, you can, if anything happens, you can kill me. I am your, literally, hostage. That if anything happens, you hear of the Banu Kinana attacking, then you, you have no worry because I am a live hostage with you. لكم. So Suraqa, in the guy, obviously this is not Suraqa, this is Shaitan, is accompanying them all the way until they camp at Badr. Then when the two groups met one another, or they saw, the Tara means they saw one another. What happened? It is narrated that uh, when Suraqa saw the angels come down, and he saw Jibreel coming down on his horse when Shaitan, obviously, in the guise of Suraqa, saw this. He turned on his back and began running away. Now, of course, the Quraysh cannot see anything. To them, it looks just like the army. So, uh, Al Harith ibn Hisham said, Where are you running away, O Suraqa? Where are you running away? And he tried to stop him, like, What's going on here? But Shaitan, in the guise of Suraqa, pushed him so severely that Al-Harith basically flew upwards and fell on his back. Clearly this is an entity that's not a human. Flew upwards and fell on his back. And then he said to Al-Harith, that as Allah says in the Quran, that I can see what you cannot see. Inni ara ma la tarun. I'm seeing what you cannot see. There's the angels on the other side. How do you expect me to fight against that? And I am scared of Allah, the Lord of the uh, worlds. And our Prophet ﷺ said, in a hadith narrated in Muatta Imam Malik, wa fi isnadihi maqal, that the Prophet ﷺ said, Shaytan was never more humiliated and more uh, despised, yani adal, which is like, you know, dhalil. Shaytan was never more humiliated than he was on the day of Badr. So basically, since Allah created him, Shaitan was never more humiliated than he was on the day of Badr because of what he saw of the blessings of Allah and the mercy of Allah and he saw Jibreel inciting the angels go forth. So Shaitan felt the lowest ever in his life on the day of Badr. And Allah mentions and references this in the Quran and in this manifestation, in this clear example even though we don't need it, we see here the trickery of shaitan, how he promised them. And then at the last minute, how he turned his back and literally ran away. Literally, right? And this is a, a beautiful example that Allah showed with, the, with eyes, basically. People saw this, that shaitan promises everything, right? He told them, I'll be your hostage, take me with you. He told them, don't worry, I'll be your protector. And then when he saw the angels come down, right at, b before the battle, he turned on his back and he fled away. It is as if Allah is telling us, how can you believe him? How can you believe this liar? How can you believe this fraudster, this trickster? How can you believe this person or this entity who does not even feel ashamed to lie till the very last second? And he shows his true colors, his cowardice. Look at how scared he is now. And he actually admits, I am scared of Allah. Inni akhafullaha rabbal alameen. And also look at the significance as well of shaitan. Literally, this is Iblis himself. And we know from our texts that Iblis does not get involved except in very evil matters. Iblis is the, the, the head person. He sends his henchmen. He sends the other jinns to do his his beckoning. Iblis, as the Prophet said, he has a throne somewhere, you know, over uh, the waters, he has a throne. And he sends the shayateen to do his bidding. For Iblis to physically come to Mecca, and to physically be in the army of the Quraysh, it shows his desperation. And also look at the symbolism here, and it's not just symbolism, it's real. On the one side you have that very same entity who refused to do sajda to Adam. That very same creature, you have him. 
and you have Abu Jahl and you have Utbah and Walid and Shayba ibn Rabi and you have Umayyah ibn Khalaf and literally a hundred meters away on the other side you have Jibreel come down from the heavens and you have the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you have Abu Bakr and Umar and not Uthman because Uthman was in Mecca as we'll come to uh, well, Medina and Ali you have all of the Sahaba Wallahi if this is not as Allah says in the Quran the day of decisive Furqan, Yawm al-Furqan, Allah calls Badr, Yawm al-Furqan. Furqan means sh shifting or changing or clearing the truth from the falsehood. Right? Yawm al-Furqan, the day of decision. Faraqa means to separate. Faraqa. Furqan, separation. What was separated? Truth from falsehood. Correctness from evil. This is Yawm al-Furqan. And there is no question. Look at the people on both sides. Jibreel versus Iblis himself. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu versus Abu Jahl, the Fir'aun of this Ummah, right? And then all of the Sahaba, there is no doubt that this type of, of symbolic battle and a real battle is both symbolic and real. It has never taken place since Allah has created mankind up until the Day of Judgment. And that is why Yawm al-Badr is indeed one of the greatest victories. Uh, in fact, it is the greatest victory. Perhaps the uh, conquest of Mecca is at a similar level, but there's no doubt that the Battle of Badr is the greatest victory that was given uh, to the Prophet in terms of the actual military expeditions and uh, when the Sahaba began uh, attacking, we had mentioned this last week that the Prophet had given them in rows, in the first row, who was in the first row, who can remind me, the very front, who was in the front? We said there were three groups, who was in the front? No, 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 in terms of, in terms of characteristics, or the people with spears, and then the middle, swordsmen. And then in the back, the archers, right? We had said this, that the process had divided this, and I had mentioned that this was the first time in military warfare of Arabia that the Arabs had fought in ranks and rows. This is the first time. This was not of their tactics. And it is amazing that the Prophet who was never schooled in an army school, in a military academy, he is doing what military academics have taught for hundreds and thousands of years, that army should be in rows. And this is what every military training school teaches, that there are rows. To this day, the military has his people in rows. They're marching in ranks. And Allah says, Inna Allah yuhibbu alladhina yuqatuna fi sabilihi saffan ka'annahum bunyan Right? As if they are solidified rows and ranks. This is something that the Prophet was taught directly uh, by Allah Azza wa Jal and military commanders later on uh, have their own books for this. Now we had mentioned that the Sahaba launched the offensive. The details are not mentioned sadly. As I have said many many times, all that we have is specific incidents. What we do know is that eventually, uh, we mentioned at least 10 stories in the last, uh, uh, last Wednesday, Eventually, the Quraysh turned on their backs and they fled. The Quraysh turned on their backs and they fled and they returned back to Mecca. Now, some modern military <coughs> uh, commentators looking at the map of uh, Badr, and inshallah, maybe next Wednesday or the one after that, we'll do the map and the, the, the PowerPoint. Uh, some modern, modern military analysts, when they look at the map of Badr, <coughs> they notice that there was one clear passageway back to Mecca that the Prophet ﷺ could have blocked if he wanted to, but he didn't do so. So it is as if the Prophet ﷺ allowed one escape passage back for them. Now this is a theory because we don't know what is in the mind of the Prophet This is a theory. Now why would he do this? Modern military uh, analysts, they say, this is because when a group knows that they're fighting to death, they will fight much more severe. And when there is a pressure valve outlet, what's going to happen? Their, revolve, their, their resolve will go down very fast. Right? You see the point here? That when there's no outlet, what's going to happen? There will be desperation. And when there is an outlet, then you know, well, you know what? I can always run away. So if you look at the, mili the, the layout, and I'll show you the diagram next week, inshallah, uh, next Wednesday. If you look at the layout, remember this, that there's going to be one very clear area that the Quraysh could have used to retreat. And the Prophet ﷺ, because he was on the field before the Quraysh, he could have blocked them. But he didn't do so. And that is exactly where they retreated from. And this is a very realistic theory. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows uh, the truth is very uh, plausible. The net result at the end of the battle was that 70 of the Quraysh had been killed. 
and around 73, 74 taken prisoners. So around 15% of the army of the Quraysh was either killed or taken prisoner of war. Out of more than a thousand. Fifteen percent. And from the Muslim side, <coughs> there were no prisoners of war. There were around fifteen from the Muslim side uh, killed in the battle. And this is uh, less than five percent of the Muslims were killed. So fifteen percent of the Quraysh and their army was three times larger are killed or taken prisoner of war and less than 5% of the Muslims around 15 of the Muslims less than 5% they were uh, 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 shaheed or they were martyred in the battle of uh, Badr and when the army fled the army of the Quraysh fled the Prophet Sallallahu regrouped the Sahaba and he said we are going to remain here for three days so he announced for them we're going to remain here for three days why did he remain for three days for many reasons. Firstly, to make sure that all of the Muslims, their bodies were gathered and they were given a proper janazah. They were given proper burial. Janazah here, I mean burial, not the salat al-janazah. As you know, the, the shaheed is not prayed for. And by the way, this is the first time that the sharia of shaheed came down. What do you do for a shaheed? You don't wash his body. Uh, you don't pray salat al-janazah. This was when it came down that this is what you do for the shaheed. That you don't do any of this for the shaheed. Uh, also, they were not taken back to Medina. They were, even though Medina is not that far away. I mean, if you drive to Badr in our times in a car, it takes around an hour and ten minutes. You know, it's not that far. By car, hour, 10, hour, 20 minutes, max, it'll take you. So Medina is not that far away. It's literally half a day's journey away, a day at max if they were to be slow. And yet the, the bodies were buried right there. To this day, if you go and visit Badr, I have visited Badr. You go and visit Badr, you find the graves of the Sahaba are still over there. And this shows us that the Shaheed is buried where he dies. That is the sunnah of the shaheed. Wherever he dies, you dig a grave for him. Uh, as close as possible to that place. If it's reasonable distance or whatnot, that's fine. But he is buried where he dies. We know he is buried in his clothes. He is not given another shroud. And his wounds are not even washed. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that on the day of judgment, the shaheed will be resurrected. His blood will still be the, the color of blood. But its scent will be the scent of musk. Uh, but the scent will be rihu rih al misk. That the scent will be the scent of uh, musk. Uh, he also stayed there for three days to partially recover, to recuperate, to make sure that the Quraysh did not launch a counteroffensive, and most importantly, to clarify beyond the shadow of a doubt who is the winner and who is the loser, who is the victor and who is the coward. This is very clear. You're camping at the battlefield for three days and the Quraysh don't even have the audacity, the Gauls to return back and fight. Clearly the Prophet ﷺ was the victor uh, of this uh, uh, expedition, of this battle of Badr. So the Sahaba were buried in individual graves and there's only 15 Sahaba so they were basically given uh, individual graves. In the battle of Uhud, when the man number was much more, two Sahabi shared a grave as we'll get to when we get to that, right? That it was too much of a burden for them to, to, to dig uh, 75 plus graves for, the ba for, the, for Uhud we're talking about, right? So two people shared a grave because it was too difficult. But for Badr, because there were so few, they were given individual burials. As for the Quraysh, the bodies of the Quraysh, there's over 70 plus who died of the Quraysh. They were covered up in a well. They were not given the same burial as the Muslims, but they were buried by throwing the bodies into a one of the abandoned wells, right? And this shows us that in our Sharia, we show even a minimal respect to the, to the bodies of those whom the Muslim army has killed, that we don't just let them rot in the sun. That we do something to cover them up, right? We don't have to give them the same uh, funeral procedure or the same respect or the same, and this is by the way, everywhere in the world. Any, your wounded and your dead are treated a million times better than theirs. This is all, everywhere in the world. This is the, the law of the land. So even in our Sharia, the, the, the Quraysh who died, they were given a different type of burial. They were, their, their bodies were simply uh, thrown into one of the empty well so that they are covered up and then sand is thrown onto that to cover up the uh, bodies. Uh, there was only one body who could not be buried and that was, we mentioned this last Wednesday, Umayya ibn Khalaf, right? We mentioned this last Wednesday, Umayya ibn Khalaf, that when they found his body, and he was a fat man, he was a big man, uh, when they found him, Rajul Samin, they say, and he, it's typical, you can imagine, the rich, and he, you know, he's coward that he was. So whatever they tried to pick him up, the flesh just literally melted. It, they didn't, it didn't allow 
uh, them to pick up the body. And literally, the flesh just did not decompose right then and there. And so they had no other option other than to take the pebbles that he was found in. He was found in some pebbles, right? To just take some of those pebbles and then cover his body with a mound of pebbles. And as we said, there is just no question that Allah is demonstrating. As you do unto others, it will be done unto you. As he used to punish Bilal with pebbles and rocks and stones in that desert heat, his ending will be in a sand of pebbles, in a, in a mound of pebbles. His ending will be that his body shall forever and ever and ever be rotting in this mound of pebbles as he used to punish Bilal, so too will his fate be, so that everybody knows and witnesses. And there's no question this is uh, a mu'jizah or an ayah that, uh, uh, that Allah Jalla wanted us to uh, contemplate about. So all of these uh, bodies were thrown into the, uh, the well and on the third day, as the Prophet ﷺ was departing away from the, the well, he passed by, he, di he diverted the caravan so that it would actually pass by the well. The, ca the well was not directly on the way back to Medina. But as the caravan packed up the bags, everything is, is ready to go, he diverted the caravan and the Sahaba, obedient as they were, they never asked any questions about why would you do this, they simply followed along. Right, it's diverting to the right, let it be. He diverted the, the whole caravan is following him. Then he stopped at the well where all of those bodies had been buried. All of those bodies had been buried. And he began calling them out by name, one by one. O oh, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, O oh, Walid ibn Utbah, O oh, so and so, O oh, Abu Jahl, by name. And he mentioned every one of the Ru'asa, every one of the Sanadid, every one of the, the leaders of the Quraysh. O oh, so and so. هَلْ وَجَدْتُمْ مَا وَعَدَ رَبُّكُمْ حَقَّ Have you found what your Lord has promised you to be true? As for me, I have found the promise of Allah to be true. Have you found the promise of Allah to be true? Then he moves on to the next man, and then the next man. And so he mentioned all of the leaders of the Quraysh, one by one. And then he gave this rhetorical question. Did you find the promise of Allah true? I have found the promise of Allah true. And Umar said to him, that, Ya Rasulullah, how can you speak to bodies that have no soul? How can you, to khatibu jasadan la arwaha, that you're talking to bodies that don't have any uh, cognition, they cannot hear you. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ I swear by the one in whose hands is my soul, you are not able to hear me now any better than they can. Your hearing is no better than their hearing right now. I.e., just like you can hear me, they can hear me. Right? But they cannot respond to me. But they cannot respond to me. Uh, one of the, this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. One of the narrators, Qatada, and Qatada is the student of Ibn Abbas. Qatada is one of the famous tabi'un. Qatada said, Ahyahumullahu ta'ala. Allah brought them back to life in order that they could hear the Prophet speak and in order that they could be insulted upon their injuries and humiliated and they could be a source of regret and guilt for them. So Qadada explained that Allah Azza wa Jal brought them back to life. Now, uh, we're going to pause here and go into another issue. And it is an aqadi issue, a theological issue. But it is an issue that is very relevant and people always ask about it. And this is one of the main stories that is used in a discussion of this theological issue, and that is the issue of can the dead in the grave hear or not? Can the dead in the grave hear or not? This is a, an issue that, uh, as I said, always people ask about if you go visit your relative, your grandmother, your uncle, if you visit a person in the grave, does the person know you are outside the grave, you are listening, or you can hear, sorry, not you are listening, but the, the, that person is listening to you. Uh, can he know that a visitor is at his grave? This is a very big theological question that even the Sahaba differed over. Even the Sahaba differed over. And this incident of Badr is one of the most important evidences used by both sides. It's an authentic evidence. Everybody knows it is there. The interpretation is the issue. Now, even the Sahaba, uh, so it is said, for example, that Ibn Umar, uh, Ibn Umar uh, would say, that the uh, person in the grave can hear the one uh, uh, that visits him. And, can, and, and he even said that uh, the, the uh, person in the grave will be punished by hearing his relatives cry for him. 
by hearing his relatives cry, what is called niyaha al mayyit. Niyaha al mayyit means wailing over the dead. Wailing over the dead. Uh, for example, to say, how am I going to live? Who's going to support me? You know, how are we going to live after this? This is wailing over the dead. And there is a hadith which is not exactly directly relevant to this, but the Prophet ﷺ said in one version of the hadith that the one in the grave will be punished when his relatives do this. And Aisha denied this and said, no. The one in the grave will not even hear them. How can he be punished? Rather, the actual hadith is that. So that's not exactly relevant to the point. The point here is that Ibn Umar affirmed that the dead can hear the wailing. Ibn Umar affirmed the dead can hear the wailing. Aisha said, no. The dead cannot hear the, uh, uh, the person outside. Did you not read in the Quran, Surah Fatir, verse 22, uh, uh, So Aisha used something in the Quran. You will not be able to make the one in the grave hear you. So Aisha denied this interpretation. Forget the issue of Niyah al Mayyit and, 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 and Ta'adib al, 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 al Mayyit. That's not relevant now. The issue is Ibn Umar affirmed hearing. Aisha said, No, this is incorrect. The dead cannot hear. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُسْمِعٍ مَنْ فِي الْقُبُورِ And there are other Quranic evidences as well. Surah Al Rum, verse 52. Uh, Allah says in the Quran, فَإِنَّكَ لَا تُسْمِعُ الْمَوْتَى وَلَا تُسْمِعُ الصُّمَّ الدُّعَاءَ إِذَا وَلَّوْا مُدْبِرِينَ You cannot make the mawta here. فَإِنَّكَ لَا تُسْمِعُ الْمَوْتَى Nor can you make the deaf person here when you call out to them, especially when they turn their backs and they walk away. So in this ayah, it is as if Allah is saying, al mauta is like a sum He's comparing the, the dead person to a deaf person. Also in Surah uh, An-Naml, verse 80, Allah says, وَمَا يَسْتَوَى الْأَحْيَاءُ وَلَا الْأَمْوَاتِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُسْمِعُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُسْمِعٍ مَنْ فِي الْقُبُورِ that Allah says in the Quran, the living and the dead are not the same. Allah can make anything He wants here, but you cannot make the dead here. So that all of these ayat are used <coughs> to talk about uh, the, the, the fact that the dead cannot hear. And one can say it seems very explicit from the Quran. From the Quran, there does not appear to be any evidence to suggest that the dead can hear. Clear? The Qur'an seems to say very clearly that the dead cannot hear. Clear? Right? Now, let's look at the ahadith. A number of ahadith seem to suggest that the dead can hear. Hence the controversy. This is why the controversy arises. So, of the ahadith is the hadith in Sahih Bukhari. That is a very long hadith that the Prophet mentions what happens to the gray, uh, what happens to the soul when it dies, and uh, the very long hadith. One phrase in it is of relevance to us that the Prophet said that the person in the grave he hears the footsteps of those who have come to bury him as they return. <coughs> the one in the grave when he is buried. This is at the burial. So the Prophet is talking about what happens to the ruh and it goes up and it goes down. The righteous goes up, the evil goes down. And then uh, Munkar and Nakir, all of this. So in this there's a phrase that the, the one in the grave will hear the people who have come to bury him. As they walk back, they, he, he, he will hear or she will hear, the, the soul will hear the footsteps on the ground as they go back to the houses basically. Right? This hadith is in Bukhari. Pretty clear. Pretty explicit that they will hear the footsteps going back. Another evidence that is used uh, is the famous hadith in Bukhari and Muslim that the Prophet ﷺ visited Baqi al Gharqad, Jannatul Baqi as we call it, Baqi al Gharqad, and he said, Assalamu alaykum, ahla qawmin min al Muslimin wal Mu'minin. So he's saying, Assalamu alaykum. Why would he say, Assalamu alaykum, unless the people can hear, right? Assalamu alaykum. To the people of the grave, assalamu alaikum. So this is another evidence. Another evidence that is used is the mutawatir hadith, well known in every single book of hadith, that the Prophet ﷺ said that uh, whoever sends salam upon me, Allah will send an angel to tell me that they have given salam. Right? Whoever sends salam upon me, an angel will come and tell me that so and so is sending salam. Uh, there is also a hadith uh, that says, and now this hadith is very explicit, whoever passes by the grave of anybody whom he knew and says salam, the one in the grave shall recognize who said salam and he shall return his salam to him. Now, 
This hadith is very explicit. However, it is uh, clearly a weak hadith. It is not mentioned in the six books. It's mentioned in some of the more obscure books, Ibn Hibban and Ibn Asakir and Tariq Damish, some of the more obscure books, and it is uh, very clearly a weak hadith. It's not in the famous uh, Kutub al-Sitta or Kutub al-Tis'a. Uh, had this hadith been authentic, then end of story. It's, it's very clear, but it's not authentic. Uh, of the evidence that is used is uh, the hadith of Amr ibn al-As. It's not a hadith. It's his own statement, his own wasiyah. That he's telling his children, that when uh, he's telling him what to do after he dies, and one phrase in there says, "So when you bury me, stay at my grave for the length of time it takes to slaughter an animal and distribute the meat." Now, this phrase, "slaughter an animal, distribute the meat," is found in other hadith as well. It must have been a unit of time for them, right? I mean, they have something. They don't have 20 minutes on a watch. So this is like a phrase that they would use. For the amount of time it takes to slaughter an animal and, and, and give the meat out, I would say an expert slaughterer can do it all in half an hour. Is that, is that reasonable? Right? An expert slaughterer can you know, take a goat in half an hour, just do it and cut it up. Right? In half an hour, 25 minutes, maybe even less. I don't know. So the point being, I mean, we have a rough idea that stay at my grave for this amount of time. Half an hour, however it might be. Why? What is Amr ibn? You know Amr ibn Aus. Who is he? The father of Abdullah, the famous Sahabi, the very last Sahabi who, who can remind me? Come on, I sent went over the story of conversion. I don't understand. You guys are taking notes. It should be like <laughs> somebody redeemed you. The last from Mecca, <laughs> the last who made Hijrah, right? The last who made Hijrah is Amr ibn Aus. You guys forgot of those three, the last three who made Hijrah. Allah Azza wa blessed Amr to be of the last three who made hijrah, right? So Amr ibn al-As, when he's about to die, he says, wait at my grave for this amount of time. Why? bikum. Your presence will calm me down. He's telling his children and his loved ones, stay at my grave, your presence will calm me down. Until once I am calm and recollected, I will be able to answer to Munkar and Nakir when they come. This is a very explicit hadith where he's basically saying, I'm going to be terrified, I'm going to be lonely and scared. Stay with me as friends and comforters for a while. <laughs> Let me calm down. Astatnis means to basically yani, get comfort from you, right? Once I am comforted, then I'll know how will I respond to the messengers from my Lord. He didn't say Munkar and Nakir, he said the messengers of my Lord, meaning Munkar and Nakir. Clear? Right? So this is a very explicit hadith that Amr ibn As thinks that the people at the grave will give him comfort. Right? This is another evidence uh, that is there. Now, uh, the, so this is the position, by the way, of uh, many of the scholars. Uh, so much so it is said that this is <coughs> the majority of the ummah. Uh, they said that the dead can hear uh, those who visit. Now obviously the dead can hear those who visit, not anybody in the world. I mean nobody said this, right? The dead, according to this group, if you go visit the grave and you say salam, then the person in the grave will be aware that so and so is sending salam. Okay, now who said this position? This is Jumhur, really, frankly. This is the majority position. We have, I mean, I have like 10 names here. Some of them, Ibn Hazm and Nawi, Al Suyuti, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al Qayyim, as well, held this position. The both of them held this position as well. Allah al Shanqiti in our times, uh, this is a majority position. And Ibn Kathir, I mean, a lot of scholars, they held uh, this position, and it is clearly the majority uh, position. Now, of course, their main evidence is the incident of Badr. This is their main evidence. That's why I went into this tangent here. That the Prophet explicitly said, what did he say? They can hear me just as well as you can. You can. Right? So, this is like the most explicit evidence. And that's why I wanted to go into this because the, the incident of Badr is always used uh, to be the most important and the most explicit evidence. Okay. What is the other opinion? In response to this, other people, starting from Aisha radiallahu anha, right? So we, they have Sahaba and they have Sahaba. Both groups have Sahaba. And both groups have Tabi'un. And bro both groups have great Imams. And by the way, this shows us that in some issues, even in Aqidah, there is difference of opinion in Sunni Islam. In some issues, there are a minority of issues, handful of issues. Even in theology, Sunnis differed. And this is one of those issues that the Sunnis themselves differed in. 
This is not an issue where one one aqidah says this. Hatta ibn Taymiyyah, no, nothing like this, right? I, even some scholars of the Athari or the Ash'ari tradition on one side and the other scholars as well on the other side. So this is not something that is a theological dispute. It is something within the Sunni madhahib. So what did the other camp say? On the other side we have Aisha, Umar ibn al-Khattab. We have uh, Qatada. We just mentioned, what did Qatada say? What did Qatada say in this very narration? That he's trying to explain how can the dead hear. So he said, Allah brought them back to life. Not that the dead can hear. But he said, Allah brought them back to life so that they could hear. Right? Because he could not posit an opinion that says the dead can hear. So what does he say? Allah brought them back to life. This is Qatada's interpretation. This is not the Prophet This is not the Sahaba. This is Qatada. Uh, we have as well uh, the famous Al-Bayhaqi, Ibn Atiyah, Ibn Al-Jawzi, Ibn Qudama, Al-Suhaili, Al-Qadhi Abu Ya'la Al-Hanbali, uh, Al-Shawkani. In our times, uh, Shaykh Al-Albani has written an entire booklet on this that the dead cannot hear and he has a lot of evidences in there. Now, how do you reinterpret all of these hadith? We just mentioned more than half a dozen hadith. What do you do? So, and, uh, and, and how do you respond to this? So, firstly, they say that the verses of the Qur'an are very explicit. Oh, I forgot to mention, how did the other camp interpret those verses? Sorry, I forgot to mention this, right? How did the first camp interpret all of those verses that says, the dead cannot hear? I forgot to mention that, right? The dead cannot hear. The Qur'an says, at least in three, four verses, the Qur'an says the dead cannot hear, right? How did the majority interpret those verses? They have a number of interpretations. Uh, the first interpretation is, the meaning of hear is not to hear just hearing, but rather a hearing that will benefit. A hearing that you will follow up to. Not just a physical hearing. And uh, they have an evidence for this. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, in Surah An-Naml verse 81, uh, Surah An-Naml verse 81, uh, that uh, you will only cause those to hear, uh, uh, what is the, <laughs> my mind is getting blank now. Number 80, 81, may you may be hum muslimun. In, no, no, not, there is no mota here. Number 81, you will only cause those to hear who believe in our signs. <laughs> we have four Hufas sitting in the audience. <laughs> They're all blanked out, <laughs> including myself. Innaka. <laughs> I'm telling you the verse, Number 81. I want to know it because I myself am stomach right now. He's looking up, Number 81. Hmm? We have seven iPads, four iPhones, three real Mus'hafs, and we're still waiting. <laughs> Number 81. You'll get it. No, we want to have the Amir Dhar. In to smear illa man you minu be ayatina for whom Muslimun, right? In to smear illa man you minu be ayatina. The only people that you can make to hear are those who will believe in our signs. What is the hearing here? Those who follow Islam. Not the hearing just to physically hear. So they have a verse in the Quran where they say, look, the hearing is a reference to hearing and following. Not just hearing with the ears. Is that clear? You understand this point, right? The second interpretation is, the dead in the Quran is not a physical death, but rather the spiritual death. إِنَّكَ لَا تُسْمِعُ الْمَوْتَى الْمَوْتَى is not the one who's dead. الْمَوْتَى is the one who's a kafir. And they have evidence for this as well because Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-An'am, uh, Surah Al-An'am, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, that أَوَ مَنْ كَانَ مَيْتًا فَأَحْيَيْنَا Give the example of the one who was dead and we gave him life. And the meaning here of death and life is kufr and Islam. So Allah calls the kafir mayyit. So another interpretation is, إِنَّكَ لَا تُسْمِعُ الْمَوْتَى You cannot make the kafir hear you. This is another interpretation. Right? Not, has nothing to do with the mawta there. Right? Now the problem comes that, with that interpretation is that Allah very explicitly says that, وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُسْمِعٍ مَنْ فِي الْقُبُورِ in one ayah he says mawta, but in another ayah he says man fil qubur. And man fil qubur clearly means 
those are in the grave. That's very explicit, right? So in any case, that's how they interpreted the ayat of the Qur'an. Okay, camp number two. Ash-Shawkani and others like him, Ibn Qudama, Al-Qatada, what did they say? They said that while it is true that mawta can refer to the kafir, in these verses it refers to the dead because of the verse that says man fil qubur, as I just said. Right? That these verses they refer to the one in the grave. As for your point of saying the Quran talks about hearing of benefit, this can be refuted through Surah Fatir verse 14. They bring another evidence from the Quran. Surah Fatir verse 14. Where Allah says in the Quran, إِن تَدْعُوهُمْ لَا يَسْمَعُوا دُعَاءَكُمْ وَلَوْ سَمِعُوا مَا اسْتَجَابُوا لَكُمْ وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكْفُرُونَ بِشِرْكِكُمْ وَلَا يُنَبِّئُكَ مِثْلُ خَبِيرٌ Allah is talking about all of the false entities that you call out. All of the false gods. Allat, Al-Uzza, Manat, Jesus Christ, Jibreel, the angels, they're calling them daughters of God, right? And they call them out. What does Allah say? When you call them, لَا يَسْمَعُوا دُعَاءَكُمْ They can't even hear you. وَلَوْ سَمِعُوا Even if they could hear, مَسْتَجَابُوا لَكُمْ They couldn't have the power to respond. So the reference is very clearly, they can't even hear when you call out. Only Allah is as samir When you say, Oh Jesus, He cannot hear you. When you say, Oh Allah, and Allah was a human being. We, we did this in Aqidah class. Allah was a human being, right? The five, go- the five false gods of Nuh were human beings, right? Uh, that, These five were human beings, right? And the Arabs would worship them up until the time of the Prophet So Allah is saying, they were human beings. They were gods when they were human beings. They were gods afterward. But they were humans. They're dead. And so Allah is saying they cannot hear you when you call them out. They're in the grave. Right? The idols idols were humans in the beginning. And the same goes for Jesus Christ. The same goes for Jesus Christ. The same goes for anything that is worshipped. It's an unconditional ayah. That when you make dua to them, in tadu'uhum la yasma'u dua'akum. They cannot even hear you. Walau sami'u, even if they could hear you, they couldn't even respond. And on the day of judgment, they will do kufr of your shirk. Yakfuruna bishirkikum. You did shirk, they will say we have nothing to do with this shirk that you have done. They will do kufr of your shirk. And this shows us the reference is to entities like Jesus Christ. Because only Jesus and the righteous will yakfuruna bishirkikum. Right. So that's a very explicit verse from the other uh, camp. Now another evidence that they have, how do you explain all of these ahadith? As for the incident of Badr, they say this is the strongest evidence against you and not for you. They change the incident 180 degrees. How so? They say, Umar questioned, how could these people hear when they're dead? The Prophet did not correct him and say, Ya Umar, the dead can hear. What are you talking about? Rather, he made an exceptional case. Oh Umar, إِنَّهُمُ الْآن Right now, this group can hear me just as well as you can. (coughs) An exception in time, and in place, and in people. And he didn't say, Oh Umar, why are you asking such a question? Don't you know the dead can hear? You see the difference between the two responses, right? He made a very clear exception that they are hearing me right now just as well as you can, right? And this clearly shows that Umar understood the Quran correctly. And now he's questioning how can you speak? And the Prophet is not correcting that misunderstanding because it is not a misunderstanding, it's a correct understanding. And the Prophet is simply saying this is a miracle, basically. Special time and place. How about the other evidences? The issue of the footsteps. The dead can can hear the one in the burial going back. Once again, the Prophet is making an exceptional time and place. (laughs) That this is not any person who visits him. This is at the time of burial and we know in authentic ahadith that the ruh will come back to the grave right now for Munkar and Nakir. Right? The ruh will come and re- be reunited with the body in the alam al-barzakh to respond to munkir and nakir. So the Prophet is basically telling us at that point in time, 
the footsteps of those who walk back, those footsteps on the top of the ground, they will be heard by the one in the grave. Not conversations, not hello, hi, how are you doing? Rather, just the reverberations from the top of the grave for that period of time when the soul is reunited with the body. Once again, there is a clear exceptional clause that makes logical uh, sense. As, <coughs> as for the issue of the Prophet I'm going to Baqi' and saying, Assalamu Alaikum, Ahla Qawmi Min Al-Muslim Min Al-Mu'mineen. Yes, he did say Assalamu Alaikum. But this is the Salam of Dua and not the Salam of Tahiyyah. I.e., this is a Dua he's making for the dead and not a greeting of Salamu Alaikum. Because Assalamu Alaikum literally means, may Allah's peace be upon you. So he is saying Assalamu Alaikum and he means it. He's making Dua for them. Where did you get that the dead can hear from this? There's no evidence at all that he's saying, may Allah's peace be on you, O people of the grave. And there's no evidence here that the dead can hear. And that's actually very valid. That from this hadith, you don't get anything about the dead hearing. As for the... Uh, yeah, but there's no, there's, no, there's no evidence of hearing is my point. As for the hadith of uh, the dead person recognizing the one who says salam to him, we said this is weak. And pretty much every scholar of hadith who studies hadith says it is uh, weak. As for Amr ibn al-As and his wasiyah to his children, we say this is his interpretation. The Prophet did not tell him to do it. And some of the Sahaba, Aisha and Umar, are authentically reported to have denied the dead can hear. So this is, seems to be from the Sahaba's time. As for the ahadith of the Prophet that the angels come and give him salams, once again this is a very explicit evidence against and not for. Because if the Prophet could hear directly, he wouldn't need the angels to go tell him. The very fact that an angel has to convey the salam indicates what? He cannot hear. And Allah is telling an angel to go convey the salam. And by the way, this is a common misunderstanding. It doesn't matter whether you're in front of the grave or whether you are in America. The angel will go and to give him the salam. Visiting to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ, of course, it's an emotional experience, it's an iman builder, of course. But in terms of how your salam will get to him, it's all going to be from the angels, right? How your salam will get to him. So, you being in front of the grave versus you being in America, the angel will go and tell him. Therefore, if even the Prophet ﷺ requires an angel, what does this show about? The salam that can be heard, it cannot be heard. Therefore, in my humble opinion, one of the few things I would disagree with Ibn Taymiyyah about, in my humble opinion, it does seem to be that the dead cannot hear. And Allah knows best, we, could, we shouldn't be too strict about this issue because some of the Sahaba had the other opinion. And it is true to say that many scholars held a position that the dead can hear the one who visits them. Many scholars held this position, right? So, the main point that we need to emphasize before moving on, this is a theoretical issue. As they say, no action is derived from this. It's a theoretical issue. By unanimous consensus, you don't go to the grave and start having a conversation or start asking the dead for your needs, which is shirk, right? Or, yani, such jahala you see sometimes in the Muslim world when somebody is buried, somebody is going to stand there and say, Oh, so and so, Munkar and Nakir are going to come. Make sure you say that Allah is your Lord. Now you pause for a melodramatic effect. Now say that the Prophet is your Prophet. Then you pause again. Now say that you know, this is jahala. Wallahi, is complete stupidity. Who are you to answer on his behalf? I mean, do you really think he needs you to be telling him? And they call this talqeen, talqeen al-mayyit, right? In many cultures and societies, you, you will have this talqeen al-mayyit, right? And wallahi, I mean, you just... I mean, you just wonder how foolish people are. You really think that at this point in time, he can cheat on his exam, right? Because that's what's happening, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're going to cheat on your exam that somebody's shouting the answer for you and just because you're shouting, you're going to give the answer. And he, you really wonder at the mentality of these people. So, my, what I'm trying to say is, even if you say that the dead can hear in the grave, there's no action that will come from that. There's no action that will come from that's just a theoretical issue and the evidences are frankly uh, strong on both sides. Nonetheless, from this incident of Badr, we'll get back to the incident of Badr, what did the Prophet say? That 
I swear by the one in whose hands is my soul, O Umar, they can hear me right now just as well as you can. Honestly, what do you learn from this or what do you glean from this except that this is an exception? Well, this is what comes to my mind. You know, this is an exception for these people that Umar himself was amazed and the Prophet did not correct his amazement. Rather, he simply said, they can hear me at this time just as well as uh, you can. In any case, that's uh, an issue of uh, uh, aqidah. I wanted to go into that tangent. Now we get back to the issue of uh, the incident of Badr. Now, another thing that took place in these three days before the process and returned, so he's still camped at the Battle of Badr. <coughs> the next uh, incident that occurred was the issue of the spoils of war. What is to be done with all of this is called Ghanima. Because they've never actually been in a battle before where they captured Ghanima. They've never actually caught Ghanima before. And we know for a fact from the Quran and Sunnah that the previous Ummas were not allowed to keep Ghanima. The previous Ummas they had to give it up. The Bani Israel and the people before them, Allah has not made uh, war ghanima halal for any ummah except for our ummah. That before this, as we know, um, and by the way, this is mentioned in the Old Testament as well, that when they captured the, uh, the, the, the items from war and whatnot, they would make a big pile. They would make a big pile. This is in the Old Testament. And the Quran, the Hadith affirms this. And Allah Azza wa Jal would send a, uh, 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 a lightning would send a thunderbolt and burn this up in front of them to show that it has been accepted. That in front of them, all of this money and wealth would be destroyed in front of them as a sign that Allah has accepted it from them. So when the Muslims uh, finished the Battle of Badr, they had a lot of ghanima, they had a lot of spoils of war. And they began to wonder what exactly to do with it. And some discussion broke up amongst the Sahaba. Some discussion broke up. And that is because the Sahaba in the course of the battle had split up into a number of groups. And each group was claiming some privilege over the other group. So one group said that we were the ones who collected the booty from the battlefield. We have the share of it. We should get it. We were the ones who went and collected it and so we should get it. Another group said, we were the ones who were pursuing the Quraysh as they ran away to make sure they wouldn't come back. And had we not been pursuing, you couldn't have collected. So we protected you. The third, a third group said, we were surrounding the Prophet ﷺ as precaution that they wouldn't attack. And the only reason we stayed next to him was to protect him. So how could you deprive us? Rather we deserve it as well. And so, and this was not a fight, this was not a debate, but rather this was a discussion breaking out who is going to get the, uh, the, uh, the war booty. And uh, it is said that one of the Sahaba, uh, uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, he came with a beautiful sword that he had captured from, uh, from uh, the person that he had killed. And he said, O Messenger of Allah, uh, give this sword to me. It wasn't his, it was the one that he killed. Give this sword to me for, by Allah, I used it in the battle. So he got rid of his sword, he used that. I used it in the battle, so give it to me. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْأَنْفَالِ قُلِ الْأَنْفَالُ لِلَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ This is the first ayah of Surah Al-Anfal. And so Surah Al-Anfal is revealed literally on the battlefield. Literally. And inshaAllah, I'm still serious, inshaAllah, Maybe not next week, but the weekend after that or the next Wednesday, we will go over, inshallah, maybe even the whole Surah Anfal. I'm still serious about this, right? It's a bit of a tangent, but I, we really want to connect the Quran with the Seerah. I really want to make sure that we have a... And a Surah Anfal is not a small Surah, but it's not a long Surah. It's around eight, nine pages. Uh, and uh, it's basically the every single ayah is directly linked to Badr. I mean, literally, every single ayah is linked to Badr. So I think it's a very good summary that we go over quickly all of Anfal. And I'm uh, serious about that, inshallah ta'ala. So this is the first verse of Anfal. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ Anfal. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. Ya Rasulullah, I want this. Give it to me. قُلِ الْأَنْفَالُ لِلَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ Tell them, the general rule, this is not your property. This is the property of Allah Azza wa Jal and His Messenger. And we can do with it or Allah can do with it as He, 
uh, pleases. And so, Allah Azza wa Jal is reminding them that they should not allow greed to become their primary incentive. That don't break up your brotherhood. That Allah's pleasure is more important than this money. Then the Quran goes on and then explains that, yes indeed, the war booty can be distributed and the, <coughs> the details or the fiqh of distribution is beyond the scope of, uh, of, of this but yani, every book of fiqh has chapters of, about this issue uh, but in a nutshell in a nutshell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that one-fifth one-fifth of it is put aside this one-fifth is itself divided into five. This one fifth is itself divided into five shares, right? Number sh share number one. وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّمَا غَنِمْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَأَنَّ لِلَّهِ خُمُسُهُ وَلِلرَّسُولِ لِلَّهِ وَلِلرَّسُولِ is considered one. So that is one fifth of one fifth. That is zero point zero four. No, one fifth of one fifth is not in tenth yard. <laughs> that's why that's why you're a doctor and not an accountant okay <laughs> it is it is four percent right four percent so four percent goes to the Prophet and this was unique for him in his life after his death then obviously this is not there so four percent goes to him number two what is the this is for al bayt of the Prophet and this is khumus al khumus again one fifth of one fifth so another four percent right and this is in sunni fiqh we respect the al bayt and we even give them khumus al khumus by the way the shia the, the khumus this is where they get it from the khumus that the khumus they say they have a different fiqh than us and their khumus is different than their zakah for us khumus is only in ghanima khumus al khumus is only in ghanima and it is for al bayt and the Al al Bayt, who they are, is again a question of Sunni and Shia difference as well. For us, Al al Bayt is broader than those whom the Shia say is Al al Bayt. That's another difference. But we respect the Al al Bayt and we give them this Khumus al Khumus. To this day, if this occurred, and those who were in uh, uh, the area that we are in, we will give them Khumus al Khumus. So that is the second of the five Khumus al Khumus. What's the third one? Wal Yatama, orphans. 4% goes to the orphans. What's the f next one? Masakin, poor people. Four percent goes to poor people of the community. Wabn is sabil, travelers and wayfarers don't, who don't have any money. So four percent goes to them. These four, 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 four percent. This gives you a total of twenty percent. Correct. The rest of the eighty percent is given back to the army. And in the battle of Badr, every single person was given an equal share. <coughs> This was early Islam. <coughs> Every single person was given an equal share. Later on in the battle of Khaybar onwards, the Prophet ﷺ changed this. And he gave the one with an animal three times the amount that the one who didn't have an animal. The infantry was not the same as the cavalry. right? The one who had a horse or a camel got three times the amount of the one who didn't have a horse and a camel. Uh, this was later on changed in the in the Khaybar and onwards. But right now for Badr, everybody was given an equal amount. And there were nine people who were given an amount even though they were not on the battlefield. Every one of them had a legitimate excuse. The most important for us, the one that we'll discuss is Uthman ibn Affan. Right? Uthman got a share. The same amount as all of the other Badriyun. And he's considered a Badri even though he didn't participate in Badr. Why? Because Ruqayya, his wife and the daughter of the Prophet wasallam, had fallen severely sick. In fact, they didn't know this, but she was going to die. And so, Uthman wanted to go, but the Prophet wasallam told him to take care of Ruqayya. So he remained behind and we'll come to the story later on. She passed away the day that the Prophet wasallam returned back from Badr. That she was buried on the same day. That uh, he returned back later on. She was buried earlier on in the day. So Uthman stayed behind, and he was given a share of the uh, of the uh, booty as well. Uh, another issue that took place 
in those three days, so we're still talking about again those three days, two major incidents happened. The first is the issue of, well, the issue of the, the talking to the people. I said that already. Uh, the other issue is about the, the, the booty. Uh, the third issue, which is of significance, is about the prisoners of war, the POWs. This is another big issue. The POWs, the prisoners of war. What exactly is to be done with these uh, prisoners of war? What exactly is to be done with the 73 or 74 of the uh, Usara that were captured in Badr? Once again, this is the first time they've taken prisoners. They've never done this before. And they don't know what is to be done. And in Sahih Bukhari, we learn <coughs> that the Prophet ﷺ surveyed all of these prisoners in front of him. 70 plus, all of them were in front of him. And he said, لَوْ كَانَ مُطْعِمْ إِبْنْ عَدِي حَيًّا ثُمَّ كَلَّمَنِي فِي هَأُولَئِ النَّتْنَا لَأَطْلَقْتُهُ لَهُمْ If Mut'im ibn Adi were alive right now, Mut'im ibn Adi had just died a few months before Badr. Mut'im ibn Adi is a recent death, fresh death. If Mut'im ibn Adi had been alive right now, and he spoke to me to free all of these Natna means it's filthy, filthy, dirty, because they just tried to kill us. I mean, you know, the, he spoke to me about all of these people. I would have freed them all for him. Now they're about to collect a fortune from this 73 people. Literally in our times it will be estimated in the millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. And he says, if Mut'im just uttered one word, I would return all of these people to him. For free. Now this is, in my opinion, a very significant phrase that has profound implications for us, especially here in the Western world. Question arises, why? Why would he say this? What has this phrase got to do? And why would you utter a word when Mut'im has died? Mut'im is not a Muslim. Mut'im was not a Muslim. Why would he utter this, this phrase? So Mut'im ibn Adi, if you remember, we mentioned his name many times in the seerah. And Mut'im has done multiple tasks throughout the Meccan era to help Islam and the Muslims. Mut'im was one of those who fed the people when they were boycotted. Mut'im was one of those who stood up and wanted to break the boycott. And perhaps most importantly, perhaps the number one thing that Mut'im did was that when Abu Lahab, his own uncle, said, you are no longer Qurashi, you can no longer stay in Mecca, right? When Abu Lahab himself said, you can't be here. And the Prophet returned from Ta'if and he camped outside Mecca for three days. And Bilal is negotiating because he can't return to Mecca. Abu Lahab has revoked his citizenship, basically, right? Abu Lahab has revoked his visa. You cannot come in. I am not giving you permission to come in. And so he sends Bilal to Suhail ibn Amr. He sends Bilal to Walid. He sends Bilal to four or five people. Every one of them gives an excuse. Sorry, you know what? No, this and that. I'm not that powerful. Mut'im, when he hears this, what does he do? He sends his own sons. He arms his own sons and he sends his own sons outside to escort the Prophet ﷺ back into Mecca, right? And he commands the Prophet ﷺ to do tawaf, escorted with his own sons. And then he stands up in public and he says, I have protected Muhammad ﷺ. Anybody who harms him has harmed me. Even Abu Lahab had to bow his head down and say, we will protect those whom you have protected. His own uncle refused. Mut'im stood up. And so, what is the Prophet ﷺ doing with this phrase right now? He is repaying the favor in kind. He is giving a kafir mushrik pagan what is due to him. And this shows us over and over again, and alhamdulillah, by now people Alhamdulillah in America have lost this mentality, but Wallahi 10 years ago we had it, and many people still have it, across the globe they have it, that they think, yani even now, Wallahi even now they think you're not allowed to vote, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that, the mentality is just so backward, you want to scream, scream with frustration, and yani how people, you know, that you cannot cooperate with the kuffar, and the kuffar this, and the kuffar, I mean, they're living in some other, you know, utopia or some other, you know, mentality, I think. In this uh, incident, what do we learn? That the Prophet ﷺ respected the highest honor that he is saying one word from Mut'im and all of these will be handed back to him. This is like the Medal of Honor. 
This is like the 21 gun salute. This is like the, 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 the purple star, the heart. This is like, how else are you giving the honor due? The guy is dead. He's not even going to hear this hadith, right? But there's a legacy. There's an honor. He helped us out. We have to repay that help. And we learn here that there are those who are not Muslims, but they have good hearts. Yes, this is true to say. They don't have good hearts in Tawheed. Okay, they are shirk. But they have good hearts in Islam, in, in, sorry, in, in mercy, in humanity, in tribalism, in standing for truth. This is what it is. That Mut'im did not approve of Islam as a religion, but he did not approve of the zulm of the Quraysh against the Muslims. And so the Prophet ﷺ took advantage of this. And he appreciated it and he repaid him back in kind. In our times, there are those non-Muslims who don't agree with Islam theologically. Okay, but they want to stand for truth. They want to stand for freedom. They don't want these Islamophobes. They don't want the hatred. They don't want... So it is our job to honor them, to respect them, to reach out to them, to work together for a better society as the Prophet ﷺ did. This is exact, I mean, it's so crystal clear that it is amazing that people, again, they, they, they have a selective reading of the seerah. There is no question that there are those who want to stand for truth and justice, even if they don't have the same belief as you. And to honor them, to respect them, to cooperate with them, to be with them, our Prophet ﷺ did it even in death. Mut'im is dead, and he's still uh, giving this praise to Mut'im ibn Adi. So he says this about the... Uh, about the uh, the prisoners of war, that Lokana Mutim ibn Adi Hayyan, if Mutim were alive and he spoke to me about these people, then I would have given it, uh, uh, it uh, would have given all of them uh, back to him. Now the issue came, what is to be done with the prisoners of war? And this was a very traumatic issue. Because on the one hand, these very people have just tried to kill them. Literally, it's been not only a few hours. In the morning, they've tried to kill him. Now they're prisoners of war in the afternoon. What is to be done? So the Prophet ﷺ asked the Sahaba, what do you think? And in particular, he asked his two wazirs, Wazirai, Wazirayu Rasulullah Wasallam. Ali ibn Abi Talib called Abu Bakr and Umar Wazirayu Rasulullah. Abu Ali said this, that these two were the wazirs of the Prophet ﷺ. So he asked his two wazirs, Abu Bakr and Umar, what is to be done? And so Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, they are our relatives, they are our blood, they are our kith and kin. So show mercy to them. For the sake of, 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 of brotherhood, for the sake of, of you know, uh, our own tribe, show mercy to them. After all, they're the same family as us, the Quraysh, right? And Umar ibn al-Khattab, you know him and who he is. He said, as for me, Ya Rasulullah, I think that you should give Aqil from the Banu Hashim to Ali and he'll cut his head off. And give me somebody from the Banu al-Khattab and I will do the job here. So we don't leave any of them. They tried to kill us, we should do the same to them. Why should we send them back so they're going to come and attack us another day? And so the Prophet ﷺ said uh, that verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes some hearts so soft they are softer than milk. And others he makes them so hard they are harder than stones. As for you Abu Bakr, you have a resemblance of Ibrahim and Isa. When Ibrahim said, to his to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, when Ibrahim said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that فمن تبعني فإنه مني ومن عصاني فإنك غفور الرحيم if they follow me they are of me <clears throat> and if they disobey me then oh Allah you are forgiving and merciful and Isa alayhi salam he says in the Quran إن تعذبهم فإنهم عبادك وإن تغفر لهم فإنك أنت العزيز الحكيم if you punish them then they are your servants but if you forgive then you are Aziz and Hakim so Abu Bakr you are like Ibrahim and you are like Isa and O Umar you are like Nuh and you are like Musa right Nuh what does he say don't leave a single house of kafirs on earth. Not one. And Musa says that, O oh Allah, ushdud ala qalbihim. That make their hearts hard. And fala yu'minu hatta yarawul adhab al alim. Make sure they never have iman until they see the very punishment come down on them. Right? So, O oh Umar, you are like Musa in this regard. And the Prophet ﷺ agreed to the suggestion of Abu Bakr. He agreed to the suggestion of Abu Bakr. And uh, 
the next day, Umar ibn Khattab is narrating the hadith, the next day, he found, so this is the, the second of those three days, right? He found the Prophet crying under a tree with Abu Bakr. The Prophet says Abu Bakr crying under a tree. And so Umar said, what is causing you to cry, O Messenger of Allah? For by Allah, if I understand, then I will cry with you. And if I don't understand, I'll force myself to cry just to be with you. And just to be a part of this group. Whatever it is, I'll cry. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ recited to him those verses of Surah Al-Anfal. The Prophet ﷺ recited to him those verses of Surah Al-Anfal in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that uh, it is not permitted or it is not, not permitted is the harsh word, it is not good or it is not desirable uh, for a messenger, for a prophet to have prisoners of war until he establishes power. Right now you're still weak. You shouldn't have had prisoners and then released them or ransomed them off until you have established yourself in the land. Allah mentioned one of the reasons that some of the Sahaba wanted to ransom. Not Abu Bakr, some of the Sahaba. That you wanted the money. You wanted the ransom. That was your main motivation. Wallahu yuridu al-akhirah. But Allah wants something bigger than this, better than this, and that is the akhirah. And then Allah says that were it not for the fact that Allah had already decreed this for you, or Allah Azza wa had already allowed this to happen, an adab would have come and taken you. A punishment would have come and seized you. And so this is what caused the Prophet to uh, cry and to uh, uh, feel so sad about this. Now, of course, later on, Later on, the Sharia came down to give the Khalifa the choices of what to do, right? And so this this ruling is now no longer, of course, valid. Of course, the Khalifa, if there is ever a Khalifa and this happens, there are a number of options that are allowed to be done. In this time, for the Battle of Badr, Allah Azza wa Jal said it wasn't the best decision, but now that you have done it, then let it go. And this leads us to a very deep theological and usul al-fiqh issue, which we don't really have the time to discuss in a lot of detail, but one of our brethren was insisting that we uh, talk about this in some detail. So just a few minutes on this and not too much because it is not the place for this topic. And that is the issue of uh, does the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have independent ijtihad? That is he able to exercise his own opinion? Or does everything he say emanate directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is an issue that the scholars of usul al-fiqh especially have been discussing from the earliest of times. Uh, And there are obviously, as usual, more than two opinions, but there's two primary opinions. The first of them, and this is the minority, but by the way, is that everything the Prophet says is directly wahi. And they mention in the Quran, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ That everything he says is wahi that comes to him. This is the minority opinion. The vast majority of Sunni scholars, now of course the Mu'tazila have other positions, the vast majority of Sunni scholars, they said that it is very clear and explicit that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah gave him the right to do ijtihad. And he did ijtihad and Allah Azza wa Jal would sometimes correct this ijtihad and sometimes let it pass. And in both cases, his ijtihad was binding for the Sahaba to follow. So the key point which has to be very clearly mentioned, whatever the Prophet ﷺ commanded, the Sahaba had to follow. Regardless of whether you say it came from Allah or it came from Him, unanimous consensus, all the scholars agree, whatever He commands you to do, you must follow it. However, it is in my humble opinion very clear, and this is the majority opinion, that Allah gave our Prophet the right to do ijtihad. And sometimes he was correct and so Allah let it pass. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed it or even the Prophet sallallahu himself uh, changed it. And there are many examples of this. Now as for the verse in the Quran, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى Even by the context it is very clear, this is a reference to the Quran. عَلَّمَهُ شَدِيدُ الْقُوَى ذُو مِرَّةٍ فَاسْتَوَى وَإِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ فِي لَوْحٍ مَحْفُوظٍ It's very clear that the context is about the Quran directly. 
It is very clear that the Prophet ﷺ was a human being, we all agree to this, that for 40 years before the Wahi, he spoke as a human, that even after the Wahi began, he still remained a human being. He said in an authentic hadith, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ أَنْ تَنْسَوْنَ I am a human being, I forget as you forget. In one hadith, he said that I get angry sometimes. I get angry sometimes. And uh, we'll go on and mention some examples of this. But So he mentions certain things that he is showing his own humanity. وسلم, so it is very clear that at times he can make an ijtihad regarding an issue. And this issue later on is correct or, or he himself corrects it. Of them, we are, the example is given of the incident of Badr where he made ijtihad. And this is not a purely secular matter. This is a semi-religious, semi-secular matter. It's a little bit of a both issue. What is to be done? And he made ijtihad. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, told him this wasn't the best ijtihad to do. Uh, also the issue of the example of cross-pollination. The hadith is in Bukhari where he passed by uh, farmers doing a type of cross-pollination. He said, why are you doing this? So they said, well, it works better. So he said, why don't you try not doing it? They didn't do it and obviously it wasn't pollinated. So then he himself said that if I give you something of um, uh, of Umur al-Din, then I am Rasulullah. If I give you something of Umur al-Dunyakum, fa'antum a'lamu bi Umur al-Dunyakum. You know your worldly affairs better than I do. And this clearly shows he is speaking from his own ijtihad. He is speaking from his own ijtihad, even if it is in something secular, he is speaking from his own ijtihad. However, even in matters of sharia, sometimes it appears that he was making his own ijtihad and Allah gave him the right to do that. So for example, the issue of prohibiting going to the graves. He himself said later on, I used to forbid you from visiting graves, but now go ahead and visit them. And there does not seem to be any wahi from Allah to change this. Rather, it seems that he himself felt that this is now okay to go visit graves. Another example which is even more explicit. He said, I, I was about to forbid you al-ghila. And al-ghila means uh, being intimate with your wife when she is uh, feeding the child. Uh, basically for that year or so after delivery, uh, uh, to be intimate with your sp spouse during this time of after delivery when the child is being breastfed. So he said, I was about to forbid you to do this. But then I saw the Romans and Persians do this and it doesn't affect their child. So therefore, go ahead and do it. Now this clearly shows that he, this is his ijtihad. And had he forbidden this, well I would be in trouble number one, but number two, had he forbidden this, we would have been obliged to follow. Correct? We would have been obliged to follow. So it's something that quite clearly our Prophet ﷺ had ijtihad and he was exercising it, but he looked around and he said, you know what? No, it's all right. You can do it. Also, he said, uh, for the issue of the hypocrites of Tabuk, he forgave them. And Allah revealed in Surah uh, at Tawbah, Allah revealed in Surah at Tawbah, عَفَ اللَّهُ عَنْكَ لِمَا أَذِنْتَ لَهُمْ why did you give them permission? Allah has forgiven you though, but you shouldn't have done that. So in Tabuk as well, he made an ijtihad and Allah said, why did you do that? But it's alright, Allah has forgiven you for doing this. And uh, he himself changed his mind for a number of rulings which are again, as I said, very clear that he had ijtihad and he, uh, uh, and he uh, changed it. For example, uh, Hadith of Fatiba bint Qais. She was a, a young lady that many people were interested in marrying her. Her husband died a shaheed, so the, and she didn't have a house to live. So the Prophet said, go to Umm Shuraik's house, uh, wait until your idda finishes, then I'll see who you should marry. Uh, then he sent her a message that, you know what, uh, Umm Shuraik, a lot of men visit her because she was an elderly lady and she would have uh, maybe a, uh, every few days she would have a feast or something. We don't know the whole stories, but a lot of my Sahaba visit her of the young Ansar. Don't go, don't be in her house because maybe they'll see you when they shouldn't see you. Go to your cousin Ibn Umm Maktoum. He's your cousin, he's blind. You can live in one of his rooms, so go there. Clearly he's changing his mind. First go there, first go there. Nothing wrong with this, he's a human being. Also we have for example the issue of uh, uh, Hajj. When he went for Hajj. The, the only hajj he did. The Prophet ﷺ, what type of hajj did he do? Who can remind me? What type of hajj did he do? Danish, I'll put you on the spot. What type of hajj did he do? Qiran. Qiran, very good. He did Qiran. What did he say? In hajj Qiran, لَوَ اسْتَقْبَلْتُ مِنْ أَمْرِ If I knew now what I knew, uh, what I knew when I began the hajj, I wouldn't have done Qiran. 
And I would have done basically tamattu, basic. I mean, he didn't use the words, but if I knew now what I knew back then, I wouldn't have done this, I would have done that. And this is clearly religion, and it's clearly he's talking about his own change of heart, change of uh, ijtihad. It's not sharia, but it's clearly his own ijtihad. And I've given you other examples of sharia. Again, we don't want to go into this whole discussion. I've told you this is the vast majority opinion, and the evidences are on and on and on. Um, also, the, the issue of uh, matters even of, of aqidah a little bit, where, for example, in the incident of Uhud, in the incident of Uhud, when the people hit him and the blood started coming down, he said, How can Allah ever forgive you? How can Allah ever forgive you? And what did Allah, Allah reveal in the Quran? What did Allah reveal in the Quran? Ya Hufad. Ya Hufad, what did Allah reveal in the Quran? Laysa laka min al amri shay. This is a very strict verse, very strong verse. You have no right to say this. لَيْسَ لَكَ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٍ Nothing. Whether Allah forgives or punishes, this is not yours to say. لَيْسَ لَكَ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٍ أَوْ يَعْذِمُ أَوْ يَتُوبُ عَلَيْهِ فَإِنَّهُمْ ظَالِمُونَ They have done ظُلْم. But you don't have the right to forgive or to punish. This is... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is right to do so. Also, the, is, he made a dua about Muawiyah, which I don't want to get into now. It's going to be a bit, bit too long. But yani, clearly, even when he was told, did you say this about Muawiyah? He, he made an explanation for that. Not, I didn't mean it at face value. Don't take it in that manner. Uh, a very explicit shari ruling, Mutawatir, Bukhari, and Muslim, that when he conquered Mecca, he said, every single tree in Mecca is haram. Nobody should pluck a leaf from Mecca. It's all haram. Right then and there, what did his uncle say? إِلَّا الْإِذْخِرِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Allow me to pluck the idhkhir because we use it for spice, for this or that. So what did the Prophet say? Okay, إِلَّا الْإِذْخِرِ What does this show? I mean, wallahi, you, you are very clear. It is, to me, this is an honor that Allah gave to the Prophet You have the right to do the shari'ah. Rather than flipping it around, somebody said this is disrespectful, it's the exact opposite. For our Prophet ﷺ, Sam'an wa ta'a. He's human, but he's Rasulullah. So he is allowed to write then and there say, Illa al idkhir. Okay, idkhir. So to this day, every book of fiqh says you cannot pluck any leaf in Makkah except for idkhir. To this day. Why? Because Abbas begged him for an exception. He gave his uncle the exception, and the whole ummah has an exception. إِلَّا الْإِذْخِرِ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Okay, fine. إِلَّا الْإِذْخِرِ And again, on and on. I mean, we can go on and on and on. We don't, we just, the time is up here. My point being, the brother wanted to uh, go into a little bit of a discussion in this. So there are literally, uh, no exaggeration, 50 or more examples of the ishtihadat of the Prophet ﷺ. Some of them secular, some of them somewhat secular religious, some of them purely religious, some of them even theological, clearly shows us he is bashar, he is human being, but Allah made obedience to him obligatory. So whatever he says, we must obey. Sam'an wa ta'a. Whatever he says about the sharia, about the matters of, this, uh, uh, of our religion, we are obliged to obey. And if he makes an exception, if he makes this, if he does that, this is completely permitted for him to do. And it is our obligation to hear and to obey. Inshallah, in our next Wednesday, we'll continue talking about uh, the issue of the, the prisoners of war. We haven't quite finished, so let's leave the questions uh, and answers about the prisoners to the next class. But if there are questions and answer about the issues before that, inshallah. Yes, bismillah. Uh, I have a question about where you mentioned that you know, uh, nobody came here and then you mentioned the story about the Nadi So when he will come back, how he will he know about all the incidents after his demise to his life? How will he have the knowledge of all the incidents? How will he have the knowledge of which incidents? About any of uh, the we have studied that he will come as a Muslim. But he has, he's not dead though, he's alive. So, so, but you're saying that in this, uh, in this ayah, Allah Ta'ala is also saying that he cannot hear. You're implying that, you know, when... Well, that's very clear that Isa cannot hear those who call him. That's very clear that Isa cannot hear those who call him. I, I don't understand the question then. Well, Are you saying that Isa can hear? No, Isa cannot hear. So then how will he have the knowledge of 
Of all of what? The people who call out to him? Coming back, the events. Coming back? Allah told him he has to come back. The life in between. What does he need to know about the life in between? Whatever he needs to know, Allah will tell him. Allah will ask him, did you tell people to worship me? This is in the Quran. No, the life on earth, when he comes to earth, how would he have the knowledge of what is happening? But he is Rasul. Allah will tell him what he needs to know. And I mean, when he's going to come back, histories will still be here, people will still be here. They will tell him what, whatever he needs to know. I mean, I don't see this as being ilm al ghaib. That I mean, I don't see this as being a problematic. What he needs to know, either Allah will tell him, or the people will tell him, the Mahdi will tell him, the Muslims around him will tell him that this and this is happening. I don't see this as being an issue of hearing uh, of the dead. Plus, Isa is not technically dead right now, right? Questions before we conclude? Yes. Did you hear any other incident than Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam talked to the like the people in the cover? Like, no. Like, is there any other incidents? No. The only time that's why the incident of Badr is the most explicit evidence. The incident of Baqi' is not explicit because it's just Salam. The incident of Badr, that's why I went into the tangent that that is the main incident that is used. That he literally spoke to the dead. And the point is the Sahaba did not understand this. Umar said publicly, how could you do that? Even not, none of the other Sahaba said, oh Umar, don't you know the dead can hear? So it's as if all of the Sahaba tacitly wanted this question. Umar was the brave one to ask it, that how could you be speaking to the dead? There is no other instance in the entire seerah that the Prophet speaks to a, uh, a dead person. Sisters, any questions? Brothers, yes, go ahead. How does that uh, relate to reciting the Quran on the grave? So there's two issues. Number one, reciting Quran for the dead. Number two, reciting Quran at the grave. As for reciting Quran for the dead, as I have said many, many, many times, the vast majority of scholars have allowed this. They have allowed it to recite Quran for the dead, to gift to gift it to the dead. Uh, even Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim, they all allow this. Hatta Shaykh Ibn Baz, they all allow this. Uh, and it is a minority opinion that has said it is not allowed. As for going to the grave and reciting Quran, there is nothing that has been narrated from the Prophet ﷺ in this regard. And we have authentic hadith prohibiting salah in the grave. So, honestly, the least that can be said is should be avoided. The least that can be said should be waited. However, in some books, and I haven't looked at the Asanid, it is mentioned that uh, Ibn Umar gave the wasiyah that uh, the last verse of Baqarah should be recited when he's buried. Khawatim Baqarah. And based on this, some of the madhahib have said that you recite the Quran at the grave. So they extrapolated even from this incident of Ibn Umar. So, no doubt, yani, Whoever does it, there is some basis for it from Ibn, Mas uh, Ibn Umar. And whoever avoids it, I think they're being closer to the Sunnah. Does that relate to Ibn Umar's position that uh, they can Obviously. Yes, this is <laughs> the, the whole, it's connected, right? The theological position there. Right. Yes. So if we believe that uh, the Prophet ﷺ yes. allowed it to have, and we also believe that uh, there are all these examples where, that show that, and sometimes he aired it as Is there a difference in the way uh, ulama today view that ishtihad versus what's already commanded in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So, uh, inshallah I'll make this point clear in the next Wednesday lesson as well. But I, I, I said this very explicitly in today's lecture. All Sunni scholars believe that the fact that the ishtihad was allowed to stand means Allah approved it. So, it is direct approval. The only uh, time that wahi will come down is to correct it. Which means if it's not corrected, it is correct. Right? So, this is very explicit that every ijtihad of the Prophet is binding. The Quran is very clear in the Quran. وَإِن تُطِيعُوهُ تَهْتَدُوا Only by obeying him shall you be 
guided, right? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Every prophet we have sent, we have sent so that he be obeyed by the permission and command of Allah. Know by your Lord they will not believe until they take you as the final judge in all of their affairs. And they submit to everything you say and they don't find anything in their hearts problematic to submitting to you, right? So any person who says, I don't follow the Prophet Sallallahu by unanimous consensus, he's not a Muslim. He's literally a kafir. So, your question of, are there people who are trying to distinguish? Yes, they are. These are the progressives. These are not traditional Sunni Muslims or Shi'i Muslims or any Muslims of the traditional mindset. These are those who say, you know what? Let's have a secular Islam. Let's have Islam that you know tells me how to pray five times a day, but not how to do business transactions. They are the ones extrapolating this point. And it is because of this that somebody might feel we should cut the door at its roots, but that's not the proper way to fight, you know, deviation with another deviation. We believe that the Prophet was a mujtahid, that Allah allowed him to do ijtihad, and that his ijtihad is binding. That's very clear. Now, these groups are basically saying, because he made ijtihad, why should we follow it? That's what they're trying to say. Right? And in response to them, we say we follow it because there are over 60 verses in the Quran that command us to follow the Prophet. That's why. Is that clear? So, in, in that case, when the Prophet said not to even pluck a leaf from a tree in the Haram, then how do we justify, like, when you see all this expansion? Well, that, I mean, realize, Yadanish, and all of, all of you here, please, this is a Sira class. Don't derive laws from anything I say. The issue of plucking is deeper than this. By unanimous consensus, you may pluck uh, trees that are planted by humans, for example. How else are you going to harvest food? Right? Also, by unanimous consensus, the wali al-amr or the ruler or whatnot has the right to designate property for expansion, for houses, whatnot. The point here is that vegetation and free animals wild animals should not be touched for no reason okay so we might have other issues with the expansions taking place but plucking trees is not one of them <laughs> okay the plucking of the trees doesn't apply here because the it, it would not apply when you're plucking it for a greater good for example the Prophet ﷺ ordered that the trees of Medina be dug up because he wanted to expand the masjid right so when he came to Medina you are allowed to pluck those trees to expand the masjid or to build houses or whatnot. How do you think people in Mecca and Medina are going to build houses? They have to. So when there's a, a overwhelming reason to do so, then you will do it. But otherwise, there's a sanctity even on the wildlife of Mecca and Medina. That you don't touch even the wildlife for no reason. Okay? But when do you touch wildlife for no reason? Hunting. Hunting. You're not allowed to hunt. In Mecca... In Medina, you're not allowed to hunt. So you see gazelles and deers. Once upon a time, there were gazelles and deers outside Mecca and Medina. Right now, of course, not, but once upon a time, there were zebras in Arabia. There were zebras. There are still rabbits and hares in the desert outside Mecca. You're not allowed to go and hunt over there. So the, the wildlife is sacred. If you're outside of Mecca, you're just, you know, walking and, and, and you see a tree there, you can't just pluck it out for no reason in the Haram area. As long as in the Haram. But if you're building a house, that's a separate issue. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. Uh, so we are now doing, I think, the sixth lesson of Badr, correct? Seven. This is the seventh? Yes, sixth. It's the sixth of Badr. And uh, we still have probably another two to go. Uh, so we're doing this in quite a lot of detail. I thought I would finish by today, but it looks like there's still quite a lot left, and then we want to do Surah Anfal. So maybe even three from today we have left from for uh, Badr. Um, so last lesson, we were still at the place of the prisoners of war. And we had mentioned that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his ijtihad, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed a verse that basically uh, said that, okay, this time you can do it, but it would have been better if you had done the other option. And the other option was the stricter option. Now the question arises, what is the wisdom in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala telling the Prophet Sallallahu that the harsher treatment, which was the execution, that was the harsher treatment, was better than uh, clemency and mercy in this time? 
There are a number of wisdoms that uh, we can derive. The first of them is mentioned explicitly in the Quran. And that is, Allah says that مَا كَانَ لِنَبِيٍّ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُ أَسْرَى حَتَّى يُثْخِنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ It is not appropriate that a prophet, any prophet, has pr prisoners of war until he establishes his authority in the land. You see, forgiveness, when it's done out of weakness, is not considered to be effective. Whereas forgiveness, when it is done at power, this is when it is the most effective. That you can, if you forgive and you're not capable of exacting your anger, then what type of forgiveness is it? It's not the perfect forgiveness, right? Whereas if you forgive at the height of power, this is genuine forgiveness. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hinted that at this stage of weakness, at this stage when the table has not yet turned in your favor, when you are the ones who are still having the lower hand, it would have been better if you did this to get to the upper hand. So this is one wisdom that is uh, done. That, uh, and here we're going to talk um, today and next uh, lesson, we'll talk very explicitly about, in my opinion, the, the pragmatism of Islam compared to other types of systems that preach tolerance and love but can never practice it themselves. Right? That those ways and systems that say turn the other cheek and forgive and whatnot, because this is such an unrealistic mode of living one's life, I mean, if you always turn the other cheek, everybody in the world would take advantage of you, right? And no country or society or people can exist with this ideal. And that is why these teachings cannot be a socially viable alternative to society. You understand what I'm saying here, right? To always turn the other cheek and to always forgive, this means that everybody in the world will take advantage of you. And never has any country that has claimed to follow this doctrine ever adopted it. Think about it, right? Never has any society that claims to follow this ideal of turning the other cheek, never have they been able to implement it. And this, in my humble opinion, clearly demonstrates that this is an unrealistic utopia. This is a role model that it might work on an individual level once in a while. But it will never be a realistic option. Our religion teaches that the general rule is forgiveness and mercy. Yes. The general rule is if you forgive, it is better. But at times you need to demonstrate justice and sternness. You send the message. People understand, don't mess with me. That needs to be demonstrated. And this is, in my humble opinion, frankly, a sign that Islam is a much more realistic, pragmatic reality. That it deals with the status quo. Deals with how to deal with people. Allah is saying that you shouldn't have forgiven at this stage. Because you are still humiliated, you are still oppressed. When you established your authority, then you should have forgiven. So what is the ideal to forgive? But when is the forgiveness done? When you are powerful. Look at the practical element of our religion. حَتَّى يُثْخِنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ Another <coughs> wisdom of not forgiving at this stage was that, and this is exactly what happened, that for every person that you'll save, maybe for every two that you'll save, one is going to come back to fight you. Because you're still in the beginning of the battle. And it's the same enemy. These are not going to be a different enemy. It is the Quraysh. Right? So you're going to save them now, and the exact same person whom you saved will come back to kill you. That's not very wise at this stage. And this is what happened that some of the people who participated in Badr, they, of course some of them accepted Islam, but some of them came back for Uhud. Some of them came back for Ahzab. Some of them fought in other expeditions. So this is another wisdom that why would you free somebody that will come back and then try to harm you, the exact same person. And a third wisdom Umar himself alluded to, Umar ibn Khattab, when he basically said to uh, the Prophet that, Ya Rasulullah, give me the Banu Adi, give me my relative, give Ali his relative, give everybody their relative, to demonstrate to the tribes that we are more loyal to Allah and to the faith than we are to the ancient system of Jahiliyyah, of tribalism, right? This is a wisdom demonstrated by Umar. 
that give me my relative and my sub-tribe so that nobody can accuse that Banu Hashim killed Banu Adi and Banu Kilab killed Banu Abdadar. No, we will demonstrate our loyalty. And by the way, this took years for the Quraysh to understand why are these people fighting together. Remember in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, <coughs> when uh, Suhail ibn Amr came to negotiate with the Prophet and he's looking around, he's a Qurashi, he's a Kafir at that time, he accepted Islam. He's looking around and he says, Oh Muhammad do you really think this motley crew, this crew of weirdos basically, from all different tribes, what is uniting them against you? This is exactly what he said basically, like this, this disparate group, because he couldn't see anything in common. Right? Do you really think this, this motley crew is the English word? Like literally a bunch of, of, of you know, different uh, uh, people that have come together will be able to unite and fight you against the Quraysh? Come on, get real, he's saying. Right? Look at now, he cannot understand that Islam is more powerful a combining factor than tribalism. Why would they fight you? As soon as they see us, they will run away. He's telling them this, and that was when... Um, We'll talk about that, but Abu Bakr, and he was not one to get angry, right? Abu Bakr stabbed him with the, 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 the butt of his knife, not the sharp part, but the, the, the back of his knife, right? Hit him, and he said a very vulgar phrase, which we would never expect Abu Bakr to say. But his anger got the better of him, and he actually uttered a type of curse word. Literally a type of curse word, which when we get to it, we'll figure out how to teach in the masjid. It's a difficult thing to teach. But the point is Abu Bakr said it, and Abu Bakr is the most modest and the most humble and the most quiet. But this thing made him so angry that he actually hit him. And he cursed him in a vile, vulgar language. Right? Because he couldn't understand what is Islam, that Islam unites us all together. My point being, Umar gave this wisdom that, uh, uh, that if we do this, then we will demonstrate that. Nonetheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted, as we said, the ijtihad of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And therefore, the decision was given that all 70 prisoners of war will be taken back to Medina. All 70 prisoners of war will be taken back to Medina. On the way there, <coughs> on the way back we said that the process and passed by the well I give you that story in a lot of detail the, the Qalib of Badr, the well of Badr uh, and then he paused at an open area of land and in this open area of land two prisoners of war were executed out of the 70 two of them were not spared the general rule that they were spared but then there were two who were not spared and some scholars have said this is the only time that a prisoner of war was ever executed under the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That this is the only time. This is one uh, uh, the, the theory that shows that the general rule is that prisoners of war are not executed in Islam, but on occasion they might be. And those two that were executed were another ibn al Harith. And Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Another ibn al Harith, number one. And number two, Uqba ibn Abi uh, Mu'ayt. Uh, why these two? As for another ibn al Harith, another ibn al Harith, Ibn Ishaq said about him uh, that he was Shaytanun min Shayatini Quraysh. He was of the Shayateen of Quraysh. And it is said that over eight verses in the Quran were revealed. Uh, about him. And another Ibn al Harith, he was of those who, uh, he was one of the very few Qurayshis who, before the coming of Islam, he had lived abroad. So he had lived in the, the ancient city of Hira. And Hira uh, was the capital of the, uh, the, the, the Lakhamid dynasty in Iraq. And this is an ancient Arab uh, dynasty. And Hira was a very magnificent city. So another had lived there for a few years. Then he had come back. And then the Wahi had started. So he was one of the few who had an outside education, basically. When the Quran began to be revealed, he became the most sarcastic commentator of the Quran. And he would say that, what is these fables? I can give you better fables than this. And it is said that every single reference in the Quran to somebody saying these are fables, this is another. In here, illa asatiru al-awwalin, right? Asatiru niktatabaha, fahiya tumla alayhi bukratum asila. There are many such references that they say that these are ancient fables. Asatir is story. Literally, I've said this many times. The word story and the Arabic asatir 
the same asatir story history asatir they're the same root which is a latin root uh, which has been gotten into arabic and then went into english as well asatir and history uh, are the same so he would say these are ancient fables and he would say that i can give better than this <coughs> and allah revealed in the quran that uh, who does more injustice than the one who says, سَأُنزِلُ مِثْلَ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ I can reveal as Allah reveals. This is another Ibn al-Harith. He is the one who said, سَأُنزِلُ مِثْلَ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ I can do better than Allah in this Quran. right? And it is said that when the people would come around the Prophet to listen to him, another would come and say, leave these stories, come and listen to mine, I have better stories. And he would start talking about the stories of the uh, ancient kings of Persia and the <coughs> I apologize my cough has still not uh, recovered the ancient kings of Persia and the legends and the heroes of the uh, the Persian fables which by the way has been recorded who knows the book that has been recorded in which is a classic even before this Firdausi's Firdausi's uh, Shahname Shahname right Shahnama of Firdosi. Uh, this is the original, which is in Persian. And then Alf Layla Layla is. is uh, no, no, that's Alf Layla. You're getting confused. No, you're confusing me. No, no, that's nothing to do with this. Nothing to do with this. Alf Layla Layla is a Baghdadian Arabic uh, tale which has some Persian. No, we're talking about Firdosi Shahnama, which us Indians, Pakistanis have heard more about because it's written in Persian, right? In Farsi, in ancient Farsi. And he's a Muslim, Firdosi. Why am I going to this tangent? Let's get back here. SubhanAllah, sometimes I just go down these, these uh, tangents. It's a very interesting book which has become a legendary in Persian literature. The Mughals loved it. The Mughals uh, mass produced it in, in beautiful calligraphy with, with paintings and whatnot. And this uh, Shahnama of Firdausi's, uh, Firdausi Shahnama, it is a history of all of the ancient Persian kings up until the coming of Islam. And that's why it's relevant for us as well. That he talks about the conquering of Islam and the, the, the Persian Empire. In any case, so this guy, another Ibn al-Harith, had many of these stories. The same types of stories that are recorded in Firdausi's Shahnameh. So the ancient fables of the, the Persians. So he would say, come listen to me, I will give you better stories. Right? This is that person that Allah referenced in the uh, Quran. Also another Ibn al-Harith and Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id, these two in particular. And so they were killed together, they had a lot of tactics together. The both of them decided to travel to Yathrib in the days of Islam, early Islam, and ask the Yahud trick questions to trick the Prophet with. You know, remember the story? Remember we told, we mentioned the story, right? Because of which surah, which surah was revealed? Surah Yusuf in one opinion and Surah Kahf in another. Surah Kahf, the three trick questions, right? Tell us about Dhul Qarnayn, tell us about the Ruh, tell us about... Who were those people that traveled <coughs> from, <coughs> from, from Mecca to Medina? Another ibn al-Harith, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id, these two. To travel all the way, for what reason? To try to trap the Prophet And they came back so happy and proud that now we have him trapped. We have the questions from the Ahli Kitab, the Yahud. That for sure he cannot answer, and that shows he's a liar. And of course he answered it, and then what happened to the two of them? They just ignored their claim. Right? This is another and Uqba. And as for Uqba, I mean, what can we say about Uqba? Uqba was one of the most vile and evil. Who remembers what Uqba did? He has so many stories. Uqba was the one who physically carried the carcass. Physically carried the carcass. In that infamous incident when the Prophet was in Sajda, Uqba was the one who went outside happily. Abu Jahl taunted. Abu Jahl said, Who can get the carcass? Who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? Come on. So Ibn Ishaq says that uh, the most uh, despicable of them stood up. And that is Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. And he rushed to get the carcass and he then carried it from outside of Mecca and as I said can you imagine a nobleman who has slaves who's a rich person he's gonna spoil his blood with a dead animal stinking rotting dead animal and he's gonna take it all the way back to the Kaaba to throw onto the process and this is Uqba this is Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt what else did Uqba do who can remind me he has a number of stories in the seerah what else did Uqba do any other 
Uqba was the one who physically tried to choke the Prophet to death while he was praying. That he took out his, his uh, cloak, Jazakallah he took out his cloak and he threw it around the neck of the Prophet and he tried to choke him. <coughs> then what did Abu Bakr say? <coughs> Excuse me. Ataqutuluna rajulan an yaqula Rabbi Allah. Will you kill a man just because he says Allah is my Lord? This is that ayah in the Quran. Uqba is the one trying to do it. Okay? Uqba is the one trying to uh, do it. And then there are other uh, stories as well about Uqba. What else did he do? Uh, multiple stories. This is Uqba. So when Uqba was brought out to be executed in front of all of the prisoners, he said, why me out of all of them? Like he's literally begging for his life now. Why me? And Ali said, because of your animosity or enmity, adawatuka, because of your animosity to Allah and his messenger. And it is said that Ali was the one who killed him. So Uqba himself, uh, and also there's a, um, uh, in Sirah Ibn Ishaq, it mentions that right when he's about to be killed, he's basically begging for his life. And SubhanAllah, look at his character. Some of the others, they died, however ignoble, but they didn't beg for their lives. Abu Jahl and others, they remained kibber to the very end, right? And um, here's uh, an Umayyah, Umayya, as you know, he tried to barter his life for money, right? Umayyah tried to purchase himself, right? So Uqba, when he sees now Ali with the sword, he falls on his knees, he's begging the Prophet being saying that, O Muhammad, who will take care of my children? Man Sibia, who will take care of my children? Who's going to do uh, take care of my children? And uh, the Prophet gave a very enigmatic response, which we're going to explain now. He simply said, An-Nar, the fire, An-Nar. And then he was executed by uh, Ali. Now, what does it mean, uh, An-Nar? One of two opinions is given. Uh, the first of them uh, is that the Prophet is saying, don't worry about your children, you have to face the fire now. You have something far more bigger than uh, you, your children to worry about. Uh, and then the, the other uh, interpretation is that uh, if they follow your footsteps, they don't have to be worrying about taking care of. You have already led the way to the fire for them. So these are two interpretations given about what uh, An-Nar means over here. Also, there's no question that it has to be pointed out that here he is groveling for forgiveness and begging for his own children. Where was his own sympathy when the Prophet's daughter had to come and save the Prophet from sajda? Right? When no other man could do it. Because of Uqba, Fatima, the little girl, had to come running. You remember the story of the carcass, right? And Fatima had to come and, uh, because no man would dare do anything over there, the, the, they, were, they were laughing. Ibn Mas'ud himself says, I couldn't do anything, I was a slave, right? Abu Bakr was far away, Fatima comes running. Where was his sympathy for children then? This is of course the standard, uh, you know, cowardice that is used. Where is his bravery now? That he could do this to the Prophet and now he is saying, Man Sibya, Ya Rasulullah. Also, as I said, and I don't make any, uh, I think this is a very realistic and pragmatic sign, that our religion shows harshness when it is due, and it shows mercy when mercy is due. That people like Uqba and people like another, the message needed to be given, that not all kuffar are the same. That people like these, they went out of their way. They are, as Ibn Ishaq says, the uh, shayateen of the Quraysh. So for them, the message is given that there is no clemency, there is no forgiveness. You will not be forgiven. And frankly, these people, they were to the level of all of the others who were killed. They were to the level of those who Umayyah ibn Khalaf and, and all of the rest who were killed for some wisdom that Allah knows, maybe to demonstrate a special death for them. These two were spared. Maybe to demonstrate that uh, the special, if you like, uh, ignoble fame that they got, that they will be the only prisoners of war executed at the command of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu left from the, the Battle of Badr, from the Plains of Badr, on Monday the 20th of Ramadan, because he stayed there for three days. 17th is Badr, the battle. So, 17th was Friday. So, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. He left on uh, Monday and 
the Muslims, he had already sent some criers back, and the Muslims were waiting patiently to find out what had happened at the Battle of Badr. And the rumors had come, because three days had gone by, but they really could not firmly believe that this is happening, until finally the first person to return was Zayd ibn Haritha. Zayd ibn Haritha, the adopted, quote-unquote, uh, son of the Prophet And the Prophet sent him on his own camel, Al-Qaswa, as a sign that this is, he's telling the truth, Al-Qaswa. And Al-Qaswa, uh, the camel, is everybody recognizes. They could recognize animals back then as well. Unlike us, to, to us, all camels look the same and whatnot. They recognized Al-Qaswa, they recognized Zayd. Zayd comes so excited, he's saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And then he starts mentioning the names of all of those who had been killed. Qutila Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, Qutila Umayyah ibn Khalaf, Qutila Abu Jahl. And it's a who's who of every single famous person of the Quraysh. Right? It's unbelievable. Like this is just news that it's, it really is if you think about how many people were killed and who that list is, it's unbelievable. When the Muslims heard this, they became very happy. And when the neo, if you like, munafiqun, because at this point there are no munafiqun. The munafiqun will start right now, today. They will start. This is the beginning of nifaq. Right? So the group that was to become the Munafiqun, that's why I say the Neo Munafiqun, right? The group that was to become the Munafiqun, when they heard this, they started mumbling and, 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 and whispering amongst themselves that clearly was, uh, that Zayd has gone crazy and that Muhammad Sassim, has been killed and Zayd has gone crazy and taken his camel and now he's delirious and he's now babbling. Because they couldn't believe that the news is actually true. It's simply unbelievable. Ironically, as we'll come to, the exact same reaction happened in Mecca when the first crier came back. That's not true. That couldn't be true. right? Both camps basically were in a type of disbelief that how could this actually have uh, happened. Uh, and so the hypocrites began, uh, and the neo-hypocrites really like, began saying that uh, the Prophet himself uh, is dead, and subhanAllah the nifaq is about to begin now, and such is the way with the munafiqun that they will leave no opportunity except that they will attack Islam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. There's one footnote of a sad news here, that as Zayd ibn Haritha was coming into the city, and he's saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, one person also heard the takbir, and that was Uthman ibn Affan, he heard it in Baqi' just as they finished burying Ruqayya, right? So the takbir came, he literally heard it the same day that, that, uh, Zayd, uh, that Usama came back. Uh, sorry, not Usama, Zayd. Zayd came back the same day, the same minute, the same hour that it is said that he just finished burying the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, that was when he heard uh, Zayd saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So he asked, what is going on? What is the takbir? And so he was told that uh, the, 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 the battle of Badr has been a uh, success. And wallahi, if you think about it, the battle of Badr is one of the happiest occasions for Islam and the Muslims. Perhaps up until this point in time, nothing happier has happened. Nothing more joyful than this. And yet still, Allah will that on that day, a tragedy strike. The very household that deserves the most joy. And that is the Prophet ﷺ, right? That Ruqayya, his daughter, according to one, now the, the order of his daughters, uh, we really don't know to be honest, even though there's a common understanding, but Ruqayya might have been the second, she might have been the third, uh, some say she might have been the first as well. Uh, so there's some ikhtilaf, which number of daughter, uh, which number of daughter she was, but she was the first daughter to die. That's for sure. She was the first daughter to die. Right after her, Uthman married Umm Kulthum. After her, Uthman married Umm Kulthum. Right. So Ruqayya was the first of his daughters to die. It is as if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is showing that no matter how happy you are, this world is going to be a world of testing and a world of trial. That even on the day of Badr. Now, if Allah had willed, it could have been delayed a week, could have been come back. But the very day of Badr. That the happiness should be the utmost, it is as if the message is also being given. That realize this world is a temporary abode. And life and death does not stop for anybody. Anybody. That it comes when you least expect it. And this is the reality of Hayat al-Dunya. That as the Prophet said, every one of us has a long list what we want to do. 
And before we get to the end of this list, life makes that list, cuts it in half, right? He gave this, you know the example, right? That every one of us has a long amal, and his amal goes everywhere, all the way out. But then he drew a line, and it goes, death comes, and psh, all of those desires go out. And wallahi, this is the way every one of us, when our time comes, we will wake up and we think we have this to do, that to do, this to do, that to do. And where will that list go? It will just go out the window. With our death, khalas, it will be gone. This is the reality of life. It is as if our Prophet himself is being shown. And through him, every one of us. Through him, because obviously he is our role model. That even at this time of happiness and joy, still realize that the ultimate happiness is in the next, not in this uh, life. And uh, so Zayd, uh, Zayd ibn Haritha came back. And uh, the news spread in the, amongst the people of Medina. And they all gathered together to wait for the Prophet ﷺ to come. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ came back with all of the 70 prisoners. Uh, prisoners, And they marched to the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ because they don't have any other place to put the prisoners. right? And the Prophet ﷺ dispersed the prisoners amongst those who had captured them. So he said, go take care of the prisoners of war yourselves. Each one who had captured would basically host the prisoner. And the chieftains or the leaders of the Quraysh were hosted by the Prophet ﷺ himself. And I have commented here before when I taught the seerah, that never in the history of humanity has a prisoner of war been taken care of by the ruler, the king, the prophet that was in charge of the other side of the army. Never has a prisoner of war been taken into the very house that the king, or in this case, the prophet lives in. This is never in the history of mankind. That the chieftains of Quraysh, and in particular, Suhail ibn Amr was the senior most living, and Suhail ibn Amr was the same one who's going to negotiate Hudaybiyah. Right, you can understand who is Suhail ibn Amr. He's the same one who's going to negotiate Hudaybiyah. He's of the level of Abu Sufyan. He's now of the elite of the Quraysh. The, the rest have all gone. Those senior to him, they're all dead now. So the senior most members of the Quraysh, they are housed in the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Foremost amongst them, Suhail ibn Amr. And as I said, where in the history of mankind have prisoners been taken and put in the houses of the same roof that the leader, that the ruler is going to uh, sleep in. And this is what our religion did, that they housed the prisoners along with their captors. And Sauda, the wife of the Prophet wasallam, something happened here which caused her to regret what she had done. Sauda, uh, she was with the mother of those that had killed Abu Jahl. Remember the two kids that had killed Abu Jahl, right? Sauda was in their house. And when she heard, so she was not at home, when she heard that uh, the, the Quraysh have surrendered and that the process has come back, she rushed back home, and this was before hijab was revealed, so there's no concept of separation at this time. Uh, she rushed back home and she barged into her own house and there in the corner of the room she saw Suhail ibn Amr with his hand tied up and sitting as a prisoner, that's what he is, he's a prisoner, right? And she didn't even notice the Prophet is next to her. She didn't even know, she just comes in. And when she sees the leader of the Quraysh with her ha his hands tied up, she said, and she herself narrates this, that I, I forgot who I was, that I forgot every, the whole scenario. And I simply said that, Ya Aba Yazid, that's his kunya, Ya Aba Yazid, you surrendered like this? Why didn't you die an honorable death? Then live like prisoner. So what happened? Instantaneously she just reverted into those old days. Like she feels a disgrace that the leader of the Quraysh is now sitting as a prisoner. That she is saying, did you have to surrender to save your life and live like this? You should have died on the battlefield like an honorable man. That's what she's saying, right? Sauda said, فَمَنْ تَبَهْتُ I didn't even realize what I said until I heard the Prophet next to me. Like, completely lost track of what I'm saying. Until I heard the Prophet next to me and saying, Ya Sauda, أَتُحَرِّضِينَهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ You are stoking him to fight against Allah and His Messenger? Like, do you realize what you're saying? And Sauda said, 
يا رسول الله والله والله الذي لا إله إلا هو I lost sense of who of what I was saying when I saw him sitting like this I lost control and it basically I went back to uh, that stage and فلم أتمالك على نفسي I couldn't control myself like so she's making an excuse for herself and the Prophet ﷺ accepted that excuse and this shows us over and over again we see this in the seerah the humanity of the companions this is a uh, a very major blunder. And yet the Prophet ﷺ didn't criticize her. Like she gave a legitimate excuse. And it, we understand her excuse. That, that <coughs> Suhail ibn Amr, the senior, now you can imagine Soda's grown up and Suhail is like the leader. That Soda has grown up and she has been taught to respect Suhail. And she has been taught to uphold the Jahili ways. Jahiliya ways. Now she accepts Islam. And then she sees Suhail tied up like this. So she said, basically, I mean, I'm translating colloquially, she didn't say, I forgot who I was. She said, I couldn't control myself. And I, when I saw him like this, I couldn't control myself. So what is the psychological frame of mind that I forgot where I am and who I am and all of Islam? What I, did, what I couldn't stand is to see my chieftain and my leader tied up like a prisoner of war. So she's making an excuse and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forgives her and accepts this excuse. And the point being that, wallahi, every one of us, sometimes we make mistakes of judgment, mistakes of emotion, mistakes of anger, mistakes of every, we all make mistakes. <laughs> if the Prophet can forgive a mistake that outwardly it is a type of kufr, it is a type of kufr. Why? Because she is saying, you should have fought against Allah and His Messenger. That's what she's saying, right? And that's what the Prophet said, you are encouraging him to fight against Allah and His Messenger, right? But what happened? In her emotionalism, she lost control of rationality, right? And there are many examples in, for example, the famous hadith of uh, the man who's going to die in the desert out of thirst. The man who's going to die in the desert out of thirst and hunger, right? And he's literally dying and then he sees his camel. What does he blurt out? Oh Allah, you are my servant, I am your Rabb. Even the Prophet smiled at his madness and he, and he made an excuse for him. That he said, أَخْطَأَ مِنْ شِدَّةِ الْفَرَحِ Even the Prophet made an excuse for this guy that he made a mistake because he was deliriously happy. Right? So, my point here, every one of us brothers and sisters, when our loved one, when our brother, when our son, when our father, when anybody makes a mistake out of emotion, out of anger, out of anything, and then recognizes the mistake. Let us also act the way that the Prophet acted here. That, okay, okay, let's move on. That's it, he never brought it back up with Sauda again. It's human nature that people do make mistakes for whatever reason, whatever the reason might be. Don't keep on on the same point of that uh, mistake. Now, the Prophet as I said, gave every prisoner of war to uh, the one who had captured him. And he said that, uh, treat them with kindness. I command you to treat them with kindness. And so Ibn Ishaq mentions a number of stories here about how uh, kindly they were treated. That one of them, Abu Aziz, he is the brother of Mus'ab ibn Umayr, he said that I was assigned to a group of the Ansar and every time they sat down to eat, they would give me the, the bread and the meat and they would take the dates and the water. They would take the dates and the water, they give the luxurious meal to me because, the, he himself says, because the Prophet had told them to treat the prisoners with kindness. And he said, out of embarrassment, I would put the bread back in front of them. Because I felt very embarrassed that I'm getting the, the luxury meal, right? And they would take it and put it back in front of me. And again, I say, this is the beauty of our religion. Strictness, a time of strictness. Those two were executed. Right? But what happened to the other 70? They were treated before there were any Geneva Conventions, before there were any of these things. Our Prophet and the Sahaba, they treated them way better than even themselves were uh, treated. And this is an unparalleled treatment of prisoners of war in human history. Never before this time. And that's why, by the way, why were the Geneva Conventions given? Is because mankind realized, you know, we need to treat prisoners decently. We cannot just do this to them, right? Our Sharia, gave these rights when no other culture on earth was giving them. That they were given not the same food, better food than their captors. Right? They were treated 
royally. Suhail is living in the house of the Prophet ﷺ. Can you imagine? I mean, as I said, imagine which ruler has ever taken a prisoner of war and caused him to live in the same house as himself. The same roof, the same food is there. there no Guantanamo, yes. No Guantanamo over there. Yes. This is the reality of our religion. And we say this in light of what happened to another and an Uqba. And this is what makes our religion really a practical, realistic religion. A religion that, wallah, you can understand, it is a, a, a true religion of Allah. Strictness when you need to, but the general rule is mercy and kindness. The general rule is mercy and kindness. So, the uh, Prophet wasallam sent the message back to the Quraysh that these are the prisoners that we will ransom off. And uh, there are different uh, narrations given about the price on the prisoners of war. And inshallah, the correct opinion is that every single prisoner, and because there seems to be contradictory narrations, but what seems to be the case, every prisoner was given a price that was suitable for him. That this seems to be the strongest position. That the rich prisoners had to pay a higher ransom, and the poorer prisoners paid a lower ransom, so much so that the poorest prisoners basically went away with nothing. They could go back without paying anything. And this again is an amazing uh, reality that what other society will do. And also by the way, the fact that the processor knew every one of them personally, so he knows how much money they have as well, right? That's also something that who else can say? Every single family is known to them. They are after all relatives, they're all Qurashi. And so every one of them has a, uh, a price. Uh, Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu the Ansari who captured, remember captured quote unquote, remember the story of his capture, right? The, the small Ansari who thought he had captured him. So he was living with this Ansari. So the Prophet uh, the, the Ansari came to him and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I'll gift him to you. He's your uncle meaning, you know, I'll gift him to you. That take him as a gift. And the Prophet said, no, rather, do not decrease his ransom by even one coin, one penny. Take it fully from his ransom. No, you're not going to gift him. He will pay for his ransom from every single, uh, you know, every the, the price that he has. And he got a very high price. He got 4,000 uh, dirhams. 4,000 dirhams was the highest price uh, given. And subhanAllah, again, here we find the beauty of our religion. The Prophet had said, don't kill him. Don't kill him. Remember that was the command given. Don't kill him. But now that he's captured as a prisoner of war, he shall get the exact price that is due, the 4,000 that is due. Not just that, but the Prophet ﷺ told him that you must also pay the ransom of Aqil and uh, Nawfal. Both of these are his nephews. Aqil, uh, Aqil is the older brother of Ali. Ali ibn Abi Talib. right? The older brother of Ja'far. Ja Aqil was the oldest. And then Ja'far and then Ali. Aqil, Ja'far, and then uh, Ali. So Aqil was also captured, and then Nawfal ibn Harith, and Al-Harith was the oldest son of Abdul Muttalib. Al-Harith was the oldest son of Abdul Muttalib. So Nawfal ibn Harith is a cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu and he's a nephew of Abbas. So he said, you will pay their ransom because they don't have any money, you have money. So the, he had the highest ransom and he had to pay for all of them. Now it's an interesting hadith here in Muslim Imam Ahmad that he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said that, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, I'm a Muslim. So why are you putting a ransom on me? I was a Muslim and they forced me to fight. So now he's arguing that he was a Muslim. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? <coughs> Allahu A'lam. Allah knows your situation. Basically, we have to judge you on the outer reality. Allahu A'lam. Allah knows. I'm not saying you weren't. I'm not saying you were. Allahu A'lam. Allah knows your niyat and your situation. And if what you say is true, Allah will give you something better. But we have to judge you by your actions and you were against us, so you must pay your ransom. It is said, and he himself said this, Abbas himself said this, that uh, Allah revealed Surah Anfal verse 70 about me. Allah reveals Surah Al-Anfal verse 70 about me. What is this verse? Allah says in the Quran that Ya ayyuhu an-nabi qul liman fi aydikum al-asra in ya'lam illahu fi qulubikum khayran yu'tikum khayran mimma ukhidh minkum wa yaghfir lakum wallahu ghafur rahim. O Prophet, say to those whom you have as prisoners of war, 
If Allah knows that you have good in your hearts, Allah will give you something better than what He took away from you. And Allah will forgive you, and Allah is ghafoor and rahim. If you're good in your heart, Allah will give you much more than He took away. So Abbas said, this verse came down for me. So Abbas said to the Prophet ﷺ that, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you put 4,000 dirhams, I don't have any money. I don't have, how am I going to pay 4,000 dirhams? That's just for me, by the way. Then he had to pay for Aqil and he has to pay for Nawfal. He said, I don't have any money. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? So he said to him, Where is that money that you and Umm al Fadl, your wife, hid on such and such a day that you went out and you buried it? And you said to Umm al Fadl that if I ever die, then this will go to, uh, to Al Fadl and this will go to Ab uh, Abdullah and this will go to Al Qutham, another of his sons, right? Where is that money that you hid? Right? So immediately he said, I swear by the one who has sent you with the truth that you are the messenger of Allah. No one knew about this other than me and her. Like he, subhanAllah, look, you know. And this also shows that perhaps even Al Abbas was not that much yaqeen. Like he's saying he's a Muslim. Allah knows at this stage how much, right? And even the Prophet said, Allahu A'lam. I don't know, you know, Allahu A'lam. So this type of incident, so he's saying, where is my money? I don't have the money, right? So the Prophet said, well, you had that money. Remember you and Umm al-Fadl, your wife, you went and you hid it on such and such a place and you told her on the way back that if I ever die, this much goes to this son, this much goes to that son, this much, where is that money? That's the money I want, right? So that's when he said, I swear that Allah is the one that has uh, sent you with the truth. And uh, Al-Abbas used to say that, so the verse says that if Allah knows you have good in your hearts, He'll give you more than what He took away. Abbas said later on in life that, Wallahi, I wish the Prophet had taken more from me because what He gave me in return is much more than what He took. And he said that, I had to give 20 uqiyas, which is an amount of silver for, for uh, uh, an amount of silver. And instead of these 20 uqiyas, now I have 20 slaves. Each one of them is a businessman trading. And I get basically uh, the profits of 20 businessmen underneath me, right? So Abbas was a businessman. He was a very shrewd businessman. He had a lot of businesses in the end. And that's why in the uh, khutbah of uh, Wada', Hajjat al Wada', what did the Prophet say about Abbas? That the first business transactions that deal with interest that I will make null and void are those of Abbas because Abbas had a, a lot of interest. A lot of interest that was owed to him. And he said, the Prophet said that to show you I don't want anybody to benefit, my own uncle, nobody has to pay him interest anymore. So he had a lot of money even by the time of the conquest of uh, Mecca. So uh, the point being that Al-Abbas therefore paid his full ransom along with uh, the ransom of his two nephews. It is also authentically reported, <coughs> we hear about this as children and we, we teach our children this, and it is authentically reported in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad that there were some captives who didn't have any money but they knew how to read and write. And so the Prophet ﷺ told them that they may go free if they taught the children of the Ansar how to uh, read and write, to be literate. And this is an authentic hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmed. We hear about this all the time and this is a very true incident and we know the benefits from this. I don't need to derive them for you. The importance of education, that education was valued more than a few thousand uh, dirhams were, that the Prophet ﷺ wanted to spread literacy in a society that at the time didn't care about literacy. At the time, literacy was not encouraged, but the Prophet did encourage it, and these types of hadith uh, show with this. I've also said many times before that Islam was a civilizational force for the Arabs. That Islam came to a group that did not care about culture, about adab, about history, about reading and writing, and it brought them all of these things and more. That Islam came and it was a civilization it, it raised the Arabs up to be the leaders of the world. This is something that I've mentioned many times before, and these types of incidents, they uh, prove that. Another incident regarding the prisoners of war deals with uh, Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'ah. Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'ah, who was the son-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The husband of Zainab. The husband of Zainab. And Zainab is most likely his eldest. Zainab is most likely his eldest. <coughs> Abu al-As, by the way, his mother was Hind. Who is Hind? No. No. 
other hand? The other hand. No. Oh, Khadija. Khadija's sister. Khadija's sister. You're right. I knew I made a mistake. Exactly. I'm thinking I made a mistake. You're right. Hala. My mistake. Yes. One point. One point for him. Mithai. Mithai. <laughs> I was wondering. It's not Hind. You're right. It was, uh, it's Hala. Hala. Hala, the older sister of Khadija. So, uh, Abu al-As, Khadija is his Khala. So he's the cousin of Zainab, right? You understand? And this marriage had taken place in the days of Jahiliyyah. So this shows us how old is Zainab as well, by the way. Right? This marriage had taken place before all of this animosity and whatnot had began. And Abu al-As was a loving husband. And there's an incident we're going to come to later on where Zainab gave him protection when she was in Medina. We're going to come to that when we come to it. So Abu al-As at this point in time is fighting uh, against the Muslims in the battle of Badr. And uh, the ransom was sent for him as well. And it is said that when the ransom came, the uh, Zainab, the, the daughter of the Prophet to, uh, to make up the whole quantity, a part of what she gave was her jewelry. And one item of that jewelry was a necklace that Khadija used to wear that she had gifted to Zainab at the time of their wedding. As is a custom till to this day that mothers gift their jewelry to their uh, daughters, right? And so when the Prophet ﷺ saw this very necklace, his heart melted. That this is the necklace that Khadija used to wear, right? And they could see the effects on the face of the Prophet ﷺ that this is that necklace that brought back the memories of Khadija. SubhanAllah, so many as we know, I've given, I've given a whole lecture about Khadija, I remember. A detailed lecture about Khadija that the footsteps of Hala would almost bring the Prophet ﷺ to tears. Right? Yes, that's how you remember it, right? The footsteps of Hala. That he would recognize from her footsteps. He would think it's Khadija. Then he would say this is Hala. And Aisha would get jealous when Hala visited. Because she could see the effects of Khadija's memory on the face of the Prophet So when he saw this necklace, they could see it physically uh, affected him. And the Prophet uh, will find out why in a while. He requested to those who uh, owned Abu al-As or who had captured Abu al-As. That if you feel it is appropriate, uh, can you set him free? Without this, without this item, can you set him free? So he made a shafa'a, and who's going to say no to the shafa'a of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? So he was uh, sent back, and we'll discover why this happened uh, in a while. That uh, Abu Abu Al-As ibn Rabi'ah was uh, sent back without uh, this uh, ransom. Another famous uh, story that took place was that uh, the ransom was the ransom of Amr ibn Abi Sufyan, the older brother of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. The son of Abu Sufyan. Now Abu Sufyan is of course the leader of the caravan. Abu Sufyan is going to be the leader of Uhud. Abu Sufyan right now is the undisputed leader of the Quraysh. He is now the big guy. And so he has been traumatized the most in many ways. Because now all the pressure is on him to make a stand and a decision. He's been utterly humiliated. That in trying to save his camels and the, 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 you know, the caravan, what happened? Disaster in all of Mecca, right? You, you understand this point. Put yourself in his shoes. Like, how must he be feeling? So, uh, he was sent that, go ransom your son, Amr ibn Abi Sufyan. And when, when Abu Sufyan heard that his son was held for ransom, he said, do they expect me to give up my money along with my blood? They have killed Hamdala, one of his uh, sons that, that uh, died in, in Badr. They have killed Hamdala and now they want to make me penniless to, get, to pay for Amr. Let him remain in their hands. He will stay there as long as they want. I'm not going to pay money for my son basically. right? And subhanAllah, it is amazing here to see the only reason he could have done this was that deep down inside he knew that they wouldn't kill and they wouldn't torture, and they wouldn't persecute him. Think about this, right? That no matter how much he hated Islam and the Prophet ﷺ at this time, he knows that his son is in safe hands. 
And the irony is that that's why he can say, let him have it as long as they want him. Can you imagine if he had been tortured, would the father be saying this? No. So he knows that they're going to take good care of him. And it is this irony that he simply says, let him remain there. But he did a very dastardly deed, a very evil deed to get his son back. And he did something that goes against the principles of Islam and even the principles of uh, their jahili laws. And of course, Allah has forgiven him because he accepted Islam later on. That is that he violated the sanctity of the haram. He had something in mind what he would do. Uh, many months later, Many months later, so he's sitting in Mecca for as long as this, we don't know an exact date, but weeks and months go by, uh, that one of the uh, uh, elderly people of Medina, an Ansari by the name of Sa'ad ibn al-Nu'man, who has nothing to do with Badr or anything, he's just a person living in Medina, and he's a Muslim. He's come to do business in Mecca and to do Tawaf and Umrah, and as we all know from the beginning of this series, we've been saying that Mecca is a haram, and anybody can go to Mecca, and even the Quraysh would see the murder of their father in Mecca and they would not hurt him, right? This is the law of Islam, it is the law of Jahiliyyah, it is the law that the Quraysh themselves upheld. And ironically, they only went against it for Muslims. So now when Sa'ad ibn al-Nu'man came, Abu Sufyan in broad daylight kidnapped him and held him hostage in his house. And he said, I will not release him until you release my son. This is now blatant extortion. There's just no way to, to, to say this nicely, right? Blatant extortion. And Allah has forgiven him because he accepted Islam. But at this point in time, this is uh, blatant extortion. So he said, a life for a life. You release my son, I'll release a Nu'man. And so uh, the uh, Sa'ad ibn Nu'man, so the, the tribe of Sa'ad ibn Nu'man, they came to the Prophet and they said, O Messenger of Allah, this and this has happened. And so he released the son of Abu Sufyan without any ransom because of this, because of this extortion, because of this. Uh, uh, and this is, I mean, again, we see this from the very beginning, the double standards of the Quraysh. That a few months ago, when the Muslims killed somebody in the Haram, remember the incident, right? Sariyat al Nakhla. A few months ago in Rajab, when they killed uh, one person, they went crazy. Look at these people, they're doing this, they're doing that. When one of their chieftains in broad daylight in front of the Kaaba kidnaps an elderly person, not one word comes out of their mouths. Double standards? Obviously. And this is, we see this all the time in every single nation that opposes Allah and His Messenger. They can talk about human rights as much as they want and freedom and whatnot, but we see double standards over and over and over again. This is, again, this is when you don't have a hard and fast standard that comes from Allah, then you will make excuses for yourself and you will not make excuses for the uh, others. And also see that the Prophet ﷺ, there's an area, there's a, uh, sorry, there's an air of pragmatism here. He deals with them despite the fact it is open dhulm. He still deals with them because what is, what is the, it the fault of Asad ibn Numan? He brings him back and he has him, uh, he, he swaps the two uh, prisoners of war. And uh, of course, we all know the famous story of uh, Mus'ab ibn Umair, uh, that when he passed by his brother, uh, Abu Aziz ibn Umair, uh, Abu Aziz, when he saw his brother, he became very happy. He said, oh my brother, now, you know, help me out here now, right? Help me out, now you can help me. Uh, and uh, instead of answering him, he says to the Ansari, he says to the Ansari that had captured him, that make sure he doesn't escape. Because his mother is a very wealthy woman and she will pay top dollar for him. The highest ransom, right? So his brother says, Ya Akhi, this is how you treat me? And so Mus'ab said, Hada Akhi Dunaka. This is my brother, not you. Islam separates. This is my brother, not you. Hada Akhi Dunaka. And, uh, uh, many other stories are mentioned as well. Uh, there's also the story of those who could not afford any ransom. Uh, and of those was uh, Al-Muttalib <coughs> ibn Hantab, uh, Sayf ibn uh, Abi Rifa'a, Abu Azza. These are all names of people who could not afford any ransom. And they were also illiterate. So they couldn't teach. So what to do with them? Eventually, all of them were sent back without any ransom. And this shows us again 
the pragmatism of the Prophet ﷺ, that he knows. And it is said that Abu Azza, for example, uh, he, um, he, he came to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, O Messenger of Allah, you know that I don't have a powerful family, you know that I have no sons, I only have daughters, I have no money, uh, and I have a large family, so be generous with me. So the Prophet ﷺ freed him with one condition, that you are never allowed to fight against us again. Go back and never fight against us. And so Abu Azza agreed to this and he went back to Mecca and he wrote a beautiful poem which is recorded in Ibn Ishaq praising the generosity of the Prophet uh, ﷺ. And uh, this is, uh, again it shows us the, 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 the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ. And it, in fact it turned out that, and this is the whole point, this act of mercy caused him to accept Islam. That when the Prophet was so nice to him without taking any ransom, let him go uh, without any condition other than don't fight against us, eventually uh, uh, he accepted Islam. And in fact, many of the prisoners of the Battle of Badr, eventually they accepted Islam, either before the conquest of Mecca or, uh, or, or immediately after it, starting with Al-Abbas, uh, Aqil ibn Abi Talib, the, the brother of Ali ibn Abi Talib, he accepted Islam. Nawfal ibn al-Hadith, the cousin of the Prophet accepted Islam. Suhail ibn Amr accepted Islam. All of these people, they eventually accepted Islam. And this shows us, not all of them, but I mean many of them. And this shows us the wisdom that mercy is the general rule and sometimes strictness will be shown as well. Now, what was the effect of the Battle of Badr in Mecca and in Medina after the Battle of Badr? <coughs> <coughs> in the battle of uh, in, in, in Medina, two things are the most significant politically. Number one, all the pagans, the mushrikun that remained in Medina realized that they will have to abandon their paganism, even though there was no explicit command for the process to do so. And so the last remnants of idolatry disappeared at the battle after the Battle of Badr. That it became clear that it's simply not possible for an idol worshipper to remain in this society. And so, paganism simply disappeared. There was never a command in Medina to stop worshipping idols. That never happened. But slowly, more and more people converted, and whoever was left as a mushrik, dwindling, dwindling, until finally, uh, they all had to convert. But at the conversion of these pagans, a new trend began, and that is, Nifaq. That there was no nifaq before the battle of Badr. There are no munafiqun in the battle of Badr. Nifaq is a post-Badr phenomenon. Nifaq is a post-Badr phenomenon. <coughs> and it is said that Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn uh, Salun, and of course he is the leader of the hypocrites, and he was the eldest chieftain of the tribes of Yathrib as we have said many times and he was hoping that Yathrib would unite under him but with the coming of the process it, they didn't unite under him uh, it is said that when he heard Zayd ibn Harith as saying all of this names he said it appears that the matter has now been settled meaning I'm never going to be the chieftain it appears that this man is here to stay it appears that Islam is now supreme and therefore he outwardly accepted Islam. So the embracing of Islam of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, it occurred after the battle of Badr. And we know from the Quran that he never truly embraced Islam, that he remained a hypocrite. Now let's get back to the story of Abu al-As. Why did the Prophet free Abu al-As? One month after the battle of Badr, the Prophet sent two companions to a certain place outside of Mecca and said, wait there for a few days and you will get a visitor. Bring that visitor back. And that visitor turned out to be Zainab. So what was the deal then? We find out later on. Abu al-As was freed with the condition that he sends Zainab back to the Prophet ﷺ. This was the condition of freeing him. So he didn't pay the ransom. His ransom was the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. Send my daughter back. And Abu al-As at this time was still a pagan. He will eventually convert. Zainab was a Muslim. Remember at this time you could still be married to a pagan, right? Those ayat came down in Mumtahina later on, fifth year and later on. At this point in time, you could still be married to uh, a, a mushrik, a pagan. And so Abu al-As is a pagan. Zainab has always been a Muslim since her father began uh, preaching. And so uh, uh, Zainab is sent uh, outside the city. And there is a very interesting story uh, that uh, takes place over here. 
there's also, by the way, um, the uh, Abu al-As, he always treated Zainab honorably. And he never prevented her from practicing Islam. And later on, he was to embrace Islam many years later. I will, as well, and we'll mention that story. It's a very interesting story that happened when he embraced Islam as well. So, uh, when Abu al-As came back, rumors began to spread in Mecca that Zainab might be going back. How did these rumors spread? Allahu A'lam. But everybody knew that Abu al-As didn't pay his ransom. So people put one plus one together. The Prophet did not say this. And Hind, the wife of Abu Sufyan, visited Zainab and said, I have heard that you're about to go back to your father, to Medina. There's no need for you to leave, but if you're going to do that, then tell me before so that I can prepare your baggage for you because women know what women need more than men know. Meaning, come to me, I will prepare your bags for you. Your luggage, your, 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 your leads, I will prepare for you. Now, why do you think she's making such a generous offer? She has a plan. <laughs> she has a plan. What's that plan? That Zainab should never go back. Because they still have a hostage, if you like. Right? Daughter. They still have the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ in their midst. And they don't want Zainab to go back. And so Hind tells her that if you ever plan to leave, come and tell me, I'll help you pack your stuff. Don't worry, we'll take care of everything. Right? Zainab was very tempted to take her up on that offer. But she said something didn't feel right. There's that sixth sense going off. Something did not feel right, and therefore, she did not mention to her when she's deciding to uh, leave. She prepared and she packed the bags herself, and when she finished preparing uh, for the journey, uh, her brother-in-law, Abu al-As's brother, Al-Kinana, uh, so Abu al-As did not want to take her himself because <coughs> <coughs> he felt too humiliated to take her himself, so he told his brother Kinana that take her uh, outside the city and you will find two of the companions of the Prophet hand her over to them. So this is pre, pre agreed. They all know on this date, hand Zainab over. So he tells his younger brother Kinana, go take uh, my wife Zainab and take her outside the city. So Kinana, not very wisely, in broad daylight, takes Zainab's bags puts them on his camel, takes Zainab, puts Zainab on his camel, and begins leading the camel outside of Mecca. This is not very wise from their part. They didn't think, you know, probably to give them some, some you know, any leeway, probably it's a very emotional time for Abu al-As. He does love his wife. It is his cousin. He loves his wife deeply. He did not want to send her back because of love, but it also shows his honesty that he made a promise and he fulfilled his side of the promise. So we give him some slack that he wasn't thinking straight. So in broad daylight, he takes uh, Kinana, his younger brother, takes Zainab and starts taking her outside the city. The news spreads across Mecca that Zainab is leaving. The news spreads across Mecca. And immediately, some of the Quraysh gather together a posse, if you like, an entourage, to stop her from leaving. That you're not going to go back uh, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And a group of the Quraysh surrounded Zainab. And Al-Kinana is trying to protect Zainab. And Zainab's on the camel and Kinana is holding uh, the camel. And Kinana does not know who to fight with because there's so many uh, people. And it is said at this time uh, that Zainab was pregnant with child. She had, uh, in her womb she had uh, a child. And a certain uh, Qurashi by the name of Habbar ibn al-Aswad al-Muttalib. Ibn al-Muttalib. So he's a distant cousin. Uh, the son of Muttalib, not Abdul Muttalib. Going back to Muttalib. <laughs> Habbar ibn al-Aswad ibn al-Muttalib. He was the one, so this is her second cousin once removed, I think, if I'm, not, if I'm correct. He was the one, Yarhamukumullah. He was the one who thrust a spear to the camel. He thrust a spear to the camel to try to stop them from going. And the camel became scared, reared upwards, and Zainab fell like 15 feet from the camel, right? And she started to bleed right then and there, and she suffered a miscarriage because of this. So the child that was the grandson of the Prophet basically, uh, this child, uh, it was, or whatever you want to call it, the fetus or whatever, it was uh, miscarried at this time. And 
Some people also say that she was wounded so severely. This is one of the reasons that caused her early death a few years later as well. Because again, all of the daughters of the Prophet other than Fatima died in his lifetime. Right? Zainab also died. And it is said that the wounds that she suffered from falling, you can imagine a camel going upwards and she's a pregnant lady and she's tossed off the camel's back, that those wounds, they lasted with her for years and then she passed away a few years later, three years after this, four years after this, uh, she uh, passed away. And so her Kinana, her brother-in-law, jumped in front of her and said, I swear by Allah, anyone who approaches me will taste my sword and my bow and arrow. So he's a brave brother-in-law, he wants to protect her. Anybody who comes to her, I'm going to kill him before you kill me. And every one of you knows, he said, that how good of a marksman I am. And so the people are now, they don't want to lose their life over this. So they're all surrounding them. Uh, they don't know what to do. They're, it's a type of impasse, like what is to be done now? Until finally, Abu Sufyan hears. Abu Sufyan hears of what's going on. And Abu Sufyan rushes on his horse. Now this is a very sensitive situation, right? Zainab is the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, she is also a lady, so there should be some gentlemanness involved here, but there isn't. She is lying there bleeding. So Abu Sufyan rushes forth and he calms the situation down and he promises them, Zainab's not going to leave. You guys get away from here. The crowd, you go away. I'm in charge now, right? So he tells them to leave. Then he tells Kinana, you acted foolishly. Did you expect us to allow you to take Zainab in broad daylight? You acted foolishly. Do you expect us to let you just go do this? Go back to the people. We will not be humiliated this publicly. Go back to the people and wait some while. When the people stop talking about this issue, then quietly hand her over to her father. We have no reason to keep this lady here. Abu Sufyan is being pragmatic. Like we don't gain, I don't gain anything by having this lady here. She's the daughter of, of the Prophet ﷺ, but you can't expect us to be humiliated so publicly. You can't just expect us to let you walk out like this. Do it behind our backs is what he's trying to say, right? Do it quietly in the middle of the night. Don't do it like this. And so uh, that's exactly what happened, that they sent word to the people waiting outside that wait a few more days, you know, things are happening, we'll send, we'll send her to you. And so in the middle of the night, a few days later, uh, in the middle of the night, uh, once again, Kinana took her out and g gave her over to those companions and they took her back to uh, Medina. And <coughs> it shows us again, as we've said from the very beginning, there's always good people in every society. Here is Kinana. He's not a Muslim, but he's an honorable man. That this is just not right. We made a promise. My brother came back on the promise that we're going to send you know, Zayna back and I'm going to fulfill that promise. And he's willing to give up his life to defend that promise. That really shows that th these people, they have a genuine honesty and good heart. It also shows us the intelligence of Abu Sufyan. That he really is a politician. He's a wise man and he's a politician. Uh, it also shows us, by the way, there's one of the uh, very interesting things here, that uh, a, a completely, completely unrelated tangent. This man, Habbar ibn al-Aswad ibn al-Muttalib. Habbar ibn al-Aswad ibn al-Muttalib. His grandson was amongst those who participated with Muhammad ibn Qasim with Muhammad ibn Qasim in the conquest of Sindh. All of us know. The Arabs like who? Muhammad who? <laughs> we know this guy since we were kids. Muhammad ibn Qasim, 712. 712, he even knows the date, mashallah. And where did he land? <laughs> Karachi? Not Karachi. There was no Karachi back then. Huh? Debal. Debal. Yes, exactly. So this is a history we know. You guys don't know this history. So, uh, Muhammad ibn Qasim, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf sent him. Yes, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf sent him. So, Muhammad ibn Qasim had with him the grandson of Habbar. The grandson of Habbar, right? And eventually, this grandson, his progeny, founded a dynasty. Listen to this. That was called the Habbarid dynasty. This is the same Habbar that we just mentioned caused the, the, the miscarriage, right? And 
at least seven generations afterwards, look at how Allah's qadr, yani just, you know, how it works, right? At least seven generations later, we're talking about uh, 200 something C uh, hijrah, sorry, 200 something hijrah, right? Not, not under Muhammad ibn Qasim, no. Muhammad ibn Qasim and his people ruled India for a, a while and his governorship, and then uh, the governorship of uh, the Umayyads became weaker over India, what it was Sindh at the time, until finally Sindh became independent from the Umayyad dynasty. And when did it become independent? Under this guy that called it the Habarid dynasty. We are the Habarids, right? And this, uh, this dynasty, the Habarids, they ruled, they ruled over Makran and Sindh for over 200 years. And they minted coins in what is now Pakistan, right? They minted coins. And I don't know if uh, Pakistanis are aware of this, but there are cities in Sindh that were founded by the Habarids. Mansura, have you heard of Mansura? Yeah. You know Mansura? Yeah. Mansura is one of these ancient cities that the Arabs founded. You know this? Hmm? Mansura, it's not an inhabited city. It's not an inhabited city. If you're thinking of an inhabited city, this is incorrect. <coughs> yeah, these days it's just uh, ruins. Ruins. It's, it's, in, it's uh, outside of Karachi by two, three hours. It's not at Karachi. Uh, just by the way, uh, I did a whole paper on the Habadid dynasty when I was at Yale. For my, I, did, I took a course uh, called Islam in India. And so I chose to do the topic on the Habadid. So I have a whole paper on the Habadid so I can talk a lot about that. You don't want to be bored to death about the Habadids. Um, by the way, so also the Habadids, by the way, so the, how, when was the end of the Habadid dynasty? The Fatimid Ismailis, <coughs> they attacked. And the Ismailis, the, the Fatimids, they took over Multan and Mansura for a period of time. And they spread their da'wah in Multan and Mansura at that time. And so the Ismailis of Pakistan have been there for a long time. For a long time. And if you know history, when the, the first Aga Khan came back, I know this is a whole unrelated tangent, but all of you in Pakistan is interested in this. When the first Aga Khan came back, you should know this, there was, when did he come back? 1860s, 1870s. The first Aga Khan, right? He came back, he's an Iranian, he's a Persian, he's, uh, he's Persian. When he came to India, he found a large group of Ismailis, right? Where did they come from? The, the original Ismailis came at this time. They have been in Sindh since 300, 400 Hijrah, right? And believe it or not, the first Aga Khan, he took the Ismailis to court because they would not acknowledge him as their Imam. I am not, in, I'm not making this up, this is well known. And he took them to the British court, sued his own followers for not recognizing him. And obviously he won. He won the case. Right? There were two cases, two court cases of Aga Khan against his own followers. Because, and the point in the British court was that I am, an Isma I am the Ismaili Imam and these are Ismailis and they are not recognizing me to be their legitimate Imam. And so he went to the British court in the 1871 and 1870, there are two courses, right? Two cases. And he won both cases and a group of them broke away from him. And so they were called Khoja at the time. So a group of Khojas became Sunni. So many of you are Sunni Bohra and Sunni Khoja, right? This is at this time this happened, right? Another group became Ithna Ashari. So there's Ithna Ashari Khojas as well, right? Before this time, the Khojas were all Ismaili. Before this time. Why am I going to this time? Anyway, so le, uh, sometimes my mind just wanders in. But all I wanted to point out, and so subhanAllah, what happened out of Ismail is one, fa one final point. Then Mahmud of Ghazna came and he destroyed the Ismaili dynasty. So after Muhammad ibn Qasim, Muhammad ibn Qasim was directly under the Umayyads. The Umayyads controlled Sindh for at least probably around 80 year, or 90 years. Then Sindh kind of sort of became broke away from uh, Umayyads. How did it break away? The Habarids. The Habarids. I, I, I should have brought this. I have a coin of the Habarids at home. I have one of their coins that they, I'm a, I'm a numismatist. What's a numismatist? 
I'm a coin collector. I have hundreds of coins of the Umayyads and whatnot. I collect coins. So I have a coin of the Habadid dynasty, right? I'm a rich man. <laughs> Not as rich as you, Dr. Sahabs. <laughs> uh, so, I, I should have, Wallahi, had completely forgot. If I remember, I'll bring it. A coin of the Habadis. They have a coin. I, uh, I, per I wanted to purchase it because I, I was writing a paper on Bahnam as after I purchased a coin of the Habadis. So, the Habadis ruled over what is now Pakistan. Not all of Pakistan. Multan. Multan and, and Makran. And Mansura, these were the three places. Sindh, one area Sindh. Until the Ismailis came. The Ismailis ruled for like 30, 40 years, very, just one generation. Then Mahmoud al Ghazna came. And Mahmoud al Ghazna Sunniized it again. Right? And then from there, you all know the rest of the history, or at least the people from that part of the world know the rest of the history. Again, my point being, why did I go into this tangent? SubhanAllah, look at how Allah's Qadr, where was Habar, uh, what did Habar do? Right? And yet in history, when you say Habarid, Automatically, if you know history, there's only one dynasty that was Habadid, and it's named after the same person who did what he did to Zainab. This is called the Habadid dynasty. SubhanAllah, this is what Islam does. That Habar was a mushrik, but his grandson accepted Islam, and a whole dynasty was founded that was one of the mightiest dynasties uh, of early uh, Sindh. And uh, SubhanAllah, this is how Allah change uh, you know changes people through islam in any case inshallah uh, we are uh, come to the end of today's uh, lesson inshallah we will finish the battle of badr uh, not next wednesday i will not be here next wednesday there will be one week break i will be in freezing canada freezing edmonton uh, so i will not be here for one week inshallah we will resume uh, two wednesdays from now and we'll finish uh, the Battle of Badr on that wednesday and then inshallah the wednesday after that we will do surah al-anfal all of Surah Al-Anfal, inshallah, we will do that. Bidinlahi ta'ala, we have a few minutes left for uh, Q&A, if there are questions about... But no questions about Habadis and Aga Khanis. Let's just... That was just a tangent. So, the two people were killed at Habadis, Uqba uh, ibn Ma'id and Abi Mu'id. So, was there a prophet to us on the Ijtahad, or was there a Wahid? We don't know. There is nothing mentioned about Wahi coming down. We don't know. And in either case, as I said last week, the ijtihad of the Prophet is binding. So, well, it is said that <coughs> it is said that two different people killed each one, but in some riwayat, Ali is mentioned for another, in some he's mentioned for Uqbah. So, Allahu Alam. Allahu Alam. Okay. Yes, our young brother. No, there was so there was a uh, a stalemate. I.e., people were just around Zainab. They didn't know what to do. Kinana said, "Whoever attacks, I will kill him first before you kill me." So they're just around. They don't know what to do, and they're waiting. Probably 15, 20 minutes. They just don't know what to do. Word has gone back to Mecca. Abu Sufyan is now panicking, and so he comes rushing on his horse. So they waited. They didn't know what to do. It was a chaotic time. And Abu Sufyan got there before the situation got worse. So he came in from Makkah. From the sisters, any questions? Yes, go ahead. Can I have a long question? You always have a long question. There's no, you don't need to ask. Your questions are always long and convoluted. Go ahead. <laughs> Only on Wednesdays. Only on Wednesdays, huh? <laughs> no, actually every single day. <laughs> The second uh, the ayah after that says, Is this of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the adab of war? The adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the adab of war? Let me ask you if you say it is the adab of war, who would have caused that adab? All of it goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, but, but this adab that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, is it, is it the punishment that He always talks about like in the Akhirah? 
So the, ver the, the brother is asking about the verse that Allah says to the Prophet Sallallahu that why did you forgive, you should not have forgiven. Then the next verse is about, were it not for the fact that Allah's decree has already occurred about this, it is possible that Allah's adab would have come to you. Uh, what does the hadith say that Abu Bakr and Umar were crying, why? Because of this verse. Not Abu Bakr, the process in Abu Bakr were crying because of this verse. So they understood this to mean that this was a potential punishment, but Allah forgave them. Well, if, if the Prophet ishtahad, uh, he's, he's not liable for that. If, he, uh, if he's correct, it's two ajr. If he's not, he gets one ajr. does not deserve a punishment. And that's why he was not punished. But, but the threat is there. If, if the threat is there, meaning it was not an ishtihad that Allah would have liked him to do, but Allah let it go. Well, uh, I think is the, the, the goal of this surah is <clears throat> if the Prophet ﷺ did not, he was easy on his enemies, and he did not uh, kill more of them. That's that. That was the what well, that was the, the objection is he should have killed more people before taking Asra. That a lot more people gonna try him. So if he shows harshness to the people that attacks him, although tragic that a lot of people are going to die, but it's going to save Muslim lives because a lot of people are going to go, we don't want to mess with these people because they kill 15, 20, 30 percent of the world. What you said, I said it as one of the benefits of being strict, but that is not the tafsir of this ayah. Think about it. It cannot be the tafsir of this ayah. Well, uh, Because Allah is saying that if Allah's decree had not come, then adab would have come. I'm, I'm, I'm giving that. So if they, and also, if uh, that's that's exactly what it is. If it wasn't for for uh, for you, if you should, if, if if you stop in the middle and you don't continue killing, you're gonna lose the war, and that war is gonna cause you and your people the adab. I mean, as it happened, uh, if, you know, later on in Uhud. That when people did not, did not uh, obey the Allahu I see this as a stretched interpretation. And had this been the case, why would Abu Bakr and the Prophet be crying? Because Number two. Number three, who has preceded you in this tafsir? I, I, this is, uh, that's, uh, you know, since I brought it up the first time, I have been doing research on it. So who has? I'm asking you. I, I don't have, I, I, I think I read about 22. Uh, tafsir for just so who has read so who who has said this tafsir exactly? I didn't know that it's gonna be brought up. Okay, so we look at who is it. If it, if it is the person that you whose pamphlet you gave me, you know what I said about him. I'm asking you to look at the classical Sunni tafsir. See the paper right. that I give you. But as usual, Akhi, our conversation becomes private, and the whole people are like wondering what's going on. Right. Well, when you see a tafsir, the brother makes a point that I've been saying to you as well. You have to see who is the person writing it. You ha you can't just you can't just. The objection that you have on that paper, the Bukhari says the exact same thing. The Bukhari says the Rasul does not yeshahid. He does not work by by ra'i or qiyas. The Bukhari says that in in al atisab al kitab al sunnah, kitab al atisab al kitab al sunnah. The first. Imam al Bukhari's point is whatever the Prophet says has to be taken. Absolutely. That's what I said. No Sunni says right. otherwise. Right, but he is not making any ishtihad. In any case, okay, we're going back to the same issue of last of last week. Like I said, this is not an issue where Sunnis have a position and Mu'tazilis have another. Even amongst Sunni scholars, some people held this view. But frankly, this view needs takalluf. Takalluf means you need to try to patch up every evidence that goes against it. Like I gave the example last week, illa al idkhir except for idkhir. This is, I mean, uh, uh, this is, no this is a stretch. Mean, this is your stretch. What comes to mind is that the Prophet just said, okay, fine, illa al idkhir Yes, you could say this, but it makes a lot more sense that you yeah, just say. The way, the way works. I mean, it could have been instantaneous. So like I said, this is takalluf. I mean, this is, this is takalluf. There's a print. Anyway, we're going into this infinite loop. And then again, I tell, I tell you, Akhi, what's the thamaratul khilaf? Nothing. 
Well, actually, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of aqidah because a lot of people say this is this is the deen of Muhammad, not the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muhammad, he has not. I already explained this to you last week. There is no such thing as deen of Muhammad. Deen of Muhammad is deen of Allah. Exactly. Okay. That's all I said. If you say he can make decisions on his own... And if I say he can make decisions and Allah has told me to follow his decisions. That's what I'm saying. That's bad. No. <laughs> this, is, this is what the Quran and Sunnah says. Right? أَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولِ Allah right? threatened the Prophet and his, his companions if, because they yeah, أخي, this is very clear that the adab is threatened for other verses as well. That if he said anything against us, what will we do? Exactly. Okay, so this show. So the, in any case, Akhi, look, we're going into this private conversation. We have, mashallah, 150 people here. So we can continue. If you gave them a chance to ask, maybe they would ask. Okay. Final questions before we break for salah. Please, somebody Yes, in the back, go ahead. Bismillah. Go ahead, go ahead. Sister, yes. No, they were not brothers. They were not brothers. They were two friends. They were two friends. They were not brothers. Their ha the, the, uh, their their names sound similar, uh, Muawwid and Muath, but they are not brothers. Okay. Final question. We have two minutes left before nine o'clock. Yes. Through all the seerahs, there's not a lot of mention of the Prophet Muhammad. His, his mother's relative, his cousin from the mother's side, or uncles. So, do we know anything about that? Or? You know, that's a very good question. I will look this up. He's asking about, <coughs> he's saying that there's a lot of cousins mentioned from the father's side, from the Banu Hashim. How about from Amina's side? How about Amina's uh, siblings and uh, cousins from the uh, Amina side, uh, the Banu Zuhra? That's a very good question. I will look this up. Nothing right now. I cannot think of anything right now. But I'll look this up, inshallah. Good question. Inshallah. So as I said, reminder, next week we were not. Left off. Uh, the very last incident we talked about was, was what? Who can remind me? I went into this whole tangent of Indian Islam, Habbadid dynasty, right? Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and we had talked about how interesting and unique and strange it is that here is one person who actually caused a miscarriage to the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ, and yet Allah had written that his progeny would have great izzah and honor uh, in Islam, and uh, he was one of the founders, actually it's named after him. The Habbadids are named after this very person, Habbar. Uh, that uh, he had an entire dynasty in what is now uh, Pakistan for over 100, 130 years or so. In any case, getting back to the story of Badr. Now, <clears throat> we talked about uh, the process of his return, we talked about the prisoners of war. What happened in Mecca? In Mecca, Ibn Kathir narrates, Ibn Kathir tells us some incidents that happened in Mecca. He tells us that the first of the soldiers to return back from Badr, the first of the, the, those who had turned their back and run away, Right, because the Quraysh had broken up helter skelter. They had literally just fled for their lives and then regrouped and then made their way back to uh, Mecca. And this is interesting. They didn't even have a plan B. They did not even have a plan B. What's going to happen if we fail? They were so confident that they were going to win. There's no plan of failure. What is going to happen? Where should we regroup? And so they came back to Mecca in groups and batches. The very first person who came back was. Uh, al Haysaman ibn al Khuzai, Al Haysaman al Khuzai, Al Haysaman al Khuzai. And when he entered Mecca, they saw him in his state and, and, and fashion. You can imagine, there are no details, but you can imagine bloodied, wounded, maybe his horse is missing or something, but something was definitely uh, amiss. And so uh, they asked him, What is the matter? And he answered in a dreary tone that Utba has been killed, Rabi'a has been killed. Shayba has been killed, Abu al-Hakam has been killed, Umayyah ibn Khalaf has been killed, Zum'a ibn Aswad has been killed. In other words, he doesn't even know where to begin. Like, it's complete disaster. And he lists a who's who. Abu al-Bukhtari has been killed. Abu Jahl has been killed. Now this is, as I said, it is unbelievable for them. Even for us, when you really understand the victory of Badr, Wallahi, it is just amazing. How many people, one after the other, and they were three times the strength of the Muslims. And, and, and. So he comes back and he kept on naming. Until finally, 
they said this guy has gone mad. He must have gone crazy. It's not possible. He's listing everybody. Uh, you know, that everybody who is in Mecca, he's listing them. And uh, when the news reached back to Safwan ibn Umayyah, uh, now this is the son of Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Safwan ibn Umayyah, the son of Umayyah ibn Khalaf, right? When the news reached back to Safwan ibn Umayyah, he was sitting with his back to the Kaaba, like inside the, the, the uh, walls of the, of the, the Kaaba, I mean, basically inside the Hijr. Uh, and he said, this is simply impossible. This man has gone crazy. Go ask him, where is Safwan ibn Umayyah, meaning himself? Because he thought he's gone crazy. So once he hears a name that is supposed to be not killed, he's going to say he's killed as well, right? So he's saying, this guy's gone crazy. Go ask him, what is the hal of Safwan ibn Umayyah? And Safwan is sitting right there, that at a distance he's looking. So somebody goes to him and says, Oh, hey Saman, and what happened to Safwan ibn Umayyah? So this is a trick question, right? So he looks at him and he said, Safwan is sitting right over there. And I saw with my own eyes how they killed his father and brother. Safwan is sitting right there. And I saw with my own eyes, I was there. When they dragged his father and, and brother and they killed him in front of me. Right. And this made them realize that this is not a crazy person. This is the truth. And slowly but surely the filters began to come back. And uh, it was uh, a time of great uh, grieving, of great uh, depression. And it was as if the, the biggest icing on the cake that was to occur, it was as if Allah Azza wa Jal had willed that he saves perhaps one of the best for the very last. And that is the death of Abu Lahab. Tabbat yada Abi Lahab bin Watab. The only senior person who was of the scum of Mecca, really, the worst of Mecca, was Abu Lahab. Everybody else, we, I've said this so many times before, that those who had an ounce of decency, many times they were the ones who were saved. And the best example of this is, is who? Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan is the best example of this. And many others as well, Suhail ibn Amr and others, that generally they had some dignity, some uh, decency for themselves. And uh, what happened was, Abu Lahab, he did not participate. Why did he not participate? Who can remind me? This goes back a few lessons. Or what did he do to get out of participation? Abu Lahab. He hired somebody to go in his place. He hired somebody to go in his place. And also, frankly, probably because he was the uh, chief of the uh, Banu Hashim, they understood that it's a bit too awkward for him to go. So they didn't pressure him. Unlike they pressured Umayyah and others, they did not pressure him to go because this really was against everything they stood for. That is, your own mini tribe is coming uh, and fighting against you. Now, uh, when Abu Lahab heard of this news, he could not believe this. And it is said he went into a type of uh, depression. And he waited for the time of Abu Sufyan to come back. And he said, I'm going to ask Abu Sufyan directly. I don't believe any of these deserters. Maybe they ran away out of fear. Maybe something happened. I'm going to wait for my friend Abu Sufyan. So uh, while they were uh, waiting Abu Sufyan, finally Abu Sufyan did return. And they met at the house of Al-Abbas who was a prisoner of war. Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet is a prisoner of war. And Abbas, of course, right now is tied up in, literally tied up in Medina. And so Abbas's wife and his servant are at home. And their, uh, Abbas's brother is, of course, Abu Lahab, right? Abu Lahab is his uh, older brother. So Abu Lahab is, for some reason, perhaps that was a bigger house. We don't know the reason. He was there. And Abu Sufyan came over there to, uh, to inform him what happened. So when Abu Sufyan came, Abu Jahl said, uh, sorry, Abu Lahab said, Abu Lahab said, tell me, face to face, tell me exactly what happened. So, Abu Sufyan told him that by Allah, as soon as we, meaning our side, Abu Sufyan was not there obviously, but he's hearing the news. As soon as we met the Muslims, it was as if they overpowered us without us doing anything. It was beyond our power to fight them. That they took prisoners as they pleased and they killed as they pleased. And despite all that happened, I cannot criticize my own side. I can't criticize the Quraysh. Because by Allah, I saw a group of men with white faces riding horses that were black and white, which is the uh, epitome of Arabian horses, the stallions, right? 
So these were uh, men, that he thought they were men, obviously they're angels, riding horses that were black and white, hovering between the heavens and earth. None of us could empower them. None of us could overpower them. So when he's telling this news and he's dejected, he's sad, and Abu Lahab is also uh, depressed. The slave of Al-Abbas, who was listening in, and he was a slave, he's cooking the food, he's uh, preparing their whatever, you know, whatever he's preparing, he's not supposed to be listening anyway, and he's a slave, even if he's listening, he's not supposed to comment. It's not his place to comment. But these are Muslims, and this is an important point here that, now Allahu Alam, I talked about Abbas uh, two weeks ago, it appears that Abbas was a nominal Muslim up until the Battle of Badr. That he had said he's a Muslim, but that real iman had not entered until the one incident. What is the one incident? His money. His money. The Prophet wasallam told him, where is his money? Right? And he said, Wallahi inni lashadu annaka la Rasulullah. That that was when very clear that now for sure, this person is the Prophet of Allah. So what this means is that his wife, his slave, they have embraced Islam from before. It is also said, by the way, that his wife, Umm al-Fadl, uh, she had embraced Islam, the second lady after Khadija. That she was a very early convert. And perhaps this explains, Abbas had embraced kind of sort of because of her, right? And so he's kind of nominal. And then it takes a while for Iman to enter his heart, as it did in the Battle of Badr. After the Battle of Badr, he... Uh, is a Muslim and he is sending reports to the Prophet ﷺ, as he will do in Uhud and later on, right? So in the Battle of Badr, this is the turning point for him. His wife is a Muslim and obviously we'll learn his slave is also a Muslim now. So his slave is listening in and he hears all of this and he's eager to find out what happened. When he hears this, he jumps up for joy and he says, Ay Wallah, those were the angels. Ay Wallah, those were the angels helping the Muslims. Now it's pretty clear where his loyalty is. It's pretty clear he couldn't help himself that he's so happy that the Muslims won. He jumped up and he basically said, Allahu Akbar. You know, that's the equivalent, you know. Like he's so happy that the Muslims won. Now Abu Lahab, when he saw this slave commenting back to him, rejoicing at the defeat of the Quraysh, he, his anger just basically, he lost it. He lost his anger. And he jumped up, threw him to the ground, started beating him almost to death. And he's a slave, he can't really, if he, even if he wanted to defend, I mean, he's going to have a worse ending later on, you know. And when his slave is being pummeled, now Umm al-Fadl, the wife of Abbas, she comes out and she physically tries to stop Abu Lahab from killing the slave. And he turns on her and he begins beating her up. Now this is a man who's, he's lost it, right? He's basically all of that frustration. And she is now wounded. And so she responds back with the fierceness, the anger, the ferocity. She says, so when the Sayyid, meaning Al-Abbas, the Sayyid meaning the Lord of the house, when the Sayyid is gone, this is what you do to his household? Meaning what type of protector are you? You're supposed to be our protector. You are, you know, my brother-in-law. You're the chieftain. And when the Sayyid goes away, this is what you do. You beat my, his wife, you, beat, uh, you almost kill the slave. And uh, this made him feel so ashamed. He fled from the house in a state of humiliation and guilt. And uh, he was afflicted with a type of disease. So the books of Tafsir, uh, the books of Sirah mentioned various diseases. Uh, but he was not seen basically after this. And he died uh, a death out of sickness. We're not going to call it a natural death. He died as a result of misery, as a result of whatever it is. Some say a type of worm came to him. But uh, within a few days after this incident, he uh, passed away. He died. And so Allah Azza wa Jal basically got rid of the very last of those evil batch of the Quraysh. And this last one was none other than the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Lahab. Abu, uh, Ibn Ishaq mentions that once all of the, pris- once all of the people of uh, uh, Quraysh returned, Makkah was enveloped with the wailing noises of the women. You know how the women used to wail in the days of Jahiliyyah. That all of Makkah began to wail. Every household had somebody wailing. Remember the dream of Atika all the way so many months back? The dream of Atika, we talked about it, right? Every house a boulder came and hit it. So this is now that reality. Every house was wailing. And when Abu Sufyan heard all of this, he convened a gathering of the Quraysh and he said, 
for the first time in the history of the Arabs, he said, from now on, no woman shall wail. Why? Because we don't want to cause any happiness to the Muslims when they hear that all of Mecca is wailing. Right? You see the, the point here? That we don't want any pleasure to be derived from our women wailing. And so, the decree came that it is not allowed for women to uh, wail. This was the only time the Jahili uh, Arabs did this. And it is said that uh, Al-Aswad ibn al-Muttalib, who is a distant uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, he had lost all three of his sons uh, at Badr. And it is said, uh, Hisham mentions that one night he heard a woman wailing. So he became happy and he said, go and ask her, has the ban been lifted so that I can wail over my son? And he especially he loved his youngest. His name was Zum'a uh, Zum ibn al-Aswad. Zum'a uh, Zum ibn al-Aswad was one of the big names in uh, the Battle of Badr that died on the side of the Quraysh. So he said, go find out from that woman. Perhaps the wailing ban has been lifted so that I can wail over my son uh, Zum'a. The servant went, came back and said, no, she's not wailing over her uh, loved one. She's wailing over a lost camel. Because you're allowed to wail over anything other than Badr. So she's wailing over a lost camel. Ibn Kathir mentions here that this was a further means that Allah used to punish them. Because they would derive much comfort in wailing over their dead. And it would make their pain more bearable. When everybody's wailing and the household comes together and the women are all raising their voices and whatnot, this would bring them a sense of of comfort. Why? Because we're showing that we are making up for our loved one. We're showing our loss, our grief. So by showing our grief, this is bringing comfort to our hearts. Ibn Kathir says, by Abu Sufyan preventing the wailing, Allah was using this to make their grief even more. They have to bottle up their grief. They're not even allowed to cry as they were uh, used to crying. Uh, now there's another interesting incident related to the Battle of Badr which is mentioned in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, and all of you know of it uh, in, in a vague manner, uh, but not, not many uh, people associate it with this incident, the Battle of Badr. And that is that on the same day as the Battle of Badr, many hundreds of miles away, the Byzantine Romans and the Sassanid Persians were fighting. Many thousands of miles away. And in a twist of fate that was unexpected, Allah's qadr obviously, in a twist of fate that was completely unexpected, the Persians were viciously defeated. The Persians were defeated, despite the fact that the Romans were going down for a while, and the Persians were getting bigger and bigger. Right? And they had had a major war before this, a few years ago, and Allah had revealed Surah Al-Rum, the first ayat. Alif Lam Mim Ghulibat Al-Rum. Now, the Surah Al-Rum came down perhaps the seventh year of the Hijrah. Perhaps the sixth year, sorry, not the Hijrah, uh, the Da'wah. The sixth or the seventh year of the Da'wah. Early on in uh, Mecca, the middle of the Meccan stage. And the Roman power was going down, was ebbing. And the Persian power was getting stronger and stronger. And so, Allah Azza wa Jal told the Muslims, Alif Lam Mim Ghulibat Al-Rum. Alif Lam Mim, the Romans have been defeated, meaning in this battle that already taken place. This is one of the most explicit predictions in the Quran because it's clearly in the future. Ghulibat al is in the past. The Romans have been defeated. This happened already. Then Allah says, But after this defeat, After this defeat, They will be the victors in a few years. To Allah belongs the ultimate control from the beginning to the end. And on that day, the day that the Romans win over the Persians, the believers will be celebrating the victory of Allah. So there's two predictions. Number one, the Romans will win over the Persians. And number two, on the very day that that is happening, the Muslims will yafrahun will be rejoicing with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, uh, when the Surah Al-Rum came down, Ubay ibn Khalaf, who is no longer alive now, Ubay ibn Khalaf went to Abu Bakr and he mocked him. And he said, do you really think that the Romans will win the Persians after this 
vicious defeat after this humiliating defeat and had we been alive as well we would have sympathized politically that it's impossible for this mighty nation the Romans had a lot of internal conflict going on the Persians had consolidated they had had a lot a lot of victories and it was just one victory after another and Allah predicted something that was unbelievable he said the Romans would be victorious over the Persians so Ubay said do you really think that the Romans will win over the Persians and Abu Bakr said yes of course I do so Ubay said let us wager let us bet let us see who's right. And this was, of course, in the days of Mecca. And uh, there, you know, there's no haram you know, betting. Firstly, secondly, you're not betting because you know the outcome, right? So whatever you want to do, you cannot justify gambling from this, uh, from this uh, uh, incident. So uh, they set a wager. They set an amount. And uh, Ubay said, how many years? Because the Quran says, fi bid'i. And bid'i means in a few. So Ubay said, how many years? So Abu Bakr said, six years. Six years. Six years passed, and the Romans didn't win the Persians. So Abu Bakr lost the bet. So he had to pay up. All of the camels that he had promised, he had to uh, pay up. Now, battle of Badr, Ubay dies. On the very same day as the battle, and we know this from non-Muslim books of history, and by the way, this is an interesting point here, that Islamic sira it coincides perfectly with Western events when you read them. And those people who doubt the preservation of Sunnah, those people who doubt have Hadith been preserved or not, those people who doubt the Seerah has it been preserved or not, every incidence we find, we can link it to its equivalent. And this clearly shows us, historically speaking, that uh, the Seerah has been preserved to a great extent. So we know for a fact that on the very same day as Badr, Heraclius had launched a fierce offensive against Khusro II. Heraclius launched a fierce offensive against Khusro II and by the Qadr of Allah Khusro II two of his generals defected two of his major flanks defected and one of his family members plotted against Khusro to have overthrown him you know how it goes with these royal families right and so right before the battle it's as if his right hand was cut off Khusro's I mean it's as if, you know, internally there's things going on. Two of the generals with their entire flanks, they're not fighting on his side. And therefore he suffered a resounding defeat on the exact same day as the Battle of Badr being fought outside of Medina, a thousand something miles away in the, in the lands of Khorasan, in the lands of Iran, modern Iran, the uh, armies of Khusro uh, the second had a very, very uh, dismal, if you like, uh, defeat. And... Allah Azza wa Jal predicted this so many years before and the Muslims did not even find out on the day of Badr. Because it's going to take two weeks for the news to reach them. And of course by that time it's too late. Abu Bakr has lost the bet. Ubay is already dead. And uh, it is said, there is a weak hadith in this regard, that when the Prophet ﷺ heard, he said, uh, and this hadith is most likely weak, but uh, linguistically it's right. He said, why did you say six? Bidri can mean up till nine, which is true. Linguistically, it's true. Why did you say six? In a few years. And the Arabic few, it goes from three to nine. So Abu Bakr took the middle. Six to nine, it goes through. Sorry, three to nine, he said six is the middle. And it is said, and most likely the Hadith is weak, but, but linguistically it's right, that uh, the Prophet told him, why did you say six? You should have said nine. And in fact, it was in fact eight and a half years after the ayah came down that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them uh, that victory. One or two final points and then inshallah we will uh, show uh, some slides and then do surah anfal. Uh, one or two final points about the battle of Badr. Uh, firstly, the status of the people of Badr. I've already mentioned, Jibreel came down himself and he asked the Prophet ﷺ that how do you view the people of Badr? And the Prophet ﷺ responded, we view them as the best of us. And so Jibreel said, similarly, we view the angels who participated in Badr as the best of us. So Allah sent Jibreel down to inform us the status of the people of Badr. And in Sahih Bukhari, Imam al-Bukhari has a whole book called the Book of the Blessings of the People of Badr. And full of ahadith. And... Uh, one of them is uh, the uh, Sahabi by the name of Haritha ibn Suraqa. He had died a shaheed and it is said he was one of the first shaheeds in the battle of Badr and he was killed by a stray arrow. It came out of nowhere and it, uh, and it killed him. Uh, and so Haritha's mother came from the Ansar and she said, tell me about my son. 
is he in Jannah? And the Prophet ﷺ said that, My dear mother, my dear aunt, it is not a Jannah he is in. He is in Jinan. He is in many Jannahs. And he is in Al-Firdaus Al-A'la. He's not just in a Jannah. He is in many Jannahs and he is in Al-Firdaus Al-A'la. And one of the main evidences or, or the, one of the main uh, things that is used to show the status of the people of Badr is that very famous narration and incident of Hatib which we're going to go into much later on, inshallah, when we get there. Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a, who uh, in the conquest of Mecca, he betrayed the trust of the Prophet wasallam by sending the information of the advent of the Muslims to the Quraysh. The conquest of Mecca was a total surprise. The Quraysh were not expecting it. It was a total surprise. Hatib sent a letter to the Quraysh warning them, the Muslims are coming, prepare. Why he did it, what's the story, we'll get there inshallah when we get there. For now know that Hatib sent a letter to the Quraysh. The Prophet ﷺ, Jibreel came and told him or else he would not have known. Jibreel came and told him, such and such a lady has the piece of paper on her belongings. Go and search her. So Ali and Abbas went and they brandished their swords and they forced it out. It was in her hair. She undid her hair in the middle of her hair. She took the letter. They opened it up. It said from Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a to uh, Quraysh. Beware, the Muslims are coming. That's basically treason. It's treachery, right? And Umar ibn al-Khattab is fuming. He said, Ya Rasulullah, give me the word khalas. And this is one of the times that actually fully justified, fully justified. Right? Give me the word and we'll just execute him. And the Prophet called Hatib and he said, Hatib, why did you do this? Why did you do this? And Hatib said, Ya Rasulullah, I have no desire to love kufr over Islam. You know me, I'm not going to love kufr over Islam. But all of you, you have your, your izzah, your protection from other sources. As for me, I'm a nobody and my family is still, and my belongings are still there. And I knew Allah would protect you. I know no, no harm is going to come to you. Something's going to happen to save you. But by giving this letter, I hope that they would spare my family. So he's worried about his family. He's worried about uh, you know, his, his uh, loved ones in Quraysh and Mecca that they might kill when they hear Hatib is coming and his family is there. They're just going to kill his family. So he said that this caused me to, uh, to do this letter that they might then save my family. So the Prophet said, Sadaqa Hatib. Hatib's telling the truth that this was his reason. That he had some un weird understanding that, okay, Allah is going to protect him. He's not going to actually get harmed. So, you know, let me just make sure my family is safe. Umar once again said, Ya Rasulullah, allow me to cut his head off. Some say for the first time he said it out of nifaq, that because he's a munafiq, the second time, okay, even if he's not a munafiq, but this is treason. This is treachery. So let me kill it for a crime, not for kufr. You see the difference, right? You can kill for nifaq and kufr. You can kill for a crime. So the second time he's saying, let me kill him for the crime. So the Prophet ﷺ rebuked Umar. And he said, Ya Umar, wama yudrik. How do you know that Allah Azza wa Jal, perhaps he looked at the people of Badr. Notice it's coming out of so many years later. Five years after Badr, he is saying this. Six years after Badr. He is saying, how do you know? Perhaps Allah looked at the people of Badr. And he said to them, do as you please because you are forgiven. Do as you please because you have been forgiven. Right? So in other words, he used Badr to protect Hatib's life. He used Badr to raise the status of uh, Hatib. And therefore the Sahaba who participated at Badr are considered to be of the elite of the Sahaba. And that is why many of our classical scholars, including Ibn Hisham, Ibn Kathir, they actually took the time pages and pages to list every single Sahabi who participated in Badr. Literally, all 300 and something of them, one by one, they're listing them. It's in Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, it is in uh, Ibn Kathir, so many of the books of Sirah, out of respect and honor, uh, who, who participated in the Battle of Badr. Uh, and the final point for the Battle of Badr, what were some of the primary effects of the Battle of Badr? Well, number one, it established beyond the shadow of a doubt that the Muslims have a political presence, a legitimate political entity, that they are a separate and independent state, and that the Quraysh have to deal with them as a tangible reality. So all doubts that might have existed are now gone, that the Muslims are here to stay. Number two, 
it was the greatest demoralizing factor for the Quraysh. That it can honestly be said if you look at the seerah, that this was the single greatest shock in the entire seerah. And everything else that happened is trivial compared to Badr. Why? Because you can say Ahzab, you can say the conquest of Mecca, they already know the Muslims are a presence and a threat. At Badr, they genuinely thought that they're going to eliminate them off the face of this earth. At Badr, there was no concept that the Muslims have any potential of victory. And not just that, but the list of those who were killed, the list of the Quraysh who were decimated, was simply, uh, it's just a who's who of every single famous person. So the miraculous win, uh, those that had died, the humiliation of the prisoners of war, all of these factors, it was a huge demoralizing blow. And every single defeat afterwards, it is as if it is simply just a tafsir of what happened at uh, Badr. And the third primary effect of Badr, is that Badr brought out for the first time internal treachery within Medina. And that is two fronts. Number one, the Munafiqun. And number two, the Yehudi tribes. That up until that point in time, there was no genuine animosity. Maybe some sarcastic comments from some people, but nothing that was clear cut. After Badr, this was going to change. And after Badr, a number of incidents happened that simply made things from bad to worse with regards to these two uh, groups of people. And with this, uh, we will inshallah ta'ala show uh, the slides that our dear uh, brother Dr. Bashar has prepared. Uh, last time he taught the Sira class, he told me to take a look at them. And inshallah, it's very, actually very impressive, mashallah, that he has uh, done. Uh, he has a map of Badr. If we can turn that on. And then inshallah, we'll do... Uh, as much of Surah Anfal as we can. So those of you who don't have a Quran, might, now might be a good time to get a translation of the Quran. Or the Arabic if you want to go over the Arabic. It is still here. Try again, one more time. Control, I'll delete. <laughs> Shift F5. Was it working before? Yeah. It was? <laughs> Still not working. Which one? Okay, we have lift off. So this is taken straight from uh Dr. Bashar's uh, PowerPoint, and we just want to show the uh, pictures here. Uh, you see the pictures here. Which one is? Uh, the highlighted. Yeah. This. Hmm? This one. Okay. Uh, so. On oh, it's not going to show, isn't it? Right? Yeah. yeah. On TV. Well, in any case, I mean, to be honest, it's very self-explanatory. Uh, so you see the caravan coming down from Syria. Uh, and the red is the caravan. You see the caravan coming down. Look at where is Syria, where is Medina, and where is Mecca. That Ma the whole point of the strategic location of uh, Medina, no caravan could pass going up or down from Syria to Syria, back from Syria, except that they're going to pass by the vicinity of uh, Mecca. Uh, sorry, Medina. And therefore, this is why the Quraysh were very concerned and they kept on having to go to war with the Muslims. So, there is the caravan of Abu Sufyan. He hears that the Muslims have left Badr and so he makes his way closer to the shore, which is basically uh, towards Yambur, is what the city is now. That city over there now is Yambur, towards Yambur. He makes his way towards Yambur and he uses a route that is right next to the seashore to get away from the Muslim camp Otherwise, he would have passed through straight through Badr. He would have passed through to get to Mecca. And that is why the Muslims were on their way. There it is. Where did, how, where did that come from? Nope, that's not, that's not for me. But where is the remote? Mustafa has it. Okay. <laughs> yes, Mustafa, it is working. <laughs> yes, from there. MashaAllah. Okay. We should use this in the khutbah, right? <laughs> okay, let's see how we do this. Yalla, tayyib. So we find, uh, I'm going to take a while to get used to this. Okay, we find that the uh, Muslims, I mean, so that the Quraysh would have come down. This is really weird. 
They would have come down from, because I can't point towards there, right? Let me see. Okay, it's kind of working. They would have come down from Badr all the way to Mecca, but instead he turns uh, basically towards Yambur to make his way towards Mecca. Now, and so basically he escapes from the, uh, from the Muslims in this manner. Now, the army from Mecca leaves, and they know exactly where to go because they're going to meet the Muslims exactly at Badr, which was the route that Abu Sufyan would have come from had he gone the normal route. And here is the plain of Badr. This is the plain of Badr from uh, Google Maps. And right over there, right over there, this is, this is the location of the wells. And they say this is where those people were buried. Uh, this is where uh, Abu Jahad and all of them were thrown into the uh, were thrown into the, the well. Of course, these days there's no well left. Obviously, there is no water anymore at Badr. Uh, I have visited the the, the, the city. So there, this is the city up here. If you look very carefully, you will find a small. You know, it's like a little village. It's like just a few hundred people living there. Uh, and uh, the main reason, really, is like a tourist place. People go there and they uh, want to see the battle. Otherwise, there's no commerce or anything of that over there. Uh, and so you just see the plains of Badr. That's all that you can see. Now, notice here that this is a mountain. These are lava rocks. These are lava rocks as well. The Muslims will find... The, the, the map has, should have been expanded a little bit broader. The Muslims were camped in this area. And the Quraysh were camped in this area, as we will see here. This was this is the well now. This is the well, okay. And the Muslims came from this area, and the Quraysh came from that area. So, initially, when the Muslims arrived, the, this was where they thought they should camp. But then uh, the Prophet was suggested by Al Hubab ibn Mundir that why are you camping over here unless this is Wahi? We should camp at a front location so that the well is behind us. And we close the smaller wells. These smaller wells, we will block them up, right? So the major well was where the bodies were eventually buried. So these smaller wells were basically filled with sand. So the Quraysh had no water throughout that time except the water that they had from Mecca. So because of this, uh, the Muslims then marched forward and they set up their camp. They got rid of all of the other wells, as, uh, as I said. And then they set up their camp such that the well was within their distance. The night before the battle, the rain falls as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions and we'll talk about that. And the Quraysh then come on the 17th of Ramadan and the Prophet ﷺ sets up, as we said before, uh, the spears, the archers and the infantry, he sets them up in rows, in ranks for the first time in Arabian history. And perhaps this was one of the tactics that Allah Azza wa used also to defeat the Quraysh because the Quraysh were never used to uh, military rows, as we had said. They were not used to this uh, strategy. And then the Quraysh sent their three to do Mubaraza, and those three were Walid, Shayba, and Utba, two brothers and uh, a son. And the Prophet ﷺ said, sent Ali and Ubaidah and Hamza. The three of them they fought. Ubaidah was mortally wounded, uh, and eventually he, Hamza and Ali had to come to his rescue, but he died after that. And then the Quraysh attacked the army, the Quraysh attacked the Muslims, and it was at this point in time that the Muslims began the offensive, and uh, the Prophet ﷺ basically told them, charge to meet a Jannah whose width is as broad as the heavens and the earth. So when the Muslims charged, the Quraysh, they uh, fled in their ranks, and they turned around and they fled helter-skelter, and they made their way back to uh, Mecca. And as I said, one opinion has it that the process of intentionally left this open. There was only one escape route. They could not have escaped from here. This way is back towards Medina. There's only one escape route. And he could have maybe sent a contingent. One opinion has it that he purposely left a route, escape route so that they could uh, not fight to the death basically and basically run away uh, in, in, in cowardice. And then the Muslims uh, continued forth and they camped over here for three days to show the victory, to show that they had uh, won over the uh, battle. And uh, then we can get back to this, inshallah. And I wanted to go over Surah Al-Anfal, so if all of you can have Surah Al-Anfal opened up, which is, of course, the eighth Surah of the Qur'an. And pretty much the entire Surah is about the Battle of Badr. And I purposely wanted to go over it. I don't know if we can finish all of it. I'm going to have to go at a super fast uh, speed. So I forgive. Uh, I ask your forgiveness for this. But 
I want you all to basically understand all of the points of the Battle of Badr and then see that pretty much every single major incident is alluded to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins. Now by the way, from the beginning we learned therefore that Surah Al-Anfal came down on the plains of Badr. On the plains of Badr. This is when Anfal was revealed. So literally the Muslims are still camped. All of this is going on. So it's fresh. So can you imagine their minds would know. So the references, I mean I have no doubt in my mind that there are many references in Surah Al-Anfal that we won't ever know. Because they're gone now from memory. But the, the Muslims understood them. You understand what I'm saying? That the, the memory is fresh and Allah revealing a surah. Perhaps there are many incidents that is indirectly alluded to and yani, we don't have the direct knowledge of them. But of course we have a lot of uh, indirect and a lot of specific stories. So let us begin. They ask you about uh, Anfal, the, the, the war booty. Tell them that Anfal belongs to Allah and His Messenger. So fear Allah and amend that which is between you and obey Allah and His Messenger if you are believers. In other words, stop fighting about money. The Sahaba, they weren't fighting, they were disagreeing. We had mentioned this. Remember some of them said, remember the three camps, right? Some said we were protecting the Prophet Some said we went out to charge. Some said we were, uh, you know, the second guard, this and that. So Allah is saying, don't have these disagreements. وَأَصْلِحُوا ذَاتَ بَيْنِكُمْ Forgive all of these, not forgive isn't a good word, but uh, reconcile. Aslihu That come together, all of you, and have taqwa of Allah and obey Allah if you are truly believers. Verily, the believers are those who when Allah is mentioned, their hearts become fearful. And when His ayat are recited, their iman goes up and they put their trust in Allah. The ones who pray and who give their uh, money, these are the true believers. They are the ones who have their ranks with Allah and forgiveness and a noble provision. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding them of the real goal. It's not this money, it's not anfal. It is iman in Allah, it is taqwa, it is salah, it is dhikr. And Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying, you want a sign of iman? This is a sign of iman. That when my name is mentioned, your heart should tremble. Right? And uh, when my ayat are recited, then your iman goes up. This is the sign of believer, of a believer. Now Allah mentions that, كَمَا أَخْرَجَكَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَيْتِكَ بِالْحَقِّ That it is just as if, so Allah Azza wa Jalla is now starting the incident of Badr. That your Lord caused you to leave your house. He brought you out of your houses for the truth. Even though a group of the believers did not like this. What is the reference here? The reference here is when they discovered that it is the army instead of the caravan. When they discovered it is the army instead of the caravan, there was some hesitation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this. And a group of them said, or the, 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 in the books of Sirah, it said, a group of them said, O Messenger of Allah, we're not prepared, let's go back. We're not prepared, we don't have armor. And it was the elite, it was Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, it was the, of course, all of the, the Quraysh, uh, I mean, all of the Muhajirun, excuse me, the Muhajirun, and the elite of the Ansar. Some of the Ansar, they were a bit shaky, like, we're not ready for this, how are we going to fight them? So Allah references those. And, and notice here, by the way, that Allah is criticizing but at the same time, he describes them with what term? Mu'minun. And mu'minun is a high term. Allah didn't say Muslim, right? And therefore, this is a consolation to them. That yes, they, they made an error here, but they still have iman. And iman is a praise. It's not, Islam is not a praise. Islam is generic. Everybody has Islam. Iman is a higher praise. Iman is the second level. And Allah says, the mu'mins, they fell into this mistake. They didn't want it. They were arguing with you. You jadhirunaka fil haq. That let's go back, Ya Rasulullah, we'll get prepared, we'll get armor. You know, we can be prepared for them. Even after the truth was made clear to them, meaning you had told them that Allah had promised me victory. Even after this, they still find it, found it hard. They were so terrified. So Allah describes their internal state of mind. They were so terrified, it was as if you were, not you, it was as if they were about to be killed while they're looking at their executioner. So notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that they were so terrified, yet that terror did not negate their iman. It's possible for the believer to be a little bit scared or very scared. They were terrified of death. And Allah Azza wa Jal says it was as if they are being dragged to their deaths when they look at their executioner, but you had promised them victory would come. And that's what Allah says in the next ayah. Allah had already promised you. Now remember the first day of Badr. 
the Prophet ﷺ has said, Allah has promised me victory no matter who we meet. And when there was a bit of a doubt, is it army, is it, is it the, the caravan? The Prophet ﷺ had announced to them, my Lord has promised me one of the two shall be mine. So the promise has been given. So Allah reminds them, That remember, Allah had promised you one of the two would be yours. And you wanted the one that was less harmful, that was not armed, i.e. the caravan, to be yours. But Allah wanted to establish the truth with his words and to eliminate the kafirin. So you wanted the dunya and Allah wanted something else. Once again, this is not a criticism. It is Allah Azza wa Jal is explaining that your short-sightedness is different than my long-term wisdom. You wanted the immediate ghanimah. The, the caravan of Abu Sufyan. And I had bigger plans in mind. Why? So that the truth can be made clear and the battle can be destroyed even if the sinners do not like this. Remember, when you were asking your Lord for help, is Rabbakum? If this ayah came down on the same day as Badr, this is in the morning. And if it is the next day, this is the day before, right? In the morning of Badr, the process of making the dua. So this ayah is fresh. Everybody remembers. Can you imagine the vivid memory of the process of raising his dua, making his dua, his upper garment falls down, Abu Bakr comes and puts his hand down. This is this reference now. Remember, you were the ones pleading for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you. So I responded to you that I will help you with a thousand angels, one after the other, coming down. And I only said this to you so that it will be good news. I didn't need to tell you, you're going to win. But I told you to comfort you. So you are comforted. You know that you're going to win and realize that victory is only from Allah and Allah is Azizun Hakim, exalted and wise. Remember as well. So Allah is reminding them of all of their favors that just happened. Remember as well, when you were overcame with sleep, with drowsiness, as a blessing and a security from him, right? So the night before, when everybody is terrified, Wallah, we cannot sleep if we have an interview the next day. We cannot sleep if we have an exam the next day, right? And they have a battle and they fell asleep. So Allah is saying, remember, when I sent down to you sleep, and I sent down rain, when sleep overcame you, and I sent rain upon you, why? لِيُطَهِّرَكُمْ بِهِ To cleanse you spiritually and physically. Spiritually was a cleansing. Even physically, it's refreshing to have a little bit of a drenching, a little bit of a bath. And, uh, and الشيطان, to get rid of the evils of shaitan and to make your feet steadfast, to make the ground around you firm. Remember when your Lord told the angels that I am with you. So strengthen those who believe. فَثَبِّتُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا ثَبِّتُوا here Ibn Abbas and others said that you complete what the believers are doing. Remember we talked about this, that every time a believer did something, the angel followed up, right? So the believer raised his whip without seeing his own whip. He hears a whip and he sees the effect of a whip. He didn't do anything. So this is thabat. Thabat means to affirm, to, make, to strengthen. So the Muslims started, the angels finished. So, ثَبِّتُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا سَأُلْقِي فِي قُلُوبِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا الرُّعْبِ That Allah is speaking in the first person now. I am the one who is going to uh, throw into the hearts of those who have rejected me. I am going to throw into their hearts fear. فَضْرِبُوا فَوْقَ الْأَعْنَاقِ Now the command is to the angels, or some say to the believers, and some say to both, that go and strike the enemy at their neck and strike them. كُلَّ بَنَانِ كُلَّ بَنَانِ could mean the fingertips and it could mean at every uh, joint. That is because... Why is there such harsh, harshness towards these people? They have opposed Allah and His Messenger. Shaqullaha wa Rasula. And shaqa means to do everything you can to prevent, to do everything you can to stop. So these people aren't just disbelievers. It's one thing to be a kafir. These are those who have wanted Islam to be destroyed. They have gone against Islam in every way possible. And whoever does this will find Allah to be severe in punishment. ذَلِكُمْ فَذُوقُوهُ Go ahead, taste this for what you have done. ذَلِكُمْ means because of that, فَذُوقُوهُ Taste it. Because of your attitude, because of your arrogance, 
taste the punishment of Allah and verily what is going to await you in the adab of nar will be even worse than this. O you who believe, when you meet those who disbelieve, advancing towards you, do not turn your back in flight. فَلَا تُوَلُّهُمُ adbar. Whoever turns his back on that day, unless there is a reason to do so. For example, he is joining another group or it's a tactic of strategy, has faced anger from Allah and his refuge or his place of abode will be the fire of hell and what a evil destination. Uh, scholars say this ayah was abrogated by the end of the surah. That in fact it was never applicable. It was as if Allah Azza wa Jal told them in the beginning that you never have an excuse to turn around. Then the majority opinion by the end of the same surah, we'll come to it, Allah gave them uh, an excuse. What is that excuse? If you are outnumbered, you may flee. If you're outnumbered, you may flee. And therefore, it was as if Allah is saying, this is the asl, the basic ruling. And there are some commandments that have been abrogated that were never implemented. There are some commandments in the Quran that have been abrogated that were never implemented. And the wisdom is very clear that when Allah says, you have no excuse to turn around, what impression do we get? Then Allah says, well, if you're outnumbered 10 to 1, which is what the Quran says. If you're outnumbered 10 to 1, then you can turn around, right? So clearly, it's as if you're be, being given the ideal, then you're given a concession. That That is so. ذَلِكُمْ here, there is no English equivalent. It, it is as if we say, so be it, or this is the case. ذَلِكُمْ and Allah Azza wa Jal will weaken the plot of the kafirin. Verse number 19. تستفتحو, the reference here is to the Quraysh. If you are asking Allah for a victory. Verse number. Oh, did I skip something? Sorry. Sorry, I skipped something. I skipped 17. فَلَمْ تَقْتُلُوهُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ قَتَلَهُمْ that uh, you did not kill them, but Allah Azza wa Jal killed them. And you did not throw when you threw, but it was Allah who threw. We explained this verse that at the beginning of the battle, the Prophet ﷺ took those pebbles and those stones and he threw it into the entire army. And Allah says that, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى That it wasn't you who was throwing when you threw, but rather it was Allah who threw. And there's a beautiful point of qadr here that the Prophet ﷺ, Allah affirmed that he did throw. وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ That the Prophet ﷺ did throw. إِذْ رَمَيْتَ If Allah had said, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى It would have been that you have no will. You are like a robot. And this is not the belief of Ahl sunnah Ahl sunnah don't believe in Jabr. Jabr is called, Allah forces us to do. We don't believe this. Ahl sunnah is not Jabr. And neither is it the opposite, which is denying Qadr. Ahl sunnah is in the middle. And this ayah is an evidence that Ahl sunnah uses. Why? Because did the Prophet ﷺ throw? Yes. And did he have the intention to throw? Was he called the thrower? Yes. So Allah is saying, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى It wasn't you who threw when you threw. Rather it was Allah who threw. So he did throw. But the effects of that throw, Allah Azza wa was the one who caused it to go over all of the uh, Quraysh. And so that he may test the believers or... Bala can mean test and bala can mean reward. That he may reward the believers with a good reward or he may test the believers with a good test. And verily Allah is Sami and Alim. That is so and Allah will weaken the plot of the uh, kafirin. Verse number 19 now. That if you Quraysh in tastaftihu, if you are asking for victory, then your dua has been responded to. This is the dua of, of which who? Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl. That when Abu Jahl made a dua. It is said he made it twice, once at the Kaaba before they left, and once while facing the army. And he said the same thing. Oh Allah, whichever of the two of us has been more, uh, has broken away more from the traditions of his fathers, and has done more against, uh, you know, the, 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 the family bonds, right? Then, which of us has done no, sorry, which, was, which, yeah, which one of us has done uh, more harm and broken more? Then help the one against this. Help those who are closer to the original uh, religion of, of, of the Arabs, which is Ibrahim alayhi salam. Help the ones who are closer to family ties against the ones who have broken away. So the, uh, Allah Azza wa is saying, your dua has been responded to. In تَسْتَفْتِحُوا فَقَدْ جَاءَكُمُ الْفَتْحِ You wanted the victory, 
for the one of the two that was closer, you got it. And that was against you. وَإِن تَنْتَهُ But if you stop, it will be better for you. وَإِن تَعُودُ If you come back, نَعُودُ We will come back. And all of your money and all of your power will not help you even if it is a lot because Allah is with the believers. O you who believe, obey Allah and His Messenger and do not turn away while you are hearing the orders. And do not be like those who say we have heard while they do not hear. Verily the worst of the living in the eyes of Allah are those who are deaf and dumb who do not use their reason. And if Allah had known any good in them, He would have made them hear. And if He had made them hear, they would have still turned around rejecting you. Now the reference here is to those who uh, the, that Allah Azza wa is saying that the, the people who have been blessed with hearing and seeing and aql and intellect, but don't use it, they are the worst of mankind. Basically, summun bukmun umyun fahum la yarji'un fahum la ya'qilun. Summun bukmun umyun. They have the capacity to speak and to hear and to see, but they don't use it properly. So Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, when you have blessed with aql and you don't use it, you are the worst in the eyes of Allah. When you have been blessed with eyes, but you don't use it to see the truth. Now, by the way, those people who say that the dead can hear, remember the whole controversy? They use this ayah here. Because Allah is saying that, If Allah knew there was good in them, He would cause them to hear, meaning a hearing that would guide them, a hearing that would benefit them. So those who say the dead can hear, they say, the verses that say the dead cannot hear are a hearing of benefit and not a hearing of just faculty, cognitive faculty. Go back to that discussion that we did. O you who believe, respond and obey and hearken to the call of Allah and His Messenger when they call you to that which will give you life. And know that Allah comes between every man and his heart and that you shall go back to Him. So the call here is primarily the call for qital. The call for fighting against the Quraysh. And, Allah, and generally speaking, qital is death. Right? And Allah is saying, come to the call that will give you life. In this is the life of Islam. Think about it. We would not be here today if they hadn't done what they did then. There were only 85 of the Quraysh, of the uh, Muhajirun. Just 80 of the five of the Muhajirun. Right? And the bravery that they displayed caused Islam to go where it did. So this is what Allah is saying, that this is going to give you your real life. And know that Allah can come between a man and his heart. Meaning what? Both meanings are here. Number one, if your heart is weak, turn to Allah to strengthen it. Number two, if you feel your heart to be strong, don't be deluded that it might not go astray. Turn to Allah for strength. Right? That even between you and your own heart, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can intervene. And that's why our Prophet would make dua to Allah. Ya muqallib al qulub, thabbit qulubana ala ta'atik. Thabbit qalb qulubana ala ta'atik. Oh, the one who moves the hearts back and forth, make my heart firm in your worship. So, this is the meaning here that Allah comes between a man and his heart. And fear a trial that will strike uh, those who have not necessarily done any wrong amongst you. It's not just going to hit those who have done zulm and know that Allah Azza wa Jal is. Uh, Shadid al Iqab. What is the reference here? Some say this is a reference to the future battles. That don't be misguided, don't be um, deceived into thinking that khalas, it's all going to be easy, easy uh, stretch from here. Others say that the meaning here is that never feel that life will stop being te uh, full, of, full of temptations, full of fitan. There are always going to be trials and tribulations no matter how long that you live. Remember when you were few and oppressed in the land, fearing that people might يتخطفكم الناس تخطفة uh, means to shoot you down one by one. تخطفة means pluck, like one by one. And the meaning here is you don't have strength. In Mecca, you could have been killed one by one. And so Allah is saying, remember when you were few in number in Mecca. مستضعفون في الأرض You were oppressed in the land, weak in the land. Worrying that people would abduct you, kill you one by one. What happened? فَآوَاكُمْ Allah gave you comfort, Medina. وَأَيَّدَكُمْ مِنْ نَصْرِهِ He helped you with his victories, Badr. وَرَزَقَكُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ He gave you good things, 
the dates of Medina, the waters of Medina. You don't have to worry now about uh, the troubles that you had in Mecca so that you may uh, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. O you who believe, do not betray the trust of Allah and the messenger uh, or betray your own trust while you know the consequences and know that your properties and your children are a trial and that Allah Azza wa Jal has a uh, great reward. Uh, some say this is in reference to later incidents. Realize as well, by the way, that a lot of times Allah revealed Quran and then it was applied later on. That the exact meaning uh, was not known. In any case, the, the meaning is generic and it applies for every single incident. Uh, let's go to verse number 30. I don't think I can do every single verse. And remember, when those who disbelieve plotted against you, this is on the night of the Hijrah. So Allah Azza wa Jal recalls back what happened on the night of the Hijrah which was around a year and a half before this incident. Remember when they plotted against you to either jail you, uh, that liyuth bitukam means tie you up. Because one of the, remember, do you remember the story of uh, the plotting where the Quraysh locked themselves up, they made sure everybody knew everybody else in the room. And then shaitan came to him in the form of a tribal leader from Najd. And he said that, I have an idea. So initially they said, we'll, we'll lock him up. And Shaitan said, that's not going to work. They said, we'll exile him. Shaitan said, that's not going to work. Then they said, what's your opinion? So he said, we have to kill. This is that reference here. That they said they will exile you, or they're going to kill you, or they're going to tie you up. And وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهِ They plotted and planned, and Allah will also plan, and Allah is the best of uh, planners. And remember as well when they said, that when they heard our verses, they said, Enough, we've heard. We've heard enough. If I wanted to, I could say the same thing as the Quran. Verily, these are Asatir stories of the ancient legends. Who, who said this? Who said this? Another uh, ibn al-Harith. Who was the one, one of the two that was executed. So Allah is referencing him now. Right? And now we don't know exactly, but it is not too unreasonable to assume this ayah came down while Nadr was still a prisoner of war. Right? And now he is being mocked at the highest level. That Allah Azza wa Jal is quoting him directly. Remember when you said this, now what? And the next ayah also applies to another. وَإِذْ قَالُوا And this is also another. Remember when they said that, Oh Allah, if this should be the truth, in كَانَ هَذَا وَالْحَقَّ مِنْ عِنْدِكْ فَأَمْطِرَ عَلَيْنَا حِجَارَةً مِنَ السَّمَاءِ Why don't you send a rain of rocks to destroy us? أَوِئْتِنَا بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Or send us a punishment. This was the punishment. This was the punishment. So Allah is reminding another through the Qur'an. Remember what you said? Here it is. You see the point now, right? This is exactly what another is saying. And now, now... There is no riwayah in the seerah that says this, but I am guessing that the purpose of these verses is so that another hears them. We don't know, maybe it came right after another was executed, but then what would be the purpose? So Allahu Alam, it would make sense these verses came down. And, re and remember, the anfal, the spoils, were being decided on the battlefield. Another was executed, by the way, after they left the battlefield. On the way back to Medina, another was executed. He was not thrown into the, uh, the, the well. He was, he was executed on the way back. So it makes complete sense that these verses would have been read to another. Or he would have heard these verses and then he is uh, executed. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعْذِبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ But how could Allah punish them while you are amongst them? In other words, another is being told, did you think that while the Prophet was in Mecca, this would happen? It has to wait until he's in Medina, which is now. Right? Did you think when the process was in Mecca that a punishment will come? How could he punish him? How could he punish you when the Prophet is amongst you? How can Allah punish them when Yastaghfirun here? There's like seven, eight opinions. I think the strongest opinion Allah knows best when there are still some amongst them who shall embrace Islam and be forgiven. How can Allah punish them right now? Because still, most of Mecca would embrace, right? So, yastaghfirun here means they will ask Allah for forgiveness, right? One opinion is that yastaghfirun at this point in time, which I find a little bit, uh, um, I, I don't agree with this, but, but there are many interpretations. And then Allah is saying, but why shouldn't He punish them? 
It makes sense for Allah to punish them after all that they have done. They have stopped people from going to Masjid al-Haram and they are not even qualified to be in charge of it. Verily, only the muttaqun have the right to be in charge of it. And then Allah mocks their prayer at the, at the, at the Kaaba. وَمَا كَانَ صَلَاتُ عِنْدَ الْبَيْتِ إِلَّا مُكَانَ وَتَصْلِيَ The only thing they do around the Kaaba is to whistle and clap. This is their salah. To whistle and clap. Muka'an wa tasdiyah. Muka' is to whistle. And tasdiyah is to clap their hands. And so Allah is saying, what type of salah is this? That you are whistling and, uh, and clapping your hands. وَمَا كَانَ صَلَاتُمْ إِلَّا مُكَانَ تَصْدِيَةً فَذُوقُ الْعَذَابَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْفُرُونَ So taste the punishment for what you have uh, done. Uh, indeed, those who disbelieve, they spend of their money in order to stop people from coming to the way of Allah. This is the uh, Quraysh when they heard Abu Sufyan's caravan is being attacked. They all came together and they donated the biggest monies that they ever had, that they ever donated for an army. This is a reference to this fundraiser that took place in Mecca for the Battle of Badr. So Allah is saying, فَسَيُنْفِقُونَهَا They will spend it. Then it will be a source of regret and then they will lose in the end. They will be the ones who lose and then those who have disbelieved, they will enter uh, into Jahannam so that Allah will separate the wicked from the good and place the evil people one on top of the other uh, into the fire of hell. Those are the real uh, losers. Uh, say to those who have disbelieved, if you stop, إِيَّنْتَهُ يُغْفَرْ لَهُمْ مَا قَدْ سَلَفْ Allah will forgive you what has happened in the past. وَإِنْ يَعُودُ But if they come back to fight you, then they have the examples of those nations that have gone by. So Allah is telling the Quraysh, look to history. Look to those before you. Stop now, you'll be forgiven. Continue, look at Ad and Thamud and Fir'aun and see where they are now. وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ Continue to do qital against them until there is no fitna. The meaning of fitna, Ibn Abbas said, الْفِتْنَةُ to هِيَ shirk. Fitna here is worshipping other than Allah. Continue to fight them until there is no idolatry and the religion is completely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if they stop, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, aware of what they do. And if they turn away, then know that Allah is your protector and what a great protector He is. Uh, verse number 41 is the verse of uh, one-fifth goes to Allah and His Messenger. Uh, we talked about four-fifths goes to the army, one-fifth goes to uh, the state. And there's a lot of fiqh here, which is not uh, the point over here. Verse number 42. Remember when you were on the near side of the valley, meaning the one towards Medina, and they were on the farther side, the Quraysh, and the caravan was in a lower position towards Yambur. So Allah describes the battle of Badr over here. And if the two of you had agreed for a battle, you would never have been able to make the appointment. Something would have happened. Meaning, neither of you really would have done this. If you had planned it, it wouldn't have worked out. But Allah Azza wa Jal did it without your planning. Allah Azza wa Jal accomplished it so that a matter already decreed would take place so that those who perish would perish upon evidence and those who live would live upon evidence. Meaning, those who die, they have seen the reality. Those who live, they have seen the reality. And Allah is Samir and Alim. Remember, when Allah showed you in your dream that they were so few in number. This was the dream that the Prophet saw on the night of Badr, on the morning of Badr. It is said that he just went to sleep for a little bit of time. When he woke up, he was happy. And he said, I saw them and they are very few in number. And Allah is saying, if he had shown you as many as they were, the believers would have lost courage. And they would have disputed amongst themselves, but Allah saved them from this calamity. And remember when He showed you, when you actually met, that they were so few in your eyes. So, verse number 43 is for a dream. Verse number 44 is the actual battlefield. In the dream, that He showed you were few in number. In the actual battlefield, when you met each other, from this we learn, and there are some athar, that when the Sahaba saw the Quraysh for the first time, they were shocked at how few they were. And one of them said, do you think they are 70? Even though there were a thousand. And uh, the other responded, no, I estimate them to be a hundred. This is in uh, um, Al-Tabarani, al tabarani that one of the Sahaba said, do you think they're 70? And he goes, no, I think they're 100, even though they were 1,000. So Allah is saying, I showed them so few in number in order that you not fall into uh, chaos, into despair. 
O you who believe, if you encounter a company, uh, meaning from the uh, from the uh, enemy, then stand firm and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that you can be successful. In the khutbah that I gave about dhikr, I mentioned this ayah, that one of the ways to overcome fear is dhikr Allah. One of the ways to gain Allah's victory is dhikr Allah and obey Allah and His Messenger and do not fight amongst one another nor do you, should you lose courage otherwise your strength will leave you. So internal fighting amongst Muslims is a sign of defeat. وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَذْهَبَ رِيحُكُمْ And notice in the battle of Uhud Allah mentions the cause of their defeat as exactly تَنَازَعْتُمْ Exactly the same verb is used. In Badr, Allah says, وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا So you won. In Uhud, in Surah Ali Imran, as we'll come to, Allah says, وَتَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ And you argued with one another. And that was the cause of defeat, right? So Muslims fighting one another is one of the biggest causes of defeat. And historically, this is so true. Where do we even begin with uh, examples? And obey Allah and His message. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, number forty-seven. Do not be like those who left their houses arrogantly and insolently, insolently, wanting to be seen of people and preventing people from uh, the way of Allah. And Allah is well aware of what they do. This is the Quraysh. Allah is describing their arrogance and their kibr. They were flaunting like peacocks their chests. Allah is saying, "Bataran wariya an nas." They thought that they're going to win. So Allah says, "Don't be like them." And then He mentions the story of Suraqa ibn Malik. Or not Suraqa, but Iblis in the, f- in the form of Suraqa, right? Not Suraqa, Iblis in the form of Suraqa. Remember, when Shaytan made their deeds pleasing to them and said, this is Shaytan in the form of Suraqa, no one can overcome you today from the people and I will protect you. Meaning, the, kin- the, the Kinana will not attack the Quraysh. This is the protection here, right? But when the two armies saw one another, نَكَصَ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ Which is a very powerful expression in Arabic. Uh, there is no English equivalent, but basically he turned his back, put his tail between his, uh, you know, behind, and he fled. That's what nakasa al aqibahi means, right? And he turned around and he said, "I have nothing to do with you lot. Inni bari umminkum. Inni aramala taron. I see what you do not see. What did he see? The angels. Inni akhafullah. I am fearful of Allah, and Allah is shadidul aqab, severe in uh, punishment." Uh, and I think we need to move a little bit faster because we're going... Um, Allah mentions Fir'aun and it is fitting that he mentions Fir'aun over here because it was at this point in time that the Fir'aun of the Ummah had just been killed. Okay? So Allah mentions Fir'aun uh, because Abu Jahl had just been killed and he mentions him twice. That Allah says, this isn't the first time I'm killing a Fir'aun. The Fir'aun before had been killed and now Abu Jahl as well had been uh, killed. Uh, let's move on to 50... Uh, 58. If you have reason to fear betrayal, then, and this uh, the reason I'm doing this is not related to Badr, it's related to the, the later of Badr, and it's also related to us here uh, in our situation. That Allah is saying, once you have a treaty with the Quraysh, then you're worried they're going to break the treaty. There is a reference here to the conquest of Mecca, because that's what the Prophet did. That he uh, told them that the treaty is no longer valid. So you are never allowed to break the treaty by surprise. A Muslim must honor his word even in the times of war. If you feel that the Quraysh or others are going to break the treaty first, then you need to publicly annul the treaty before you do anything. So you tell them, treaty over. Then you can do whatever you want. But you cannot surprise them. فَمْبِدْ إِلَيْهِمْ Throw it back to them. عَلَى سَوَى Both of you are now forewarned. You both are on the same boat. Verily, Allah does not love traitors. A Muslim is never a traitor. Even in war. And this is a very important point. These guys are now, the Islamophobes are now, you know, barking all the time about taqiyya and all of this, you know, ridiculous stuff. Well, it's so explicit here. Yes, it is true that deception is sometimes allowed in war. But deception is not treason. There's a big difference. What is deception? Deception means you go right and eventually you're going to come back in the left. Right? Deception means that uh, you, you use double meaning words. There, you don't, there's no promise. There's no treaty. There's no, there's no contract. It's just that you, you have a tactic of war. 
But treason means you make a promise, you swear an oath, and you break it. This is never allowed in any circumstance. And Allah is very explicit over here. And then verse 60, Allah says, Prepare against them whatever you're able to of power, of quwa, and of horses that you may uh, inflict fear into the enemies of Allah and your enemies and others whom you do not know but Allah knows. In other words, there are people you don't know them to be enemies. But Allah knows what they think of you and when they see your power, you will terrify them as well. There's a wisdom in you showing your strength and whatever you give in the way of Allah, Allah will return it back to you and you will not be uh, wronged. Our Prophet ﷺ interpreted this verse and he said, Ala inna al quwwata ar rami, ala inna al quwwata ar rami. That verily, quwwa that Allah talks about here is in archery. The quwwa that Allah is talking about here is archery. Ala inna al quwwata ar rami, ala inna al quwwata ar rami. So he said the main quwwa for his time was uh, archery. And if they incline towards peace, then you as well incline towards peace and put your trust in Allah. Verily, Allah is sami and alim. This is a very important verse. The asl in Islam is not war. The reason that we go to war is لِتَكُونَ كَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلْيَةِ And if the enemy is not preventing us from this and they're willing to have peace, then Allah is saying وَإِن جَنَحُوا لِسَلْمِ فَجْنَحْ لَهَا If they want to lay their arms and have peace, you as well lay down your arms and have peace. And this is what the Prophet did in Hudaybiyyah. Right? This is exactly what he did in Hudaybiyyah. So by the way, a lot of the Islamic political science is now being told in Badr that the Muslims are now becoming a real political entity. So Allah is laying out some of the foundations that will happen uh, uh, later on. But if they want to deceive you, then Allah is sufficient. Allah will take care of you. He is the one who has protected you and supported you with His help and with the believers. And now this is a beautiful verse that all of you know. وَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ Verse 63. Allah is the one who has combined all of your hearts. If you were to have given all of this world, you could not have brought their hearts together. Rather, it was Allah who brought it together. He is Azizun Hakim. Once again, unity is a cause of victory. Disunity is a cause of defeat. O you who believe, Allah is sufficient for you and for whoever follows you of the believers. Whoever follows you, Allah is sufficient for him. O, you who, o Prophet, urge the believers to battle. Now here is where uh, these rulings are given of turning around and not turning around. If there are 20 who are strong amongst you, patient amongst you, they shall overcome 200. And if there are 100, they shall overcome 1,000 amongst you. So, uh, 20 to 200. And 100 to 1,000. That is 1 to 10 basically. A ratio of 1 to 10. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-ana khaffaf Allahu ankum. Now, what is going on here? Some scholars say that Allah azza wa jal is saying if the ratio is 1 to 10, you will win. Think about that. 1 to 10. Therefore, you have no excuse to turn and flee. If the ratio is more than 1 to 10, sorry, less than 1 to 10, 1 to 20, 1 to 30, then you may flee. Because remember, in the beginning, Allah said, never flee. Now, in this verse, the ratio 1 to 10 is given. In the next verse, Al-ana khaffaf Allahu ankum. Allah has made it easy for you. Now Allah has made it easy for you because He knows you are weak. So if there are 100 strong amongst you, uh, steady, they will defeat 200. And if there are 1,000, they will defeat 2,000. The ratio goes down to what? 1 to 2 now. Very big difference, right? So, and the majority of madhahib are on this, that if the Muslim army is half the army of the uh, non-Muslims, then they're not allowed to flee. That's a pretty... Imagine, subhanAllah. But Allah promises that if you have 100, you will overcome 200. If you have 1,000, we thank Allah it wasn't the previous one, right? 100 versus 1,000, Allah is saying it's going to happen. Then Allah says, Allah knows you have a weakness, so He has made it down, 1, 2, uh, 2. Then we get to the issue of the prisoners of war, 67. مَا كَانَ لِنَبِيٍ مَا كَانَ is the Arabic phrase for it is not befitting. It's not appropriate. 
it's not appropriate for any prophet that he have prisoners of war until yuthkhina fil ard means establish his power until he shows his dominion and dominion is shown by by establishing political power by execution by many things is shown hatta yuthkhina fil ard turiduna arad ad dunya you wanted some of the arad ad dunya the commodities of this world but allah wants the akhira now the muslims by and large they also wanted the ransom because it brought them a lot of money 4000 dirhams was a lot of money that's like a, a fortune and it wiped out the savings of most of the quraysh that's why even abu sufyan said i've lost one son you think i'm going to uh, lost the, you know so much of this you think i'm going to lose my money as well let him stay there right abu sufyan said this that he did not cuz literally it would make him bankrupt and abbas down to the last penny the process of took of his own uncle remember he said i don't have any money so he said no you have this 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 he took everything from him right so it was a very large sum for them so they wanted this and allah says you wanted this but allah azza wa jalla wanted something else were it not for a kitab min allah what is this kitab min allah there's a number of interpretations the first interpretation is were it not for the fact that allah had already decreed you would do this so it's qadr that's the first interpretation the second interpretation kitab min allah here means that were it not for the fact that allah had decreed that anybody who does something without knowledge will be forgiven and you didn't have knowledge so this is one interpretation a third interpretation is that kitabu min allah over here means were it not for the fact that allah had allowed for your ummah prisoners of war and war booty which he never allowed for anybody else then you would have been punished so there's a number of interpretations here but the point being some decree from allah prevented this uh, punishment now that this decree has come go ahead and kulu mimma ghanimtum halalan tayyiba go ahead and eat of this ghanima war booty the prisoners of war money as it is all lawful and allah is ghafur and rahim o prophet say to those who are uh, prisoners of war amongst you and this is primarily to abbas abbas used to swear by allah wallahi this ayah came down for me even though of course is more than him but primarily it's people like him right al abbas used to say wallahi this ay allah reveal for my sake that say to those who are prisoners of war if allah knows in your hearts any good meaning you will be muslim then he shall give you better than what has been taken away meaning your islam is better than all of this money and allah will forgive you and allah is ghafur rahim and it wasn't just islam abbas said I wish I had more money that he took because everything he gave I got 10 times more back. Right this is Abbas himself is saying I wish I had more that he could have taken because I got 10 times more back. But if those prisoners want to betray you then they have already betrayed Allah and Allah has given you power over them. Fa amkana minhum means they tried to trick you they tried to kill you they couldn't win then they're not going to win again. And Allah is alim and hakim. And by the way, we're going to come to the fact one or two of the prisoners of war, they uh, betrayed their trusts. They made promises they're not going to fight again. That they did this. But then when they went back, they fought again. Some of them were executed. And that's prediction here. It's being predicted. Don't worry. You will catch them and you will have power over them. If they betray you, you will catch them. You will have power over them. In the battle of Uhud, we're going to meet a few prisoners. One prisoner in particular, he betrayed his trust. And this is, ayah is being a reference to that. Now, the, the ending of the uh, surah. Now, by the way, so after the battle of Badr, the commandments came down. Every last Muslim in Mecca has to immigrate to Medina. Every last Muslim in Mecca has to immigrate to Medina. No excuse. You're not allowed to remain. So Allah says that... Uh, those who believe and they immigrate and they fight in, with their money and their uh, lives in the way of Allah. This is the, this is the uh, muhajirun. And those who help, awo, these are the ansar, wa nasaru, that's why Allah uses the verb nasaru. This is the ansar, right? So, inna ladhina amanu wa hajaru, these are the muhajirun. Wa ladhina awo wa nasaru, these are the, the ansar. Ula'ika ba'dhuhum awliya'u ba'd. These two, they are the helpers one of the other. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يُهَاجِرُوا Those who believed but did not immigrate. This is the Muslims in Mecca. 
malakum min walayatihim min shay. You have no walaya. Walaya here, uh, there's a number of interpretations. One of them means you have nothing to do with them, but that's a little bit harsh. Another is you don't have any responsibilities towards them. Because one of the meanings of walaya, just like wali, what is a wali? The wali is somebody who takes charge of, the guardian. Malakum min walayatihim min shay. You have no guardianship, you don't have to protect them. Illa an yuhajiru, except if they. Until they make hijrah. So the, the Muslims remaining in Mecca, you have no legal obligation to protect them. But if they beg you to help, then go ahead and help them except if it be against a people that you have a treaty with. Now this ayah is especially important in the modern political world that we live in. There are many Muslims who are begging us for help. And we help them as much as we can with dua all the time, unconditionally. Other types of help, physical help and financial help. We need to see our political situation. Allah very clearly says, وَإِنْ إِسْتَنْصَرُكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ فَعَلَيْكُمُ النَّصْرُ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ قَوْمٍ بَيْنَكُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ مِثَاقٍ If you have a covenant with a group, and they're asking you to help against those whom you have a covenant with, then you are forgiven. I think it's very clear from this ayah what we are referring to. Because, wallahi, it's a very deep topic here. And I have spoken about this more explicitly in other places, but now is not the time to go into this tangent here. That there is an obligation to help all oppressed Muslims. Without any conditions, we, we help them with dua. We help them by spreading their plight, by advertising their issues. We do this all the time. But in terms of physically helping, and in terms of financially helping, we need to look at our own situation as well. And this ayah is very clear. That there is an excuse for political reasons. It doesn't affect the bonds of brotherhood. Because notice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, that uh, they are that wa in istansarukum fid deen. They are your brothers in faith. Fid deen. Fa'alaykum al nasr. Go ahead and help. Illa ala qawmin baynaku baynahum ithaq. Unless there is a treaty between the two of you and Allah is uh, aware of what you do. And as for those who have disbelieved, they help one another. If you do not do so, meaning if you don't ally with the other believers, then there will be much fitna and oppression in this world. In other words, Allah is saying, others will unite against you. If you don't unite as well, then there will be much fitna and fasad on the earth. This is what the point of the verse is. Others might have their differences, but they'll all unite against you. This is the reality. They might have their differences, but they will unite against you. If you don't unite amongst yourselves, illa taf'aluhu means unite against yourself, amongst yourselves. There will be much fitna and fasad in the uh, earth. And those who have believed, and those who have immigrated, and those who have fought in the way of Allah, and those who gave shelter and aid, muhajun and ansar, these are the real believers. For them is the forgiveness and the uh, noble provision. And those who believed after, meaning the immigration, and immigrated, walladin uh, amanu min ba'du. So after the, uh, the, the hijrah, after the hijrah of the, of the uh, muhajirun, if they believe, so this applies to our times, this applies uh, after the battle of uh, uh, Uhud, it applies in every single stage after the initial stage. And by the way, so we talked about this many times, in early Islam, was al your time of embracing Islam gave you your rank in Islam. And this verse also references this point. The earlier you embraced Islam, the higher up you are in Islam. And the later you embraced, the lower you are. And then Allah says, arhami ba'duhum awla bi ba'd. And the ties of blood, these are stronger in the book of Allah. It is said, this is one interpretation, that this verse annulled the condition of the Treaty of Medina, in which the Muhajir and the Ansar would inherit from one another. Do you remember this? clause, right? The the mu'akha that took place, right? One of the conditions was they will inherit. When this verse came down, this annulled that clause. That families are closer when it comes to inheritance. 
Verily, Allah is aware of all things. Uh, we did a very brief uh, tafsir of Surah Al-An'am, and pretty much every single verse is related, uh, Surah Al-Anfal, excuse me, and every single verse is related to uh, the Battle of Badr. Insha'Allah Ta'ala, next Wednesday, after, <coughs> after how many lessons of Badr? I think seven lessons of Badr, we will now begin uh, the interim between Badr and Uhud, and then we have probably around maybe ten lessons of Uhud, because Uhud is uh, a lot of lessons and victories. Uh, and lessons as well and was it a victory or not that's also an entire lesson inshallah ta'ala we will continue next wednesday we don't have time for q a uh, is there any announcements to be made before